Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of... The Return from Death. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. How to turn on the machine. You'll see for yourself what I mean. How to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now, look at him, David. Why, he's alive. He was dead, but now... Now he's alive. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Return from Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. Dr. Jason Sinclair was a brilliant man. He was one of my instructors at medical school. He gave of his knowledge freely, creating in the students a desire to learn, imparting some of his own enthusiasm for his subject into the minds of his students. I always looked forward to his classes. After I received my degree, I lost track of him for several years. But one evening when I was ready to leave the research center... Hello? May I speak to David Cummings? Speaking. David, this is Jason Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair, it's good to hear from you. I was wondering if you'd remember me. Of course I would. All of us have studied under you owe you more than we can ever repay. What are you doing this evening? Well, actually nothing. I'd like to see you, David. Why don't you come over to the house tonight? It'll be a pleasure. Do you still live at the same place? Yes, the world may change, David, but Jason Sinclair and his habits don't. I'll be expecting you about eight. See you, David. Come in, come in. Good to see you, Dr. Sinclair. You can forget the doctor part of it, David. Call me Jason. You're not in school now. How long has it been? I've I've lost all track of time. You received your degree in 1943. It's been ten years. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so long. You haven't changed, you know, Jason. I'm only ten years older, that's all. Oh, do you remember my daughter, David? I believe she was that's in... That's right. She was in my class. How are you, Elaine? Fine, David. It's good to see you again. Are you working with your father? Yes. Sit down, David. Sit down. Can I pour you a drink? Not right now, thanks. Are you still with the college, Jason? No, I left there some time ago. Oh, really? How come? I wanted to devote more time to research. I see. David, are you happy with your present position? Well, I hadn't stopped to think about it. I guess I am. That's a shame. Why do you say that? I was wondering if you'd like to work with me. I don't know. I hope you'll forgive me for hesitating, Jason, but I've... I've been with Associated Chemical for several years. I understand, David. It's only natural that you'd hesitate. Why, of course. Dad doesn't want to push you into this, David. You're perfectly free not to accept. Of course, I would like to have you with me. I can guarantee you more than you're getting now. Well, that's a pretty good inducement. I'd like to work with you, David. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. What are you working on, Jason? Come, I'll take you downstairs. And you can see for yourself. Do you remember some of our discussions years ago about death and the possibility of bringing back to life a man that medical science had pronounced dead? Yes, I do. Well, that's what I've been working on. Oh? Have you had any success? Quite a lot. More than I'd expected this early. I'll show you. The rabbit you see on the table is dead. I'd like to have you examine it, if you will. Yes, he's dead, I'd say, for... Uh... For at least two hours. Very close, David. A few minutes longer, that's all. What do you intend doing? You'll see. I've already given him the preliminary injection, David, to save time. He 
You know, of course, that all life has a connection with electricity. We think we send out small charges of electricity along the nerve network, which in turn activates our muscles. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. Now to turn on the machine. You'll see for yourself what I mean. Now to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now look at him, David. What? He's alive. This animal's alive. Yes, David. But there's something strange about him. How do you mean? I don't know. I, I can't explain it. You're imagining it, David. You saw him dead, now you see him alive. The sight is foreign to your mind. Perhaps. I've learned the secret, David. Now we can restore to the living those who have passed into the realm of death. Although Jason Sinclair passed over my objection, I still couldn't get the thought from my mind. There was something strange about the animal. Something seemed to be missing. We went back upstairs. Jason left the room to get the papers he'd written explaining the various steps he'd taken in his experiments. I was left alone with Elaine. Did you see it? Yes. It's amazing. Are you going to work with him? I think so. David, I wish you wouldn't. Why not? Did you notice the rabbit after he returned it back to life? Yes. David, didn't it look foreign to you as if something were missing? I noticed something, but I, I couldn't put my finger on it. That's what I mean. David, I don't think you should do it. I don't see why. Elaine, think what a boon this will be to the world. Will it, David? Well, of course. I'm not too sure about that. Elaine, you of all people should have faith in your father. I don't, though, David. Why not? Because I don't believe that once an animal is dead, it should be returned to life. It should remain dead. Because when it dies, its spirit dies with it. And when Dad brings these creatures back, the animal lives, true enough. But, David, it's like an automaton. The body may live, but the thing which gave it personality is dead. I'm still going to work with him, Elaine. Do you know what you're getting into? Dad is a precisionist. He'll experiment and experiment until finally he'll want to try it on a man. And where is that man going to come from, David? Where is he going to come from? Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. I was in the house of Jason Sinclair. A few minutes before, I'd been witness to a scene which had amazed me. As I saw it, I made up my mind to work with Jason. We went back upstairs, and when Jason left the room, his daughter tried to dissuade me from my decision. I'm serious, David. Where is he going to come from? I don't know. Then you're going to go through with it? Yes. I warned you, David. Remember that. Here are the papers, David. Oh, thank you. Look them over. They contain all the notes I've made on the experiment. I will, Jason. Are you going to work with me? Yes. Good. You'll have to give the organization for which you're working now at least two weeks' notice. Of course. If you like, you can live here with us. Do you have any relatives, David? No. Glad to hear that. I'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks later, I moved in with Jason Sinclair and we began working. We conducted experiments making a few changes, altering the content of the preparatory injection, resetting the amount of voltage required, progressing from the lower stages of animal life ever higher. And then one night, he told me what he intended doing next. David, have you heard of Terry Whalen? Whalen? He... Oh, yes. He's going to die next week for the murder of that old man. That's right. We're going down to the prison tomorrow to see him. Why, Dad? Whelan has no relatives, no one to bury him after his death except for the state. What do you mean? I believe we can have access to his body after he's executed. You mean you intend using him as a subject? That's correct. 
What if we're successful, Jason? Won't it, won't it be dangerous to return a killer back to life? Not if we watch him. Not if we can destroy his urge to kill. Dad, I don't think you should do it. He's a dangerous man. Nonsense, Elaine. We'll increase the amount of voltage, David. Enough to destroy that part of his brain which motivates his desire to kill. Perhaps he'll completely change. You someone else, Dad, not Terry Whalen. Where would I get someone else, Elaine? We arose early the following day and drove out to the prison. Jason was well known and thought highly of in official circles. We were allowed to talk to the warden and Jason convinced him that Whalen's body would be used for medical research, but he neglected to tell him how it would be used. Then we were allowed to talk to Whalen. Just a few minutes, Dr. Sinclair. I understand. Uh, who are you? My name is Jason Sinclair, Mr. Whalen. Uh, what do you want? To talk to you. So talk? You ought to be executed next week, Mr. Whalen. Look, if you come here just to tell me that, I got a surprise for you. I already know it. I'm a doctor, Terry. We'd like to use you as the subject of an experiment. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Not now, Terry. After you've been executed. Ah, what do you mean? Who are you from? You from one of those medical colleges? Listen, I don't go for that stuff. No, sir. If that's what don't you're here Terry. for, I... I propose to bring you back to life. You mean... You mean after I'm dead? That's right. You're crazy. <laughs> you sound like you've been in stir too long. <laughs> I'm serious. We can do it. You mean... <laughs> you mean you can actually bring me back to life? That's right. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> ah, and they can't punish me a second time, can they? They can't kill me twice. <laughs> you agree to it then? Yeah, sure. Sure, Sawbones. Sure, I agree to it. Anything. Anything to get another chance. <laughs> <laughs> Jason made arrangements for an ambulance to pick up Whalen's body a short time after the execution. That night, the night Whalen settled his debt with the state, a storm broke. We stayed at the house and waited. The ambulance was already at the prison, waiting for its passenger. What time is it? Almost 12. I wish you hadn't arranged all this, Dad. Nonsense, Elaine. Well, that is, 12 o'clock time is to die. It should only take them three hours, even in this storm, to get back here, Jason. That's right. When they do, David, they'll have Whalen with them. We waited there at the house. The storm was the perfect background for the strange mood which had seized hold of each of us. A short time after three... The ambulance pulled into the driveway and we went down and opened the basement door. They brought him in and sat him on a table. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Are you ready, David? I guess so. I'll prepare the hypodermic then. We'll give him 20 cc's of this. No more than that? Of course not. There. That does it. Now, help me attach the wires. Dealing with the death has always frightened me. It's foolish, my boy. As a scientist, you should never allow yourself to be subjective about things. You must be completely objective. There. I believe that'll do it. Dr. Sinclair. Anything wrong, David? Maybe. Maybe we ought not go through with this. You can't turn back now? No, I suppose not. Shall we begin? Switch it on. Pleasant sound, hasn't it, David? What's the reading? Ten thousand. Increase the charge. The reading? Fifteen thousand. Twenty thousand. Twenty three thousand. Twenty four thousand. Five thousand, shall we stop? No. You must destroy his desire to kill. Twenty-six thousand. Twenty-seven thousand. That's it up. Turn it off. Now, to take a look at him. 
Place the contact microphone in his chest, Ed. Yes, Jason. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart, David. The beating heart of a dead man. We've succeeded. We've brought him back from death. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Return from Death. It was a wet and storming night. Jason Sinclair hovered over the body on the table in the center of his basement laboratory. I stood just behind him, watching a dead man return to life. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart. We've brought him back from death. Remove the contact, Mike. Jason. Look at his eyes. They're open. Yes, I see. Waylon? Can you hear me? Answer me, Waylon. Uh, Think what uh, this means, David. uh, He can tell us what it was like to be dead. The first man ever to know the secret. Waylon, answer me. He, the strap's taken off. All right, let's loosen them. Uh, how do you feel, Waylon? Look out, Jason. He's getting off the table. Nothing to be afraid of, David. He didn't limp before, did he? No. Some of the motor section of the brain must have been damaged. He's coming toward us. Don't move. You might frighten him. Look at his eyes, Jason. They're not human. Go ahead, David. He's trying to say something. I can't understand you, Waylon. What are you trying to say? He's patting you on the back. Trying to thank me, no doubt. All right, that's enough, Waylon. I understand you appreciate... Take his hand away from my throat, David. That's enough, Waylon. Ah! Look out, David. I see him. You knocked him out. Yes. You shouldn't have done that. Are you serious, Jason? I was protecting myself and you for that matter. He wouldn't have hurt me. You didn't seem to think that when he had his fingers around your throat. Well, I admit that I was frightened. All right. What are we going to do with him? Well, keep him down here. Teach him to talk again. Seems to have lost the power of coherent speech. Look at him, Jason. Why? Is there anything wrong? I don't know. But looking at his face now, I have the strangest feeling that he's not really a human being anymore. That something's missing. That he's a mad, vicious creation of a devil. You're talking like a fool, David. Perhaps you're tired. I know I am. He can't get out of here. he will lock the doors and the windows are barred. Let's go upstairs. All right, Jason. But remember what I said. We placed him back on the table, taking the precaution of strapping him down in case he should awaken. Then Jason locked the doors and took the keys with him. We went upstairs. I've been waiting for you. Then I thought you were asleep. No, no, I couldn't sleep. You should have come downstairs and joined us then, Elaine. You brought him back? Yes. How did he react? Not as well as he might have, Elaine. Anything wrong? No, nothing. He tried to kill your father. What? He was merely trying to thank me, David. He's probably suffering from a sort of amnesia. He doesn't realize his own strength. He's like a baby. You know, that's not true, sir. He's an inhuman, vicious killer. Oh, you should never have done this, Dad. Would you both be quiet? I'm tired of listening to you. What? I don't like to admit it. But I know I've been wrong. I'm sorry, my dear. I lost my temper. I shouldn't have. I know it's because I think you're both partially right. How do you mean, Jason? There is something inhuman about that thing that was a man downstairs. I noticed it tonight when his hands were around my throat. In his eyes, that intangible something that makes an animal a man is missing. In its place, I see... The eyes of a madman with no soul. What are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe we haven't failed, sir. 
Maybe because we're tired, we think we have. It may look completely different to us after a few hours of sleep. I just... <gasps> what was that? Came from downstairs. Whelan. We had him strapped to the table. He must have gotten loose. <laughs> that was the door. He's trying to knock the door down. We have to stop him. But how? Elaine, how? get my gun. All right, Dad. I'll be right back. I tried not to admit it, David, but that was only lying to myself. You and Elaine brought me to my senses. You were right, right all along, about the rabbit, about the other animals, and especially about Whelan. He must be destroyed. He's a monster without feeling. Here, Dad. Here's the gun. Thanks. I'm going down there and... You don't have to go down there. That was the door. Listen. Listen, he's coming up the stairs. Turn the lights out, David. Yes, sir. I'm going out in the hall to meet him. No, Dad. No, let him come in here. I'll stay right over here on this side of the room. All right, Dave. Be quiet. He's coming. I don't want to shoot him. We'll have to take him alive. You'll have to shoot him. Oh, yes, Dad. He's just outside the door. David, I'm afraid. Be quiet. There he is. Where are you close? He's searching for me. Shh, be quiet. He's looking this way. Oh. Oh, he's me. Oh. Use the gun, Jason. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he's here. Yes. Look at his face now, David. Yes. I see it. It's composed. It looks human again. Perhaps we're not meant to tamper with the natural laws of life and death, David. I see that now. But it took Wayland's return from death to prove it to me. unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. size again. I know. The mouse is gone. Now, look at the partition between the two pens. But there isn't any partition. That's right. And I don't think the partition slipped down between the two cages. I think that the two holders for it were opened and then the partition slipped down. But that means you're endowing the spider with... With intelligence. Yes, that's right. Remember what I said earlier? What would happen if the yes quantity also enlarged the ability of the brain to think? Well, it's happened. That spider will kill. It can think. That hairy, crawling thing can think. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Crawling Thing. 
And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Crawling Thing. Quite by chance, I've come upon this little diary of Emery's. The mirror of a man's mind. I shall read you only those parts which concern the experiment, the months which brought him into contact with his ultimate death. Oh, yes. It begins on this page. July 7th. Today I met Dr. Henry Sindler. I've always recognized him to be one of the greatest research men in this field. I applied for the position of his assistant... I only hope that he accepted me. It would be a great opportunity for me if I managed to get the position. I remember when he walked out to meet me. I take it that you are Mr. Bolton? Yes. Sindler, Dr. Henry Sindler. Yes, I know. Please sit down, Mr. Bolton. It distresses me to see a man like you nervous and shaky. I'm not going to hurt you. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Now, you no doubt are aware that I drive my assistants to a state of utter exhaustion, that I expect quite a good deal from them? Yes, I'm aware of that, Dr. Sindler. Yes, all right, good. And thank you for you for coming to see me, Mr. Bolton. I have many other applicants to see before the day is over. If you are accepted, we will notify you. The Dr. Sindler... That is all, Mr. Bolton. Good afternoon. July 11th, I was accepted. He called me this morning and said that he had chosen me to fill the position. Yesterday I felt sure that I'd been rejected and almost accepted the position with Gates, but something held me back. I am to see him tonight for dinner. This is Donna Atwell, Mr. Bolton, another member of the research team. How do you do? It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Atwell. Will you join us in the martini? Yes, certainly. The laboratory up in the mountains should be completed by the end of this month. I have a few things to clear up here before we start on this new research. I imagine you're willing to live with me and the rest of my staff? Oh, yes. By all means, Dr. Sindler. Yes, excellent. I'm very interested in knowing what we're going to do. Tell him, Donna. Dr. Sindler is endeavoring to discover a method by which he can make plants and animals larger. Larger? Yes, Emery. Well, how? Every living thing, be it plant or animal, gives off electricity to a greater or lesser degree... By means of the electroencephalograph, science has already discovered the human brain gives off small microvolts of electricity. When a man becomes angry, this charge is strengthened. With the increased flow of electricity, his physical strength is also increased. Dr. Sindler is looking for the chemical which is released into a man's body, along with adrenaline, which gives a man this added strength and which also increases the microvolts of electricity. I see. Your cocktail. Allow me to propose a toast to our work together. May we have success. July 23rd, the laboratory is finally completed. Sinzer and I are going up by car tomorrow. I am impatient to begin. July 24th, we arrived shortly after noon today. I'll take you on a tour of the building later, Emery. Now I want you to meet the others. Donna... Will you and Dr. Henderson come into my office, please? Yes, Dr. Sindler. Besides the four of us, the only other persons in the building are the cook and janitor. I dislike having too many people engaged on one problem. You understand, of course. Certainly. Miss Atwell and Dr. Henderson have been my colleagues on several other occasions. Well, the building is perfect, Henry. Yes, Henry. They've certainly given us everything to work with this time. Emery Bolton, this is Dr. Paul Henderson. You already know Miss Atwell. How do you do? Glad to have you with us, Bolton. Emery... You are to work on the effects of the unknown chemical which is released into the body at moments of anger or peril along with adrenaline. I shall try to isolate the chemical. You are to discover what effect it has upon the nerves and brain. August 4th. Sindler has isolated the chemical. He calls it the strength quantity or S quantity. He fed some to a lab mouse. How much time has passed since the injection? Three hours, Dr. Sindler. Let's look at the pen. I hope we have more success this time. I think we will. Maybe I'm wrong, but the mouth does seem to be larger. It is larger, Donna. Then we found the formula. We can't be too sure if it's safe. The other subjects died. Dr. Sindler. Yes? How large will the animal grow? We have no idea of knowing that, my dear. Do you think there's any possibility of it growing too large? What do you mean? 
we're changing the size of that animal beyond all proportion to what nature has evolved. Do you think there's any possibility of the subject growing too large for us to handle? That mouse there might grow into some hideous monster that, that could destroy us all. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Crawling Thing. I'm here in this seemingly deserted laboratory. In my hands, I hold the diary of Emery Bolton. Though there's nothing in his words that should cause me to feel any alarm. Still, there's something, something I feel that causes me to look back over my shoulder into the shadows. I continue with the diary. August 5th. The animal is three times its normal size. It killed two other mice. Emily. Yes? How is your part of the research coming? I've written it down for you. Here. Mm. Let me see. The effect of the S quantity increases the microvolts of electricity and we go on. Dr. Sindler. Yes, what is it, Donna? Paul wants you in the isolation room immediately. Why? What's wrong? I don't know. He just told me to get you. Oh, come with us, Emery. I wonder what's happened. We'll know in a minute. What is it, Paul? Henry, the mouse died a few minutes ago. What? Yes. As you know, the S quantity has an immense effect on metabolism. I imagine the animal wasn't able to stand the strain. What are we going to do? We'll try it again. Failure may mean nothing. Perhaps the animal was sick. We're not sure that the strength quantity will kill. August 9th. Sindler told us to feed the S quantity to another mouse and also to one of the large, hairy banana spiders, a member of the deadly tarantula family, in the cage next to the mouse. I was with Henderson when the feeding began. Open the cage door. Right. I'll set the food in here, like this. All right, close the door. Mm-hmm. Now the other one. Open the cage door. All right. There. That'll do it. Paul, do you think the spider will react to it? I don't know. I imagine so. Spider, I... What's the matter? <laughs> Ever since I was a small child, I've, I've hated them. I get nervous whenever I see one. This type, especially. You're a scientist, Paul. You should be completely objective in this experiment. I know I should, but... That spider, that hairy, crawling thing, I... I wish I could forget my fear and hatred of them, but I, I can't. They always seem so cold. A person feels that they have an unearthly, inhuman intelligence behind their beady little eyes. Of course, that's not possible. I think it just the same. I wonder if the S quantity will also increase the size of the brain. And its ability to think. Still, August 9th. Four hours later, the mouse has increased slightly in size, but the growth of the spider has been amazing. Its twice, size has been more than trebled. It's almost as large as a child's fist. August 10th, three in the morning. Henderson woke me and went into the isolation room where the mouse and spider were kept in a double cage. Be quiet. I don't want to wake the others. Look at the cages. Why, what do you... The mouse. What happened to the mouse? Let's go over to the cage. The spider has doubled in size again. I know. And the mouse is gone. Now, look at the partition between the two pens. There isn't any partition. That's right. It slipped or was moved down to the bottom of the cage. Then that means that the mouse and the spider had nothing to separate them. But what happened to the mouse? Don't you know, Emery? Unless... Unless what? Unless the spider... And that's just what happened. Another thing, Emery. I don't think the partition slipped down between the two cages. I think that the two holders for it were opened and then the partition slipped down. That means you're endowing the spider with... with intelligence. Yes, that's right. Remember what I said earlier? What would happen if the S quantity also enlarged the ability of the brain to think? Well, it has happened. That spider will kill. It can think. That hairy crawling thing can think.
August 10th, forenoon. I didn't get much of a chance to see Sindler before 11. When I did, I discovered Henderson had already told him what had happened in the isolation room. And you know about the spider. Yes, Emery, I do. Henderson told me earlier. What do you think about it? Think? What do you mean? Don't you think we ought to destroy it? Destroy it? Of course not. This may be what we're looking for, Emery. This may lead us to success. But, Dr. Sindler, it might be dangerous. Yes, it might be. But you remember that the development of the atomic bomb was dangerous, and so is the research going on in countless laboratories across the nation, across the world, Emery. That spider has intelligence, Dr. Sindler, a crafty, cunning intelligence. Yes, I know that. We have found a new formula to increase the intelligence and size of an animal. And, Emery, it will increase man's intelligence, too. Our contribution to the science of the world will be invaluable. There's nothing to worry about, absolutely nothing. August 15th. The spider has grown so large that it cannot be kept in the cage anymore. The isolation room is its pen now. It has the run of the entire room. It's as large as a large dog. I must admit that every time I enter the isolation room, I'm nervous lest that thing should attack me. But it generally stays over in one corner of the room. Apparently, it has no desire to harm us. August 25th. Donna and I are taking a stroll outside the laboratory. Emery. Yes? Emery, I've... I've been with Dr. Sindler for several years. And all that time, he's never made a mistake. That is, up to now. What do you mean, Donna? I think he's created something that will only bring evil. That will only... Oh, I wish I had the words to express myself. I know exactly how you feel, Donna. I've talked to him about this before. I'm going to talk to him again when we get back. I wish you would, Emery. I wish you would. What are you doing in here, Emery? I want to talk to you, Dr. Sindler. Can't it wait till later? No. That noise, what... It's the sound of the spider as it moves closer to us. What did you want to say, Emery? I'll be quite frank about it, sir. I think we should destroy it. Why, that's nonsense, Emery. No, it's not. It's true we may learn something. It's true that we may even succeed in our research. But let's start over again. Let's experiment with something else, something that doesn't look like a monstrous throwback to a prehistoric age. It crawls and slides across the floor with its large, beady eyes always open, staring at you. Let's destroy it. What's the it's matter coming with... toward us? Come with me, Emery. Quickly, sir. The creature... Who's crawling towards us? I wonder if it can understand us. I wonder if it knows what we're saying. Either that or it sensed that I was urging its destruction. Maybe I'm wrong, Henry. But I feel there's something malevolent about that spider. I get the feeling that it's waiting for the right moment. Waiting for the time when it will kill us. <laughs> An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Crawling Thing. I am beginning to feel some of the terror that Emery Bolton must have felt. I'm beginning to feel the presence of the crawling thing about which he writes through the words upon these pages. The diary continues. September 8th. The cook and janitor left today. If we remain here... They'll be forced to do all the work they did. Henderson has been acting queerly. It's a strange, haunted look to his eyes. He barely eats at all. Either he's ill physically or mentally. What's the matter with you, Paul? What do you mean? You, you look ill. You're not yourself. Can you be yourself, Henry? That crawling monster in the isolation room? Well, can you? No, not exactly. Let me tell you something, Henry. My dreams, I see it. My dreams in the dead of night. I, I see those beady eyes looking for me, trying to pierce the darkness. And I feel drawn to it. As if it hypnotizes me. And I feel that I'm caught in its web. Just like a fly, Henry. Just like a fly. It's only your imagination. I'm not insane if that's what you think. But I'm quickly being driven there. Do you ever look at those eyes for any length of time, Henry? Do you ever see the hatred and loathing and... Evil mirrored in them. I'm not imagining it. I see it. When the opportunity comes, I'm going to destroy it. Sindler or no Sindler, I swear to you, I'll kill it. 
October 10th. Henderson has been so quiet lately that I know he has some plan in his mind. Some plan that will culminate in the destruction of the spider. Sindler hasn't noticed any change in Henderson. He's engrossed in his work. October 16th. Henderson whispered to me this evening that tonight he will kill the spider. I sit in my room and write this, with only the desk lamp lit. It is almost 11 o'clock now. I have the feeling that the moment is drawing near. I heard it's What happened? I don't know. I think we may find the answer in the isolation room. Come with me. You don't mean that Henderson went in there alone. I'm afraid he did. But that's against all my orders. Why would he want to go in there? Let's kill it. What do you what? mean? He hated and feared the spider. We'll see what happened right now. Here's the key. We don't need it. The door's open. Turn on the light. Good heavens. Back. Back to the other side of the room. It seems to, to understand you, Dr. Sim. Probably from the tone of my voice. Now, to examine Henderson. He's dead. Dead? Yes. After all, in the spider's original size, the poison could kill a man. Here, give me a hand. Help me get him out of here. All right. Look out! The spider's coming towards you. Help me with Henderson. Hurry! All right. All right. Let's get out of here. Hurry, hurry! Lock the door, Donna. Yes, yes, of course. Oh. I don't want that thing to get out of that room. Don't you think we should destroy it? No! Henderson was a fool. He went in there to kill the spider. I think the spider sensed it. That's why Henderson's dead. We are still going on with the experiment. October 17th, we buried Henderson in the graying light of dawn. Even Sindler was quiet. October 18th, I am in charge of feeding it. Donna and I were in the isolation room today when a curious thing happened. Emery, look. What's wrong? The spider. It's crawling over to the table where the S quantity is. I wonder if... If what? The spider's trying to get more of the S quantity. Stop growing now because we stopped the injection. If it were to get more of the serum, it would grow larger. Going to get that bottle and take it out of here. Be careful, Emery. Don't worry, I will. Look out! It's... Let me get past. I think we better get out of here. Oh, it's crawling towards the table. We have to stop we it. We can't. It's lifting one of its legs. What is it trying to do? Get the bottle, Donna. The bottle of serum. Knock the bottle to the floor. It's going to drink that serum. Get out of here. You're right. What are we going to do, Emily? I don't know. I don't know. I heard some commotion down here. What's the matter? Spider just got through knocking the bottle of chemical serum to the floor. What that means is that it'll grow larger. I told you we should destroy that thing in there. Now it's too late. We don't know how large it'll get. Be quiet. I have to think. That's right. Use your mind now, Cinder, when it's too late. We had a chance to destroy it earlier, but no, you wouldn't have any of that. A man of science, that's what you are. But you're a fool too, Cinder. A stupid, misguided fool. That thing in there can kill us all. It's trying to break the door down. We'd better barricade that door. If we don't, it'll break it down in a matter of seconds. October 24th. Six terrifying days have passed. That creature in the isolation room is out of all proportion. Though we've barricaded it, the door is weakening. It won't hold up much longer. I called Frank today. We can't leave that thing alone. If it were to get loose, we must destroy it. Sindler has a plan. We've placed explosives just outside the door. We'll give way any minute now. It's only a matter of minutes now. When it breaks down the door and comes through that doorway, the explosive will automatically go off. I hope we're successful. Why don't we just leave? We can't do that. We have to see it destroyed. That's the only way we can be sure. What if... If the explosive does not kill it, I... I don't know what will. The door is starting to give. It's starting to come through. Ah! It wasn't her. Look at his eyes. The 
Almost as if I were hypnotized. I I can't move. So close to me. Look out! Look out! Even though the last entry in the diary was marked October 24th at 7 in the morning, in my mind I've reconstructed what must have happened after that last entry. There was evidence all around me of the death and destructive power of that hairy, crawling thing. It must have left the building after what happened. I'd better get back to the city and notify the... In front of me. Something so large. Giant. Gigantic eyes looming up at me. I can't move. Ah! So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. People around here has seen him at night. But he's dead. That's right, he's dead. And they've seen him walking. Ah, this must be their imagination. It ain't their imaginations, I know. I've seen him myself. What are you trying to do? Frighten us? I ain't trying to frighten you, none. <laughs> I don't have to. He'll frighten you. Old Mr. Thomas. The death that walks. Because he'll come for you. <laughs> he'll come for you. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present He Who Follows Me. And now for our story. Adapted for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled He Who Follows Me. I have before me the diary of a dead man. He and his wife were my best friends. The words he has written down tell a tale so fantastic it's almost impossible to believe. Yet I know that Bill and Helen Mason lived the last few months of their lives in dread fear of the slow steps that followed them. It is late evening as I read his words. I have come to their house now so empty and sit in the large overstuffed leather chair in the library. Outside, rain pummels against the side of the house... The wind blows the fall leaves from the trees and the sound of thunder gives vent to the anger of the storm. There's something in the house. A tension. A fear, perhaps. I feel almost as if unseen eyes were watching me. As if someone is here with me. Here in this room. So I start to read his diary, living words from the pen of a man who sleeps forever. March 3rd. Today, Helen and I came across one of those delightful old southern mansions, 
we decided to stop and make a study of the place. And Helen was especially interested in taking some color pictures to illustrate our lecture series in the fall. Well, I guess no one will mind if we take a look around the place. No, I'm sure they wouldn't. Oh, it's a shame that whoever owns the house and grounds lets the place run down this way. It must have been beautiful in its day. Yeah, I imagine it was, Helen. And the house could still be saved, renovated. Beautiful place. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I- I'd like to get a shot from here. Hmm. Ah, if that turns out, it'll make a nice picture. Helen? Mm-hmm? I wonder what that building is over there. Where? Right over there, just in back of the house. Oh, well, no one's to stop us. Why don't we take a look? All right, let's do I can't understand why anyone would let the grounds and house deteriorate so... Well, it must have cost a lot of money to run a place as large as this, darling. The real estate office probably couldn't find a buyer. Oh, uh, you're probably right. I notice the other building doesn't seem to be so run down. No. It's in remarkably fine condition. It must have been built a lot later than the house. It seems to be made of stone. Gray stone. I wonder what it's used for. I don't know. Actually, I believe that someone lived in the old house not too long ago and... I think probably the second building was constructed during that time. Well, it's a crime to let a beautiful old place run down like this. Mm. Well, here we are. Bill? Yes, dear? It doesn't have any windows. Yes, I noticed that. Seems rather strange. Oh, well, maybe it was used for a store. Oh, look at the door. Well, what's the matter with it? I think the lock's broken. Oh, you're right. Why don't we take a look inside? All right. The lock's all rusted through. There. Yeah, that does it. And now to see what's inside. Well, there might not be any windows, but there's a skylight that lets in the sun. Come on, let's go in. All right. Ooh, it's so, so cold in here. Uh, so I noticed. Helen... What's that in the center of the floor? <laughs> That's just what I was going to say. This isn't a storehouse by any stretch of the imagination. It's a mausoleum. That thing in the center of the floor is a sarcophagus. Stone coffin. There's nothing else in here. Just that... That thing in the center. And yet I feel as if... It's crowded. As if there are things here that we can't see. (laughs) That's nonsense, darling. Hey, look, notice how the sun falls across the head of the sarcophagus. Yes, I wonder if we have light enough to take a picture. Well, I doubt it, but you could try. Well, I might as well if it turns out... Yeah, that... What are you two doing in here? Well, we noticed the lock was broken, and so we came on in. You shouldn't have done that. Why not? We didn't do any harm. Well, I'm sure of that, but he won't like it. Who won't like it? The thing that sleeps in that stone coffin. What are you talking about? Just what I said. You didn't notice the writing over the door when you came in, did you? What writing? You didn't notice it then. That's a shame. Because you didn't know what you was getting into. Getting into? Look, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand. We didn't hurt anything. We're not intending to steal anything. But that don't make no difference. He doesn't care what your reasons were. Who is he? They called him Mr. Tannis when he was living. They call him the death that walks now that he's dead. The death that walks? How did he come to get that name? Because people around here have seen him at night. But he's dead. That's right, he's dead. And they've seen him walking. That must be their imagination. It ain't their imaginations, I know. I've seen them myself. What are you trying to do? Frighten us? I ain't trying to frighten you none. <laughs> I don't have to. He'll frighten you. Old Mr. Thomas. The death that walks. I uh, think we'd better go, Bill. You don't believe what I'm telling you. That's all right with me. I don't care what you believe, but you listen to what I'm saying now. If I was you, I'd get away from here as fast as I could. Not just from this place, but from the town, from this part of the country. Why? You want me to tell you a little of the story? Yes. All right. Maybe you'll believe me then. Old Tannis came here from someplace in Europe. I say old, but he really wasn't old. Just seemed that way. He brought the house and grounds here and had them clean up. Till the place looked like it was brand new. And he started building this here building. There's something funny about town. There's something in his eyes that, that made you frightened of him. His eyes, they looked like the eyes of a, of a dead man. He didn't act like anyone I ever knew. He was always talking about dead. 
Always telling me he could come back after death. I was the caretaker then, just like I am now. After this building was completed, I used to watch him at night when he'd come out here. It seemed like he was in some sort of a trance. He'd stay out here for hours. And when he'd come back to the house, his, his eyes would glisten and shine. So you couldn't hardly look at him. A week before he died, he told me that as long as I lived, I was to take care of this place. Because if I didn't, he, he'd come back and kill me. And then he died. Just like that. And he was put in here, in his coffin. And one night, about two months later, when the moon was full, I heard a noise. And when I come out to look, I saw the door to this place opening. And him come out in the moonlight. And I could hear his footsteps. It sounded queer and hollow-like. And I turned around and... I could see his face in the moonlight, pale and pasty, sick-looking. And those eyes of his seemed like two burning coals of fire. He seemed to be looking at me. And I heard him say, They have disturbed me, and the moon has awakened me. I shall follow them. That's what he said. And I heard it just as plain as you're hearing me. And then he vanished in the night. Towards morning, I heard his footsteps again. And I heard that big iron door closing. And I knew he was back. The next day in town, I heard that Alf Cummins had died the night before, screaming something about not meaning to go into the mausoleum. I knew who killed him. And that's all there is to the story? Oh, that's just part of it. It's happened again and again in the last ten years since he's been dead. Folks around here say he'll follow you wherever you go if you come inside here. Well, in that case, why haven't you been killed? Because he needs me. <laughs> he ain't going to kill me. But if I was you, I, I'd get out of this part of the country just as soon as I could. Let's go back to the hotel, Bill. Yes, yeah, all right, dear. You going to get away from here? Yes, we'd better get going. I wish I'd have been here when you come, but I was in town getting this lock. You can't go around leaving this door unlocked. Uh, that ought to satisfy him. There's the inscription, Bill. Yeah, that's the writing I mean. Got a nice sentiment, ain't it? If you enter here, into the realm of death... I shall follow you and bring him with me. March 3rd, later. I sit here and write these words. It's quite late and the moon has risen full in the sky. Helen is standing by the window looking out. For some reason, I am frightened. And yet I know that a few months from now I shall only laugh at the memory of my fright. However, in the morning, I do believe that we will leave this place. All true? Yes, for tonight at least. I think we'll be leaving tomorrow, Helen. Oh, I'm glad. I don't believe the caretaker story, and yet I'm afraid. Yeah. It's a beautiful night. Yes, isn't it? That moon's so big and full that it could... Bill. Yes, dear? Look down there at the street. There's a man down there. Oh, there's nothing to be... Bill! He's looking straight up at us. And pointing to us at... Look at his face, Bill. Look at his face! Pale. Pasty looking. And his eyes... Like two burning coals of fire. Back now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled, He Who Follows Me. As I read these pages, the words tear up at me, and their formations bring to life a nameless terror which I feel all around me. Outside, the storm still rages. Yet the 
sound of it fades from my mind as the terror in the pages of the volume I hold before me becomes increasingly apparent. March 3rd. Still later. The man down in the street, whomever he was, left after about ten minutes. He has given us quite a fright. Where I felt any doubts as to whether or not we should leave this place... They've all been dispelled now. Helen has just gone to bed. I think I shall do the same. If we're going to leave in the morning, you'd better get to sleep, Bill. I want to get out of here as soon as I can. Yes, I was just coming to bed, Helen. That man we saw... Yes? It might be only coincidence. Do you really believe that, Helen? Are you trying to talk yourself into it? I guess I'm trying to rationalize it, and I'm afraid I'm not doing a very good job of it. Uh, I don't know what to believe. It could be coincidence, but somehow I'm afraid it isn't. Then you think that... Maybe. No, don't worry about it, Helen. By tomorrow, we'll be several hundred miles from here. And I doubt if whomever it was will follow us. No, they sound just like the steps that caretaker described to us. Yes, but we saw him walk away. He didn't believe in the room upstairs. Well, it's probably someone else. It's not, I know it's not. All right, all right. Just a minute, I'll call the desk. This is William Mason in 316. Can you tell me who has the room directly above mine? The clerk's going to check. Yes? Oh, I see. No, no, thank you very much. What did the clerk say? The room directly above ours is unoccupied. March 4th We left the hotel a short time after we heard the steps We went immediately to our car and drove all night and all day And are stopping now in a motel almost a thousand miles away It's reassuring to know that he could not possibly follow us I am very tired we'll Go to bed and get an early start in the morning Helen, you asleep? No. What are you thinking about? The words that were written above the mausoleum door. If you enter here into the realm of death, I shall follow you and bring him with me. Phil? Yes, I hear them, too. He couldn't possibly have come this far, could he? I don't know. What's the matter? I saw a face. Pressed against the window. It's not there now. It was there for just a few seconds. I saw it, Bill. The same man we saw last night outside the hotel. He was right outside the window. March 5th. This morning when I went in to pay the bill... The man who owns the motel said a strange, pasty-faced man had been in earlier and told him to tell me that he would follow me. March 11th. It's impossible to get any material together that'll help me in my work. Everywhere we go, he's there also. March 16th. Yeah, Mr. Mason, this guy said it was all right for you to go on ahead because he was going to follow you. March 22nd. No, he didn't leave a name. He just said that he'd be in touch with you. April 7th. Never saw anyone who looked like that before. See a friend of yours, Mr. Mason? April 18th. He said he'd follow you. April 29th. He told me to say he'd follow you. May 15th. Follow you. 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 No. No, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. <laughs> I, I wish there was something I could do, Helen, but there's nothing. I've done my best to lose him, but I can't. I want to go home, Bill. Oh, if we go home, it'll be the same thing. Maybe. Maybe it won't. I can't stand this anymore. All right, all right, darling. <laughs> We'll leave for home right away. It's 
June 23rd. We arrived home this evening. I called Gary as soon as I could. He said he'd be out within the hour to see us. He wasn't able to help us in any way. I really didn't expect any help. But I was hoping that he might be able to offer some concrete suggestion as to what to do. However, last night was the first night in months that we haven't been aware of his presence. Maybe, maybe Helen is right. Perhaps he won't follow us here. Back now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled, He Who Follows Me. July 3rd. We've not seen or heard anything unusual since we first came home. I feel as a man might feel who has been given a new lease on life. July 10th. Still nothing. August 19th. For the past two months, a feeling of peace and security has enveloped the house... Helen and I have been able to go around with no sense of danger nor of dread. But last night, that feeling was shattered. Gary had come out for dinner. It was almost ten o'clock. Well, it's about time for me to get along. Oh, it's only ten, Gary. Sure, you don't have to go so soon. I'm afraid I must, Helen. Tomorrow's a working day for me. I thought I might be able to get you into a game of chess. Oh, some other time, Bill. (laughs) Well, next time, don't stay away so long. Don't worry. I think we ought to... Tell me, is someone upstairs? No. Listen. (gasps) He's back. Who's back? The man we told you about. Those are his footsteps. I'd know them anywhere. I should. I've heard them enough. What are you going to do? Look, will you come upstairs with me, Gary? Yes, of course. You stay here, Helen. Don't go up there, Bill. Don't let him, Gary. No, Helen. This time I'm going to meet him face to face. And I'm going with you. No, you're not. You're going to stay right here. You ready, Gary? Yes. Okay, let's go. Be careful. As careful as we can. If he is up there, what are you going to do? I don't know. We'll find that out when the time comes. Our steps came from the guest room. I don't hear anything. Well, let's see if he's in there. Stand back, Gary. I'm going to open the door. Right. It's empty. There's no one in here. But I heard someone up here. Yes, he was here, but he's gone. I can feel it when he's near me. I know that... Come on. Helen! Helen, where are you? Helen! There she is. In the front room. Helen. What's the matter, Helen? Helen, answer me. She can't, Bill. She's sitting there with her eyes wide open. She's dead. August 23rd. We buried her today. As I sit here in the empty house writing this, I know that Thomas will come for me too. I am writing this in the hope that someone will find it, read it, and maybe understand my death. It's lonely here. Yet, suddenly, I have the feeling that I'm not alone. Someone is here with me. He is here, in this room with me. I'm afraid to turn and meet him. To have those eyes of his burning into me. And yet, yet I must. I pray that someone reads this. Perhaps he will... He will... I have read the manuscript in full. The August 23rd entry was the last he ever made. The feeling of creeping horror that runs through the pages has imparted itself to me. And I sense that someone is here with me. Of course, I 
realize that it's only my imagination. But I can't shake that feeling. There is someone here. Who... Who are you? Who do you think I am? So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Hangman's Rope. Jim, it came from our right. We'd better take a look. Yeah. <laughs> I hope nothing. I don't. Huh? Look. Hanging from that tree, swinging back and forth. It's a man. The Hall of Fantasy will present The Hangman's Rope in just a moment. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy entitled The Hangman's Rope. a legend in hell, a tale about the hangman. For 23 years, the executioner for the crown. Jack Ketch was his name, governor. Jack Ketch. <laughs> I remember we were on our way back from the lake, Jim and Carol and I. And for some reason, we started back to the city later than usual. We hadn't been driving for more than half an hour when one of those sudden spring storms... Now, where did that come from? Someone said there might be a storm tonight, but I thought we'd be home before it broke. Well, we'd better put the wipers on. We started back too late tonight. What, uh, what was it that held us up, Jim? I don't know. A lot of things. When I finally looked at my watch, I couldn't believe my eyes. Yeah. Arnold, look huh? out. There's a man right in front of the car. Huh? You stay here, Carol. Come on, Arnie. We'd better take a look. Yeah, right. We didn't hit him, did we? I don't think so. Now, why would someone be out in the middle of the road on a night like this? Well, there's a lot of crazy people in this world, Arnie. Ah, he must have been one of them. Yeah, I'm getting soaked. Now, he was just about here. I... Huh. I can't understand. Jim, look. Where? There. There beside the tree. I don't see anything. I guess I was wrong. You know, for a minute I thought... I thought I saw someone hanging from that tree. Oh, you must have been mistaken. You know, I can't figure this out, Arnie. That guy was out here on the road right in front of us. I saw him just as plain as day. <laughs> but now there's no one around. Yeah. We'd uh, 
We'd better get back to the car. Yeah, that's for sure. There's no sense looking back at that tree, Arnie. There's nothing back there. I don't know. I I thought I saw someone swinging there back and forth with a, with a rope around his neck. Oh, no, you couldn't have. Maybe it was some kind of optical illusion. It could have been a shadow or a branch or anything. Yeah, that's right. Anything. Well, there's the car. Oh, you two must like it out there in the rain. Are you kidding? No, I'm not. All the time that you were out there in the rain, the man you almost hit was talking to me. What did you say? You heard me. Oh, now, sis, wait a minute. I looked back at the car a couple of times. I didn't see anyone talking to you. Well, I don't know what's wrong with your eyes then. I asked him if we couldn't give him a lift. And he said, no, he, he only had a little distance to go. Carol, honey, this is the truth. We didn't see anyone near this car. No. Look, I can prove it. He insisted I take this... Oh, that's strange. What? He, he was... He was such an unusual man. Not American. He... He insisted that I accept a ring from him. Practically forced it on me. I put it in my pocket and... And now it, it's gone. And in its place... There's a funny little piece of rope. Shaped like a... Like a hangman's noose. I knew Carol wasn't lying to us. I asked her if she would let me have the little piece of rope. After I dropped them off at their place, I went home, took it out, and set it on the table. I can't explain it, but there was something about that rope which seemed old... It was made of hemp, the kind of rope you would imagine Jack Ketch might have used 250 years ago when he was the hangman. That night, as I slept, my sleep was troubled. In my dreams, there was a huge black gallows. I saw a man climbing the stairs to his death. He reached the top and stood there. Standing beside him was a black hooded man. He raised his hand and the trap door sprung open. There was a scream. And then I saw this man swinging back and forth. His face was hidden from me, yet there was something strangely familiar about him. I felt as if I knew him quite well. We'll return to the tale of The Hangman's Rope in just a moment. Back now to our tale of fantasy entitled The Hangman's Rope. When I awoke from my dream, I couldn't get back to sleep. For in the black blankness of sleep, I had come into contact with death. As the morning approached, I fell into a nervous sleep. I was awakened. <sighs> Hello? Arnie, this is Carol. Uh, could you meet Jim and me for lunch today? Mm. What time? Oh, about one. I hope you'll forgive me if I don't sound awake, Carol. I, I just couldn't sleep last night. I didn't sleep either, Arnie. How? See you at one. Then I guess I wasn't the only one who missed out on sleep last night, huh? That's right. I don't know what it was, but I had the craziest dream. When I woke up, I couldn't get back to sleep. But that's what happened to me, too. What, uh, what kind of dream was it, Carol? Well, everything was dark and gloomy. I seemed to be watching a... An execution, an old-time execution, maybe two or, or three hundred years old. A man walked up the steps of the gallows. Another man was there with a black hood over his head. He raised his arm, the trap door opened, and... Uh, and, the, and the man swung back and forth, and there was something familiar about him, isn't that right? Yes, but how did you know? Because my dream was the same as yours, sis. Exactly the same.
Jim's and my vacations were due the following week. We decided to spend it up at the lake, where his family had a cottage. Carol said she might be able to join us on the last weekend, but not before that. Jim and I left the following Friday night. Well, I can certainly use this vacation. Maybe we can catch a few northerns this time, huh? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, is your family going to come up here while we're there? No, no. Carol will be up the last weekend, that's all. Mm-hmm. Well, then I guess we'll have the place to ourselves, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Hey, why are you stopping here? Last Sunday night. This is where we stopped. I'm going to get out and take a look at the side of the road for a minute. Oh, Arnie... Why don't you forget about it? I just want to check it, that's all. That's the tree, isn't it? I... I think so. On that limb. That's where I saw him hanging. Oh, just thinking about it makes me nervous. Come on, let's go back to the car. All right. Carol said that while we were out of the car, she was talking to the fellow we saw. If that's the case, I can't understand why we didn't see him, too. You know, Jim, there just wasn't enough time for him to get away from the car without our seeing him. Unless... Unless what? Unless he was never there. Oh, but that could... Arnie! Look! On the car seat. Another little piece of rope. I could stop him, Jim threw the little noose out into the darkness. A little piece of rope, an inanimate thing, coiled and twisted, which somehow seemed to be alive. We reached the cottage perhaps half an hour later, and though we were both disturbed by what had happened, still it didn't interfere with our sleep. The next day, we went out fishing early, had little luck, and were on our way back to the cottage when the woman who owned the property next door stopped us. Good morning, Mr. Stanley. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Bennett. Uh, out for the weekend? Well, for the next two weeks. Oh, excuse me, uh, Mrs. Bennett, this is Arnold Slade. Uh, pleased to meet you, Mr. Slade. Well, thank you. Same here. Uh, you must be that young man that Carol's going to marry. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, she'll make you a fine wife, Mr. Slade. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, the reason I stopped you, Mr. Stanley, is is this. Mm-hmm. There's something strange going on out here. Oh, what do you mean? Well, the constable came by the other day and asked me if I'd seen any strangers here. A couple of people have died over on the other side of the lake. And the constable ain't been able to find out what happened. How... How did these people die? Well, that's what's so strange about it. Both of them... Were killed by hanging. Hanging? That's right. Old Mr. Taylor, who, who lived about a, oh, a mile down by the shore, he was one of them. And he couldn't hardly walk. They found him swinging from a tree. But he was several feet off the ground. And nobody can figure out how he got up there. What the woman had said frightened me. It seemed as if we were getting deeper and ever more deeply into something from which we would never be able to get away. That night, it was Saturday, Jim and I went out for a walk. It was a particularly dark night. The moon was obscured by clouds, and as we walked along, I could hear the chirping of many crickets. And occasionally a bullfrog's hoarse voice raised in protest. Arnold... This thing has me worried. In what way, Jim? Uh, This whole thing. uh, Last Sunday night and today when we stopped by the tree. And then what Mrs. Bennett told us. I've been thinking about it, too. Well, that's strange. What? The crickets have suddenly stopped. It's too quiet. (laughs) Jim, it came from over there. We better take a look. Yeah. It's too quiet, just as you said. There must be something terribly wrong up here. I hope nothing... Arnold, go... Huh? Look. Hanging from that tree. Swinging back and forth. It's... It's a man. What are we 
going to do? We'd better cut him down. No. no we'd better call the authorities first. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come on, Mrs. Bennett's got a phone. If we hurry, we may be able to get out a great deal of help to the authorities. Jim, did you notice how high that branch was? Yeah, I saw it. Yes. Why, Mr. Stanley, it's you. Uh, uh, Mrs. Bennett, may we use your phone? Well, I suppose so. Uh, come in. Oh, thanks. Thank you. But it's in the other room. Thanks. Uh, what's the matter, Mr. Slade? It looks like something's happened to upset you two. Well, it, it has. It certainly has. The constable. Why, what's happened? We were out Mr. for a Jim walk. Stanley. Yes? yes well, we heard a scream. I think you'd better oh. get out of where the scream had we come a from. Dead man hanging from a we tree. found a man hanging from a tree. That's right, hanging. Yes, we'll stay here at Mrs. Bennett's. Yeah, thanks. Oh, what you're telling me, the truth, young man? That's the truth, ma'am. Well, Mr. Stanley, is what Mr. Slade told me the truth? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Oh, then no one is safe around here. I wonder who it was. What difference does that make, Mrs. Bennett? A man's been murdered. It makes a lot of difference, Mr. Slade. If it was Bill Roberts, then it was just like the other two. I saw him just the other day. And he said someone was playing a joke on him. That he'd been sent a, a little piece of rope. Shaped in the form of a noose. You are listening to the tale of The Hangman's Rope on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled The Hangman's Rope. A little piece of rope. Both Jim and I stared at each other for a moment. It might be coincidence. We knew that, but it was difficult trying to make ourselves believe that. About half an hour later, the constable arrived. You two found him, that right, Mr. Stanley? That's right. We uh, were out taking a walk. We heard a scream, and then we found him. Can't make heads nor tails out of this. Three of them. Three deaths in two weeks, all the same way. And they all received a little piece of rope just before they died. A little piece of rope? Yeah, that's right. I say all three. I ain't seen the body yet, but I have a pretty good idea who it is. Bill Roberts. It's enough to make a person afraid of the dark, Constable. Yeah, ain't it? Well, I want you two to take me to him. I'll go, too. No, you stay no, here. But... Mr. You stay off the phone. Oh. I don't want the rest of the people to hear anything about this, at least for the time being. Things are bad enough as it is. All right, come on, let's go. Now, remember what I said, Mrs. Bennett. Don't you worry, none, Constable. I hope that woman stays off the phone. The whole county will be in an uproar if she doesn't. Do you, uh, have any idea who's behind these deaths? No, I haven't. Funny thing, he was up so high. I don't see how he could have gotten up there by himself. I only wish I had something to work on. Well, we'll see if he's just like the others in a little while. How far away was he? There. There he is, Constable. I want to get a look at his face. Yeah. I was afraid of that. Who is it? Bill Roberts. But how did he get up there? The branch is 20 feet off the ground. It would take an acrobat to climb that tree. Bill wasn't any acrobat. Well, how did he get up there? I don't know. Three people received pieces of rope, and then a couple of weeks later, we find him hanging from a tree. You tell me the answer. cut him down, but it took almost an hour to get up on that branch to do it. We put him in the constable's car and drove him back to town. Before he left, we told him that we too had received the little gift, the noose of rope, which had been in three instances the forerunner of death. When we got back to the cottage, we had a bite to eat, and seeing as we weren't in the mood to sleep, we sat down to read. I picked up a little book I hadn't seen before and read it from cover to cover. It held an eerie fascination, and I wasn't able to put it down till the last page had been turned. The last word read. Jim? Hmm? Where did you get this book? I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen it before. Why? 
It looks like the first edition of 200 years ago. Well, let me see it. Here. Hmm. A short history concerning the mysterious reappearance of Jack Ketch, the hangman who served as executioner for 23 years. I've never seen this book before. Well, then how did it get here? I don't know. Hmm, Jack Ketch. Say, he was the hangman in England who took too much pleasure in his work, isn't that right? I think so. How much of this did you read? All of it. It's not very long. And this is what I got out of it. Before he died, the book says he had made some kind of a pact with an evil power. It seems they actually do have a written copy of that agreement somewhere in England. And there's his signature. And an illegible scrawl that no one has ever been able to decipher. The pact promises life after death for him in exchange for certain services. Then the book says that year after year some rather mysterious deaths have occurred. They find the victims hanging from the branch of a tree. A tree almost impossible to climb. And the book also says that each of the murdered people received a little piece of rope before their deaths, identical to the ones Jack Ketch used as executioner. That is the warning. The warning of death to follow. But that's impossible. The man's been dead for over 250 years. That's right, he's dead. But the rest of the story, it's exactly the same thing that's happening to us. Two days later, in late evening... The rest of the story unfolded. Jim had gone down to the store to pick up some cigarettes. I'd been down to the shore doing a little fly casting and had started back up to the cottage. I was surprised at how quickly night had fallen. I wished that I'd brought along a flashlight. From somewhere across the lake, I heard the cry of a dog... And the sound of it filtered through and was carried along by the night air. For some reason, I became unaccountably nervous. I stopped walking. I felt someone was watching me. Then, from the darkness of the trees, a man emerged. Here now. Where be you going? Well, back up to my cottage. I was doing some fly casting till night came. Any luck? No. Uh, I'd better be going. No need to hurry away. Nice out here, ain't it? I suppose so. Strange thing, you know. The little creatures. They stopped. Little creatures? That's right, Governor. Crickets and the frogs. They stopped talking. Yes, they... I have. You frightened me, Governor? Of course not. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You wouldn't understand it, Governor. Is that you down there, Mr. Slade? Oh, uh, uh yes, Mrs. Bennett. Uh, do you mind if I join you? No, no, of course not. Ah, oh, good. I'd better be going, eh, Governor? I'll see you another time. <laughs> Who are you talking to? I don't know. He, he he just stepped out of the darkness, and there he was. Well, I, I guess he's gone now. Yes, I guess he is. Where is Mr. Stanley? Well, he went down to pick up some cigarettes. He should be back soon. Oh, well, the constable told me to tell you that, that he'd be out tonight. Oh, thank you. Would, would you mind walking me back to my place, Mr. Slade? It, it's rather frightening out here. When it's this dark. I'll be glad to. That man you were talking to. What what did he look like? Well, I don't know. I couldn't see his face. He had an accent. It sounded mm. like he might have come from London. Wait a minute. Huh? I I can't understand it. The crickets and frogs, they've been starting and stopping all night. They must be afraid of something. Every time they stop... What'd you say? Every time they stop, something happens. Arnold, where are you? Uh, I'm walking Mrs. Bennett back to her cottage. Anything wrong? No. I got back from the store and I was wondering where you were. It's just that 
I have a strange feeling that something is going to happen. Let's go up to our place, Mrs. Bennett. Maybe the constable will want to see you, too. That's a good idea. For land sakes, Mr. Slade. The strangest things have been happening out here lately. Arnold! We'll be right there, Jim. Well, there's someone up here now. I thought it was... Jim! Something's wrong, Mr. Slade. I don't know. Jim! What's the matter? Answer me! and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Cast of Amontillado. <laughs> Fools and cowards, Montracer. Fools and cowards. What I say about your ancestors is true, Montracer. Every last word of it. <laughs> Dull-witted fool, Fortunato. That he should dare to insult the names of my ancestors. For that I swear, Fortunato shall die. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Cask of Amontillado. And now for our story. Adapted for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled... The Cask of Amontillado. As my story begins, it was carnival time in Venice, a time of feasting and merrymaking. Fortunato and I had been celebrating with all the rest. Perhaps we'd indulge our taste for wine too greatly that day. But that was when it began. The day was almost spent, and we were standing in front of my house watching the crowd. Ah, yes, my friend. The carnival has been a great success. Through Fortunato. Did you know that it was one of my ancestors who made the plans for the carnival over four generations ago? What? Oh, come now, Montrezor. You're not serious. <laughs> it's no joke, Fortunato. It's in the records of the family for any who wish to see. Ah, I cannot believe you. He was one of the foremost swordsmen of his age. In fact, all the male members of the family were renowned for their ability with a foil. <laughs> even you, Montrezor? <laughs> yes, my friend, even Montrezor. <laughs> with those spindly legs, you, a swordsman? <laughs> Take care, Fortunato. What? You dare threaten me. How do you like it, Montrezor? How do you like the point of my rapier at your throat? Fortunato. 
please, can you fancy yourself a great swordsman? <laughs> it's so funny, Montresor, to look at you all white in the face. So frightened. <laughs> so brave. <laughs> I do not know about your ancestors, Montresor, but you certainly have made this carnival the funniest in a long time. <laughs> a great swordsman. <laughs> I bid you a brave farewell, Montresor. <laughs> it was then that I began to hate Fortunato. He turned and disappeared to the crowd. Though he was gone, the echoes of his spat laughing <laughs> face remained in my brain. The great <laughs> I went into the house and thought to see no more of him that night. Little by little, the remaining hours of the carnival wasted away until finally I heard the great bell striking midnight, marking the end of the celebration. I sat in the library reading, but the printed words refused to be silent and rearranged themselves into a likeness of Fortunato's face. <laughs> so brave, Montresor. so brave. My mind was playing tricks on me. That I knew. But of a sudden, a shadow fell across the pages. Hey, Montresor. Fortunato, how did you get in? <laughs> Don't be alarmed, my good Montresor. One of your servants was so kind as to allow me entrance. What do you want? Oh, come now, Montresor. You wouldn't refuse a good friend the hospitality of your house, would you? I forgot. It passed midnight. The wine shops are closed. <laughs> yes, quite true, Montresor. <laughs> so I came to you. May I offer you some wine? Well, I hoped you would. Yes, I imagine you did. Here, Fortunato. Yes, many thanks, Montresor. <laughs> There's nothing like fine wine. That's why I like you so much, Montresor. Why? Well, no matter what you are, your wine cellar is filled with the finest of wine. Thank you for your compliment, Fortunato. <laughs> but uh, there's one wine you do not have. And that is? Amontillado. Someday I hope that you will procure some Amontillado. Amontillado is the rarest wine in all of Italy, Fortunato. Well, but for your friend, Fortunato, you might perhaps get some. We shall see, my friend. Now you were about to leave. <laughs> yes, Montresor, I shall leave. Uh, but before I do, pour me another glass of wine. I drink to the great uh, swordsman in your family. <laughs> you didn't lie to me about your family, Montresor. I know them for what they are. And that was? Fools and cowards, Montresor, all of them. What you say of my ancestors should be well-tempered with thought, Fortunato. Oh, no, it was, Montresor, it was. Fortunato, if you... No matter. You're drunk. You're not responsible for what you say. Drunk? <laughs> I never drink enough to muddle my brain, Montresor. I mean what I say. Just the same. I'll excuse you this time. Why, excuse me? What I have said is the truth. I think perhaps you'd better leave. <laughs> yes, my friend, I shall leave. <laughs> but before I do, however, may I ask if you're going to the party tomorrow night? Yes, I am. Why? Oh, merely asking. Of course, Rosita will be there. Yes, I know. <laughs> Lovely girl, Rosita. Yes, I know. <sighs> I shall be going. Do. I shall accompany you to the door. Uh, no need, my friend. I'm steady enough to make it myself. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow night, Montresor. Yes, tomorrow night. Oh, and uh, what I said about your ancestors still holds true, Montresor. <laughs> oh, and Montresor, don't forget the Amontillado. <laughs> I decided to let the insult pass this time. But if it occurred again, I would settle the score with Fortunato. The next night, I was with Rosita at the ball. It's a lovely party, Montrezl. Yes, Rosita, and with you here, it's all the lovely. You flatter me. It is deserved. Rosita. Yes? I've been observing you closely of late, Rosita. Indeed. Yes. And do you find me pleasing? Well, you know I do. I was wondering... Oh, well, here you are, Montresor. Out in the balcony. I thought... <laughs> you thought you'd lost me, huh? <laughs> well, listen, it'll take much more than you to outwit me, Montresor. <laughs> I wondered where you were, Fortunato. Oh, indeed, Rosita. <laughs> well, of course, I do not doubt it. Montresor is such a terrible boor. I do not make excuses, my friend. Whole family were boors, and therefore you cannot help it. <laughs> Can you, Rosita? <laughs> Forgive me for bothering you, Rosita. I have come looking for you in the hope that I may have the next dance, Rosita. But I promise to... Don't let me worry, Rosita. Dance, dance with Fortunato. Are you sure you don't mind? Only too sure. Montresor doesn't mind. 
How could such a dolt as he mind anything? Shall we go, my dear? Goodbye, Montreal, sir. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. <laughs> did I think he would go so far as to insult me before Rosita to deliberately interfere between Rosita and myself to I knew then that Fortunato would pay for his insults for I hated him more than anyone else on earth it was then I swore that Fortunato would die back now to our story Adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Cask of Amontillado. I determined then to even the score, to revenge the desecration of my name, of my family honor, and immediately into my brain flooded a host of ideas to destroy him. What were his weak points? How could I catch him at a disadvantage? If only I could lure him down into the catacombs beneath my house. Few people knew of the vast subterranean caverns that lay beneath the house. But how to get them there? Let me see. Something he said might give me a clue. Something he said. <laughs> Fools and cowards, Montreal. Fools and cowards. No, no, not that. Something else. And what they said about your ancestors still holds true, Montreal. And Montreal, don't forget the Amontillado. The Amontillado. The Amontillado. Don't forget the Amontillado. Was it? The Amontillado. The cask of Amontillado. Wine drinker, was he? <laughs> a connoisseur of fine wines, eh? That was it. That was the way to accomplish my revenge. Amontillado, the rarest wine in all of Italy. Fortunato would die for a glass of Amontillado. Yes. Fortunato would die for a glass of Amontillado. Accordingly, a few days later, I sent him a message saying I would like to meet him at his favorite place of entertainment with wine merchants in, of course. I waited anxiously for his answer. Yes? A message for you, Signor Montresor. From whom? Signor Fortunato bade me give it to you. Mm, thank you. Good. And thank you for your tidings, lad. Here's something for your trouble. Oh, thank you, Signor Montresor. Fortunato had agreed to meet me on the morrow. My nerves were tense and the time moved so slowly. I sat by the hourglass the entire night and part of the next day watching the grains of sand mark off the time. Finally, when I knew I could bear to wait no longer, the time arrived. Ah, Senor Montresor. Oh, good day, Peroni. I was just leaving. Senor Fortunato was over by the window. Uh, confidentially, Montresor, I'm glad you're here. When he's had too much to drink, he, he's a destructive man. Well, I shall take care of him, Peroni. Uh, thank you, Senor Montresor. Uh, while I'm gone, and if you want something, just call my wife. Uh, she's in the rear. Thank you, Peroni. Good day, Senor Montresor. So you come in, Montresor. Come and join me. I'm quite glad you could meet me today, Fortunato. I hope I didn't inconvenience you by asking you to meet me here. <laughs> Absolutely not, Montresor. If you had, I wouldn't be here. What are you drinking? Sherry. Will you have a glass? Yes, you can pour me a glass of sherry. Well, I assure you, my friend, it's the very best. Uh, there you are. <laughs> Uh, well, excuse me, Montresor. I have a cold. You should take better care of yourself, Fortunato. Okay, it will pass. Well, then, tell me. What did you wish to see me about? Perhaps I'd better not mention it. No, oh, come, come, Montresor. Don't tell me you wanted to see me for nothing. Well, I wanted your advice on something. Oh? What? You see, I have procured a cask of what is supposed to be a Montellano. A Montellano? Where? When? From whom? That I cannot tell you. But you see, I have my doubts about it. A cask of a Montellano? A whole cask? It sounds impossible. I agree with you, my friend. It does sound impossible. Perhaps I was foolish to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. But you were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. No, I can't get over it. Amontillado. I have my doubts for you. Amontillado. And I'm a satisfied. Amontillado. I had contended with sort of Casey. If anyone should know, it should be he. He will tell you. Oh, no, Casey is a fool. But he cannot tell Amontillado from, from the uh, common sherry. And yet some people say his taste is a match for your own. They lie. Well, that is a matter of opinion. Now, they lie, I tell you. <laughs> Lucchese, 
I see is an apostate. I think I'd better be going. I'm going with you. My friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I... You will not go to Lucchese. Entree, sir. Are you insulting me? Why, no, Fortunato. I merely thought... I care not for what you think. <laughs> I will go with you. It is really your cold that I worry about, Fortunato. It is damp in the cellar. It's very damp and very cold. Nah, it matters not to me. This cold is a mere nothing. But a Montreano. Yeah, I must know if you've been swindled. Oh, and uh, Montresor. Yes? Uh, forget about Lucchese. He knows nothing about fine wines. As you say, my friend. Shall we go? When we reached the house, there were no attendants present. I'd made sure that we'd be entirely alone. <laughs> Before we go downstairs, my friend... Let us fortify ourselves against the cold and dampness with some wine. The catacombs will undoubtedly make your cold much worse. Yeah, a capital idea, Montresor. A little sherry, if you please. Yeah, no, not too much, <laughs> but not too little, either. I have no fears, Fortunato, my friend. It'll be just yeah, right. Yes, yeah. Let me have it. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, it makes me feel better. Much better. Have another glass, Fortunato. Uh, no, 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 no. Please, please. please. Well, on second thought, Montresor, <laughs> yes, I will have another glass. <laughs> I thought so. Here you are, Fortunato. Yeah, many thanks, Montresor. Drink heartily. Who knows, you may not be alive tomorrow to enjoy it. I, uh, <laughs> yes, Montresor, how right you are. <laughs> what a sense of humor you have. <laughs> but I intend to be alive tomorrow. <laughs> but then, who can tell? <laughs> yes, who can tell? Back now to our story. Adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled... The Cask of Amontillado. We finished the wine and sat talking for a few minutes. Then, seeing his eagerness was at its height, I led him to the archway that led down into the vaults. We passed down a long and winding stairway. At length, we came to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. Here we are, Fortunato, in the catacombs of the Montresor. Yes, but the castle of Montellano, where is it? It is farther on, Fortunato. Uh, see, the walls of this place are so dirty. I hate to be caught down here. <laughs> How long have you had that cough? Uh, oh, it's nothing. Uh, let us proceed. No, we'll go back. Your health is precious. You'll be ill and I'll be responsible. We might even become lost. Besides, there's always a case. Enough! The cough is nothing. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, Fortunato. You will not die of a cough. I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, Fortunato, but you should use the proper caution. And there's a bottle of wine on the rack here. And just have some to make you forget the dismalness of this place. <laughs> yes, by all means. It's so damp and cold down here. Sorry, I have no glass to offer you. No, don't stand on ceremony, Montresor. <laughs> here, let me have the bottle. Here. Uh, this is the family crypt, is it not? Yes, this is the crypt of the Montresors, an ancient and honorable family. Uh, well, then, I drink to the buried that repose around us. And I? I drink to your long life. <laughs> yes, that's a good toast. In my long life. Uh, you know what, Tracer? These vaults are extensive. What would happen if we were to be lost down here? I will not be lost, Fortunato. Still, uh, perhaps we should go back. And leave the Amontillado? Well, we could return another time. If you're afraid, I can always get Lucchese. Uh, no, 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 no. Let us proceed to the Amontillado. After all, we shall only be here for a little while. If you insist, Fortunato. If you insist. <laughs> Coughing grew worse, but I said nothing. I could see that he was not quite so enthusiastic about finding the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt. Hey, Montresor, where is the Amontillado? The Amontillado? Oh, yes, in the crypt, Fortunato. I, I can't... Where? In that low crypt ahead of you. Why, oh, it's just tall enough for a man of my size. Yes, isn't it? But, uh... I do not see the cask of a Montreal. Oh, but you will, Fortunato. You will. 
You wouldn't want to turn back now, would you? A man of your courage. I will not have it said that Fortunato is a coward. Now then, just where is the Amontillado, Montresa? Lift your torch a little higher, Fortunato. You'll see it. Yeah. Where? Just inside this niche, Fortunato. Just inside. Yeah, why did you... Why did I hide it here? You forget Amontillado is the rarest wine in all of Italy, Fortunato. <laughs> yes, you're wise, Montresa. Now, Fortunato, herein lies the Amontillado. As for Ducati... He's a fool. Yes, Amontillado. A whole gang. Yes, go in. Get to the Amontillado, Fortunato. <laughs> the Amontillado. <laughs> this rock is in the way. Put your hands up high and push, Fortunato. No, higher. That's it. That's just right. Come on, Peter. What are you doing, just taking you, Fortunato? But I'm facing the, the Amontillado. Now, Fortunato, dance. Dance with Rosita. have seen the look of terror on his round face. He could barely move. The crypt was just the right size for him. Just the right size for him to die in. Then I began to work. I began walling up the entrance to the niche in which Fortunato was chained. Monte, sir. What are you doing? Even a dolt can understand what I'm doing, Fortunato. Even a dolt such as Montresor. Please, Montresor. Don't wall me up in here. I, I, I didn't mean the things I said. Please. Please. I, I, I promise I shall leave Rosita alone. Yes, Fortunato. You will leave Rosita alone. Have mercy, Montresor. I'm sorry for what I said. It's too late, Fortunato. Too late to make excuses. I had barely finished with the first tier of masonry when I discovered that the effect of the wine had worn off Fortunato. He began shaking his chains in an effort to throw them off. I don't get loose, my sister. I'll throw these chains off and I'll kill you. It'll do you no good to shake those chains. They're strong, Fortunato. I made sure of that. My face. Look, I- I- I'll give you anything you want. Rosita, money a thousand lira. Anything at all. Anything. No, Fortunato, I find this payment enough. Montresa, please. Please have pity on me. Pity, Fortunato, you ask for pity. I have no pity for you. For the love of heaven, Montresa. His head was twisted over his shoulder, watching me as I piled brick upon brick. With each stone I put into position, his eyes took on a look of increasing terror and torture. I beg of you. He made little sounds in his throat. I continued my work. I had finished laying the seventh tier of rocks before I paused to rest. The wall was almost upon a level with my chest. Help me, someone! Help me! My face is mad. My face is trying to kill me! Help me! Anyone at all! You make sound all your wish. No one can hear you. <laughs> Someone will know that you took me. You saw me. That's what they will find me, even if I'm dead. And you will be punished. Few people know of these catacombs, Fortunato. And those who do are my friends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a very good joke indeed, Montresor. Who would have thought that you had such a sense of humor? <laughs> but uh, don't you think your little joke has gone uh, far enough? <laughs> we will have many laugh over it as we drink our wine, eh? <laughs> I will have many a laugh over it, Fortunato. I don't think you'll be able to laugh. Montresor. Montresor, you can't be in earnest. So much in earnest that you'll die for it, Fortunato. Please, Montresor. Please, please, Montresor. He began to scream. But then, after a while, he was silent. His eyes watched every move I made. With a great deal of effort, I raised the last stone and shoved it into position. I waited for a few minutes and then called to him. Fortunato... Fortunato. 
Dear me. Where is Fortunato? I look about me. So dark down here. So depressive. So cold and damp. I must remember to stay away from here. I might catch Fortunato's cold. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Black Figurine of Death. Is that you, David? Yes, I heard a shot. So did we. I thought it was one of you. It was Sawyer. He came out late tonight. I found him out in the mausoleum about an hour ago. Here's this room. Try the door. It's open. <gasps> On the floor. Is he? Yes. He's dead. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Black Figurine of Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Black Figurine of Death. <laughs> Through all the years of man's existence, no matter what he has learned or been taught from generation to generation, still he carries in the innermost depths of his mind a certain fear of the darkness. A fear of the night, which is somehow associated with death, and which in actuality is the fear of death itself. Each of us in his lifetime will probably come in contact with some psychic phenomenon either directly or indirectly through the experience of a relative or acquaintance. An experience never to be forgotten. And about such an experience is my story tonight. I was there with the others the night he died. We stood at the foot of the bed, Joyce and Harold and I. Amos Jansen's head was cushioned on a pillow, and in his hand he held a little figurine. You sent for us, Uncle Amos? Of course I did. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here in my room, Harold. No, Uncle Amos is no... Be quiet. Be quiet, all of you. Ah, you're here too, David. Uh, Yes, sir, I... I didn't ask for a speech, young man. I'll do the talking, if you don't mind. I must speak to all of you while I still have time. Why don't you rest, Uncle Amos? Rest? (laughs) You'd like to see that, wouldn't you, Joyce? David and Harold. What? No answer from any of you? I know why you can't say anything, because it's the truth. Now, see here, Uncle Amos. Don't listen to me, young man. These last years of my life, you've all left me alone. You've had more important things to do. That is, until tonight. Ah, tonight you're all here, because you know I'm dying. 
You've come here like a pack of wolves, waiting for me to die, waiting for your chance to inherit my estate. Oh, that's not true, Uncle Amos. Oh, isn't it? I think it is. <laughs> oh, don't worry. You'll inherit the estate, the three of you. But in the end, you'll wish you never had. What do you mean, Uncle Amos? That though I die, you'll see me again. All of you who've hated me. And you'll know of my presence when you see this. Oh, that's just a little figurine, Uncle Amos. Ah, you'll wish you'd never seen it before I'm through. You'll wish that you'd never known me. That you'd never been born. Before you die, you'll all learn what fear is. You'll learn how it feels to be... (laughs) Bill, to be... uh, Alone. Uncle Amos. He's dead, Joyce. Oh, no. Oh, no, he can't be. He's dead, all right. What's that? Something dropped out of his hand. Why? It's the little figurine. The little figurine lay there on the floor. It had fallen from Uncle Amos's hand just as he died. And when it struck the floor, it had broken into three pieces. I picked them up and held them in my hand. The pieces fitted together perfectly, much like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. It was a queer little figure, its arms raised in supplication, a look of fear upon its face. There was something frightening about it. Three days later, Uncle Amos was buried in the family mausoleum at the north end of the estate. A week after that, we had gathered again in the library of the old house with Carl Sawyer, the executor of the estate. As you know, your uncle appointed me as executor of the estate and left instructions that the three main heirs, ten days following his demise, be gathered together in this house for a reading of the will. You told us that earlier, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, So I did. Are you all seated comfortably? Uh, Quite comfortably, Mr. Sawyer. It's a rather long will, you know. Now, I shall begin. I, Amos Johnson, being of sound mind and body, do make, ordain, and publish this instrument as my last will and... Uh, Mr. Sawyer, why don't you just tell us about the will? Hmm? That's a rather unusual procedure, David. Well, David's right, Mr. Sawyer. It'll save a lot of time and trouble. Well, perhaps you're right. Let me see. Now, referring to the disposition of the monies and property... It's to be divided equally amongst the three of you. Of course, there are certain gifts to the servants. Naturally. Yes, naturally. There is a considerable amount of money to be divided, even after taxes. Each of you will be independent for life. Well, I can't understand Uncle Amos willing us the entire estate. The night he died... Uh, contrary <clears throat> to what you may think, your Uncle Amos was really quite fond of you. Is that all to the will, Mr. Sawyer? No. Of course you realize that if one of you were to die, his or her share of the estate would be divided between the two remaining heirs. And there is one other proviso which I cannot quite understand. Yes? Your uncle made one condition referring to the disposition of the monies. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, Oh, yes, yes. Here it is. May I read it, please? The heirs are to reside in the family house on the estate for a period of one year. If this is not done, their claim to the estate is to be nullified, and they are to be left without a penny. Unfortunately, they were present very infrequently during the last years of my life. That's a rather strange provision. Yes, isn't it? However, as executor of your uncle's will, it is up to me to make sure the provisions are carried out. And believe me, I feel a deep sense of duty to your uh, late uncle. four of us discussed the will until the early hours of the morning. We persuaded Sawyer to spend the night with us, to return to the city in the morning. The house became quite silent, and the only sound I heard was the ticking of the clock on my dresser. I wondered about the provision of the will in which Uncle Amos ordered that we make our residence in his house. I was lying awake in bed thinking of that when... Standing outside my door in the hallway was the housekeeper. Mr. David? Yes, Emily? I 
found this in my bedroom tonight. Oh, let me see it. Here. Mm hmm. It's a little black figurine, just like the one my uncle had. Hmm. Uh, you can have it back now, Emily. Oh, it uh, it frightened me, so I, I I came to you, Mr. David. How do you think it got there, Emily? Oh, well, uh, th- there's something strange going on in this house, Mr. David. And uh, I have an idea. I know who's in bed. Oh, who's... Uh, who's talking out there? Oh, it's you, David. And Emily. <clears throat> You're uh, up rather late, aren't you? Yes, Mr. Sawyer. I, I was just going to bed. If you'll excuse me. Uh, good night, Emily. Good night, sir. I'll see you in the morning. Well, I suppose I'd better get back to bed, too. Good night, David. And good night, Mr. Sawyer. I watched him go back into his room. Then I turned and went back into mine. Emily had been on the point of saying something to me. Something that was important enough to her to make a special trip to my room. I got back into bed. Wondered what she'd wanted to tell me. Little by little, sleep clouded my brain. And I was half asleep. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Black Figurine of Death. I had been just on the point of falling asleep. (laughs) Sawyer, I heard someone scream. So did I, David. I don't know, I heard something. I know I did. There's David and Mr. Sawyer. Maybe they can tell us what happened. Did you two hear anything? It was a scream. At first, I thought it might have been you, Joyce. I think it came from the servants' quarters. Emily. What did you say, David? It'll keep. Come on. Do you think it was the housekeeper, David? It has to be. Maybe she was just startled or something. Well, we'll see in a moment. No, that, that's a room just down the hall. I hope it's nothing serious. It was serious enough to make her scream. Emily. Emily, is anything wrong? Well, try the door, David. Right. It's unlocked. The light's on in there. She's not in bed. She's... Oh, on the floor. Maybe she fainted. No, she's dead. And look, right beside her, there's a little broken black figurine. Though the police came out and went over everything, there were no clues to follow. They said that Emily had been strangled, but there was nothing to indicate who might have done it. The police continued their investigation for almost a month. But at the end of that time, all they could write down in their case book was murder unsolved. One evening, about six weeks after Emily's death, Harold, Joyce, and I were in the living room. The police said they'd never be able to find out who did it unless something new turned up. And it probably won't. Oh, the whole thing frightens me. I still remember Uncle Amos's dying words. That though I die, you'll see me again. All of you who have hated me. And you'll know of my presence when you see this. Oh, it makes me shudder every time I think of it. I've been thinking about what he said, too, Joyce. I wonder if he could come back. You mean come back after death? Yes. <laughs> Don't be a fool, Harold. Once a man dies, he's dead. Is he? I'm not so sure of that. You shouldn't talk that way, Harold. It, it's frightening. Would you come out with me to the mausoleum, Dave? Why? I don't know. I just want to check, that's all. Well, I don't think either of you should go. I'll go, Harold. Well, I won't. That's all right, Joyce. Someone expects you to. All right, David, let's go. I've always had an interest in the supernatural, David. You know, there are certain things that happen, psychic phenomena, which have no normal or natural explanation. I've never seen any. Nor have I. But what's to say that Uncle Amos can't return? Oh, you got the key? Yeah. Open the door. It's a good thing we brought these flashlights. Yes, it's pretty dark in there. Shall we go in? I guess so. I still don't see any reason for coming in here, Harold. There may not be. Then again, he's in that crypt over there. Hmm. 
Nothing's been disturbed in here. It looks just like it did the day he was placed here. Just a minute. This wasn't here the day he was buried. What? This? Hmm. That's strange. I didn't see that when I came in. You probably weren't looking over there. I wasn't either. Another little black figurine. Broken just like the others. It gave me an eerie sensation. The little figure was broken into three pieces. I looked at Harold, and he seemed to be as afraid as I was. We locked up the mausoleum again and went back to the house. By that time, I began to wonder if perhaps Uncle Amos was striking back at us from beyond the grave. We said goodnight about 11 and retired to our rooms. I couldn't get to sleep. I'd fall into a half doze and then snap out of it again. I felt as if... as if someone were watching me. That there were unseen eyes in the dark waiting for me to fall to sleep. I knew it was only my imagination. Yet that feeling would not go away. About three o'clock, I got out of bed. I decided to return to the mausoleum. As I went out the front door, I noticed a light drizzle had sprung up. Something drew me toward the mausoleum, a compulsion, an inner force over which I had absolutely no control. I walked slowly up the gravel walk leading to the mausoleum, not even noticing the light rain which fell on me. When I was close enough to see the doorway, I received a distinct shock. For the door was open... And there was a circle of light behind it. I walked to the door. I tried to get through the door quietly. But I jarred it a little. And the noise made the man inside whirl around. In his hand, he held a gun. David! What are you doing here? I... I might ask you the same question, Mr. Sawyer. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Black Figurine of Death. I had gone into the mausoleum. Standing there with a gun in his hand was the executor of the estate, Carl Sawyer. David! What are you doing here? I... I might ask you the same question, Mr. Sawyer. I began to wonder. <clears throat> I I don't believe in people coming back after they die, but... Is that the reason for the gun? I didn't know what I'd find. I wanted to be safe, that's all. Now that I see it's you, I'll put it back in my pocket. By the way, David, what are you doing out here? I... I was restless. Harold thinks everything that's happened has some supernatural significance. All his talk made me nervous. I see. And do you think that there is... Something supernatural about the way Emily died? I don't know, Mr. Sawyer. I just don't know. Sawyer and I returned to the house. I asked him to spend the remainder of the night with us. Besides, I wanted to keep an eye on him. I didn't feel much like sleeping, so I went down to the library, picked out a book and sat down to read. David? Uh, uh, yes? Mr. Sawyer told me you were down here. What's the matter? Oh, I can't sleep. David, I, um... I talked to Mr. Sawyer for almost ten minutes. He said he thinks that you're in back of everything. What did you say to that? I told him I thought he was wrong. Thanks for your confidence, Joyce. The more I think about it... The more I think that Harold's right in what he says. You mean that Uncle Amos has come back to life? Yes. I'd keep an eye on Sawyer if I were you. Do you think he's in back of it? I'm not sure. 
But you must have some reason for it. I went out to the mausoleum tonight about an hour ago. Sawyer was out there. He had a gun in his hand. He told me he was just curious. Why should he suddenly get curious at three o'clock in the morning? Well, it does seem rather odd that he... No! Stay away from me! I'm the one who... That was Sawyer. Come on. It couldn't happen again. It just couldn't. We'll see. Matthew Davis. Yes. I heard a shot. So did we. I thought it was one of you. It was Sawyer. He came out late tonight. I found him out in the mausoleum about an hour ago. Here's his room. Try the door. It's open. On the floor. Is he? Yes. He's dead. the floor sprawled in the grotesque position of death. By one outstretched hand was a gun, and by the other, broken into three pieces, was a little black figurine. Harold called the police. They said they'd be out as soon as they could. The three of us went downstairs to the living room. I was right. It is Uncle Amos who's behind it. Oh, it must be. There's no other explanation. I told you before that there are certain things which can never be explained. The deaths of Emily and Sawyer prove that. You don't still think that Sawyer was in back of it, do you, David? Hardly. Will or no will, I'm leaving here now. I'm not going to stay around here and be killed like the others. I'm going upstairs and back. I'll be down in a while. I'm going to leave too, David. What about you? I don't know. I still can't make myself believe... <laughs> Stay here. Oh, no, no, I'll go with you. Harold's dead. I... He has to be all right. Harold! Harold! Doesn't answer. Harold! Where are you? Harold! Harold, answer us! His door is open. He'll be dead. He'll be dead just like the others. No, Joyce, he's not here. The mausoleum. Uncle Amos came and took him back to the mausoleum. <laughs> went into Sawyer's room. Harold wasn't there, nor was Sawyer's gun. I supposed that Harold had picked it up on his way to the room. I decided to go out to the mausoleum to see if Joyce was right, to see if Harold's dead body would be found there. Joyce wouldn't remain in the house alone, so together we started out through the rain-filled night. Why don't we wait until the police come, Dave? If this is something supernatural, then they wouldn't be able to help us anyway. David... What's the matter? The mausoleum doors open. You can stay here if you want. I'm going in. I'll go with you. Stay close to me, Joyce. I will. I don't like it in here, David. Neither do I. But you're going to remain here for some time. That was Harold's voice. That's right. But turn the flashlight on. You can see me then. But we thought you... Dead? Hardly. But you two will be very soon. He has a gun, David. That's right, Sawyer's gun. Plan this very carefully, David. When the police arrive, they'll find the three of you dead, and I'll be wounded. Tell them that Sawyer was behind it all, that he killed both of you out here, and that he came into the house searching for me. It was a fight. The gun went off. And he died. Then you killed Emily and Sawyer. Yes going to kill both of you, too. You don't think I believed all that hokum I fed you about Uncle Amos coming back, do you? Of course not. It served its purpose. And now you'll serve yours. Hell, Hell look out and back up. How stupid do you think I am? Uncle Amos is coughing and slipping. Get out of the way, Hell. Get out of the way. Uncle Amos. What did you say? I remember what Uncle Amos said when he was dying. That he'd come back and settle with us. The coffin. I wonder if it was just an accident that it slipped out of the crypt. Or whether Uncle Amos really did come back. Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. 
Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Silver Flash. And so it is that the prophecy of charming shall be fulfilled. For the evil committed, your reward is death. And from the mouth of the flask poured a crawling white fog, which became quite dense, and then assumed the size and shape of the demon of the night, and it reached its hands towards his throat. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Silver Flask. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Silver Flask. And so it was that you town called the silver flask to be made. Small and thin it was, with a diamond embedded into its face, so that it could see. And we summoned the sorcerer Charming and bade him bestow upon this lamp the mantle of magic. And this was done. For goodness, it will return good. For evil, it will bring death. It began commonly enough. Chris and Pat Redfield and I had dropped into an art dealer's shop in the avenue. I don't know what made us go in. I think it's mere circumstance. There was an auction going on. Going once, going twice, three times and gone. Sold to the lady in the brown fur coat. Oh, that was a bargain. Chris, a real bargain. I don't know, maybe. I wonder what it'll be up next. Probably an old bed warmer. <laughs> oh, we might as well leave. I don't think there's anything here we'd be interested in, Pat. Oh, just a few more minutes, Chris. But we'll be late for... Oh, all right, Pat, but just a few minutes. Oh, now, there's a husband for you. May I ask for your attention once more, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. Now I ask you to look at the object in front of me. It's a flask, a silver flask. Perhaps tarnished a trifle, but silver nonetheless. How old this object is, no one has been able to ascertain. How it came into the possession of this company is a mystery. But the workmanship is definitely oriental. For a collector's item, it would be perfect. I like the Now, who will start for a bidding thing. on I this valuable will. piece of art? Come, come, ladies and gentlemen. Who will be the first to make a bid on the silver flask? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, ten dollars. Ten dollars. The man in the blue overcoat bid ten dollars. Do I hear fifteen? Fifteen. Twenty. Twenty dollars for the silver flask before me. Twenty dollars is the bid. Do I hear twenty-five? Twenty-five. Thirty. Fifty. Fifty. No, 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 Chris. Fifty dollars is the bid. Fifty dollars. Do I hear more? Fifty dollars is the bid. Going once. Fifty dollars. Going twice. Fifty dollars for the third time. Sold to Mr. Henry Seven. Come on, let's get out of here. All right, Chris. You really wanted that flask, didn't you, Chris? Yes, I... 
I don't know why, though. Oh, it just caught your eye, that's all, darling. Excuse me. Uh, pardon me, please. Will you let me go through? Now look, Chris, there's the man who outbid you. Oh, he seems to be coming over here. He's waving to us. I wonder what he wants. Uh, please, madam, will you let me by? Uh, thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help but notice you bidding against me. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry that only one of us could own the silver flask. Oh, it's perfectly all right. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Stebbins, Henry Stebbins. I'm retired now, you see, and my hobby is collecting unusual art objects. Uh, your name is... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Stebbins. This is Larry Reardon. How do you do? My wife, Pat Redfield. How do you do? And Chris is mine. Uh, really? I'm uh, very pleased to meet you, all of you, you know. Uh, are you by any chance interested in collecting art objects, uh, Mr. Redfield? I have an interest. I'm not a collector. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Redden? I'm afraid I'm in the same category as Chris. I see. Well, I was wondering, I do have a rather good collection, you know, and I hope you won't think it presumptuous, but it's so infrequent that one meets people who are interested in the same things as he. Uh, why don't you, uh, all of you, uh, come to dinner at my house next week? Uh, say, Monday? Why, of course, Mr. Stebbins, we'd be delighted. Uh, here's my card. Uh, you will come, won't you? I'm sure you'll find it very interesting. The following Monday, we went to Henry Stebbins' house. He seemed quite wealthy, for the house was large and lavishly furnished. After the meal, he showed us his collection, pausing finally when he came to the silver flask. As you can see, the flask is uh, a bit different, uh, shall we say, from when you saw it last. Why, why, it's as bright as a new coin. That <laughs> stone in the center, it wasn't there when I saw it at the auction. Oh, yes, yes, it was. It had been covered over by a thin layer of silver. I noticed the imperfection and uh, took it off. <laughs> Underneath was the diamond. diamond. Are you serious? Are you sure it's a diamond? Oh, quite sure, Mr. Redfield. You see, the silver flask has quite a history. It's really very ancient. How old is it? Oh, at least 3,000 years, possibly more. It's a relic of the Juan dynasty. Lost for over two centuries. How do you know these facts, Mr. Stebbins? I've been watching for the flask for several years. Many times I was sure I'd found it, but <laughs> needless to say, I was disappointed. At last, however, it's in my possession. <laughs> Would you like to know some of its history? Oh, oh yes, very much. All right, then. It was first ordered made by the Chinese emperor Yu Duan, made for him by the sorcerer Zhao Ming, who also was responsible for a certain jade dagger I would like to possess. Uh, Zhao Ming bestowed this magic upon it. For goodness, it would return good. And for evil, it would bring death. The flask was in the family of Yu Juan for many generations. However, 100 years after it was first made, the last of the Juans was emperor. A member of his court plotted against him. Strangely enough, the original motivation was possession of the silver flask. But the night he came to steal the flask... Who dares enter Emperor's vegetable? Who is in here? What do you want? <laughs> Where are you? It is so dark my eyes cannot see. It is pity you will not see dagger which brings you death. <laughs> Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Silver Flask. Our eyes were upon Stebbins as he talked. Yet we saw not the man before us, but the scene which his words conjured up in our minds. Is this story true, Mr. Stebbins? Every word of it, Mr. Reardon. Is that all to the story? Oh, no, not at all. There's a good deal more to it. A good deal? I'd like to hear the rest of the story. Are you sure I'm not uh, <laughs> boring you? Oh, no. no. <laughs> all right, then. Uh, let me see... Uh... Where was I? The emperor had just been murdered. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, what had originally started as a covetous fascination about the silver flask resulted in the murder of the last of the Juans. The killer knew of the supposed magical properties of the flask, yet he thought it only legend with no true significance. He took the silver flask with him when he left the side of the murdered emperor. No one knew of the emperor's death. When the killer retired for the night, he put the silver flask next to his bed but he was unable to get to sleep, and his gaze was drawn to the diamond in the flask, the all-seeing eye that Zhao Ming had given it. It began to glow and shine in the darkness, becoming a thing alive. The killer watched it in horrible fascination. 
And then he heard a voice. And so it is that the prophecy of storming shall be fulfilled. For the evil committed, your reward is death. And from the mouth of the flask poured a crawling white frog which became dense and then assumed the size and shape of a demon of the night and it reached its hands toward his throat. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. So perished the killer of the last of the Juans. It's, it's a rather fantastic story. Fantastic? For that... The pattern has been repeated many times since, and perhaps it will be again. There is something quite fascinating about it. Yes, Mr. Redfield. <laughs> quite fascinating. Of course, all that happened many years ago. I don't believe it's actually true. It's probably like so many other legends that changed during the passage of the centuries. Endows a person or object with supernatural power. Even though what actually occurred originally was nothing out of the ordinary. Well, that's quite possible, Mr. Reardon. But as a collector of these objects and their histories, I much rather prefer to believe the legend, as you call it. <laughs> Chris? Chris? Hmm? What? Oh, you're so quiet. What were you thinking about? It's really quite fascinating. The flask. I can hardly take my eyes off it. The evening ended shortly thereafter with another invitation from Henry Stebbins that would return soon. Chris was silent as we drove home, his mind lost in thought, only occasionally joining in the conversation. I knew that he was thinking about the silver flash. I was inclined to think of the story Henry Stebbins had told us as coming from a man who was highly nervous, a man who, because of his loneliness and preoccupation with himself, would read into the slightest glance a willingness to commit murder. Three days later, Pat Redfield dropped into my office. I hope you don't mind my coming in to see you like this, Larry. Oh, of course not, Pat. It's a pleasure. Cigarette? No, 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 thanks. Now, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, how did you... What a look on your face. What's bothering you? It's Chris. Chris? That's right, Larry. I, I know it's a, it's a strange term to use, but... For the last three days, he seems like a like a man possessed. Even at night, when he's asleep, he has a nightmare. He talks and screams out. When did this start? That night, we'd seen Henry Stebbins. I can't understand most of his words, but every once in a while, I hear him say something about the silver flask. He seems to be struggling with someone or, or something. Oh, I just don't know. I'm so worried. I, I can't even think. Oh, it's a story that Stebbins told us. I know, but, but there must be some truth to it, Larry. Look at the tremendous fascination the silver flask holds for Chris. Sometimes I even think he'd be willing to kill Stephen just to get his hands on it. In the evenings, I took to parking my car across the street from Stephen's house to see who his callers might be. About a week after Pat had been to my office, I'd been parked across from his house for several hours. It was almost midnight, and I was on the point of starting my car and driving home. But on my side of the street, about half a block away, I saw a familiar figure walking towards me. He walked slowly, like a man in a trance. His head turned so that his eyes were on Stebbins' house. Chris? What are you doing out here, Chris? I might ask you the same question. I've been waiting for you. Why me? Why not someone else? Because no one else has an interest in the silver flask. Has Pat been talking to you? Not recently. Then you know all about it, don't you, Larry? That I want the silver flask, that I'm going to get it now, tonight. No, you're not, Chris. Yes, I am, Larry. Now, get out of my way. Get that knife back in your pocket, you fool. It's pretty, isn't it? Just press a button and the blade snaps open. Out of my way. You're not going anywhere with that knife. No, we'll see about that. Oh, you asked for it, Larry. <laughs> Let go of my arm. Drop that knife. Drop it. Drop it. All right. That's better. Take this little thing. Now get into the car. Oh, I'll get into the car, all right, Larry. I won't make any fuss about that. You think you're doing me a favor by stopping me. I don't. Maybe my chance is lost tonight, but I'll get another. Don't worry about that. There isn't anything that's going to stand in my way. Not you, not Pat, most certainly not Stebbins. 
I'd even commit murder to get that silver flask. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Silver Flask. <laughs> Chris was quiet and sullen as I drove him home. He didn't say a word to me all the while we were together. I watched him enter the front door of this house, and I drove back to my apartment. When I got there, I called Henry Stephens. Hello? Mr. Stebbins, this is Larry Reardon. Oh, yes. You'd better make sure that your house is locked up tight from now on. Your friend? Yes. I've been watching the front of your house for several nights. Tonight, about midnight, I saw Chris... I think he intended to break in. I'll be careful. <laughs> Thanks for calling. In the morning, for some reason, Henry Stebbins phoned first the Redfields and then me, and asked us to come to dinner that night. I couldn't understand his line of reasoning unless he enjoyed playing a cat and mouse game with Chris. Pat didn't want to go, but Chris insisted, and promptly at seven we were at Stebbins' house. We finished the meal and adjourned to the library. I'd like to see your collection again, Mr. Stebbins. Oh, I'd be glad to show it to you. Uh, would you two like to come with us? No, I'll stay here if you don't mind. So will I. All right. Then just you and I'll go to see it, Chris. Suits me. Hey, we'll be back in a little while. I wonder if we should have let him go alone. Chris won't try anything while we're here, Pat. I hope you're right. Besides, I'm sure that Stebbins can protect himself. Oh, I'm worried about him, Larry. Chris has changed, so. When we're alone, he never says anything anymore. He just doodles on a scratch pad with a pencil. Always draws the same picture. The silver flask? Yes. I think something's wrong with his mind. Oh, I don't think what it's any... What do you do with it? Just a minute, Mr. Where is it? Where's the silver flask? Come on, Pat. We shouldn't have let him go alone. I figured it would be best to put the flask away. I know it disturbs you quite strongly. I could kill you. Oh, we seven minutes. stop them, Larry. Don't worry. Now, stay away from me, Red Dude, You'd be better off. Stay out of All right, now. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. He knew I wanted to see the flask. He hit it on purpose. Uh, thought it would be the wisest thing to do. Oh, Chris, how could you do such a thing? Let's just forget this ever happened. Well, I, I'm perfectly willing to do that, you know. <laughs> I really don't mean to gloat, Mr. Redfield, but I have the silver flask and you haven't, and I know you wanted it. Why, you... Chris? Uh, you see, that's why I hid it from you. After all, as long as you don't know where it is, my life is safe. Isn't that right? <laughs> Stebbins was right, of course. As long as Chris didn't know the whereabouts of the silver flask, Stebbins' life would be safe. But if Chris knew where it was with his overpowering obsession to own it and Stebbins stood in the way, his life would mean nothing to Chris. But Chris had told me that he wouldn't stop, even at murder. And so it was that you drawn called the silver flask to be made. And he summoned the sorcerer Chao Ming and got him to bestow upon the flask the mantle of magic. And this was done. Two days later, I was home in the apartment. I'd sat down with a good book, and it was about 11 o'clock when the phone rang. Yes? Oh, Larry, this is Pat. You'd better go over to the Stebbins' house right away. Why? Chris came home this evening. Pat fidgeted all night long, and then, then about 15 minutes ago, he muttered something about the silver flask and ran out of the house. You think he was going to see Stebbins? Yes, yes, I, I think so. You have to hurry over there, Larry, before he does anything. Have you called Stebbins? Yes, yes, I, I warned him. But Chris might do anything. Oh, go over there, Larry. See that there's nothing wrong. I have the strangest feeling that Stebbins is going to die tonight. the time had come. I knew it would. Sooner or later, Chris had to be stopped from entering that house at all costs. I hopped into my car and drove over to Stebbins' place as quickly as I could. Within 15 minutes, I was knocking at his front door. Oh, uh, I'm glad you came, Larry. Pat phoned you, didn't she? Yes, I'm sorry I took so long coming to the door, but I was looking out the front window to see who it was. Uh, come in. 
It's strange what power the silver flask has, Larry. You should never have invited him back here after I told you what had happened. Oh, we might as well go into the library. You know, I think you'd better call the police. You think it's that serious? Yes. Uh, I'll call from the library. Is your house secure? Oh, yes. Everything's locked and bolted. Hey, sit down, won't you? I'll phone the police. Stebbins. The flask still hidden? What? Oh, no, no. It's over there on the table. Perhaps the police can send a man out and you'll be able to go home. Oh, uh, hello? Uh, my name is Henry Stebbins. Uh, I have good reason to believe that someone is going to make an attempt on my life tonight. What? Name? Uh, uh, Chris Redfield. He's wanted something of mine for some time. He'll do anything to get it. Yes. Yes, I, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll have a man out here in 15 minutes. I didn't tell you that Chris had a knife the night he came here to kill you, did I? No, you didn't. Well, that's funny. Still have it with me. Well, we'll give it to the police when they get here. Yes, I'm sure they'll find it. What? The knife. I'm sure the police will find it. What do you mean? This. It's Chris's knife. You should never have been afraid of him, Mr. Stebbins. Chris would never really kill you. But I would. Stay away from me. I can't do that. You see, Stebbins, everything fits in perfectly now. You've warned the police against Chris. They'll find his knife. They'll never suspect me. You're insane. No, far from it. I merely want the silver flask. The curse. Don't forget the curse. Who believes in curses, Mr. Stebbins? Don't come any closer. Just close enough. Ah! Good night, Mr. Stebbins. Stands in the dresser next to my bed. The diamond shines so in the dark. It seems almost to be getting brighter. I imagine the police are looking for Chris Wright. The diamond is getting brighter. And there's something else. The sound. Like the sound of escaping air. There's something here in this room with me. silver flask to be made. Small and thin it was, with a diamond embedded into its face, so that it could see. And he summoned the sorcerer Charmaine and bade him bestow upon the flask the mantle of magic. And this was done. For goodness, it will return good. For evil, it will bring death. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. To hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.
The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. There's something strange about this whole setup. I don't know... Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present... The Dance of the Devil Dolls. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Have you heard of Avutamo? Literally, the word means face image. The practice of Avutamo is as ancient as Egypt and Assyria and still found from Ceylon to the United States, Europe to Africa, South America to Scandinavia. A figure is made to resemble that of a hated enemy, then methodically injured or destroyed, resulting in pain and death for its human counterpart. Charles and I had gone up for a weekend of fishing. Saturday night at dusk, when the sky had dulled from blue to gray, and the gray was shading darker every minute, we were walking back up to the cabin. Not a bad haul, huh, Emery? For you, not for me. I'll bet you the smallest of those three bass weighs over four pounds. What bait were you using? A spoon. The fish just wouldn't leave it alone. Anyway, we'll have a good fish dinner tonight. And maybe tomorrow my luck will change. Well, I hope so. What time is it? About nine. We've been out five hours. Chuck. Yeah? There's someone coming down the trail towards us. Where? Oh, yes, I see. You can't be going down to fish this late. Oh, well, we can't tell. Some guys really get the bug. There's a guy I know named Lloyd Erskine who will fish Excuse off... Excuse me, gentlemen. He means us. I wonder what he wants. Excuse me, gentlemen. I lost something. I wonder if you found it. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for, mister, but we haven't found it, whatever it is. Perhaps you saw it lying on the ground. It was a doll. A doll? Yes, about 12 inches tall. It looked something like... like me. I'm sorry, we haven't seen it. Of course, you can always buy your daughter a... It doesn't belong to my daughter. Oh. Well, we haven't seen it. Are you staying at a cabin on this lake? Yes. Only until tomorrow night. It's right at the head of the trail up there. You must have passed it as you started down. If by any chance you do come across it, I'll stop in before I leave this area, if you don't mind. Well, that's perfectly all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Well, what do you make of that? Search me. He talked so strangely. I must have the doll for the dance tonight or the old woman will be angry. (laughs) I think he's off his rocker. Well, it's not our worry, Henry. Come on, let's go. We went back up to our cabin, cleaned the fish, and had one of those fish dinners you talk about for years. It was about 11 o'clock, and we'd started to go to bed, intending to get up as early as possible the next morning when there was a knock on the door. I wonder who that is. I don't know, but we'll soon find out. Oh, it's you. Yes. May I come in? Of course. I see you found the doll. Yes. I wanted to let you know that I had. Well, thanks for telling us. Now I must take him to the dance. Well, the dance ought to be just about over. Oh, no. It it hasn't begun yet. Well, you'd better get there or your wife will be angry. You misunderstood me. I said the old woman, not my wife. You see, I'm not married. Oh. I hope you'll forgive me. I see that you're just about ready to retire, but I'm afraid. Afraid? Of what? The old woman is already angry with me. I told her I'd lost the doll, and she swore that if I didn't find it, she'd kill me. That's why I've come to you. If you hear that I'm dead tomorrow, that I committed suicide, you'll know it's not the truth. If I could only get in touch with Dr. George Kaltman... He could help, but I'm caught up in something I can't stop, and it's too late to get out now. I've tried to... Oh, my head! You dropped your doll. 
I didn't drop it. She caused it to move. She doesn't want me to talk. I've said too much already. I must go now. Here's your doll. Thank you. Remember what I told you. If I'm dead tomorrow, it's murder. Good night, gentlemen. After he dropped the doll. Did you get a good look at him, Chuck? Yeah. The doll hit the floor on its forehead. A few seconds later, there was a heavy bruise on the right side of his forehead. You know, he said if he was found dead tomorrow, that it would be murder. It was about 11.30 when we finally got to bed. We'd opened the windows of the cabin. The sound of the alarm clock we brought with us mingled with that of the crickets outside. I heard something. I didn't know what it was. It sounded strangely like words, but they were uttered in a voice so tiny and shrill that I thought I was imagining things. But then, I heard his voice. No! No, I won't die! That will help me! Henry, I didn't know you were awake. I couldn't sleep. I thought I heard a tiny little voice. I thought... Hey, quiet! Hey, go! The old woman will take care of them, too. But I'm not going to die! I'm not going to... Ah! Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I had retired for the night, but neither of us could sleep. Suddenly, from outside, we heard the voice of the man we'd met earlier, and another voice, high and shrill, and somehow deadly. out there. We'd better take a look. This is a pair of hands and some shoes, huh? Remember what he said about dying? Yeah. You ready? Yes. All right, let's go. I'm beginning to think that guy belongs in an institution. Maybe. Maybe not. I think his scream came from the left. I'll take a look over there, then. He didn't tell us his name, did he? No. Well, I'll try calling him. Anybody out here? Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. Something strange about this whole setup. I don't know it. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer his Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. That little doll that looks so much like him. I don't see it any way around. Neither do I. You know, Chuck, it sounds crazy to say it. That shrill, high little voice we heard. You're letting this thing run wild with your imagination, Emery. Even though it looked like him, it's just a doll, nothing else. It had to be my imagination, of that I was sure. But the mere thought of it, of the doll which so resembled the man with its shining face and beady little eyes, caused a strange sense of apprehension and fear to come across me. And I glanced out into the darkness and saw only the lumbering shadows of the trees and heard the rustle of their leaves as they brushed together. I saw nothing. Yet I had the feeling that something with deedy little eyes was watching us. We notified the authorities. They came out, found no evidence of foul play, and diagnosed his death as being caused by heart failure. Our luck was exceptionally bad out on the lake Sunday, and we drove home that night, speaking but little, thinking only of what had happened the night before. About ten days after we returned to the city, both Charles and I were home one evening. We shared an apartment together, and that night neither of us had anything to do. We were playing gin rummy. One more hand like that and you'll be out, you lucky dog. It was pure skill, my friend. No luck involved. Cut. No, I trust you. It's a good thing Pamela stood you up tonight. She knew that you wanted a gin partner. <laughs> Don't be humorous. Proposed to her yet? No, but I'm uh, working on it. You know, you deal like a card shark. I have nothing but... Expecting anyone? 
No, you. Mm-mm. Well, I'll see who it is. Whoever it is, get rid of him. I got a good hand. Coming right up. Is this the residence of Mr. Emery Ryerson and Mr. Charles Hunter? Yes, it is, but... I have a package for you. Are you expecting a package, Emery? Just bills, no packages. It's for both of you. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. And good evening, sir. Oh, yes, yes, good evening. It's an old woman. She had a package for us. Well, set it down on the table and open it, man. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So I'll open it. It's oh, wrapped very well. Maybe it's a bottle of scotch. Who is be sending us a bottle of... Someone has a real fine sense of humor. It's like the doll that fellow had with him. It's the same doll. Notice that little nick out of its forehead? That happened when he dropped it on the floor. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. We can keep it, I suppose. Well, let's get back to the game. No, I'm not in the mood now. You know, Emery, I can't help but remember what he said. The man who died? Yes. He said, I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Yes, that's right. What brought that back to your mind? The woman who delivered this package. We put the lid back on the box and left it on the kitchen table with the cards we'd been using. Neither of us entered the kitchen again that evening. We went to bed a short time after 12. Again, I was restless and couldn't sleep. I had the same feeling I'd had that night in the cabin. And I remembered the words I'd heard spoken in that unearthly little voice. The old woman will take care of them, too. And I wondered if I'd only imagined those words, or whether they had actually been uttered by the creature in the box in the other room. It was then I heard it, like a thin, reedy piping. It sounded like music, a rhythmic, discordant melody I'd never heard before. And then, I heard another sound. Henry? Yes? Am I going crazy? I hear it, too. I think we'd better see what it is. All right. I don't like this, Emery. It sounds like... I know what it sounds like. Emery. I can't believe my eyes. The box is open. The little doll, Emery. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I couldn't believe our eyes, for the scene before us was as bizarre and fantastic as the wildest dream of an insane imagination. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Yes, I see it. This is something that... I'm going to destroy that thing. Be careful. Look out, Chuck. It's running. I'm going to get it if it's the last thing I do. It's running over toward the window. It's gone. It's gone through the glass. Maybe it's down there on the sidewalk. It's possible, but that's a two-story drop. I can't see it. No, Emery. It's gone. They turned again to the old woman. The man who had died had mentioned a name that night in the cabin. The name of Dr. George Kaltman. Now it came back into my mind. Kaltman was associated with occult research. If Kaltman could have helped the man who died, perhaps he could explain what was happening to us. We got in touch with him and made an appointment for the following evening. You have told me everything that has happened. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes, everything. We'd like to know what it all means. Well, I shall explain it to you as best I can. Have either of you ever heard of envoûtement? No. Not that I recall. Well, envoûtement is the practice of making little dolls to resemble a hated enemy and then methodically injuring or destroying it, thus bringing about either pain or death or both in the doll's human counterpart. Dr. Colton, this doll we saw last night, it, it moved, it danced. I know. What you witnessed last night was the dance of the devil dolls. 
You say these dolls bring about pain or death, Dr. Kaufman. Why should we be singled out? The man who died told you about the old woman. Is that not correct? Yes. Therefore, you must be destroyed. She feels that you are dangerous to her, that you know too much. Undoubtedly, the woman you saw last night, Mr. Hunter, was the manipulator, controller of the little figures. Since you saw her, she has probably made little figures of both of you. But before it will live and be subject to her will, she must have a part of you, a lock of your hair, a fingernail clipping, anything that will make yours and the doll's identities one and the same. What should we do? Go back to your apartment. I shall return with you. She will send the little doll back to your apartment tonight. I'm sure of that. We must capture the doll, for it is the only thing that will lead us to her. Kaufman, Charles, and I returned to our apartment and took up our vigil in the bedroom, for that was the place the doll and the old woman would expect us to be. We made dummies of the extra blankets and arranged the bed so it looked as if we were sleeping. You left the apartment door unlocked? Yes. But why? It only makes it easier for it to enter. See, it is what we must do. One way or the other, the doll would find means of entrance. If not tonight, then another. You have no idea what those little creatures are capable of. It's coming. Be quiet. Wait until it is in here. Then close the bedroom door and put on the lights. We understand. Now, quiet. Now! Catch it quickly! There it is over there. <laughs> this time it won't get away. Don't let it get near the window. I've got it, I've got it. Quickly, put it in here. Ah, there. We have it. Now, what do we do? The star will lead us to the doll woman. You mean now? Tonight? Yes, Mr. Ryerson. She will know that we have captured her little messenger if it does not return in a few hours, and she will be prepared to stop us. We must find her, destroy her if need be, before she has a chance to destroy you. Then began one of the strangest sights I've ever seen. Kaltman took the doll out of the box in which we'd imprisoned it, tied its arms and legs while it writhed and twisted in his hand. Then he began speaking to it. His mind. Softly. Rhythmically. Slowly putting it into a hypnotized sleep. The eyelids of the little figure finally closed. And it was in an hypnotic trance. Sleep and tell me. Now. Listen to me. You must tell me where your mistress is. You must tell me where your mistress is. The house. The house of dolls. The house of dolls. That's a strange answer. Not so strange, my friends. I know what it means. What is it? She is a diabolical person, this doll woman. The house of dolls is a toy shop with rare and unusual dolls. What better place to hide? No one would suspect what was behind those burning eyes of hers. I myself have purchased dolls for my little granddaughter from her. We must go there immediately. We have no time to lose. This is the place. Let's go. Right. Past two, there's no one on the streets. Oh, it's a better. Try the door. It's open. Probably waiting in the rear of the shop for the creature she sent out. Well, let's go in. As quietly as possible. We must catch her by surprise. All right. There's a light coming from beneath that door back there. That is where we must go. It is the dance of the devil dies. The door is ajar. They're in there. I can see them. Yes, so do I. Be quiet. And soon, my children, you will be joined by two others. 
And then, no one can harm you. But when the new doll returns, he will bring with him what I need for the spell of the dancers. We must take her now. And they will join you in the dance of, of the Jekyll doll. Now! What are you doing here? We've come to stop you. Look out, Bob, she has a gun. So have I. She is dead. She will cause no more harm. It seems strange to see those little creatures on the floor. All of them so quiet and still. And just a short while ago... They were participating in the dance of the devil dolls. Yes. Do not feel pity for them, Mr. Hunter. The dolls did not really live. They were a creation of evil... sparked by the malevolence of the old woman. When she died... They died with her. Perhaps the humans they resembled will rest quietly now. The secret of the devil doll is as old as man. It is lost now, but it will be found again. Then... Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. somewhere in the jungle. Oh, what a frightening Are you sure they won't attack our camp? The campfire alone is enough to keep them at a good distance. Don't worry, Sharon. You'll be safe. Listen. Yes, native drums. Somehow they, they sound ominous. They only sound ominous if you believe them to be. The diamonds bring death. What's going on out there? Just a wounded animal screaming out. Oh, no. No, there was something else. <laughs> Do you think the jungle has a voice, Frau Courtney? That is only for children to believe. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Diamonds of Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled, The Diamonds of Death. Vince Porter had just returned from a business trip to Caracas. 
He called me shortly after his plane landed and said that it was important that Sharon and I come over to his hotel that evening. I tried to get more information out of him, but had no success. At 8.30 that evening, we were in his apartment, and there began the story I am telling you. Good to see you, Vince. Glad to be back, Jeff. Sharon, you're looking lovelier than ever. Oh, always there with a compliment, Vince. Now, why don't you say nice things like that to me, Jeff? <laughs> I'm married to you, darling. <laughs> There's someone else here that I want you to meet. Well, you sounded so mysterious over the phone, I'd almost think you were guarding some great secret. Well, it's a secret, all right. I'm going to tell you what it's all about tonight. Oh, uh, these are the people I told you about, Carl. A pleasure. Sharon and Jeff. Courtney, Carl von Ornberg. How do you do? How do you do? Have you told them anything yet? No, sit down, kids. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, now, what's it all about, Vince? Oh, show it to them, Carl. Yeah. Oh, what is it? It looks like a diamond, but it can't be. I've never seen a diamond that large. It not only looks like a diamond, it is one, Jeff. The largest diamond in the world. Well, you're not trying to joke with us, are you, Vince? No, I'm not. Where did you get it? From a man I befriended in Caracas. He gave it to me. Well, that's worth a fortune. What would he want to give it to you for? He certainly could use it himself. Not where he is. What do you mean? The man who gave the diamond to Herr Porter is dead. Oh? Well, I hope you'll excuse me if I seem a little dense, but I'd appreciate hearing the story from beginning to end. All right, Jeff. I met this man. His name was George Maupate, a Frenchman, at the hotel in which I was staying in Caracas. He was a strange man, seemed to be afraid of his own shadow. One night, it was quite late... He knocked at my door. He asked me if I'd let him come inside for a while, but he had reason to believe his life was in danger. I couldn't refuse him, of course. That was the first time I saw the diamond. He said he'd been with a hunting party that had gone deep into the Belgian Congo and stumbled upon a strange race of white men who worshipped a huge stone idol on the bank of the Congo River near the equator. They made offerings to this idol, and the offerings were diamonds. His party waited until the ceremony was over. When the people had gone, they took all the diamonds they could carry with them and started back to civilization. But one by one, the men in his party died until he was the only survivor. He felt sure that he was being followed and took passage for Caracas. That was when he met me. Then what happened? Well, two days later, he again came to my room. Carl was there with me. He gave me the diamond, said I was to keep it for him. That if anything happened to him, it was mine to do with as he wished. Well, evidently something did happen to him. Yes, early the next morning they found him dead in his room. How had he died? No one knew. It was quite unusual. Three doctors examined him and not one of them could tell us how he died or what caused his death. George Mopate had just stopped living. And so you have the diamond? Yes, that's right. What are you going to do with it? Keep it and go into the Congo and look for these people he told me about. Won't it be dangerous? Yes, but I don't expect it to be too dangerous. We ought to be able to get back in one piece, eh, Carl? Yeah, and when we come back, we will bring with us as many diamonds as we can carry. Well, that's the reason you're going in. Yes. Why have you told us all this? Because I want you to go with us. What about it? I don't know. Think, Mr. Courtney. When we return, all of us will be millionaires. What do you think, Sharon? It's your decision, Jeff, not mine. Well, Mr. Courtney, I'll go with you. Then I'm going to. Oh, you'd better stay. Oh, no, I won't be any trouble, believe me. Vince, she can come with us. As long as she makes no trouble for us. No, don't worry, I can take care of myself. All right, then it's settled. I just thought of something. What? Well, this is going to cost a lot of money. Where's it coming from? From the diamond we already have. We are going to sell it. Huh. I guess that takes care of all the answers. All of them. And it is agreed that we share in the diamonds equally, one quarter share for each. I like that. You bet you will. We'll leave as soon as we can get ourselves clear. Oh, it seems such a shame. Jeff. What's the matter? Look. Look at the diamond. I don't see anything. It's shining so strangely. Before it was dull in color. But now look at it. Gleaming and shining as, as if there was something inside of it that was alive. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Diamonds of Death. A month later, we took off from New York bound for Dakar. 
there. We changed planes, and several hours later found us in Leopoldville, where we bought a car and a truck and our provisions, hired three native men to come with us, and set out on the last leg of our trip. The roads were good for the first 500 miles, but eventually we were forced to abandon the car and truck and set out on foot. How much farther have we to go? About 250 kilometers. I've been noticing the natives we brought with us. They seem to be getting nervous and afraid. Yes, they've heard stories about the idol in the jungle and they're afraid of it. They say to go near it means misfortune. To steal from it means death. What's that? A cat. Probably a tiger somewhere in the jungle who has just found his dinner. Oh, frightens me. There's nothing to be afraid of, Sharon. We can protect ourselves. We have all the guns and ammunition we need. I was wondering, Vince, you don't think there's any danger of the natives taking off some night and heading back? I don't know. They don't know where we're heading, do they? No, but they do know it's in the general direction of the Stanley Falls. I think that's what's making them nervous. I should think the closer we get to the falls, the more apt they'll be to desert us. They will die if they try to desert us when we get close to the falls. I will see to that. Well, you mean you'd shoot them down? Not really, but I will say that to them if need be. They will think twice, then, before they try so foolish a thing. Elephant. Are you sure the animals won't attack our camp? The campfire alone is enough to keep them at a good distance. Don't worry, Sharon. You'll be safe. I hope so. Listen. Yes. Native drums. Somehow they... They sound ominous. They only sound ominous if you believe them to be. Animal screaming out. Oh, no. No, there was something else. I heard it, too. A voice that spoke from the jungle. You're imagining it. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think the jungle has a voice, Herr Courtney? That is only for children to believe. We pushed ahead in the days that followed. The deeper into the jungle we went the more difficult was it for us to travel. And the drums, the jungle messenger who throbbed out before us that we were coming, coming to steal the diamonds from the idol. Now, according to the map, we should reach the river tomorrow. This is the spot the Frenchman said where we would find the idol. This is the end of our trail. We'll all be rich. But will we be alive to enjoy it? Of course we will. I'm beginning to wonder. The drums. Those are the same drums we've heard ever since we started into the jungle. They know we're coming. They're waiting for us. Do you notice that every time those drums start up, it seems to drive the animals mad? They're comparatively quiet until the drums start beating. <laughs> They do seem to get angry when the drums begin. I say to you, the diamonds bring death. There it is again. There, what is it? The voice. Nonsense. You heard nothing but the animals and the drums. Oh, didn't anyone else hear it? I thought I heard something. I'm not sure. I think you're tired and nervous, Sharon. We all need a good night's sleep. In the morning, you'll feel a great deal better, I'm sure. They're going as fast as they can, Carl. They are afraid, and their fear makes their feet lag. Why don't you relax, Carl? We're almost there. Because I won't be satisfied. Look. The idol of the diamonds. Why, it must be a hundred feet tall. Standing up with its legs outspread, and its arms stretched forward as if it were waiting to greet us. There's something frightening about it. Look. Where? Over there. There's a man coming toward us. Put your gun down, Carl. What do the strangers want? We have come to see the idol. The idol has seen you, and you have seen it. You speak English? Yes. Some of your countrymen have stumbled upon our secret. From them we learned your talk. We come as friends. Friends? Of all those who have come here, none came as friends. They came to steal, to steal the diamonds from the idol. What 
that noise. Time will teach you. You say you come as friends. If so, you will be treated as friends. If not, then the diamonds will be your death. Come, follow me. I shall take you to my village. I guess we're to spend the night here. Well, they seem friendly enough. Strange how they all disappeared when it became dark. Well, the whole village seems to be deserted. What fools we are. Of course. This is the night of the full moon. This is the night they make the offerings to the idol. The village is deserted. Listen. I am going to see the ceremony. Well, I'll go. Do not make any noise, then. Come. All right, let's go. <laughs> Be quiet. They must not hear us. They must not know we are watching them. We must be getting close. Yeah, we are. I can see something ahead. Yes, through the trees. The whole village is there. And look, each man walks to the idol and sits at its feet. Diamonds. What's the matter? They've stopped chatting. Strangers, we know that you watch us. Step out into the clearing, but always remember that if you betray our trust, death will reach out and touch you, and the power of the diamond idol will destroy you, even as it has destroyed all others who have betrayed us. Strangers, Step out into the clearing! Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Diamonds of Death. We had followed the sound of the chanting and it brought us to the river bank and the clearing in which the idol stood white and tall, rising up into the sky. We thought they weren't aware of our presence, but we were wrong. Strangers, step out into the clearing. They know we're here. Let's do as he says. Right. Don't try anything, Carl. That is as far as you can come. Stop there. You have followed us, strangers. You say you are interested in the idol of diamonds? Then you may stay here. You may watch the ceremonial offering. So <laughs> diamond that places the idol's feet. There's no expression on their faces. Just walking towards the idol as if they were hypnotized. Later, when the village is asleep, we shall return to this place. And when we leave, we shall take with us all the diamonds we can carry. And now I leave you. You will spend the rest of the night here. Thank you. Make no attempt to steal the diamonds, for the idol will raise up in wrath and bring the fury of the jungle down upon your heads. He will raise his voice in anger, and there will be no escape from him, for the fever of the curse will be upon you, and you shall die. They understand, Buddha. It is my hope that you do. May we meet again on the morrow. Go inside the hut. Hmm? What do you think, Vince? I don't know, Jim. He said if the diamonds are stolen, the idol will cry out in anger and death will be our reward. I believe him. So do I. I think they're right, Carl. I think we should leave here just the way we came. You think I came all this way so that I could turn around and go back to civilization empty-handed? You're mad if you think that. Think of George Mopate. Mopate died of a fever. That's what we thought he died of. But it wasn't caused by the jungle. It was caused by the power of the diamond idol. You are a superstitious fool. Be quiet. Do you want the whole village done on our heads? All right. I say to you, we came here for diamonds. 
Be leave here for diamonds. I'm not taking any. Jeff, right. And I agree with him. <laughs> All right. Let it be that way then. Perhaps it is better that way. For in the end, I would have been the only one left. What do you mean? That when we got near the edge of the jungle, I was going to kill you. Because I wanted them all, not just one fourth. But now you said you want none of the diamonds. That means I own them all. And you will help me carry my diamonds back. You and the native porters we brought with us. That's where you're mistaken, Carl. We're not going to help you carry them back. Oh, but you are. He has a gun. And I will not hesitate to use it. You're a fool. You are the fools, not I. Now, my gun is ready to talk for me. The village is asleep now. We will go back to the clearing and get the diamonds. Move. I said move. Yes, that is correct. The native workers we brought with us are in the next hut. You will get them. Tell them that we are leaving. They will be more than glad to come with us. Now get your packs and we shall go. possibly carry any more diamonds. You are not carrying enough. It'll have to be enough, Carl. If the natives are loaded down, they can hardly walk. Our packs are just as heavy. We can't take any more. It is a shame to leave them here. But then, one can always return without his companions, of course. It's a long trail back from Arnberg, and you'll have to sleep sometime. We shall see about that. Now let us go. Move along! To think that you believe the story he told us. What fools you all are. Maybe. Maybe not. They do not even know that we have gone. What's that? I don't know. And the idol shall raise his voice in anger. And there will be no escape from him. Listen. They do know that we're gone, Carl. Then you must hurry. The first one who slows down shall answer to me. Sound as if the whole jungle is awake. Hurry. Move quicker. Start to run. We, we have to stop to rest. We've been traveling like this for two hours. You cannot rest. Even you're tired, Carl. We must rest or we won't be able to go on much longer. Oh, please. For your own good, too. If we don't rest along the way, we'll drop down in our tracks and we won't be able to carry the diamonds out for you. Stop then and rest. But do not try anything. Don't worry, we won't. We won't have to. Shut up. Vince. Yes? Haven't we been here before? Don't get you. This is the spot we were in when they discovered us watching the ceremony. Are you sure? Yes. Just ahead of us, there should be a clearing. The clearing in which the idol stands. We've been traveling in a circle. What did you say? We, uh, we can go on now. Then let us go. Uh, 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 Mulan, move! Yeah, you're right. The clearing is... Something is wrong! We have been here before! We are back in the clearing! We have traveled in a circle! I must get away! I must... <laughs> animal. It jumped out from behind the trees. You didn't have a chance. How horrible. Yes, it is horrible. But it was the death that he deserved. We didn't want to take the diamonds, would I? I know. When you came here, the thought was in your mind. But you were wise in that you pushed it away from you. What? What are you going to do with us? You and your party may leave this place in peace. And when you return to your world of civilization, it would be better if you did not tell them of what has occurred here. But there will be others, even though you do not tell them. There will be others who come upon this place. Let us hope that they do as you have done. For if they steal from the diamond idol... Death shall be visited upon them 
and it may come in many forms. But it will come. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. wrong? Well, I, I, I must be going insane. Why? Well, I, I was asleep. Suddenly, I woke up. A voice seemed to be calling to me. I started downstairs, always listening to that strange, unearthly voice. When I got down here, I walked into the living room and stood by the fireplace looking at the masks of Asia. And Bert, Bert, I saw a pair of eyes in each, each mask looking down at me. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Masks of Azure. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Masks of Azure. There are certain things in this life of ours which can never be explained at least with any normal, rational explanation. Often we try to shrug them off, to forget about them, so that the question will not rise in our minds to trouble our waking hours and to create nightmares in our sleep. But there are some things which can never be forgotten, and among them are the masks of Azor. Marcia's uncle sent them to us. Harold Letterby was a man of wealth and unusual tastes. He traveled a good deal, and frequently he'd send back little curiosities that he thought we might enjoy. So we thought there was nothing unusual about the masks of Azor. Oh, who can that be at this hour? I don't know, but don't you think you'd better see who it is? <laughs> I suppose so. Package for Marcia Stanton. Well, I'm Marcia Stanton. Will you sign here, please? Yes, of course. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Did you order anything, Bert? No. Did you? No, not that I can remember. Oh, wait a minute, Bert. It's from Uncle Harold. <laughs> Harold to go broke sending us all these things. Well, open it, honey. See what's in it. Did you notice the postmark? Mm-hmm, he's down door. Oh, I'll save those stamps for Greg. He'll want them. <laughs> Uncle Harold's certainly been useful to Greg in his stamp collection, hasn't he? <laughs> well, there, that's done. Now I'll take the top off the box. What? Why, there are two masks in the box. Gold masks. And a letter. Uh-huh. Here, I'll open it. Read it loud, Marcia. All right. Let's see. Oh, my dear Marcia and Bert. Here is a little little present I picked up in Istanbul. I hope that you like them as much as you seem to have enjoyed the other curiosities I have sent you. I picked them up at a little shop for 
from a dealer who was quite anxious to get rid of them. He called them the masks of Asia. They're almost pure gold, and yet I bought them quite cheaply. There's some kind of a story connected with them. I don't know what it is. If I learn anything more, I'll be sure to write you. We'll return to the state shortly. Love, Uncle Harold. Mm, they're beautiful. And yet grotesque at the same time. Well, they look human. And yet... Well, it was pretty nice of Harold to send them to us. Where should we hang them? I don't know. That's your domain, not mine. Well, how about... Oh, over the fireplace? One on each side of the mirror? That sounds pretty good. Well, we can hang them right now. Anything to make a man work. Bert. Yes, dear. Oh, it, uh... It... it it's nothing. Well, what were you going to say? Well, I, uh... I don't know. For a minute, I had the strangest sensation about those masks. As if they could actually see me. It didn't take more than a few minutes to hang the masks. They hung one on each side of the mirror over the fireplace. They looked quite good there, and yet, in a way, they seemed out of place. The following night, Greg dropped in for a while. Thanks for the stab, Bert. <laughs> that was the first thing he said when the package came. Greg will want the stamp. All the way from Turkey. <laughs> from your Uncle Harold, Marshal? Mm hmm. He sent us those. And I wondered where you'd got them. They're really quite nice. They're beautiful and yet grotesque in a way. That's just what I said. Practically the same words. <laughs> you think you both had one mind? They certainly catch your eye. Is that real gold? According to Harold, it is. Well, it must be quite valuable. Well, Uncle Harold said he bought them for a song. It couldn't have been very cheap. The gold alone is worth a good deal. As a matter of fact, Harold said the dealer seemed quite anxious to get rid of them. I wonder why. Well, why worry about it? Uh, do they have a name? Mm-hmm. They're called the Masks of Azure. Azure. You know, I've seen that name somewhere before. A-S-H-O-R, I think it's spelled. I can't remember where. Well, don't worry about it. What? Anything wrong, Greg? The holes the masks have for eyes. I thought I saw something, that's all. Saw what? I don't know. For a minute, I thought they were really eyes in the masks, and that they were watching me. Watching every move I made. It had happened again. I looked closely at the masks... Yet I could see nothing unusual about them. They hung there on the wall, lifeless, with that strange, mocking expression on their gold faces and yawning, empty holes for eyes. For a minute, I... I had the desire to destroy them. Greg left about ten. At eleven, Marsh and I went to bed. I fell asleep almost at once. I don't know what woke me, but of a sudden I was awake. I looked over at Marsh's bed, only to find it unoccupied. There was no sound in the room. Nothing save for the tiny heartbeat of the clock. For some reason, I... I had a desire to go downstairs. Something seemed to be directing my actions. I was fully awake, yet... I seemed to be in some kind of trance. I'd started down the stairs. <laughs> Marcia, is anything wrong? Bert! Bert! What's the matter, honey? What's wrong? I, I, I must be going insane. Why? Well, I, I was asleep. Suddenly, suddenly I woke up. A voice seemed to be calling me. I started downstairs, always listening to that strange, unearthly voice. When I got down here, I walked into the living room and stood by the fireplace looking at the masks of Azure. And Bert... Bert, I saw a pair of eyes in each mask looking down at me. You must have imagined it. No, no, Bert, I didn't. Those masks had eyes, and they were watching me. Watching every move I made. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Masks of Azure. 
I had awakened in the middle of the night. Something had compelled me to go downstairs. And I found Marcia down there. She was almost hysterical. Those masks had eyes. And they were watching me. Watching every move I made. Wait a minute, Marcia. Take a look at them again. With the lights. No, I can't. Of course you can. Take your hands away from your face. There. Now take a look at them. But they're just as they should be. Of course they are. You imagined you saw eyes, Marcia. Perhaps it was a trick of the moonlight. I guess you're right, Bert. Oh, of course I am. Now let's go back upstairs to bed. The following day was Saturday, and I didn't have to get down to the office. We both slept rather late that morning. A short time after we'd eaten breakfast... Uh, I'll get it, Marcia. All right, dear. Telegram, sir. No. If you'll just sign right here. Mm, of course. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Who was it, Bert? A telegram. Well, who'd be sending us the telegram? I don't know. I'll see. Who's it from? Harold. Uncle Harold? What does he say? I'm returning to the States as soon as possible. Taking plane this evening. Be very careful of masks of Azure. Do not let anyone have them. Am in danger of my life. Harold. In danger of his life? What did they mean? I don't know. But it has something to do with the masks of Azure. <laughs> Saturday evening, Greg dropped in. What he told us that night was the first inkling I had that Harold Letterby had stumbled upon a relic of the past that would have been better and have been forgotten for all time. By the way, I did a little research on those masks of yours. Oh? Did you find out anything interesting? Yes, quite a good deal. Well, give us a rundown. I don't know if you'd like to hear it. Why not? It's not very pleasant. Well, tell us anyway. All right. You see, I knew I'd heard the name Asia somewhere. Finally came back to me. In college, I took a course in mythology. That's where I'd heard the name. Asia was the messenger of the underworld. It was he who went forth and summoned the victims to death in the final accounting. He wore a mask when he appeared on Earth, which he removed when he saw his victim. The mask was also worn to protect others, for whom the time was not ready to gaze upon his countenance. For the sight of his face... Meant death. Well, you were right when, when you said it wasn't pleasant. He was accompanied always by a dog, a large dog of indeterminate breed who went before him. Azor's presence was always known by the howling of the dog. Well, of course, that's just a myth. Azor never really existed. I have to take it for what it's worth. Oh, yes, and one other thing. Yes. It said that the masks were once stolen from him. That he's been searching for them ever since. That he wears a different mask while searching for the gold ones. Oh, you... You've given me the shivers. Well, that's the story, Marsha. Well, it sounds like nonsense. A being who set forth to summon people to death, always accompanied by a dog. The superstitious belief that's come down to us from the childish minds of an ancient people. Did you hear that dog? Oh, it's only a dog in someone's backyard baying at the moon. Rather a coincidence, you might say, talking about a dog and then hearing one howling. But just a coincidence. What's that? I don't know. Sounds like an animal of some kind. Scratching at the door. Uh, I'll take a look. I'll go with you. Now, now, be careful. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing out here. What? I said there's nothing out here. But I think I heard something scratching at the door. Well, there's nothing here now. There's no need to get upset about it. Let's go back in. I, I can't understand it. Forget about it, honey. I'm sorry if what I've told you has upset you. A dog howling again. Somebody ought to talk to the guy who owns that animal. There's something at the door. Someone must be playing a joke Let's on us. See it. what's there. I want to know what's outside. I'll go, Bert. Uh, I'll go, too. But is someone playing a joke on me? Well, 
Don't move. It is a dog. Why, I don't... Him. He wouldn't stand a chance. Balak! Balak! Come here. That must be the dog's owner. Balak! Where are you? Quiet, Balak. Are you the owner of this dog? Yes. I'm sorry if he's caused you any trouble. But you ought to... You ought to keep him on a leash. Is everything all right? Yes, everything's all right, Marshal. Oh, your dog, it, it frightened us. I'm very sorry about that. Balak, you shouldn't run so far away from me. Ooh, what are you looking at? I'm sorry. I was looking past you to those masks you have hanging over the fireplace. Right, Marshal. I'd better put the leash on him. If you'll excuse me, I'll be going. Sorry to have disturbed you. Well, we might as well go back inside. Wait a minute. Why? He dropped something. I'm going down to get it. He was a queer sort of fellow, wasn't he? Yes. His face looks so strange. Soft. Almost like rubber. <gasps> Marsha! What's the matter? Look, look. He dropped it as he was walking away. He dropped it deliberately. Well, what is it? It's a mask. The mask of Azure. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Masks of Azure. <laughs> We stood just outside the house. A minute before, the man and his dog had disappeared from our sight. Marsha went down the stairs to the walk where he dropped something. And then she screamed. It's a mask. The mask of Asia. Here, let me see that. It is a mask. A sponge rubber mask. Remember what I said about his face? Yes, I do. What are we going to do? We can't do anything until Harold gets here. Maybe then we'll... We'll learn some more about these masks of Asia. <laughs> I'm sure that Marcia didn't sleep that night. As for myself, I dropped off occasionally, only to awaken with a start. But each time I looked across the room, Marcia was still in her bed, staring at the ceiling. Occasionally during the night, I heard the sound of the dog howling out there in the darkness. And each time I heard it, the sound of its voice made me shudder. The following afternoon, about four o'clock, a cab pulled up in front. Harold Letterby got out and came up the walk leading to our house. I see that you received the masks. Yes. And did you receive the cable? Yes, yes, the following morning. When you bought these masks, you said that the dealer was anxious to get rid of them. Why? Had I known then what I do now, I would never have bought them. I think we know some of the story about Azure coming to Earth to conduct his victims back to death. And the dog, Bert. Don't forget the dog. Then you knew about the dog? Yes. We found out about it last night. Who? Huh? How? It was here. Here? That's right. Then Azure has found the masks. He knows they're here. He saw them last night when the door was open. Are you sure it was Azure? After he left, Marcia found a mask. A sponge rubber mask. He will be back, you know. Oh, I wish you'd never found the mask. No more so than I, my dear. A short time after I'd mailed him to you, he sure paid me a visit. He and the dog. I, too, found a sponge rubber mask after he'd left. The night before last, I... I saw something behind the mask. Like I. We must hide the masks from him. Otherwise, he will claim us all. What are you talking about? I have a plan. Me work, I don't know. Perhaps we can strike a bargain with him. Bargain? Yes. Our lives for the masks. We must find someone else who will keep them for us. Uh, Greg will do that. Greg? Uh, a friend of ours, Greg Hunter. We must tell him it will be dangerous. I will. Good. Get in touch with him immediately. For I am positive that Asia will return tonight. I called Greg and told him of our plan. Harold decided that he'd go back to Greg's apartment with the masks. And if Asia agreed to the bargain, we would send him there and Harold would return them to him. Greg would stay with us to await the appearance of Azor. By six o'clock that evening, Harold had gone to Greg's apartment with the masks 
And Greg had come to our house to await our expected visitor. At 7.30, the shades of night had diffused themselves across the sky. By 8.30, the tension had mounted in each of us to a point where we were jumpy and, and irritable. What time is it? A little past 8.30. Do you, do you think he'll come? Uncle Harold said he would. Just waiting. It makes me nervous. So am I. Listen. Yeah, I heard it too. Well, the waiting is over now. Oh, Bert. Bert, I'm frightened. Everything will be all right, Marsha. I don't know. I feel that something's going to go wrong. He's here. Well, let's go let him in. All right. Are you ready? Yes, I guess so. Here goes. Hey, Shores. Not here. No, but he will be. Here he comes. I'm sorry, gentlemen. It seems that my dog has been scratching at your door again. We've been expecting you. Oh? Really? Yes. Won't you come in? If you don't mind, come by like <laughs> have a very pleasant little home. Oh, th- th- thank you. Do you mind if I set my package down here? Go right ahead. I see the masks are gone. Yes. We put them away. They were very interesting, you know. Weren't they, Balik? Balik is a good dog, yet he frightens people sometimes. You, uh, you came here for the masks? Didn't you? The masks. The masks of Asia. Oh. You don't have them, though, do you? Not right here. You have them somewhere else? Yes. We'll... We'll make a bargain with you. We'll return the masks if you leave us alone. Then you know the legend of Asia. Yes. I brought you something. It's in this package. In time, Barry. In time. What... What about the bargain? The bargain? Oh, yes, the bargain. I'm afraid I can't agree to it. Why? You see, I already have the masks of Asia. Look for yourselves. But Uncle Harold... ...is no longer alive. Why, you dirty... I'll tear that mask off your face and... Quiet, Valley. Quiet. I have no mask on, Mr. Stanton. But, but, uh, You I... are gazing upon the face of Asia. And those who see him no longer remain alive. Now, Balak. Now. Look out! Look out! Ah! It is time for us to go back, Valley. We have recovered the masks of Asia, and we have many calls to make. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me.
we, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Night the Fog Came. All right, we'd better take a look. Come on. We're getting close to the lake. If only this fog. Wait a minute. There. Right there. Let's take a look. I hope he's all right. Throw him over. All right. He's dead. I know. I know. Do you realize how he died? What do you mean? Look at him closer, Hal. His clothes aren't wet. Even his hair isn't wet. Look at the water trickling from his mouth. This man died less than a minute ago on dry land, 200 yards from the lake. And he died by drowning. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Night the Fog Came. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled, The Night the Fog Came. If the theory of evolution is correct, then there is a connection between the minute organisms which are found to be living in water and life as we know it today. But what connection with us did those things have which came from out of the fog? What connection with human life did those horrible creatures who came from the depths have? And what is their purpose? Why did they suddenly appear and destroy, then vanish as suddenly as they had come? I shall tell you as much as I know about it. Listen to the tale of The Night the Fog Came. The first inkling of their existence came to us as we were going through some routine research. I dropped over to the lab to see Hal. Harold Enroth was perhaps one of the foremost men in his field. Our friendship stretched back for many years. I'd been away for a while, and so I dropped in at the lab to see him one morning. Jeff, you old dog, you're a sight for sore eyes. How are things going, Al? Fine, couldn't be better. How'd you like your vacation? I can't wait till next year. I hated to come back. You know, Jeff, I'm glad you dropped in. I I have a little problem. Oh? What is it, money? No, not that. Here, I'll show you. Pull those blinds, will you? Uh, Sure. Yeah, that's fine. I have a specimen here on the slide. I want you to take a look at it. Go ahead. Turn the projector on. All right. There. What do you think of that? Hmm. I don't know. It looks like some form of water life. But I don't think I've ever seen it before. This has been enlarged a hundred times. There's no use trying to recognize what it is. It's a form of water life completely unknown to us. A new form of life. Where did you get this? It's a specimen of water one of our field researchers took from the westernmost tip of Lake Superior, somewhere near the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. Have you contacted anyone else about it? No. Why not? Well, it's... Come on, come on. Don't try to avoid telling me, Hal. We know each other too well for that. All right, all right. Listen to me, Jeff. All right? Everything I say is fact. I've conducted countless tests to discover what I do know about this form of life. That thing is able to reproduce itself. A hydra type? Possibly. That's beside the point right now. What's more important, all trace of the other organisms organisms in that drop of water has disappeared. Are you serious? Of course I am. And another thing, there was a little mist hovering above what was left of the water. A a mist? That's what I call it. Something like fog. Why, that's impossible. No, it's not. I know that when the water evaporated, it should have been dispersed into the air. Eventually it was, but not for several hours. Oh, I'm sorry, Hal. I still can't. Here, I'll show you. We have a little of the water left. It's over here in this jar. You can see for yourself. Well, it looks just like ordinary water. I know it does. But believe me when I say it isn't. Now, it'll take just about three minutes. Do you see what's happening? I can't believe my eyes. See that little cloud of misty vapor beginning to form like fog? Yes. What causes it? I wish I knew. Our field men say the conditions up there are getting to be unbearable. The whole area for a hundred square miles is almost covered completely by this fog. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going up there myself. Jeff, if I send for you, will you join me? Of course. I may need you. 
I may need everyone I can get. It's begun to prey on my mind, Jeff. Somehow I think there's something in back of this. Something the likes of which the world has never seen. Something evil. Hal went up there the afternoon of the morning I had seen him. At first he wrote that the reports had been exaggerated. Then he discovered that all traces of the new form of life had disappeared. He decided to return. I was quite glad to get that letter from Hal. Before he had gone up there, he had been quite worried. The only thing I couldn't understand was what had become of the new water life form. The day before he was to return to the city... Hello? Jeff, this is Hal. Where are you? I thought you... I had them put me through direct to you. Jeff, I need your assistance. What's the matter? I've already called Arnold Simpson and Jack Rackle. They've agreed to come. I need you too, Jeff. Just as soon as you can possibly make it. Don't worry, Hal. I'll be there. Remember, as soon as you can possibly make it. I knew Arnold Simpson, and he and I went up together. The train left Chicago and headed north, and then slightly west over Illinois and Wisconsin. Simpson and I talked it over on our way up there. Hal talked to you before he left, didn't he, Arnold? Yes, he did. I never had enough time to get up to his lab so he could show me what it was, but his words were description enough. Frankly, I'm worried. In what way? Jeff, why should a new form of water life suddenly appear? Why should it destroy everything with which it comes into contact? And why should the mist or the fog appear to be so dense and heavy? I don't know. That's just the trouble we don't know. Where has this form of life been, or did it just develop? What's its reason for being here? Perhaps we'll find the answers to those questions when we get there, Arnold. Perhaps. But I'm convinced of this much, Jeff. Whatever it is, whatever that fog is hiding, poses a new problem for us. A problem which may be unsolvable. And which could very well destroy the human race. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Night the Fog Came. Simpson seemed disinclined to talk, so we spent the remainder of the trip in silence, both of us lost in our thoughts. We arrived at the town and then hired a car to take us to the little village, where we would find Hal Enroth. The closer we came to our final destination, the darker the sky became, and the air was heavy with a mist which was both damp and clammy. It was an old rickety car, and the roads were little better than the ground on either side of it. The car stopped a few hundred feet from our destination. You gotta walk the rest of the way. You said you'd drive us all the way. Look, mister, I come farther than I was going to in the first place. I ain't no mood to go into the woods up there. If you're gonna go, then you walk in. Jeff, can't you do something? I don't think so. Here's your pay. Thanks. Let's go, Arnold. It could be worse, Arnold. I suppose so. He seemed genuinely afraid. Aren't you? A little. Hey, we must be pretty close to the lake. I've never seen the fog this thick. It's un- unnatural. Eventually, we made it up to the house. Hal was there waiting for us and showed us where we would sleep. Through the window, I could see that the fog seemed to be getting thicker. That's a neary, lonely sound. You get used to it after you've been here for a while. Hal, you wrote me that this fog, the new form of life, had disappeared. It had. But two days ago, it suddenly reappeared. And with it, the fog returned. Then there must be a connection between the two. Yes, but what? I haven't any idea. Look, I have to go down to the village for some food. We don't have enough here to feed four of us. Will you come with me, Jeff? Certainly. I'll be right back, Arnold. It's only about a mile away near the lake. Go ahead. That trip made me tired. I think I'll take a nap. The house in which we were staying was on a high level of ground which tapered off on the side facing the lake. It was only three in the afternoon, but it looked almost as dark as late evening. And there was something about that cloudy mist. It was cold and clammy and smelled strongly of the lake. 
I don't see how you were able to stand it up here by yourself. Well, I had a lot of things to interest me. I was all ready to meet you at the station, but then when I got your call, I didn't know what to think. I wish I could understand this, Jeff. The fog disappeared when the water life disappeared. When signs of this strange new form of life showed again, the fog came back. Why? Maybe we can find the answer to that. Well, I hope so. Actually, the sound of that foghorn does get on your nerves. Yes, I can imagine it would. You know, if this were a clear day, you could see the village from here. Oh? Actually, it's just a tiny resort town for fishermen and hunters. And it's located right on the westernmost tip of the lake. Imagine it must... Ah! Help it! Help it! Ah! It came from our right. We'd better take a look. Come on. We're getting close to the lake. If only this fog would... Wait be... a minute. There. Right there. Let's take a look. I hope he's all right. All right. Roll him over. Okay. He's dead. I know. But do you realize how he died? What do you mean? Look at him closer, Hal. His clothes aren't wet. Even his hair isn't wet. But look at the water trickling from his mouth. This man died less than a minute ago on dry land. 200 yards from the lake. And he died by drowning. That's not possible. Are you sure he drowned? There must be a doctor down at the village. Let's take him down there and see what the doctor says. Only I'm sure... He'll agree with me. Together, we carried the man down to the village. Luckily for us, he was a slight build, not too heavy. It took us almost half an hour to get him down there. When we finally did arrive, it took another few minutes to locate the doctor. What do you think, doctor? You're getting in, Mount. All right. Will you uh, please wait outside? The doctor can't work with you in here. He's just like all the others, ain't he, Doc? Please wait outside. Thank what, you. What did he mean by he's just like all the others, Doctor? Just what he said. Ever since this fog has settled down again, five people have died. All in the same way? Yes. You, you mean by drowning? That's right. I can't understand how this man we found could die by drowning when he wasn't in the water. No, he reached him about a minute after he screamed. How could he drown? Professor Enroth, I've been asking myself that same question about all the others. I've been almost half insane these past two days trying to find the solution. And Dr. Craig, this fog, has it always been like this in the area? No, not until about two months ago. Which coincides with the time we first discovered that new form of water life. What did you say? Uh, nothing, Doctor. We're doing a little research work up here, that's all. This keeps up. I'm afraid of what might happen. I've never seen anything like it before. The fog, those deaths, how can they be explained? We don't know, Doctor. We just don't know. When we got back to the house, we discovered that Simpson had indeed taken a nap. Our arrival must have awakened him, for as we entered, he came slowly down the stairs from the second floor. Need any help? No, we can manage, but come out to the kitchen with us. What's the matter with you two? We found a dead man on our way to the village. Are you serious? Let's set those bags on the table. All right. Well, I'm not joking, Arnold. We heard a scream. It took us about a minute to get to him. He was dead when we got there. A knife? Drowned. What? On dry land, 200 yards from the lake. You must be insane. No, it's the truth, Arnold. And there have been four other deaths just like it. When did they happen? In the last two days. Since the fog reappeared. That's right. Then there is a definite connection between this fog and the new life form you've discovered, Hell. That's right. But what's the connection? We'd gotten back to the house about six o'clock. It was about seven that it happened. Simpson said he was going outside for a minute. He opened the door. I just want to get outside for a minute. Good heavens. What's wrong? Take a look. The fog is so thick. I've never seen anything like that before. Shut the door. Some of it's getting inside. It's moving along the floor. Just Shut just the like... door. Did you see it? Yes. The fog. Just like it was alive. Moving like, like a living thing. Creeping along the floor. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Night the Fog Came. When Simpson had opened the door, the fog crept into the house in little wisps that curled and snaked this way and that. It looked like a thing alive. You saw it, didn't you, Hell? Yes, I saw it. 
What does it mean? I'm afraid of what it means. You mean you... You know? I hope I'm wrong, but I'm afraid I'm not. It's just possible that this form of life is developed from something that was present in the water all the time. The great brute animals ruled the world before man appeared and then were destroyed. Eventually, mankind wrested the supremacy of the earth from the other animal and plant life. Perhaps the cycle is to continue. Perhaps, after man, this new form of life. As the minutes passed by, we noticed that little slips of the fog began inching their way through every opening of the house. It was Simpson who pointed down at the bottom of the door and first brought it to our attention. We began to plug up all the openings in the house. At first, we did it slowly, but as time passed, we worked faster and more feverishly. No matter how tired we became, we had to finish the job or the fog might claim the house, too. It was too quiet. The only thing we heard was the distant, monotonous call of the foghorn. And then Hal broke the silence. Do you know why this fog is so thick? I wish I did. This might be insane, but it has to be the answer. That fog is carrying moisture, a lot of it, perhaps enough to also carry this new form of life. To move it from place to place, to spread it even farther. To kill everything which stands in its way. That might be it. It is, I'm sure it is. Well, in that case, what happened to break it up the first time? And that's the solution to the problem. I don't know what it is, but it did break it up the first time. It drove it back, down to the depths from where it came. That's why there was no sign of it in the water. Ah! That came from right outside the house. Racco. He said he was going to arrive this evening. We'd better take a look. Uh, bring the flashlight. Right, let's go. That light can carry more than a few feet. It's so wet out here. Over there, look. Little pinpoints of light dancing up and down, all clustered together. That must be it. Come on. It's spreading out. All right, look. There, on the ground. It's Racco. The same way. The same way as the other one. specks of dancing luminescence had withdrawn from Rakow's body, but now we noticed that there seemed to be more of them. We carried the body back to the house. We'd forgotten to close the door behind us, and some of the fog had gotten inside. It wasn't too bad, however, until my little it began to disperse. Look out that window. Yes, I see them. Gathering together with a whole mass, getting larger and larger all the time. Separating like the Hydra. It must be destroyed. Yes, but how? They created the fog. That must be the only way they can travel on land. They must have a basic water carrier. Have you realized what this means? What are you getting at? The area this fog now covers is a hundred square miles. Every animal in this area may lose its life. And then what happens? They divide again and again and again. And the area of the fog keeps getting larger all the time. If it isn't stopped now, while we still have a chance, it may never be stopped. And I ask you the same question, Simpson. How? I don't know. Someone outside. Let him in quickly. They're moving towards the house. Oh, thank goodness. I didn't think I'd make it. It's a miracle that you did. Sit down, Doctor. Thank you. I was out for a call on my way back to town. I noticed how thick the fog was. And then I noticed the animals lying dead in the forest. The smell of their death was in the air. I continued on towards the town. And then I saw the bodies lying just where they had fallen. The whole town seemed to be covered by a strange luminescent mass, which in some manner moved. I was afraid. Then I thought of you people in this house, and I got here as soon as I could. I don't know how long we'll be able to withstand them, Doctor. I'm sure the townspeople are dead now. In fact, almost every living creature in the area must be dead. But what is it? What caused it? If we get out of this alive, Doctor, we'll tell you. Look outside. It must have split again. It's twice the size it was. What are we going to do? Look under the doorway. They're getting through. Lock it up. Use some newspaper. Close anything. We've got to stop it. Husk and opening and closing the door. Loosen the other things we have down there. I think that'll do. Look. The things that did get in. First you see their light and then they're gone. What happens to them? Perhaps we can't see them. Or perhaps they die. Now, wait a minute. Your first letters to me mentioned the fact that the mist had been dispersed. What caused it? I don't know. Doctor, you're a native of these parts. Yes. I want you to tell me about anything unusual which happened that day. Well, I don't remember anything about that day particularly. I, I remember I was quite pleased to see that the fog had lifted. It was a beautiful day. Unseasonably warm. In fact, the, the sun was quite hot. Heat. I wonder if... If what, Jeff? These things, these hydra-type creatures must die in the heat. This house is quite warm. The day the fog was dispersed was warm with a bright sun. Perhaps that's the answer. 
Doctor, is there any fire break around this area? Well, there was one cut through the trees several years ago. Yes, in case of a fire, a bad one, in the heavy timberlands, everyone was instructed to get into this area. In other words, there's a complete fire break around this entire area. Yes, it comprises about 150 square miles. Then that's it. It's the only chance we have. We'll burn out this area and hope it dries them back. There's some oil downstairs. Get it. We'll start the fire here and hope it sets fire to the trees surrounding this house. Be right back. We'll have to make a run for it once this place is on fire. We may not come out of this alive, but we can try. The last. Good. Now, everybody knows what... You'd better light it. Those things outside, they're going to get in. Each man will carry a torch. Yes. All right, light your torches. All right. And then set fire to this house. All right. right. Lighting mine. All right. And yours, huh? All right. One more. Good night. Uh, uh, under the door. They're pouring in under the door. Set the house on fire. Let's get out of here. No matter what happens, keep holding those torches. They're afraid of fire. All right, make a run for it. fire caught hold and the entire area was burned out. A week later, the smoke had cleared and the fire was out. There was no sign of the fog which had meant death to so many things. I had caught a glimpse of the doctor. He had dropped his torch and it had gone out. He was immediately engulfed in those luminescent killers. I'm going back up there with Enroth and Simpson. Though there is now no trace of those things in the water, still we know they lurk somewhere waiting for their moment. We must destroy them once and for all before that moment arrives. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. To hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional. And any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Wild Huntsman. Never heard that sound before. It's so strange. Not like anything I've ever heard. It sounded like, like one of those old horns which called people to the hunt. Listen. To what? Be quiet, listen. Yes, I hear it too. It seems to be the sound of a horse approaching this camp. Maybe someone's in trouble. Well, perhaps the horse was frightened by something. He's going to come right through the camp. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present... The Wild Huntsman. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Wild Huntsman. There is an old legend about the Wild Huntsman. 
a spectral hunter of medieval legend who, with a pack of spectral dogs, is said to frequent the forests and occasionally appear to mortals. And he is not only known to the literature of our language, but also in the myths and legends of several of the world's peoples. The strange thing about this legend, there are many countries which have the same types of folklore, but the stories are the same up to a certain point. After that point is reached, these myths take different paths which never cross again. But this legend of the wild huntsman is the exception to the rule. For in every version I have come across, the tale is the same, almost word for word. It is a simple tale, whose basic motif is that if you meet him face to face, you will die. I was over at Jerry and Helen's place. Our conversation turned to hunting. We haven't been up hunting now in almost three years. You know, that's right. Ever since I was best man for you people. Say, that was over three years ago. <laughs> I can understand it, Vaughn. Back in those days at the U, those weekends up in the mountains were the things we lived the rest of the week for. Us. Isn't that the truth? I don't think we missed an opening day for deer season in four years. No, we didn't. Say, do you remember old Fisher? Mm -hmm. That half breed who was a guide who always wanted to take us where he said we could get our limit of game in a few hours. <laughs> yes, I remember well, him. Who could forget him? Well, I was walking down Main Street the other day, and who should stop me but Fisher? At first, I didn't remember his name. Then it came back to me who he was. He hasn't changed, has he? <laughs> Not a bit. <laughs> what did he want, Vaughn? Well, the same thing. He said he'd be glad to guide us up to the mountains, <laughs> to the place where we could get our deer limit without any trouble. <laughs> That's right. The season does open about six days from now, doesn't it? What'd you tell him? Same thing I always used to tell him. Maybe we would. You know, I don't see why we can't. What do you mean? Oh, why can't we go up with him? I've got a few days coming. What about you, Vaughn? Mm, I guess I could squeeze a few days out of the old man. It'll be just like old times. Is it a deal, then? <laughs> it's fine with me. Helen, darling, what about you? Well, anything you say, they're only, uh... Uh, Only what, Helen? Well, what about those stories we used to hear about Fisher? What stories? Well, I remember one that used to go around the campus. They said that of, of those he guided, very few came back. Wait a minute. Yes, now I do remember. There were lots of stories about Fisher. There was one, something about some connection between Fisher and the wild huntsman. Forget how it goes. Well, the way I heard it was that Fisher happened to be up in the mountains hunting. It was out of season. They say that he met up with the wild huntsman, but bargained for his life by saying that he would lead occasional parties up into the huntsman's domain. The wild huntsman accepted the proposal, and Fisher lived. Those, um, those stories, they, they weren't true, were they? Of course not, darling. Stories are bound to spring up about people like Fisher little man with a livid purple scar running across his cheek. Just as if it had been branded there. He always... Well, he always made me nervous. Oh, this whole thing, Helen. This old folk legend which has sprung up about the so-called wild huntsman. There isn't anything to it. It's just a bunch of stories that they tell the newcomers out here. Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there weren't a few people who hunt in that forbidden area and then tell the wild stories you've heard just to keep that part of the hunting ground to themselves. <laughs> well, what about it, Helen? Of course I'll go. Shall we have Fisher guide us, Vaughn? Why not? That's the only way he makes any money. Let's give him a break. The next day, I went to locate Fisher, and I found him in his room in one of those cheap hotels on 2nd South. Yes? Hey, it's Vaughn Steger. Just a minute. Come in. Oh, thanks, Bishop. You have to excuse the room, Mr. Stigger. I ain't much for keeping the room clean. Okay. Sit, sit down, sit down. All right, you. Now, what is it you wanted? Well, you've been telling me about this place up in the mountains for a number of years, Fisher. Well, you finally decided to take you up on it. You mean you want to go up there when the season opens? That's right. It'll cost you $50 for me. We're prepared to pay it. Fine. When do you want to start up? The same morning the season opens. I guess they can be fixed. You got your own guns? Yep. Good. If you give me a little money, uh, I'll lay in a supply of grub. Uh, how long you want to stay up there? Only as long as it takes to get our deer. It might be three, maybe four days. That's okay with us. Uh, another thing, Mr. Steger. Yes. You can't go up in no car. I've got to use horses. Well, I'm going to take you. There ain't no roads, only trails. And sometimes you have to leave the horses. We understand all that. In that case, I better start laying in the splash. Only, uh... Only one thing, Fisher. Yeah? Do you know any of the stories concerning the wild huntsman? The what? Yeah, I heard 
So, you were connected with the stories I heard, Fisher. Stories about you leading hunters up into the mountains. Hunters who never return. Oh, that ain't true, Mr. Steger. Ain't true at all. How did they start? Don't know. Well, take my word for it, Mr. Steger. It ain't true. What you heard about the wild huntsman. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Wild Huntsman. The days passed quickly, and before we knew it, we were ready to leave. Fisher insisted upon getting his fee before the trip started, and though I had some misgivings, yet I could see no reason why he shouldn't receive it. We started out a few hours before the season officially opened. Will it take us to get up to this place, you know, Fisher? We are here about the middle of the afternoon. Maybe three, maybe four o'clock. But I should imagine that everyone else would have a head start on us. And after this section of the mountain, what do you mean by that? There ain't many people who come up here. Mark my words, you'll find more than you bargained for up there. How you doing, Vaughn? Fine. What about you, Helen? Oh, I think I'm going to enjoy this trip. Maybe, maybe not. What'd you say, Fisher? Huh? Oh, I said she probably would enjoy the trip. We stopped twice to eat and rest and then continued on our way. I noticed that the woods were becoming thicker, and the farther on we went, the greener the color of the foliage became. Three times during the trip up there, we had to dismount and lead the horses over the trail. I looked at my watch and saw that it was almost 3.30. How much farther, Fisher? It's right around the bend in the trail up there. A little clearing with a stream not too far away. We can make camp there. How much farther, Helen? It's right around the bend. Oh, I'm glad of that. I'm not as young as I used to be. You know, Helen's tired, and so am I. Uh, we won't be able to get in any hunting today, will we, Fisher? It depends on what you want to do. I think perhaps we should hold that off until early tomorrow morning. Anything you say, Mr. Steger. Oh, there's the campsite. Oh, 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 there. Why, it's beautiful, Fisher. Hey, been but a few people up here to destroy the looks of the land. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh, I've never seen anything so beautiful. That's just what I told Fisher. You know, it was worth it. Just to see this place. Well... Might as well dismount. Right. Be our hope for a while. Uh, all right. Okay. We made camp and set up the tents. Helen and Jerry shared one tent, I the second, and Fisher just used a bedroll. Evidently, he was used to sleeping out in the open. Occasionally, as the wind changed, the sound of the little stream would be brought to our ears. It was about 9.30. The campfire threw shadows against the trees which surrounded the little clearing. We sat around the fire. The crackle of the burning wood was pleasant to the ear, and the clean, pungent smell of it filled the camp. Oh, I didn't realize I was so tired. Dear yeah. oh, Jerry. Something so nice and peaceful about this place. Well, I think I'm going to roll in. What was that? It sounded like a wolf. We're up pretty far, you know. I'm so eerie up here in the woods. There's nothing to worry about, darling. Well, uh, I suppose you're right, Jerry. It's just a dead up. Never heard that sound before. It's so strange. Not like anything I've ever heard. It sounded like. Like one of those old horns which called people to the hunt. Listen. To what? Be quiet, listen. Yes, I hear it too. It seems to be the sound of a horse approaching this camp. Maybe someone's in trouble. Perhaps the horse is frightened by something. He's going to come right through the camp. Okay. What was it, Fisher? I think his horse 
whoever it was 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 frightened by the wolf howl. His horse. It was all black. Did you get a look at the rider? No. So sudden I didn't even think about it. I imagine he'll be able to slow his horse down. And you don't think he'll need any help from us? No. No, he won't need any help from us. the hour grew later, a small wind sprang up and sounded its way through the branches of the trees and foliage surrounding us. It was a quiet and restful sound. At about 10.30, we all retired. I don't know about the others, but I fell asleep upon the instant. Once or twice during the night, I thought I heard the sound of that animal again as its cry echoed across the distance. In the morning, I awoke completely refreshed. As I dressed, I could smell the odor of bacon and eggs frying over an open fire. The others were about gathering wood, putting the camp in order. After we've had breakfast, I think we'd better break up into two parties. Uh, you have a compass with you, haven't you, Mr. Steger? Yes. Uh, you take the lady with you. He said uh, he wants to go with me today. Yeah, that's right, Vaughn. You can go off to Fisher tomorrow. Well, that's fine with me. You strike out due north, Mr. Steger. Uh-huh. We'll go the other way. Now, don't go too far, though. You might get lost. <laughs> don't worry. We won't go too far. <laughs> Good. Well, let's get started. See you later. All right. Bye. Bye, huh? They left camp before we did. A few minutes after we had seen them disappear down the trail, we started out. Our course was due north which happened to cross the little stream. There was a sort of trail through the trees, and we followed it until we came to the stream. That rider must have crossed the stream right about here last night. Yes, you're right. I wonder who he was. Mm. I hope he was able to stop his horse. Fisher seemed to think he would. But that horn again. Yes. It seemed to be quite far away. Well, then... Shall I go on? Yeah, I might as well. Now, that log lying across the stream, we ought to be able to cross the stream on that. Go on. Wait a minute. That sounds like a horse. It is. What? Over there, see? see there's, there's a black dog running along the pike. Oh, yeah. I wonder who it is. You'll know in a minute. He's coming right for us. Oh, boy. Over there. Many people up here. I guess not. Any luck? Uh, we were just starting out. Well, that's... Hey, you must excuse my dog. He's not used to strangers. I think. Uh, been here long? Um, we arrived here yesterday afternoon. I, uh, I rode over to apologize to you. I was out riding last night. Some animal howled and frightened my horse. He ran away with me, and I'm afraid I disturbed you. I had no damage, I hope. No, there was no damage. Good. I imagine Fisher guided you up here? Yes, he did. Good hunting country. Not many know the way up here, but Fisher does. <laughs> it brings quite a few people up here. I imagine you've heard those nonsensical stories about a spectral hunter, haven't you? Yes. Fisher doesn't seem to believe them, does he? Evidently, you people don't either. It is nonsense, of course. After all, no one's ever seen the wild huntsman and lived to tell about it. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Wild Huntsman. Helen and I stood there, looking up at the black-clothed man who sat astride a cold black horse. On the ground beside the horse stretched a dog. There was something strange about the three of them, as if they came from another world. One other thing... I hope you'll forgive me if I impose upon you. Certainly. Well, then, tell Fisher for me that Hunter wants to see him. Where? He knows where to find me. Just give him the message. If you will. We will. Excellent. Well, goodbye. I imagine I'll be seeing you again. Of course. <laughs> Horseman 
trailed closely by the gigantic black dog, galloped away. He seemed to be a nice enough fellow, but there was something about him which made me feel uneasy. Helen and I continued the hunt, but with no luck. We returned to the camp, cold and disgusted. We wondered why Jerry and Fisher weren't there, but then surmised that if they had had any success, they'd make slow progress back to camp. They came in about two. Helen! Look at the size of that deer. Hey, they made up for what we didn't oh. get. Hey, Jerry, good shooting, fella. <laughs> What's the biggest I've ever seen? Why, look at that. You've been stuck with one shot. Oh, I've oh, forgotten how to shoot. Oh, pretty enough. Enough. Put him down for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Is that a beauty? <laughs> oh, Fisher, that man was a runaway horse. Why didn't you tell us you knew him? I, I wasn't sure who it was. We met him today. Man on a black horse? Yes. Said he wanted to see you. That you knew where to meet him. Said his name was Hunter. Oh, yeah. Mr. Hunter. I'll be back in a while. I don't want him getting angry. He's like... Like a devil. When he's angry. We didn't think that Fisher would be gone long, and yet... When night fell and there was still no sign of him, we began to get worried. It was about nine o'clock. Fisher had been gone for almost seven hours. I wonder where he is. We should get back. He's been gone for almost seven hours. Well, he knows how to take care of himself. A wolf out in those woods somewhere. Now, there's something about this place. Beautiful and, and yet it's so wild. Place where man doesn't belong. No, Helen. Man does belong here. He came out of the forests himself. Yes, but when he left them, he gave them up. We don't belong here. The wilderness belongs to the animals, to, to the creatures of. Yes. The horn again. I wonder who. What was that? I don't know. It sounded like, like the scream of a human being. It wasn't too far away. Maybe we better go take a look. You're right. Get your flashlight. Right. Stay here, Helen. We'll be right back. All right. Right, over here the street. Shine your light around. Seems to be anything. Just a minute. What's that over there? Let's take a look. It might be only a good heavens. You don't think I can tell? Take a look at his face. It's Fisher. He's dead. Look at his cheek. Yes, I see it too. The black figure. A man on a horse. we managed to get him back to camp. We had to tell Helen that he was dead, though I would have preferred that she hadn't known. We talked it over and decided to go back in the morning to call an end to this ill-fated hunting party. We decided to divide the night up into shifts at which one of us would stand guard. I drew the first shift. I sat by the fire, occasionally feeding it, feeling alone, terribly alone. Who's that? Garrett. Yeah. Can't sleep. In a way, I'm glad. It's lonely here alone. How long to sleep? Yes, good. Go on. Yes? Do you think there's any truth to that? Wild huntsman legend? I don't know. The mark on Fisher's face. How can you explain that? I don't know that either. In the stories I'd heard, Fisher made a sort of pact with him. Why should Fisher die? Maybe he made a... Maybe he made a mistake. Maybe this thing intends making a new pact with someone else. We're the only ones up here. Yeah, I know. The wolf's awfully close. You got your gun. Yeah. You realize that every time we've heard that wolf howl, something's happened? Oh, I wish morning would come. I wish we'd never started off. Come on. You don't think? We'll see in a minute. Anything's happened to her. Helen. Helen! Jerry. Jerry, we have to do something. She's dead. She's dead, Jerry. We have to think of some way to save our own lives. <laughs> what? That is quite true, my dear sir. You. 
Where did you come from? Makes no difference. This is my domain. You do not belong here. You have trespassed where you do not belong. For that you shall die. If I do, I'll take you with me. When we ran to Helen after she screamed, we'd carried our rifles with us. Jerry raised his and fired. What happened then, I still don't know. I was sure that the bullet had hit Hunter. And yet, he didn't fall. But something happened to Jerry. He screamed and fell lifeless to the ground. Hunter stands there watching me. In these last few minutes, all this, the complete story, has gone through my mind. I, I'm afraid. Terribly afraid. There's no need to be afraid. You will live, but on one condition. And that is, Fisher made a pact with me. You will do the same. No, I won't. My dear sir, you must. Fisher was getting old, not quite as useful as he once had been. But you, you will live and bring more like you here to me. Just as Fisher did, out to the forest, in my domain, out to the realm of the wild huntsman. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Twisting Weeds of Death. Try the door, Doc. All right. It's open. Let's go in. Put your light on too, Doc. All right. Don't look like anyone's been in here for years. Still in pretty good condition, though. Yeah, now, let's see. That room should be over here. The door is open. Let's see what's in there. There doesn't seem to be anything in here. You sure you saw what you did, Bob? I'm not lying to you, Sheriff. I know I did. Well, there's nothing in here now. Just a minute. What do you see? Over here. Look at the floor. It's soaking wet. And there's seaweed on it. He's right, Doc. That is seaweed. When I saw her, her hair, it looked like it was covered with seaweed. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Twisting Weeds of Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Twisting Weeds of Death. on the bluff overlooking the sea about three miles out of town. It's been empty for almost 20 years. Through the seasons of the year, it stands there, buffeted by the sea wind, tempered by the rain and snow, till its color has changed to a dirty gray. No one goes near it. The people who live in my town on the rocky coast of Maine are a superstitious lot, and ever since that storm...
stormy night so many years ago, no one goes near it. The old wives say that death is in that house. My name is Jason Fielding. I'm sure it'll seem you. The job doesn't really amount to much, except in the summer when the city folks move in. Even then, my main worry is to make sure the young ones don't get out of hand. That night, the night it began, I was over at Doc Jordan's place. Usually of an evening when he isn't out on the call and when I'm not making my rounds, you'll find me there playing the longest tournament of chess in history. Your move, Doc. Now, don't press me, Jason. I have to think this out. You've been thinking it out for ten minutes, Doc. You just wait now. There. <laughs> Did it take all that time for you to figure that move out? Now, look here. It uh, might be Mrs. Lord. Wife's well, going to have a baby. Uh, come in. I figured I'd find you here, Sheriff. What's the matter, Bob? Uh, I was out walking along the shore down by the old house. Well, what are you doing down there, Bob? Your mother won't like that. I can't help it. I was walking, like I said, and I, I, I saw a queer kind of light coming from one of the windows. A light in the old house? That's right, Sheriff. What did you do? Well, I, I was curious, so I decided I'd go over and take a look. I stayed in the shadows and crept up to the window. What did you see? A murder. What? That's right. This girl was in the room seeing a man. I, I couldn't see his face because his back was to me. The girl was backing away from him, and he had a scarf or something in his hands, and he kept walking towards the girl, and she kept crying out, No, you don't know what you're doing. And then he reached the girl and wrapped the scarf or whatever it was around her neck, and he he, he choked her to death. Why didn't you do something? Because I was scared, Sheriff. I, I couldn't hardly move. But when she screamed, I'll never forget it. That scream. I... Snapped out of the trance I was in, but it was too late. So I ran all the way back to town to find you. Did you see the man's face? No, sir. His back was always turned to me. You and me, we're going back there, Bob. You want to come along, Doc? Yeah. There was a queer thing about that girl, Sheriff. Her hair. It looked like seaweed. That's the way it started. The three of us went outside and got into my car. It only took us a few minutes to reach the old house, even though the road leading up to it was gutted and overgrown with weeds. Bob Stanley said he saw a light burning. When we got there, everything was dark. This is good enough, I guess. I thought you said there was a light burning in the house. There was. There's no reason for it to be burning now. Come on, let's go. All right. Good thing we brought along a couple of flashlights. Listen. What's the matter? Didn't you hear it? Hear what? I heard a scream. I didn't hear anything. I didn't either. I'm not kidding. I heard a scream. What window was the light coming from? That one. There. Well, let's go inside. We'll take a look at it. Sure, the spooky old place. Used to be a beautiful house before... Before what? You weren't even born when that happened, Bob. Before what happened? Before the murder. You mean someone was actually killed out here a long time ago? Just like tonight? That's right. Someone was killed a long time ago. Try the door, Doc. All right. It's open. Let's go in. Put your light on, too, Doc. All right. Don't look like anyone's been in here for years. Still in pretty good condition, though. Yeah. Now, let's see. That room should be over here. The door is open. Let's see what's in there. There doesn't seem to be anything in here. You sure you saw what you did, Bob? I'm not lying to you, Sheriff. I know I did. Well, there's nothing in here now. Just a minute. What do you see? Over here. Look at the floor. It's soaking wet. And there's seaweed on it. He's right, Doc. That is seaweed. When I saw her, her hair, it looked like it was covered with seaweed. Who was that? I don't know. It came from this room. It couldn't have. Tell you that scream came from this room. Turn your light around, Doc. See, I told you. Couldn't have come from this room. I tell you it did. The boy's right, Doc. It did come from this room. But as far as I can see, there's no one else in here. Just the three of us. If it didn't come from this room, where did it come from? And who screamed? That's what I'd like to know. We went through the whole house, but we couldn't find a thing. I knew Bob Stanley wasn't lying. He had seen something there in that house, but whatever it was, there was no trace of it now. 
I dropped Bob Stanley off at his house and then met Doc off at his place. I went home, got into bed, and I couldn't sleep. In my mind, I heard the echoes of the screen in that house, and I saw again that wet section of the floor with the strands of seaweed twisted this way and that, like squirming snakes. And I had the same feeling I had when I was in the house, nervous and frightened. Speaking. This is Mrs. Stanley, Sheriff. Anything wrong, Mrs. Then you go, Sheriff. My boy's gone. Bob's gone. What? That's right. And up in this room, it's all wet, Sheriff. And there's seaweed all over the place. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Twisting Weeds of Death. After I put the receiver down, I got dressed as quickly as I could. I went downstairs, got into my car, and drove the short distance from my house to the Stanleys. Come in, Sheriff. Come in. Have you called your relatives, Mrs. Stanley? He might be there. I've called everyone. In every place, I thought he might have gone. He wasn't with any of them. I'd like to see you. Through. Just come with me. When you came in, he said he'd been with you. Is that right? That's right, Miss Stanley. Where were you so late? He wouldn't tell me anything about it. We were out at the old house outside of town. At the old house? Well, what were you doing there? Bob said he saw a murder being committed out there. A murder? Do you mean he was out there alone? Yes, he came into town and got me. Will you show me his room, please? Oh, yes, of course. He's never done anything like this before. Such a nice boy. I know that, Mrs. Stanley. This is his room. Do you see what I mean, Sheriff? It's wet. The whole room, it's, it's wet. And, and the seaweed. Look at the seaweed. I see it, Mrs. Stanley. Did you hear anything tonight? Hear anything? What do you mean? After you'd gone to bed, did you hear anything? No, I... Now, just a minute... I'm not sure, but I thought I heard a scream. A scream? That's right. I, I didn't hear it at all well. It was, it was just there. I felt it more than I heard it. How did you discover that Bob was missing? I couldn't sleep. I came into his room to see if he was covered, but he was gone. Now, now, Mrs. Stanley, we'll get him back for you. Ever since his father died, he, he's been my whole life. I don't know what I'll do if anything happened to him. I'll do my best, Mrs. Stanley. Where is he, Sheriff? What happened to him? And, and why is his room like this? On my way to the old house, I stopped at Doc Jordan's, but he wasn't home. I figured that Mrs. Lord must be having her baby. I took a gun with me because I wasn't sure what I'd find out there. Come with her. So? So I went with her. 
We walked out here to the old house together. She, she held my hand. Skin was soft. She had skin wet. She was a beautiful girl. We went into the house in the room we were in earlier tonight. Funny thing, there was a light on in there, but I didn't know where it came from. She was pointing to something. But a look of terror came across her face and she screamed, Run! Run for your life! He's coming! And I ran. That's when you ran out of the house and out here near the edge of the bluff. That's right. I thought I saw someone chasing me. I was afraid, I guess. So afraid I passed out. It's a good thing I found you. Yes, because it was. I want you to come back to town with me, Bob. I want to show you a picture. A picture of a girl who's been missing for 20 years. Dr. Jordan and I helped him to his feet. There was an odor of old rotting seaweed that clung to it. I put my arm around him and helped him up to my car. Then we drove to town in my office. Doc Jordan followed us in his car. Sit down, Bob. Thanks, sir. I'm going to show you a picture. I want you to tell me if the picture's the same as the girl you saw tonight. You all right now, Bob? Yeah, Doc. I'm all right. Yeah, here it is. Take your time about it, Bobby boy. Here. Well? That's her, all right. Only the color of her hair is different now. It's green. Green like seaweed. Whose picture is that, Jason? Elaine Scott's. Elaine Scott's. She's been missing for 20 years. Not missing, Doc. I side with the folks around here who say she's dead. Don't be a fool, Jason. Just because someone leaves town suddenly without telling anyone, there's no reason to believe she's dead. Maybe not. My mom told me she was killed. It's all conjecture. The whole town seems to think that house is haunted. Why, Sheriff? That's the house where Elaine Scott lived, Bob. That's the place where she was last seen alive. That's right. It's a birthday party. You were there, Jason. So was I. All the eligible bachelors in town were there. Elaine lived there with her maiden aunt. Her folks were dead. The morning after the party, they found her aunt dead and no trace of Elaine. It was just as if she disappeared from the face of the earth. Elaine's aunt was strangled to death. And Elaine was killed, too, only we never could find her body. That's where I think you're wrong, Jason. I don't think she was killed. I think she left town after she killed her aunt. Elaine wouldn't have hurt a fly, Doc. People aren't what they appear to be on the outside, Jason. You know that as well as I do. We see a man or a woman only as they look on the outside. We don't know all the little workings of their minds. We don't know what a man really thinks. You're right, Doc. We don't know. There's lots of things in this world of ours that are mighty strange. Things we can't explain. Things we aren't able to say are impossible. Like a sixth sense that warns you of danger. Like you hear in someone's voice just as they die. Even though a continent separates you. Like hearing the voice of the dead when they've been gone for years. What do you mean? That's what I think happened tonight. What's the date, Bob? The 25th of May. That's right. What was the date that Elaine Scott disappeared, Doc? May 25th. That's right. 20 years ago tonight, Elaine Scott disappeared from the face of the earth. And tonight she's come back. Come back to point out the person who killed her. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Twisting Weeds of Death. We sat in my office, the three of us, Doc Jordan, Bob Stanley, and myself. Something had happened that night. Something I couldn't explain or understand. For Elaine Scott, dead for 20 years, had reappeared 20 years to the night she disappeared. You don't mean to tell me, Jason, that you believe the dead can return. I believe a lot of things, Doc. People might laugh at me for saying it, but I do believe they can in one way or another. Well, what are we going to do? You said she led you into the house, Bob, and she pointed to something. Did she say anything then? No, she... Yes. Yes, she did. She said, this is where it happened, before we went downstairs. Before we went downstairs. Do you know what she was trying to tell you? 
She wants you to know where her body is. It sounds like an ignorant fool, Jason. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. We're going back out there, Bob. All right. You want to come along, Doc? Yes, I guess so. This time, I'm going to take a gun along. What for? Handy things to have around, a gun. That's a ghost, Bob. So a gun won't do you any good, Jason. I got my reasons. Come on, let's go. any more than stepped outside when there was a big crash of thunder. It started to rain. I got into my car and drove out to the house. The wind was strong and the ocean was washing in pretty heavy. Give me a flashlight, son. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, Doc. I don't know about that. He said, before we went downstairs, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, let's go downstairs. All right. Someone's in this house. It came from that room. The same room. Do you want to go in there, Sheriff? No, we won't find anything in there now. We'll go downstairs. Here's the door that leads to the cellar. All right, open it. Why don't we go back to town and wait till morning? We're here now. We might as well go through with it. What do you expect to find down there, Jason? I don't know. Let's go. Watch your step. No one's been down here in 20 years. Stairs might be a little rickety. You see anything, Bob? No. The place is heavy with dust. Cobwebs. When a house gets a reputation like this one has, it's bound to be like that. No one lives in it except spiders. You see houses like this anymore? They've all got cement on the basement floor, not earth like this one is. There uh, doesn't seem to be anything down here, Sheriff. Uh, I think there is. I don't see anything. You can't see what we're looking for. Not now, anyway. What are you looking for, Jason? Elaine Scott's body. Elaine's body. That's right. We didn't think to look down here the day we found her aunt dead. We searched the house, of course. I even came down here and looked around, but I didn't think to check the well. What well? It's behind that door. Come on, let's take a look. What's a well doing down here? They had to have water. This house isn't connected to the water system in town. Old Mr. Scott was a pretty smart fellow. He didn't relish the idea of going out in the winter snow to draw water, so he dug the well first and then built his house over it. All right, try the door. It's locked. You'll have to break it in, then. You help me, Bob. Right. Together now. Be careful now. Shine your light around. Yeah. There's the well, all right. What do you expect to find? You see. Be careful when you lean over the top part of the well wall. Those bricks might be loose. All right, shine your lights, Jim. The shaft is cracked in a lot of places, and it's all overgrown with weeds. Yeah. But I can make out something down there beneath those weeds, something white. It looks like, it's like bones. That's what they are, all right. Bones. Elaine Scott's bones. Watch out. We better get back to the bricks and pieces. You were right after all, Jason. Uh, I guess I was. What are you going to do now? Well, that depends. On what? What happened that night, Doc? What night? The night you killed Elaine and her aunt. You're crazy. I don't think so. Comes back to me now, all of it. You stayed behind after the rest of us left. What happened? Look out, Sheriff! I don't take that gun! Get that gun, Sheriff! That's right! Don't try anything, Jason. Are you either, Bob? You did kill a man. That's right. Why? You know how I felt about her? I asked her to marry me. She laughed in my face. I must have lost my mind. I killed them both. Ever wonder why I like to play chess with you, Jason? Because I wanted to be sure of what you were doing. Because I wanted to be sure you never found out what happened. What are you going to do, Doc? I'm going to kill you. Both of you. And put you down where she is. The gun isn't loaded, Doc. What? The gun isn't loaded. You're lying. Try it and see. You asked for it, Jason. What? Take your gun, Jason. He's making a break for us here. Well, let's get him. Go away, Doc. You'll never get me out. Get out of here. He's running for the bus, Sheriff. We've got to check him. What's he going to do? I don't know. He can't get away. running in that direction. He doesn't watch out. Watch where you're going, Doc.
down there to those rocks. He isn't alive. He'll come back and get him in the morning. Sheriff? Yes. The girl I saw, she wasn't real, was she? She was real, all right, Bob. You mean she came back? That's right. She came back. There's a lot of things. Oh, just a lot of them. Like I said in my office, like uh, hearing someone's voice just as they die. Or like seeing them, as you did, after they've been gone for years. Those things can't ever be explained. Elaine Scott came back to me 20 years to the day she was murdered. To right or wrong. Now, she can rest content. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. against the man. I didn't want his money. And those who say I did are crazy. He was always agreeable and liked me. But there was one thing about him that bothered me. That I, that I of his, that pale blue vulture eye. Why did you do it? <laughs> that, that voice. It's always with me. It's always with me. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen. Can't you hear it? So rhythmic, beating, beating. It's with me. It follows me wherever I go. The pounding of his heart. The pounding, beating rhythm of the telltale heart. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Telltale Heart. And now for our story. Adapted for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. Yes? Uh, there was an advertisement in the paper. I'm here to answer it. I see. Won't you come in, please? Yes, thank you. Are you the one I'm supposed to see? No, I'm Mrs. Gorman, the housekeeper. Mr. Lawrence, the old gentleman, he's the one you ought to see. You'll just wait here. I'll tell him you're here. Yes, thank you. Of course. Mr. Lawrence? Yes? Someone here and asked for the advertisement you placed in the paper. Uh, send him in, Mrs. Gorman. Sir, Mr. Lawrence will see you now. Thank you. He's over by the desk, sir. Yes, ma'am, I see him. Thank you. You come in answer to the advertisement in the paper? Yes, sir. You care to sit down? No. No, I'll stand, thank you. What's your name? Uh, Crowther. David Crowther. 
Aside from my housekeeper, Mr. Carver, I live here by myself. I feel the need of a companion. Someone to whom I can talk. Mrs. Gorman is a housekeeper. She doesn't talk very much. Very competent person, but very uncommunicative. You have references, I suppose? No, Mr. Lawrence. I, I haven't. Oh. Uh, what work have you been doing? I'll be completely honest with you, Mr. Lawrence. I, I haven't been working for the past year. I was only released from the hospital two weeks ago. I noticed you looked rather pale. Are you well now? Oh, yes. I've completely recovered. Well, uh, you don't have references. I don't know. Uh, please, Mr. Lawrence. I need employment. My money is all gone, and I must work in order to live. I see. What about your family? I have no family. No other attachments? No, sir. I'm going to take a chance on you, Mr. Crowther. Thank you, of sir. Of course, your salary won't be too large. But you'll have a roof over your head and plenty of food to eat. When can you start? Tonight, if you like, Mr. Lawrence. Excellent. You know, Mr. Crowther, David, if I may call you that. Yes, sir. I have the feeling that we're going to get along quite well together. I was with him for several months. I don't know when the idea first entered my mind. But once it was there, it haunted me day and night. It enveloped my brain with its cunning. I had nothing against the man. He was always agreeable and liked me. But there was one thing about him that bothered me. That I, that I of his. One day I asked the housekeeper about it. Mrs. Gorman. Yes, David? The old gentleman. One of his eyes. Is there anything wrong with it? What? I don't think so, David. I... I hadn't noticed. To me, one of his eyes resembles that of a vulture. Pale blue it is with a cloudy film covering it. It didn't bother me at first. And, well, in fact, it doesn't bother me now unless he looks at me, but... Unless he looks at you? Why? Well, every time he looks at me, my blood runs cold. That pale blue vulture eye... I think I... you're imagining things, David. <laughs> yes, yes, Mrs. Gorman. Per perhaps I am imagining things. You won't say anything about it to Mr. Lawrence, will you? Of course not, David. <laughs> I don't know what came over me. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the old gentleman. Nothing at all. <laughs> yes, but there was. That eye of his. That pale blue vulture eye. Little by little, I began to hate him with all my heart. One evening, a few weeks later, the old man and I sat in the living room... We had just finished dinner and we were talking as we usually did. <laughs> just as you say, Mr. Lawrence, we'll have to wait and... And, well, what are you looking at? What, David? Are you staring at me? No, of course not. Yes, you are. Don't look at me like that. I'm not looking... Don't look at me! Turn it away, turn it away, turn your eye away. David, what's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with me. On your eye. It's like a vulture's. A few days passed. And I guess he thought I had forgotten about his eye. <laughs> but I hadn't. No, I hadn't. And every night about midnight, I'd get out of bed. Creep from my room to his. I'd unlatch the door and open it. And then, after it was opened wide enough to stick my head through, I would put in a covered lantern all closed so that no light would shine forth. <laughs> and after I had my head in the room, I would undo the lantern so that only... Single ray of light darted out. And I would shine it on his face to see if his eye were open. But no, it never was. Not then. I found the eye always closed. And you see, that made it impossible to do my work. For it wasn't the old man that bothered me, but his eye. His evil eye. Unless his eye were open, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I knew that one night it would happen. Yes, it would open, and then I could do it. Then I could kill him. <laughs> <laughs>
Back now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. And so I waited. I went out of my way to make him comfortable. I made sure that I never mentioned anything about his eye to him. And every morning I would go into his chamber boldly and ask him, Well, Mr. Lawrence, did you sleep well last night? Why, yes, David, I did. You didn't hear anything? Uh, any noises? No, not a one. I'm glad of that. Why? Did you hear anything? No, 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 not a thing. And why did you ask me if I had? Oh, I was just asking, Mr. Lawrence. I wanted to make sure. I wanted to make sure. And he thought everything was all right. He was a fool, just like all the others. (laughs) How could he know? Yes, how could he know that every night on the stroke of twelve, I looked in upon him as he slept. (laughs) You know, David, I didn't sleep very well last night. You didn't, Mr. Lawrence? No, I had a bad dream. Oh? What did you dream about? I dreamt that someone was looking in at me while I slept. Just waiting for a chance to kill me. Well, that's just a dream, Mr. Lawrence. Nothing to worry about, you know that. Yes, I... I guess it was just a dream. (laughs) Because the only people here are Mrs. Gorman, myself, and... Neither one of us would hurt you. You know that, don't you, Mr. Lawrence? Yes. I'm glad you're both with me, David. They're just the same. I can't seem to get rid of that feeling Frightens me. Don't worry about a thing, Mr. Lawrence. No, don't worry. I'll take care of you. On the eighth and last night, I took special pains to make sure he wouldn't hear me. A watch's minute hand moved more quickly than did mine. I crept out into the hallway, made my way to his door. His room was all black Black as coal Black as midnight I think he heard me But I knew he couldn't see a thing (laughs) The room was too dark for that I was almost in the room And about to open my lantern When my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening And the old man was immediately fully awake He sat upright in bed and whispered Who's there? He said, who's there? I kept still. I didn't say a thing. No, not a thing. And for what seemed like an hour, I stood there and didn't move a muscle. I knew he wouldn't lie down. He was sitting up in his bed, listening. Listening for what it was that had made the noise. (laughs) The old man was in mortal fear. When I had waited a long time and still had not heard him lie back upon his bed, I resolved to open my lantern a little, yes, just a little, just the tiniest bit. And presently, the tiniest bit of light struggled out. I directed it towards him like the thread of a spider. And finally, it came to rest upon his vulture eye. And then I seemed to hear something. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't distinguish it at first, and I racked my mind to think of what it was. And then finally it came to me. Yes, that was it. It was the beating of the old man's heart. Who is in here? I could hear it distinctly. He was so afraid. Beat, 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 beat. It went. I could feel its rhythm. The old man was in mortal terror. But I held the lantern motionless. I tried to keep the beam of the light focused on that terrible eye, that pale blue vulture's eye. The incessant drumbeat of his heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker. Beep, beep, beep. Louder, louder every moment. The old man's terror must have been extreme. Didn't I? I thought of something else. The sound of his heart was so loud it might be heard by someone else, by Mrs. Gorman, by some prying neighbor. 
And then I couldn't allow that, could I? No. And the beating grew louder and louder and louder until I could stand it no longer. Who's there? Don't be afraid, old man. Is that you, David? Yes, that's right. It's only me. Nothing to be afraid of. What are you doing in my room? Just watching over you, Mr. Lawrence. I thought you were someone else. You have nothing to fear from me, old man. But you should be asleep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll go to sleep. And so will you, old man. So will you. David, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Nothing, old man. Nothing at all. Don't come any closer to me. Stay away from me. Die, old man. Die. Let your heart die with you. Let it go. Die. Die. Close your eye. That vulture eye. Close it forever. <laughs> stood there in the darkness, looking down upon him. He was quiet now. Strange kind of stillness was upon him. <laughs> For he was dead. His eye would trouble me no longer, and I knew that I had to dispose of the body, and I racked my brain to think of a place, and then it came to me. Yes, I pulled three boards from the floor. I had to work quickly. The blackness of night was fast changing to gray. I placed his body under the flooring very neatly, and then I boarded it up again. <laughs> I did it so well that even I could hardly recognize the spot under which the body was hidden. Yes, his room looked as if nothing had happened. The striking of the town clock made me realize how late it was. Well, the job was over, and no one would ever be the wiser. <gasps> Who's there? Mrs. Gorman. Uh, just a moment. Yes. Yes, what is it? Where's Mr. Lawrence? He's not here. Not here? No, no, he... He went out to the country late this evening. I heard something up here. Such as... A scream. No one screamed, Mrs. Gorman. I, I guess I was mistaken. I'll have to send them back then. Who? I was afraid when I woke up I heard or... Or I thought I heard a scream. You didn't hear a thing. Mr. Lawrence has been gone for some time. What are you doing up here? I wanted to make sure he hadn't forgotten anything. But what you probably heard, Mrs. Gorman, was the neigh of the horse as the carriage carried Mr. Lawrence away. Then I... I must tell him to go. Who? Who's downstairs? Who is it? Well, I... I was frightened. I called the police. Huh. They're waiting for you downstairs. For both you... And Mr. Lawrence. Back now to our story, adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled The Telltale Heart. I was so sure that no one had heard anything. But Mrs. Gorman, the housekeeper, she must have heard him scream. Or did she hear the beating of the old man's heart? I went downstairs with her. Here's Mr. Crowther, officer. Thank you. Will you be needing me anymore? No, I don't think so. Good night, then. Well, what can I do for you gentlemen? You'll have to pardon us, sir, for disturbing you. We received a complaint from your housekeeper about some strange noises she heard. Oh, she must be mistaken, officer. Nothing's happened here. The housekeeper said she heard a scream from upstairs. Oh, she must have been dreaming. Perhaps. But I hope you'll excuse us, sir, if we take a look through the house. Why, certainly, officer. I have nothing to hide. Uh, well, where do you want to start, gentlemen? If you'll just show us around. With pleasure. Just follow me. I led them from room to room. I took them all over the house. I wanted to show them I had nothing to hide. I showed them every nook and cranny in the uh, place except the old man's room. Well, I wanted to, to say that to last. Don't you think this is enough? <laughs> and finally, I took oh, them into yeah, his yeah, room. And though they searched the exhaustively, they found nothing. I was quite pleased with myself. That housekeeper of yours must have imagined she heard a scream from up here. Probably just a nightmare. <laughs> well, perhaps what she heard was me. I, uh, <laughs> yes, I had a nightmare, and I think it... Well, I might have been the one she heard. Well, there you are. That's a simple explanation of it. <laughs> yeah, I, always, I often have nightmares. You know. We uh, ought to go to her room and tell your house. Don't worry about it, Tom. It wasn't her fault. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, how will she know who made the noise? She said there was a 
Uh, Mr. Lawrence living here, too. Oh, yes. Where is he now? Well, he... He isn't here. Well, that's evident. But where is he? Well, he... He went out to the country for a few weeks. He left tonight. I see. Uh, sorry to have troubled you, sir. No trouble at all, officer. Well, let's get out of here, Ed. We're keeping this gentleman up. If you gentlemen won't think it presumptuous, uh, won't you have a glass of wine with me? I know how it is after you've been up all night. And... Oh, I don't know, sir. We're not supposed to drink while we're on duty. Ah, but, Ed, we're, uh, we're almost through. Let's have a glass of wine. When we finish here, we can go home. Yes, yes, do have some wine. All right, it's a pleasure. All right, I'll get it for you. And Mr. Lawrence always kept a decanter and glasses on that table. Did you say kept, sir? <laughs> a slip of the tongue, officer. <laughs> the hour is late, you know. I uh, don't mind, Ed, Mr. Crowther. He's suspicious of everybody. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, that's your job. Well, here we are. I hope you like sharing. Mm-hmm. Always have it at home. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear that. Well, here's yours, sir. Thank you. And yours. Thanks. There. Now, shall we drink to something, gentlemen? Well, let's drink to you, sir, as a sort of apology for interrupting your sleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's very good, you know. <laughs> you did interrupt me. <laughs> I wanted to show off. I had seated them in the old man's room. And after all, in a way, this was a celebration, a token of my ingenuity. I'd seated myself on top of the very spot under which I'd hidden the body. We had one glass of wine, then another, and another. We were talking quite freely when I... when I heard it. Oh, won't you gentlemen have enough... Uh, what's that? What's what, sir? That noise. That beating. I don't hear anything. Anything wrong, Mr. Crowther? No, nothing. Nothing's wrong. Uh, have some more wine. I wish they'd leave. They were getting on my nerves. I had a terrible headache. And I seemed to hear a beating in my ears. They began to look at me queerly. And yet that sound increased. There was nothing I could do about it. It was a low, dull, quick sound. Like the beating of a drum. Where, where had I heard that sound before? They watched me closely. I paced the floor. I didn't know where the sound was coming from. Beat, beat, beat. Throb, beat, throb, throb. Where had I heard that sound before? I knew they suspected. Who wouldn't with that incessant beating that filled the room that seemed to make the very walls shake with its monotonous beat, that rhythm? Where had I heard it before? Where had I? I knew. I knew where I'd heard it before. Beat, throb. Beat, rub, beat, 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 yes. I knew what I'd heard it before. It was the beating of the old man's heart. What's the matter, Mr. Crowther? Can't you hear it? Hear what, sir? Perhaps I can push it out. What's the matter with you? What are you trying to do? Stop it from beating. Stop what, sir? Get out of here. Both of you. Get out of here. Get out of here. I can stifle his heart, that throbbing heart. Can't you hear the throbbing? Can't you hear it? The only thing we hear is you, Mr. Crowther. I can't stand it. I can't. The continuous pounding will never stop till I tell you the truth. The truth about what? About the old man, about Lawrence. I did it. I did it. What did you do? I killed him. Under the floor. The body is under the floor and he stopped that beating. <laughs> Stop the beating of his children. with me. Always with me. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Listen. Did you hear it? Slow, rhythmic beating. 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 It's with me. It follows me wherever I go. The pounding of his heart. The pounding, the pounding, the beating, beating rhythm of his telltale heart. Be quiet! Be quiet! Be quiet! (laughs) 
So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Hand of Botar. Uncle Simeon, are you all right? He's dead. What? He's dead. I went out to make a telephone call. There's no extension in here, you know. I was dialing the number when I thought I heard Simeon say something. And then I heard him scream. I ran back in here and found him like this. Look. Where? At his throat. There are five red marks on his throat, like finger marks. Just as if... as if he'd been choked to death by a person using only one hand. The Hall of Fantasy will present the Hand of Botar in just a moment. And now for our story entitled... The Hand of Botar. Even after he was dead, the spirit of Simeon Botar remained with those who had known him. His personality was so strong that when he entered a room, all eyes were immediately drawn to him. But there was something strange about Simeon, something different that set him apart from other men. It couldn't be defined, but it was there just the same. And when he said, Even when I die, the world will not forget me. I'll make sure of that. Even if I have to return from death. I first met Simeon Botar several months ago. Eric Matro had insisted that I meet him. And so one evening we drove out to his small estate several miles from town. You like Simeon, Charles. He's a very interesting person. <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. The way you talk about him, he seems to be an idol of yours. Well, hardly that. It's just that I find him stimulating. And when I told him that you played a wonderful game of chess, he insisted that I bring you out. He's a chess player, eh? Oh, yes, yes. A very fine one. When you play with him tonight, you'll be treated to a very unusual experience. How do you mean? You'll see for yourself. You know, Charles, there's something odd about Simeon. I can't place it myself. Maybe you'll be able to help me. Something odd about him? Yes, and even though he's so interesting a person, there's something about him that frightens me. Almost as if there was an air of death about him. Especially about that hand of his. I didn't know whether Eric was trying to play some kind of a joke on me or not. I had no time to think about it, however, as in a minute we turned off the highway onto the gravel road leading up to the house. The door of Botar's house was opened for us by a very beautiful young woman. Oh, it's so good to see you, Eric. Thank you, Marcia. My good friend, Charles Brakeley. Marcia Jameson, Simeon's niece. A pleasure. Won't you come in? Where is Simeon, Marcia? He's in the living room waiting for you. I understand you're quite a chess player, Mr. Brakeley. Well, not a very good one, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, on the contrary. Eric says that you're an excellent player. And Uncle Simeon is most anxious to meet you. It's right in here. Simeon, say we're here. Oh, so good of you to come, Eric. Uh, as I take it, is Mr. Brakeley? Yes. Well, I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. 
Would you gentlemen care for a drink? Oh, none for me, thank uh, you. The usual for me. Marsha, will you prepare a drink for Eric? Yes, Uncle Simeon. You uh, play chess, eh, Mr. Brakeley? Yes. Then yeah, sit down, please. As you can see, I already have prepared the board for play. Seeing you're my guest, uh, you may have the white, Mr. Brakeley. Oh, thank you. Uh, would you put on the blindfold for me, Eric? Oh, of course, of course. Tighten up, Simeon? Yes. Can't see a thing. Thank you, Eric. I hope you don't expect... Not at all, Mr. Brakeley. Not at all. Here's your drink, Eric. Thank you. Are you uh, ready, Mr. Brakeley? Do you uh, want me to call out my moves to you? Oh, no. That uh, won't be necessary. Well, then, uh, how do you know what move I make? Oh, my hand will know. Proceed, Mr. Brakeley. You have the opening move. All right. King's pawn to king four, Mr. Brakeley. Good safe opening. I'll counter with the same move. Now, your move, Mr. Brakeley. King's knight to king's bishop, Mr. Brakeley. Let's say I'll bring my queen out thusly. Mr. Botar, uh, how do you know what moves I make? You can't see the board through that blindfold, can you? Of course not, Mr. Brakeley. My hand tells me. Your what? My hand. You notice how the fingers are drumming now, Mr. Brakeley? Yes. But my brain is not controlling those fingers, Mr. Brakeley. The hand is an entity unto itself. Are you serious? Of course I am. How else would I know your moves? I cannot see you, Mr. Brakeley. Neither my niece nor Mr. Petro have told me what moves you've made. How else would I know? Let us proceed, Mr. Brakeley. It's your move, I believe. The game continued. It was incredible. The fingers of his hand would be silent as he moved, but when it was my turn, he would place his hand on the table and the fingers would begin drumming slowly. As I made my move, the tempo of those beating fingers would increase and then stop as Botar made his move. Your move, Mr. Brakeley. Check, Mr. Brakeley. Check. Check. Check and mate. You play a very good game, Mr. Brakeley. I'll take this blindfold off now. Oh, now, tell me the truth, Mr. Botar. How did you know my moves? Well, I've told you the truth. Well, you don't mean to say... That's exactly that... what I mean to say. My right hand has developed to such an extent that I believe it has, well, almost an intelligence of its own. That's impossible. Not necessarily. If we lose the use of one hand, we learn to do things with the other that require two hands before. A blind man learns to make his other senses perform some of the duties of his eyes. It's not impossible. The hand does seem to have an intelligence of its own. It has a strange grayish cast to it, Simeon, as if it were dead. Get me a pin, Marsha. Yes, Simeon. What are you going to do? Strange thing, Eric. There's no feeling left in that hand. I'll show you what I mean. What are you going to do? Prove to you that I feel no pain if the hand itself is injured. Here's the pin, Simeon. Thank you. Now, watch me. There. <laughs> It's in my hand, and yet I feel nothing. Either you're telling the truth, or you've learned to control your reaction to pain. It's the truth, believe me. I'll take it out now. There. You see? I have no feeling whatsoever of pain. Well, that's strange. What? My hand is moving, and I'm not... Oh, oh, oh. Simeon, get it away from your throat! I can't move it. Do something! Do something before it kills him! <laughs> We'll return to the tale of The Hand of Botar in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of The Hand of Botar. Eric Matro and I have driven out to the home of Simeon Botar. I had been a witness and participant in the most bizarre exhibition I had ever seen. And then, after the game was over, when Botar was showing us that his hand had no feeling in it, the hand suddenly moved to his throat and began choking him. Do something before it kills him. Help me. I'll get it. Oh, I can't. 
can't uh, move a child. Let me uh, help you. Uh, you uh, starting uh, to... Uh, uh, Timmy and I... Are you all right? Yes, uh, I guess so. Oh, what happened, Botar? I, I don't know. I can't explain it. All of a sudden, it's in my throat, choking me. You're all right now? Yes. I lost control of my hand at that moment, gentlemen. I couldn't move it away from my throat. But now... Uh, now I can move it at will. Have you thought of seeing a psychiatrist, Mr. Botar? No. Why do you ask that? Well, you've heard of schizophrenia, a split personality, haven't you? Naturally. But let me tell you right now, Mr. Brakeley, I am not suffering from schizophrenia. Well, that's the only rational explanation for what just happened. I don't think so. Do you mean to say that you really think that hand has an intelligence of its own? Yes, I do. Then you'd better be careful, Mr. Botar. If what you believe is true then that hand could very well kill you. We left shortly after that. As we drove into the city, my mind wouldn't forget the image of what had occurred that night. Eric. Yeah? Uh, how well do you know Simeon Botar? Oh, pretty well. Uh, do you think he's all right? If you're referring to his mental condition, I'd stake my life on it. When I took psych in college, we studied split personality and some of the strange courses it takes. Automatic writing, for example. Mm -hmm. The victim claims his hand wrote a certain message that he himself didn't. But actually, he was the victim of schizophrenia, split personality, and his other self wrote the message. Now, that's what could be wrong with Botar. How do you explain the game of chess, then, Charles? He couldn't see anything, I know. I moved my cigarette close to his face while the game was going on. He didn't draw back even a fraction of an inch. Well, that's true, but I, I still can't believe it. <sighs> you remember how the fingers drummed on the table prior to each of his moves and during each of yours? And then, just before it happened, remember how they began drumming on the table? When that happens... I have the feeling that the hand is thinking. Then you believe it. That it has an intelligence of its own. Yes. I'm afraid I do. In the weeks that followed, I saw a great deal of Marsha Jameson. I saw Simeon very rarely, going out of my way to avoid him. I didn't believe what he had told me, but he made me feel uncomfortable, and there was something about him that frightened me. One night, Marsha and I had returned from a play downtown. We stood outside the house saying goodnight, and I noticed Eric's car in the driveway. I had a wonderful evening, Charles. Ah, so did I. Oh, Eric must be here. There's his car. I didn't notice it before. Well, neither did I. It's in the uh, shadows by the side of the house. Charles. Yes? I'm... I'm getting worried about Uncle Simeon. Why? He's frightened. He, he doesn't sleep at night anymore. What's bothering him? The hand. He says that he can't go to sleep anymore without without fearing what it will do to him. The only time he's he's rested is when he's had one of the servants tie down the hand so so he can't move. I think he should see a doctor. But that's what I thought too, but he won't. I don't know why. What's that? A scream from inside the house. Let's go. Uncle Simeon! Mr. Botar! Eric! Oh, is that you? Yes! Where's Simeon? Come into the library, hurry! What's the matter? Look. Uncle Simeon! Are, are you all right? He's dead. What? He's dead. I went out to make a telephone call. There's no extension in here, you know. I was dialing the number when I thought I heard Simeon say something, and then I heard him scream. I ran back in here, and I found him like this. Look. Where? At his neck. There are five red marks on his throat, like finger marks. Just as if he'd been choked to death by a person using only one hand. We called a doctor, and he in turn summoned the police. They questioned us closely, and when Eric told them the story about the hand, they laughed at him. The final verdict was death by strangulation killer unknown. Three days later, he was buried. 
Eric and I returned to the house with Marcia after the funeral. Marcia had taken the funeral very badly, and we sent her up to take a nap for a few hours. I'll get it. Hello? May I speak to Miss Jameson, please? Oh, she's resting now. I don't want to disturb her. I see. It was a rather irregular request that we received, but uh, we did, as the note said. I just wanted to tell her that the package is being dispatched and will reach her today. Who's calling? Uh, Mr. Erskine. Goodbye. Huh. Erskine. Now, from where do I know that name? He was a mortician. Oh, yes. What do you want? Oh, he said something about a package being delivered here today. Hmm. I wonder what it is. I don't know. Well, I'll tell Marcia about it when she wakes up. It's strange that he didn't mention what was in it. Well, the package will arrive today. Then we'll know what's in it. I'll get it. Hello. This is Erskine again. I'm afraid I can't do what the note said. The thing is... Hello? Hello? Mr. Erskine, are you still there? What's the matter? I don't know. He... He sounded like he was choking. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon. Marcia was still asleep. The sky was heavily overcast, and I knew that we were due for a bad storm shortly. Eric and I heard the front door chimes ring, and a few seconds later the maid ushered in a man we had seen before, the lieutenant of detectives who had been at the house after Simeon Botar had died. What can we do for you, Lieutenant? I don't like to trouble you, Mr. Brakeley, uh, especially today, but uh, I'm afraid I have to. What's the matter, Lieutenant? Do you know uh, Mr. Erskine? Yes, he handled things for Marshall. That's right. Uh, well, he's dead. Dead? Yeah. Well, he um, he called here on the phone. Uh, he started to choke. <laughs> he choked all right. He was uh, strangled. What? That's right. Uh, and he has the same marks on his neck that uh, Mr. Botar had that night. Five little red marks, like the finger marks of a hand. You are listening to the tale of The Hand of Botar on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled, The Hand of Botar. We had come back from the funeral with Marcia Jameson. She was upstairs getting some rest. A few minutes before, Lieutenant Hillman of the police had come out to the house. I learned then the reason Erskine had seemed to be choking when I talked to him on the telephone. That's right, five little red marks, like the finger marks on a hand. It's starting to rain. Yeah, we're in for a bad storm. Erskine didn't have any enemies. He was uh, preparing a package to send out here, and then he was killed. Who did it? Not who, Lieutenant. What? Uh, how's that? I believe it was Botar's hand that killed Erskine. What are you talking about? Botar's dead. But his hand isn't. But Simeon's been buried, Eric. I don't care. I think it was... Her. <laughs> that was Marsha. Come on. Marsha! Marsha, what's the matter? Is she up there alone? Yes. Marsha! I, I, I saw it. I... I, I saw it. Saw what, Marcia? I, I was I was half asleep. I felt that something was in the room with me. I, I looked up. The window was slightly ajar. And then, ah, on the floor, I, I saw it creeping along. What was it you saw? Uncle Simeon's hand. What? That's right. Let's take a look. Are you sure? Do you know what you're saying? Of course I do. You, you'll see for yourself. There doesn't seem to be anything in here. Maybe, maybe it went back out the window. Lieutenant, take a look at this. What? Look, on the windowsill here, little scratches as if they were made by fingernails. You don't expect me to believe. I didn't believe it either, Lieutenant, but now I do. Botar's hand has an intelligence of its own. I believe that both Botar and Erskine were killed by that hand. I think you're crazy. And I think I can prove it to you. How? Lieutenant? Get an order to give us permission to exhume Botar's body. Then you can see for yourself. Just a little more now. This had better be more than a wild goose chase. I think that's enough. We're, we're going to open it now, Marsha. All right. Uh, let's get this outside casing yeah, pop off. There you go. Forget it now. That's it. 
Now, let's get this casket open. There he is, Lieutenant. That's Simeon. Look, Lieutenant. His right hand is missing. Now, will you believe us? That thing is alive. And it's back there at the house. It's evil and malevolent. We have to go back and destroy it. We searched the whole house and we still can't find it. Maybe it left the house. I don't think it has. I think it's hiding. But where? I don't know. How did the hand ever get it? Well, Erskine well, called me on the phone. He said something about an unusual request written in Simeon Botar's hand and that he was sending the package here. While he was preparing that package, the hand killed him. That, that thing is somewhere in or around this house. I, I have a feeling that... Oh! What was that? Sounded like a window breaking. Where? Upstairs. Let's take a look. We'll break up into two groups. Mr. Michaud and Mr. Brakel will go together. I'll keep Mr. Jameson with me, all right? All right. I'll find Let's go then. I have the only gun. If you see it, call for it. All right. Stay behind me, Mr. Jameson. I'll be right, right behind you. You take the front part, and we'll take the rear. Fine. If you see it, don't forget to call. Let's go. Why don't we try Simeon's bedroom? That sounds like a good idea. Come on. Remember, that thing can hide almost anywhere. I know. We might as well... Look. The bottom left pane of the French door leading to the sun porch, it's broken. Then, then the hand is, is in here somewhere. We can't be sure. It might have found entrance this way, but... Listen. It, it's in here, all right. Lieutenant... It's in here. Be right there. Eric, stand over there by the broken pane there. Make sure it can't get out. Right, right. Oh. Well, where is it? How oh, we know it's in here somewhere. Come in quickly. Let's get that door closed. Right. Now, be quiet. There it is again. Where, where is it coming from? Be quiet. It, it's moving. Can't see it. Neither can I. Look out, Charles, in back of you! It's climbing up the wall in back of you! Where? It's making for the light switch! The, the lights are out! Be quiet! Ah. It's dropped down to the floor again. I can't see a thing in the dark. It's going after someone in this room. Hear it moving. Be quiet. Ah. I, I can feel something on my back! I can. Ah! The hands are under control! Get the hand away from her! Right! Uh, hurry! Hurry! Yeah, we're doing our best! A little bit more! A little bit more! There! Throw it on the floor! Shoot it! It'll get away! Hurry, Lieutenant, hurry! It's making for the French door! It's horrible! believe this. Nor would I. I'm still afraid of it, even though I I know it's dead. I'll make sure that it's destroyed once and for all. Oh, I'll never forget the sight of it, creeping across the floor like some crawling monster. Characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Come with me, my friends. 
We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Jewels of Kali. Is that you, Kettridge? Yes. I heard a scream. Yes, so did I. It sounded like Sheldon. You'd better take a look. Sheldon, are you all right? Sheldon? Here. Let me let a match. Sheldon, are you... Kettridge. What's the matter with them? Both of them. They're... Dead. The Hall of Fantasy will present the Jewels of Kali in just a moment. And now for our story, entitled, The Jewels of Kali. I hear and obey, Mother Kali. If need be, I shall follow them to the ends of the earth, and they shall know. They shall not have, nor quiet rest, and their days shall be lived in fear of the death that creeps behind them. One by one shall they die, and I shall return to you bearing with me the jewels of Kali. I didn't know till later why George Mayer had asked us to meet him at his cabin on the lake. Elaine and I knew that Kettridge was going to be there, but we couldn't understand why he hadn't gone to George's apartment in the city. At any rate, we wanted to hear about Kettridge's trip to India, and so Friday evening we drove out of the city heading for the cabin. Looks like it's going to rain. Yeah, maybe the storm won't break till we get to the cabin. Well, I hope not. It makes it treacherous driving on wet roads. I don't think we'll have any trouble. Do you know Kettridge, Lloyd? I met him once, it was all. Hmm. I doubt if he'll remember me. It was a long time ago. Uh, three or four years before we were married. Hmm. There have been several stories in the paper lately about the Kettridge expedition. The reporters have been comparing it to the men who found the tomb of Tutankhamun. I know. Two of his party died before they left India and another one over here. That only leaves Kettridge and Porter. And they're saying that some kind of curse follows the members of the expedition. Well, that's superstitious nonsense, Elaine. The three who died were older men. Because they died within a few weeks of each other, the papers are having a field day. It builds up circulation. I don't know, Lloyd. I, I think there's more to it than that. Hmm? How do you mean? Mm, I don't know. It's, it's a feeling I have. A, a lot of the stories jumped from one thing to another as, as if they were deliberately leaving something out. Something too terrible to put down. Well, here's that storm. The rain's going to slow us down. Well, be careful. I'd, I'd just as soon get there in one piece. Don't worry, you will. Uh, are you really serious about those stories you read? Yes, Lloyd, I, I am. I'm just as serious as I can be. I'm sure that there's a lot more behind those stories. Something that might make us think twice before going up to this cabin. Every once in a while we get a, a warning, a premonition of things to come. That's what had happened to Elaine. She didn't know what it was, but she knew that something was wrong. What she didn't know was that we would meet death up there at the cabin. It took us an hour longer than it usually did to reach George's cabin. Do you have everything? I guess so. Well, let's go then. All right. Yeah, it's going to feel mighty good to get inside. Oh, did Kettridge drive up with George? I think he's coming up by himself. Oh, well, he's not here then. Look, there's only George's car. Yeah, he'll probably get here soon. <sighs> Certainly gets cold up here at night. Oh, you must have heard us drive up. Hey, hey, hi, George. Hi, George. See, you made it all right. Yeah? Oh, why shouldn't we? Well, the storm and all. I thought maybe you wouldn't come. Come on in. <sighs> Kettridge hasn't arrived yet, has he? No, no, no. Just uh, set your things down over there. Uh, (laughs) Pleasure. (laughs) Uh, Maybe it's a good thing we came up here after all, George. I can get in a little fishing. Tomorrow morning we'll go out early. Good. Now, how about a hot cup of coffee? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Well, just sit on down. I'll get it for you. All right. 
you uh, want some, don't you, Lane? Oh, try to stop me. I uh, wonder when Kettridge will get here. Oh, pretty soon, I imagine. Uh, take your cops. He's a pretty worried fellow. Why? Well, you saw the papers, didn't you? Yes, we we saw the stories. Well, I'll leave this here in case you want seconds. Good. Is there anything to those stories, George? Well, Kettridge says there is. How do you mean? Well, he says he's lucky to be alive. Why? He said something about Kali's curse. Curse? That's right. He seems to think that everyone who is in the Lost Temple is going to die. That there is no hope for any of them. What was that? An animal. A dog. Or a wolf, probably. Oh, oh. Sir. Why does he think that they're going to die? Well, probably because three of the party already have. Hmm. He and Porter are the only ones left. He seems to think there was a curse on any who defiled the lost temple of Kali, especially on those who took the jewels of Kali. This is the first time I've heard anything about jewels. What jewels? Well, Kettridge told me that the idol held a ruby in each of its four hands. His group took the jewels. And ever since, their steps have been followed by death. Kali! Listen. Don't get so nervous, Elaine. It's probably just a dog out in the rain. That wasn't a dog. Then what was it? I... I don't know. Hey, a car just pulled up outside. Well, that must be Kettridge. Henry? Is that you? Yes, I'll be right in. Lloyd. Yes, dear? That wasn't an animal I heard. You're letting your imagination get the best of you. You're letting calm down, calm down. Well, it's so good to see you, Henry. Oh, thank you, George. Ah, uh, Henry. Henry, these are the Erskins. Uh, Lloyd and Elaine, Henry Kettridge. Uh, how do you do? Uh, it's a pleasure. Do do? Cup of coffee, Henry? No, uh, no, thank you. What's the matter? Anything wrong? Yes, yeah, plenty. What is it? Just before I left town, I learned that Porter had died. What? Yes, that's right. Porter and I were the only ones left, and now he's dead. I'm the last one of the party left alive. That my turn is next. What about the jewels? I have them all of them with me. Porter gave me the two he had. He said he didn't want them anymore. He was afraid, and he thought that by giving them away to me, that he would escape death. But he was wrong. It didn't do him any good. That means that I am the last one that soon, perhaps within the next few hours, I'll be dead too. Come in! Return to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of The Jewels of Kali in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of The Jewels of Kali. The storm seemed to be getting worse. We stood there, the four of us, in George Mayer's cabin. Our eyes were turned to Henry Kettridge, whose face was white and drawn with the fear he felt inside of him. That means that I'm the last one, that soon, perhaps within the next few hours, I'll be dead too. Do you really believe that, Mr. Kettridge? What else do you expect me to believe? There were five of us on that trip, four are dead. I'm the only one left alive. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, it's not a pleasant tale, believe me. Tell us what happened. All right. We'd heard stories of a lost temple of Kali. As you know, the British government outlawed Kali worship many years ago. But we had heard of a lost temple some 15 miles northwest of the Indian city of Amritsar. We'd heard also that she held in each of her four hands jewels of tremendous wealth, each one a fortune in itself. We set out from Amritsar. None of us knew that we were walking to certain death. It is a particularly barren country, rocky and mountainous. We had a difficult time traveling. At length, however, we came across a valley hidden by the encircling mountains. I remember it was towards dusk. Porter and I saw it first. Get rich. Look. Yes, I see it, Porter. That must be the lost temple. Sitting down there in the center of the valley. I imagine it is. Those stories about the priceless jewels. Do you think they're true? The stories about the lost temple were true, were they? Yes, only I... Ah! What, what was that? I don't know. Ah! We 
we heard the voice then for the first time. The sun had just split behind the mountains and the sky was dulling quickly into ever more darker shades of blue. The voice seemed to filter through the air so that it seemed to come from all directions at once. We decided then to push on that night, to travel until we reached the lost temple. We reached the temple several hours later and stood there bathed in the shimmering light of the moon. I think that all of us at that moment sensed that there was something inside that temple, something that was alive and wasn't just a graven image in stone. Yet, we couldn't turn back. We walked inside the temple. No one was there save for the black and besmeared idol of Kali, who held out her four stone arms beckoning to us. We stopped before her and saw that in each of her four hands she held a huge, glittering ruby. We took the gems and left the temple. Later that night, we made camp. All of us felt that we'd done something wrong, but we knew that we wouldn't return the rubies. Sometime after we'd retired for the night, I heard the voice... But I put it down to my imagination. I must have fallen off to sleep. What woke me was Sheldon's scream. Is that you, Kendrick? Yes. I heard a scream. Yes, so did I. It sounded like Sheldon. Better take a look. Right. Sheldon, are you all right? Sheldon. Let me let a match. Sheldon, are you all right? Kendrick. What's the matter with them? They're both of them. They're dead. Both Sheldon and Friedman were dead. Around their throat, we saw the ugly imprint of the Stranglers, the fancy guards rope. Kali, the wife of Siva, had struck back at us. Sheldon and Friedman were the first to die. Manning was next, and tonight I learned that Porter had joined them. I'm the only one left. They all died the same way? Yes, with the fancy guards rope around their necks. Here. I'll show you the jewels. Those are the jewels of Kali. Oh, I've never seen anything so beautiful. They're so large. I'd like to examine them more closely. Don't touch them, George. To touch them means death. <coughs> Who's that? Well, just the sound of an animal out in the storm. Well, I hope it was only that. You don't think they followed you out here, do you? They would follow me anywhere. Those who worship Kali. Either they would, or she would. She would? Why, you talk as if... as if you think that stone idol of Kali were alive. Yes, I do. It sounds insane, I know. But I'm firmly convinced that that stone idol lives in a way not apparent to us. And that she will demand revenge for the wrong we've done her. Well, calm down, Henry. I can't be calm with the knowledge that she demands her revenge. I can't be calm when I know that she will only be satisfied when I am dead. Just like all the others. Kali! Listen. I heard that cry earlier tonight. And they followed me here. What? That's right. They followed me here. For the sound you just heard was the cry of the priest of Kali. She's out there somewhere. Somewhere in the storm. You don't mean that you believe that the, that the idol of Kali is out there in the storm waiting for you? Either the idol itself or one of her followers. Lloyd, let's take a look outside. All right. Don't go out there. No nonsense, Henry. If anything's out there, we might as well see what it is. Be careful. Don't worry about a thing. All right. You ready? Yes. Let's go. Do you think he's telling the truth? Well, there'd be no reason for him to lie to us. I still can't believe it. Well, we'll see if there's anybody around the cabin itself. If he's telling the truth... He... George... What? Look, over there, by the window. Oh, I don't see anything. I thought I saw someone over there. Let's take a look. All right. Now, you must have been mistaken. I don't see how. There's not even any footprints outside the wind. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Uh, this. What'd you find? It's a piece of rope. Or rather, a, a noose with a knot in it. Maybe Kedridge is right. Maybe someone is following him. What do you mean? Kedridge has described this noose to me before. This is the type of rope and knot 
the fancy cars used, Lloyd. This is the sacrificial rope of the priests of Kali. You are listening to the tale of The Jewels of Kali on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story entitled The Jewels of Kali. Henry Kettridge felt sure that someone was outside the cabin, hidden from us by the storm. George and I had gone outside to see if we could find anything. For a moment, I thought I saw a man standing next to the cabin by the window. When we walked over to look, we found nothing but a noose of rope. Kettridge has described this noose to me before. This is the type of rope and not the fancy cars used, Lloyd. This is the sacrificial rope of the priests of Kali. How did it get here? I don't know. Well, there are no footprints here, except ours. I thought I saw someone standing over here. I can't be sure, but I thought I saw someone. If anyone has been over here, we'd be able to see their footprints. And how did the rope get here? I don't know. Listen. Yes, I heard it too. There is someone out there. But where? You can't see anything because of the storm. We better get back inside. I think you're right. Let's go. Are we going to show Ketridge? Yes. I'm sorry I asked you and your wife up here, Lloyd. If I'd known anything like this was going to happen... Oh, forget it, forget it. Ali! Look. Did you see what I see? Yes. Just for a second, outlined by the lightning, it looked like the statue of a woman with four arms. Kali comes for you. Lloyd? Yes? I hear the sound of heavy, slow steps. Let's get inside. Right. Do you see anything? Well, it's inside. Here. What's the matter, Lloyd? You you look as if you'd seen a ghost. We found this. The strangler's rope. That's right, and... And what else? We saw something else. What did you see, man? Tell me. The lightning flashed a moment, and we saw something that looked like a statue of a woman with four arms. She reached them out to us and said, Kali comes for you. Are you sure? Yes. What are we going to do? Maybe we'd better go out to the cars and get away from here. What do you say, George? I think you're right. Don't be insane. You wouldn't have a chance. They won't let us get away. If we go outside that door, we'll be walking to our desk. What do you propose doing? Waiting here until they come for us? Yes. At least they won't be able to get us outside in the dark. I think we should take our chance and leave. So do I. And I agree with them. Waiting here only means certain death for all of us. If we make a run for it, we may get away. Let's get our things together and leave. All right. Yes. Stop. Huh? You're going to stay here with me. Henry, where'd you get that gun? I've carried it with me ever since I left India. We're not leaving. We're going to wait here. Don't be a fool, Ketridge. I'm not being a fool. I'm tired of running. This is the end of the trail for me. I'm not running anymore. And you're not going to either. Maybe we can get away, Henry. Maybe. I don't think so. Stay where you are, George. I'm warning you. Don't you think that if... The next time the bullet won't be over your head. All right, Henry. You win. Look, I don't like to do this. There's no other way. Ever since we returned to the States and split up, I've had to face this thing alone. It's only a question of time when they'll catch up with me. I can't run anymore. I can't face death alone. Maybe they won't hurt you. There's no reason why they should. After all, you didn't steal the jewels of Kali. We did. And I'm the only one of that group's left alive. They all died alone. I don't want to. I need people near me. So that when it comes, I can face my death with courage and not die like a screaming coward. All right, Henry. We give you our word. We won't run away. Thank you. Kali comes for you. It won't be long now. We have only to wait. Take a look out the window, Lloyd. See if you can see anything. Right. Do you see anything? It's so dark out there with the storm and all, I can't see. Wait a minute. The lightning... The thing is less than a hundred feet in the cabin. What? The yeah, idol, the idol. I hear it out there. It, it's getting close to the cabin. You three, get over to the other side of the room. I'll stay here. But we can't. There's no time to argue. Get over there quickly. What are you going to do, Henry? I'll wait for it here. Maybe the gun will stop it. Oh, it's on the porch outside. Be quiet. It's just outside the door. Be quiet. Don't move. No matter what happens. It stopped. In just a moment, it's going to quiet. 
Kali comes for you. Look out, Henry. Stay away from me. Stay away. Ah! Is it gone? Yes. Yes, it's gone. And it took Henry and the jewels back with it. Where did it come from? Henry believed that it came all the way from the Lost Temple, 50 miles northwest of the Indian city of Amritsar. But what was it? That that black grinning face with the grotesque body and and those four arms? That was Kali, the wife of Siva, the Hindu deity of destruction. If I hadn't seen it, I would never have believed it. Yes, I know, but you did see it. The stone idol was here. All the way from India, it came to fulfill the curse on those who defiled the temple. And stole the jewels of Kali. I hear and obey Mother Kali. I shall follow them to the ends of the earth. And they shall know that I follow them. Peace they shall not have, nor quiet rest. And their days shall be lived in fear of the death who creeps behind them. One by one shall they die. And we shall return, bearing with us... The Jewels of Kali. Kali! So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Marquis of Death. Are you coming, David? Yes, Andre. Where are you? Right along the riverbank. Oh, yes, I, I see you. Where is he? Over oh, here. Everett. Don't worry. He is alive. What happened to him? I will show you. Let me light a match. Take a look at his throat, monsieur. Three little red marks. That is correct, mon ami. The mark of the vampire bat. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Marquise of Death. My brother went with me to Milo in the southern part of France. For while I wrote my novel, he was to rest. The doctors in the States had told him to take a complete six months' rest. I knew of no better place in which to do it. It was a warm evening in June when it began, this tale I tell. A warm evening, cooled by the soft breath of a summer's breeze. Everett, my brother, had gone for a walk. Monsieur André de Cour, the son of the mayor of Milo, had dropped in for a glass of wine. Another glass, Andre? Uh, one more, and that is all. And how are you coming with your novel, mon ami? Mm, I haven't even started, Andre. I've only been here two weeks, you know. What's the matter? Why do you wait so long to begin? Oh, you wine, Andre. Ah, I take pleasure. Oh, I can't explain it, Andre. It just can't get started. 
I thought I had a good plot when I came over here, but the more I think about it, the less I like it. Then you do not know what you will write about? No. I hope you'll not think it presumptuous of me, monsieur. But I know the story you could write. Oh? I shall tell it to you. Have you ever heard of those they call the undead? Les morts qui vivent? The undead? Doesn't that refer to someone who lives even after death? Oui, but in a very certain way, mon ami. One who lives after death by feeding upon the blood of the living. A woman who was known as the Marquise de la Moparte. The name rings a bell somewhere in my memory, but I can't quite place it. It should, mon vieux. Many stories have been written of the frequent appearances she's made since her death. Since her death? Oui. I myself saw her one night, many years ago, when I was just a lad. I shall never forget the sight of her. Why? Was she so terrible to behold? Oh, quite the contrary. She was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. Shall I tell you about her? Oh, yes. Mettez-vous à votre aise, for it is a fairly long tale. 150 years ago, this part of France was the personal property of the Marquis de la Moparte. The Marquis was a kind man who cared for his people as much as they cared for him. He was a lonely man, the Marquis, but he entrusted himself with his people and this way forgot his loneliness. When he was almost 45, he married her. No one knew how she came to this province, nor when she arrived. Immediately, the Marquis began paying attention to her, and in a short while, they were married. It was after the marriage that the Marquis began to change. She seemed to bring out in him everything that was bad. One night, there came to this province an unknown carriage drawn by four full black horses. The driver whipped the horses and called out harshly to them. Those who saw the carriage said the driver had the eyes of a madman. The carriage raced along the road, stopping finally when it came to the Chateau Maupart. No one got out of the carriage, but the driver jumped down and made his way into the chateau. The driver claimed to be the father of the Marquise and that she must return home with him for a while. And indeed, the Marquise upheld his story. I must go with him, my husband. But it will not be for long. And so she went with the black-caped man with the terrifying black eyes. One month to the day she left, she returned. The same man drove the carriage. Get up! Get up now! And the Marquis de la Mocard rode inside. They arrived in the dead of night. We are here, my daughter. As I see. You have what I have promised you. As long as time exists, so shall you exist. Others may die. But you will live forever. Remember that at night, when the sky is dark and the moon is high in the heavens, then you shall walk the earth while others sleep. Then you may strike them down. The Marquise went into the chateau and the carriage and man disappeared and were never seen again. It was after her return that the Marquise developed an aversion to sunlight. By day she would sleep, and when the sun had set, she would wake and live while others slept. The Marquis soon died, and he was laid to rest. And one by one, the servants died. And those that were left ran away, saying that she had caused their deaths. They said that the mark on her neck she had once she returned to the Chateau Maupart had been caused by a vampire and that she too had become one of the dead who live, les morts qui vivent. Is that all of the story? No, mais non, mon ami. It captures your interest, I see. Yes, go on. The Marquise disappeared shortly after that, but occasionally the villagers would see her 
And some lived to tell about it. What do you mean? Many they found dead. Those who were brave enough to go abroad at night. Dead with the triple puncture of the vampire bat on their throats. You don't actually believe that, do you? Oui, I do. But Andre, you don't expect I me tell to... you, I saw her, mon ami. When I was younger, I didn't believe the tale. Another lad and I had gone over to the chateau to play around the ruins. It became quite late, and the sun set in the west. Suddenly she was there, in back of me, standing there in a black gown, with her raven tresses falling down over her shoulders, her skin the color of pale ivory, and her eyes looking through me, holding me in a trance by their power. Oh, no. I shall never forget her, mon ami. She must be beautiful, the way you describe her. Words cannot do justice to her. By the way, where's your brother? Oh, he said he was going for a walk along the river. Which way? North or south? I don't know. Why? Because the ruins of the Chateau Maupart stand north of Milo on the river. No one ever walks there alone at night. You really expect me to believe that story? I would if I were you, monsieur. The Marquise walks along the bank of the town river at night. If your brother is walking north toward the Chateau, he is apt to meet her. And that meeting, monsieur could very well result in his death. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Marquis of Death. We sat there in the gathering darkness. Andre Lacour had just told me a story I found difficult to believe. Yet he sat there, sipping his wine. And the look in his face told me that he believed it. Believe me, mon ami, if your brother is walking north, along the banks of the town, he is apt to meet the Marquise. And that meeting could very well result in his death. You really do believe the story, don't you? But of course I do. And I would advise you to believe it too, mon ami. What do you think I should do? Go searching for him. Alone? I shall go with you, monsieur. All right. Venez avec moi. Come with me. Together we shall go to the bank of the town. Perhaps we may not find him. But if we do, he will be a victim of les morts qui vivent. Of the dead who live. What if he walked the other way? Then we shall have made the trip for nothing, but at least we'll know. Shall I try calling him? Oui. Here, you should have heard that. He might not be able to hear you, monsieur. Maybe yeah, we ought to split up. A good idea, but do not go far. Stay within voice of each other. All right. You go south, I'll go north. We meet again here in ten minutes. Ten minutes. Au revoir. See you later. I watched him walk off. It was getting quite dark when I started down the river. It couldn't have been more than three minutes from the time we parted. When she stepped out from behind the tree. Bonsoir, monsieur. Uh, good evening. Are you looking for someone? How did you know? I heard you calling to him. Have you seen anybody around here? No one, monsieur. What are you doing down here? I am walking, monsieur. You live around here? Near the chateau, monsieur. The chateau? Oui. What are you staring, monsieur? Your eyes. Davy! Davy! What? Your friend. He is calling to you, monsieur. A bientôt. Davy, I found him! Where are you? Part of the river now! A bientôt. Are you coming, Davy? Yes, Andre. Where are you? Right along the riverbank. Yes. Yes, I see you. Where is he? Over here. Everett. Don't worry, he's alive. What happened to him? I will show you. Let me light a match. Take a look at his throat, monsieur. Three little red marks. And that is correct, mon ami. The mark of the vampire bat. You shall know how your brother is in a few minutes, mon ami. Stop wearing holes in your carpets. 
I saw someone out there, Andre. Out where? By the river. Oh? Who was it? A woman. A woman? Yes. What did she look like? I don't know. It was pretty dark. She stayed by she bringing Ed back here. Did she talk to you? Yes. What did she say? Well, she said she was out walking, that she lived near the chateau. You know, her eyes, they were the only things I could really see clearly. They seemed to burn and shine in the darkness. I felt like I was being hypnotized, and then you called me. That snapped me out of it. Then you have met the Marquise of Death, mon ami. And had I not called you when I did, you would not be alive to tell about it. Did she say anything else? Yes. She said, Abianto, two or three times. You know what that means, do you not? Something like, I'll see you again soon, isn't that it? Oui. And she means that, monsieur. She will see you again. Well, the doctor's coming. Yes. Perhaps he can tell us how badly your brother has been hurt. How is he, doctor? He has had a narrow escape. You are his brother? Yes. He will need blood transfusions. He has lost a great deal of blood. Then do you think we should take him to the hospital? We cannot do that, Monsieur Gaumont. Oh, why not? This is a very delicate matter. The people of Milo will not allow it. What do you mean, Dr. Moreau? It, uh, you tell him, André. Uh, oui, doctor. What he means, David, is that she will follow your brother wherever he goes. The doctor cannot take the risk of bringing him to the hospital. The danger to the other patients would be too great. You can't, just... I shall bring it back here, Monsieur Gaumont. All right. He was walking down by the river, was he not? Oui, Monsieur Gorman and I went after him. We found him just in time. Those three marks on his throat, you know what they are, Monsieur? The marks of the vampire bat, the mark of the Marquise of Death. Well, he hasn't anything been done to stop her. Because we cannot find him, Monsieur. And besides, the townspeople are afraid to go after her. If they went out in sufficient numbers, they I'd... tried that before, mon ami. When the sun shines, they've gone out and searched for our resting place. For she lies helpless during the rain of the sun. They've searched all day, and yet they've not found it. Mm. And those unlucky ones who stayed after dark, some of them went to join those she had claimed earlier. That's why they do not go out after her, mon ami. They are afraid, and with good reason. What do they do? There are protective measures, Monsieur Gaumont. Garlic, the cross, things which the dead who live fear. Uh, but it's getting late. I shall return as quickly as I can. What was that? It sounded like a window breaking. Came from upstairs. Come on. Go see your regain consciousness. I doubt it. Then what broke the window? Uh, we'll see right now. Look out! What was it? The dead who live. The vampire bat. What was it doing here? Let me see. He's all right, isn't he? No, Monsieur Gaumont. He is not all right. He will not need the transfusion now. Your brother is dead. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Marquise of Death. Three of us, Andre Lacour, Dr. Moreau, and myself stood there, staring out the broken window after the thing that had flown out. My brother lay in the bed, eyes open, seeing nothing. He will not need the transfusion now. Your brother is dead. What? That is correct. Remember what Andre said about her returning? Wait. She did. She came back before we could do anything for him. Now, it is too late. To stand here and calmly say that he's dead. You accept it for a fact, but you don't propose to do anything about it. What can we do, mon ami? We can go find her. We can destroy her. Oh, others have tried before you, Monsieur Gaumont, with no success. I don't care. I'm going out there, even if I have to go alone. You cannot go out there alone. But I am. And you're not going to stop me. I shall go with you, mon ami. And I, monsieur, I shall go with you, too. What about him? He will be all right, Monsieur Gaumont. There is nothing more. She can do to him. Before we started out, the doctor insisted on picking up some things. Eventually, we were ready, and we started out into the blackness of the night. You have everything? Yes. All right, let us go. Where, where shall we begin, doctor? In the ruins of the chateau, André. Why don't you bring all those things, Dr. Moreau? The wooden stake, crosses. If we find the Mokkebib, the dead who live, 
We shall have need for the things we have brought. We must stay close together, yes. close enough so that we can always talk to each other. Yes. No matter what happens, we must not become separated. Now we all have a lump to push. A what? A flashlight, mon ami. What are we to look for? A trail. A good path worn smooth by the years of returning to her resting place. I've been thinking since we started out tonight, and that, I am sure, is the only way we can find her. At either end of the path, there we shall find the resting place of the Marquis of Death. Let's begin. Oui. Uh, I will take the center, André. Uh, you take the left. All right. Monsieur Gaumont, you take the right. All right. We will circle the chateau at varying lengths from it. Look not only for the path, but for the presence of each of us, so that she cannot destroy us singly. All right. Let us go. Right. Bonne chance, monsieur. Bonne chance. Good luck. That is far enough, Monsieur Gaumont. Right. Look for the footpath. Oui. Bonsoir, Monsieur. We meet again. What? Silence. Where did you come from? I have been following you, Monsieur. You're so beautiful. My eyes. Look at my eyes. Your eyes. And I come close to you. Like this, monsieur. So close. David! Doctor, look! Hold up your cross, David! Your cross! A bientôt, monsieur. David! David, are you all right? Are you all right, monsieur Gaumont? Uh, what happened? Uh, let, let me see your neck, monsieur. You see, all right. Oui. She did not touch him. All of a sudden, she was here beside me. She told me to look into her eyes. I couldn't help myself. And then, and I seemed to be going to sleep. It is a good thing André looked back and saw you, Monsieur Gamar. We reach you just in time. We will have to stay together, the three of us. We cannot split up. Oui. You're standing right there, right where... Look. Where? Right there. It's a path. You have found it. What should we do? Follow the path, Mr. Raymond. Let us go. This path, it... It's away from the chateau. Always before we search near the chateau. The woods get heavy up ahead, Doctor. And she cannot harm us as long as we stay together. Put the cross around your neck, Monsieur Gaumont. As André and I have done. Right. Had you worn it there before, she would not have come near you. Now, the woods begin here. Uh, let us go slowly, then. The path is well hidden. We. Oui. No wonder we have missed it so many times before. Look. Up ahead. A cave. The path leads into a cave. Then that must be a resting place. Let us go quickly. Uh, be careful. You'll be around here somewhere. It's getting close to morning. The sky is lightning. Oh, the better for us, Mr. Gaumont. She will be powerless when the sun rises. This is the cave. Let us go inside. Shine your lamp to pass your head of us. I see something. Up ahead. Looks like a coffin. It's a coffin, monsieur. Aye. She will be returning soon. The sun will rise in a short while. She must return here to sleep through the day. Ah, to the other side. Into the shadows. Panic out. She comes. There was a bed up there. Then suddenly it changed into a beautiful woman. Why did you kill her that way? That is the only way. The dead who live 
can be killed, mon ami. So perishes the Marquis de Lemopard. A terrible toll of death she has taken through the years is now ended. She has crossed the barrier from which there is no return. Melo has been freed from the curse of the Marquis of Death. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Temple of Greece and Apostoli. The drums again. They have such a plaintive sound to them, do they not, senores? They have nothing. They give me the creeps. You seem to know a lot about this area, Juan. Oh, a good deal, Senor Prescott. In the unexplored area is a race of people thought lost to the world. What do you mean? What people? When Cortez conquered Mexico, he did not conquer all the Aztecs. Part of the nation followed Quitlaua down through Central America into South America, into Brazil, senores. <laughs> into an unexplored part of Brazil, on the very edge of which our camp lies tonight. Are you serious, Juan? Why should I lie, Senor Prescott? We stand close to death, the three of us. <laughs> In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present the Temple of Huitzilopochtli. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Temple of Huitzilopochtli. I didn't think that day when I came back to our apartment in Caracas after a talk with the old man that Fred Taylor and I were going to wish we'd never heard of oil. Are you, Mike? Yes, Fred. What are you doing? Taking a shower. Come on in. Well, did you see him? I saw him, all right. What'd you say? I said I saw him. Well, what did he say about the vacation? He said no. Well, how come? We have one coming. Yeah, but not till we finish this next job. Hey, just a second. Now, tell me what he said. Ever hear of the Huruena River? Yes, it's in Brazil. Empties into the Amazon. Well, that's where we're going. What? That's right. Well, you're kidding. No, I'm not. The company just leased a big tract of land along the river. We're to go in and see if we can find any traces of oil or uranium. Uranium? Yes. Bartell's group flew over the tract. The way they've got it figured out, there's not only oil there, but also uranium. So Bartell flew over it. Why don't they send Bartell to walk over it or paddling down the river like we'll have to do? Well, Bartell is senior on the staff. He gets the cream. We get the hominy grits. The who will end it? Mm -hmm. Say, if I remember right, there's some parts of that river that have never been explored. It's in the northern Mato Grosso region, isn't it? Yes. There might be a few natives in that unexplored part that wouldn't want us to be sticking our big noses into their business. Well, the old man said he'd throw in an extra week in the States with pay. Hey, I can hear you talk. <laughs> when do we start? As soon as we can pack and hop a plane to Cuyaba. He doesn't want any grass to grow under our feet, does he? <laughs> I guess not. 
Hey, don't forget to pack your guns. We might need them. We cleared ourselves with the Brazilian Consul General in Caracas, picked up our visas, and at midnight boarded the plane that would take us to Cuyapa. Mike, you wait. Where I am now? Where are we? Just crossed over into Brazil. Uh, why'd you wake me? I don't know. Oh, no, I, I don't know what it is. We can't sleep. I keep thinking that we should never have started out on this trip. Why shouldn't we? It's a funny thing. I just have a feeling. Yes, senor. Please be quiet. Oh, I got you, amigo. You go to sleep and keeping the other passengers awake. Well, just the same. I wish we hadn't started out on this safari. It's got me worried. Landed in Cuyaba, got checked out by the Brazilian authorities, and then went about the business of finding ourselves a guide. Most of them were familiar with the territory leading to the source of the Huruena on the plateau of the Mato Grosso. But none of them had been any farther than 200 miles down the river, and none of them were willing to act as our guide. After we spoke to them, I received the impression that they were afraid. Fred was having a drink when he came up and spoke to us. We're doing fine. We can't even find the guide. Well, we can always follow the map Bartell drew up for us. We're not in the mood to go into the lowlands alone, Mike. There are too many ways a man can die down there. Well, what else can we do? Pardon me, senores. Uh, you want something, amigo? I understand you are looking for a guide. That's right. I may be able to help you. My name is Juan Torrigo. Well, have a seat. <laughs> oh, gracias, senor. You care for a drink? No, senor. Uh, you know where we can get a guide? Si. Where? I can guide you. You know the Huruena River? Si, senor. Most of it. And that I do not know. I am willing to make the acquaintance of. Well, what do you know? We look all over Cuyaba for a guide, and then one falls right into our laps. Right. Uh, when can you start? When do you want to leave, senor? As soon as possible. The other guide said that no one was familiar with the river. I am, senor. I will be ready when you want to leave. Uh, can you get the supplies and the boat we need? You will not get a boat in Cuyaba, senor. Supplies and a canoe, that is possible. A boat... I cannot get that for you, nor can anyone else. We'll settle for that, then. Oh, you'll need some money. Here. No, senor. I can pay for the canoe and supplies. You can repay me later. Well, that sounds all right to me. Perhaps you can rent a automobile and hire someone to come with us as far as the river. Then he can drive it back to Cuyabo. That's a good idea. Now it's for pay. I am not worried about payment, senor. I am sure I can trust you enough to pay me well for my work. I will be ready to leave tomorrow morning. Good. Get the canoe and the supplies. See, si. I will meet you at your hotel tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. From there, we can pick up our supplies. Can we leave early? Yes, about six. Well, tomorrow morning, we begin a great adventure. Buenas noches, senor. Buenas noches. <laughs> Seems to be a pretty competent guy, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll know tomorrow morning. Right. Senor? Yes, senor. I... I could not help but see you talking to Juan Torrigo, Senore. I know you are looking for a guide. Has he offered to guide you? Yes, he has. Why? I would not do it, Senore. He's El Diablo, that one. What do you mean? Many parties he has led out, Senore, to the Huorena River. Always. He has returned alone. Never has he brought back with him any of those he has led out. Something happens to them, Senore. And they are never heard from again. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Temple of Huitzilopochtli. Notwithstanding the warning of the girl, we started out the following day for the source of the Huruena. The roads for the first part of the trip were fair, but as we drew farther away from Cuyapa, they became worse, and we bumped and jolted our way along for the next five hours until we came to the source of the Huruena. We unloaded the canoe and supplies and had the portage downstream for almost a mile before the stream became wide enough to use a canoe. Where does this tract of land your company least begin, senor? About 150 miles down the river, about 10 degrees south of the equator. That is an unexplored area, senor Prescott. We had a party take a look at it from a plane first, before the lease went through. But no one has ever been through the land underground. 
No one has ever really seen that area. That's right, Juan. How far do you think we can go before dark, Juan? Fifty, sixty miles, Senor Taylor. As long as we paddle with the current. How far have you been down? Oh, oh, oh don't worry, Senor. I have been down this river quite far. The current was swift, and we made excellent time that first afternoon. Towards evening, Juan spotted a good campsite, and we paddled into shore and set up camp. We had a good meal, and we were sitting around the fire when we heard the first drum. With good luck, we ought to make the edge of the trap your company leads by tomorrow night, Signore. Now that's when the work will really begin. You know, I'm... Listen. Drums. Oh, 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 do not be afraid, Signore. Where are they coming from? Somewhere down the river, I think. Listen, there's another one. Have you ever heard them before, Juan? Si, senor. Many times before. <laughs> but there is nothing to worry about. The way you look, one would think they were beating for you. The drums pounded throughout the night. I didn't sleep very well with that incessant throbbing beating against my ears. Towards morning, we were quiet, and I fell off to sleep. By six o'clock, we were up, had eaten, and were on the river. Rapids coming up, senores. Yeah, they sound pretty bad. They are bad ones. We must be very careful. I wish Bartell was down here. Look out, senores. Here we go. Look out. There's a submerged street bus just ahead. Ah. Oh, senor. Hey, we're heading for a rock. Hold on, senores. Ah. That is the worst of them, signore. I didn't think we'd ever get through those things alive. I was a little worried myself. No, it's not the time to worry, signore. <laughs> the rapids are nothing compared to what may lie ahead. What do you mean by that one? Oh, not a thing, signore. But who can tell what may happen? According to our map, we had reached the beginning of the company's tract of land. We made camp at a spot about ten degrees south of the equator. Good meal, Juan. Gracias, Senor Taylor. Yeah. According to the stories we heard, this is as far as anyone has ever penetrated down the Huruena. No one has ever gone beyond this. You are wrong in that, Senor Prescott. No one has ever gone beyond this point and lived. Many have gone beyond, and all of them have crossed into the land of their ancestors. That sounds like a threat, Juan. <laughs> Why should I threaten you, Senor Taylor? I don't know. The drums again. They have such a plaint of sound to them. Do they not, Senor? It's a plaint of nothing. They give me the creeps. I wonder why they never explored this section of Brazil. Many have tried. All have failed. You seem to know a lot about this area, Juan. Oh, a good deal, Senor Prescott. In this unexplored area is a race of people not lost to the world. What do you mean? What people? When Cortes conquered Mexico, he did not conquer all the Aztecs. Part of the nation followed Quidlahua down through Central America into South America. Into Brazil, senores. <laughs> into an unexplored part of Brazil. On the very edge of which our camp lies tonight. Are you serious, Juan? <laughs> Why should I lie, Senor Prescott? We stand close to death. The three of us. Listen. Yes, I heard that cry before. What is it? The call of Huitzilopochtli. The ancient war deity of the Aztecs. Huitzilopochtli calling into the night, ordering that the sacrifices be brought to him. That drum is pretty close to us. Quite close, Senor Prescott. And do you know what it is saying? No, what? It is saying that we come for the men of another age. We come to bring them back to the temple of Witch Lepochke. You mean they're out there in the dark? See, si. I'm getting out of here. I'm afraid not. Where did you get... That's my gun. How did you get it? <laughs> While you were sleeping last night, amigo. We are here, Witch Lepochke. We are here! What are you going to do with us? <laughs> you will run that soon, amigo. Hey, Mike, look. They must have been hidden behind the trees out there. Oh, Pastor! Chirana! Oh, Pastor! Chirana! 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 They have been waiting for us. 
We will go with them to the temple of which you approach, please. They didn't want to take any chance of our getting away, did they? They tied my hand so tightly, I think they stopped the circulation. Yeah, that's the way mine feel, too. Yeah. I read about these when I was still a kid. Do you know where we are? No. Cortez found them when he first went into Mexico. This is a Teocai, temple of the Aztecs. Don't you know those two towers at either side of this landing? The sacred images of the presiding deities. And those blocks of stone in front of the towers. Those are the sacrificial altars. Mike, we have to get out of here. Look, look. Coming up the stairs to the top here. It's Juan Tarico. But he's not wearing the clothes he wore before. He's wearing a scarlet robe. Yes, yeah, so I see. The robe of the sacrificial priest. Ah, <laughs> ah amigo. Are you enjoying our hospitality? What do you intend doing with us, Tarico? Don't you know? No. Have you looked over the side, amigos? Yes. And did you notice the people gathering? Yes. They have come to witness a ceremony. The altar of which Lepochli has been dry too long. What do you mean? That it has been some time since the high priest has made an offering to which Lepochli. And we're to be the offering. Is that right? That's right, amigos. <laughs> you are to be the offering. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Temple of Huitzilopochtli. We stood on the square at the top of the temple of Huitzilopochtli. Our hands were bound behind us. Before us stood Juan Tarico, who had offered to act as our guide. Only now he was attired in the ceremonial robes of the high priest. Yes, my friends. <laughs> you are to be the offerings. You dirty... No. You should not lose your temper, amigo. If you are nice, I will make sure your death is speedy. If you continue to act as you have in the past, I hesitate to say how long it will take for death to finally put its mantle on you. We should have taken the advice of the girl in Cuyaba. Oh, yes. The girl in Cuyaba. Orfadores Shilara! Orfadores Shilara! Let me go! Let me go! Let her go! go. Oh. Amigos, this is Maria Espanza, the girl who warned you about me. <laughs> I had some of my men bring her here. She will be the third offering. <laughs> and now I leave you. Until later. Adios, amigos. Lana! Marguerite! What happened, Maria? They came and took me that night. The night I spoke to you. Tarigo must have been watching. And they brought me here. What will they do with us? Kill us in the sacrificial ceremony. Oh, no. Maria, your hands are free. Untie us. What? Untie us. Maybe it'll give us a little more of a chance when the time comes. See, see, I will untie you. I wonder what they did with our gun. I don't know. They, they tie you very well, senor. Yes, I know. There. No. No, you, senor. I have to get some circulation back into the... Zero? Cut your wrist, senor. Yes, I know. Something brewing. Hurry up. Oh, yeah, it is done. It is done. Well, that feels better. Thanks, Maria. What can we do, senor? I don't know, but we're sitting ducks here. Let's try one of those towers. Come on. Right. Just got a glance over the side. There must be a thousand people down there surrounding the temple. And they're all waiting to see us die. Inside, hurry. Look, senor. Human skulls lining the walls of this place. The ancient Aztecs kept the skulls of their sacrifices. How many have died here? I wouldn't like to know. We're going to die here if we don't do something. Hey, look. Isn't that an entrance over there? Yes. Let's take a look. It is a stairway that leads down inside the temple. They're coming for us. The only thing we can do is take that stairway. Here. You take one of these torches. Right. I'll take the other. Maria, you stay right behind us. Yes, no. Let's go. I only hope we're not happening out of the frying pan into the fire. If we wait at certain death, at least we might have a chance this way. Oh, it is so, so dark in here. There's a landing just ahead. Careful now. Right. 
Put your torch a little higher, Fred. Hey, look. It's a room. If I'm not mistaken, right in the center, those are guns. Guns, guns. Let's take a look. Hey, but they're not our guns. Perhaps they are guns taken from the other men who came here. That must be it. Guns and ammunition. We have something now to fight with. Over on the other side of the room, the stairway continues. Will we take it, senor? Yes, we will. But first, we take the guns. All the guns and ammunition we can carry here. Yeah. Hurry. They'll probably figure that we came down here. Well, they slipped up and they left Maria's hands untied. I carry guns and ammunition, too. I cannot shoot, but I can load them for you. Good girl. How you fix mine? I have as many as I can carry. My pockets are full of bullets. Oh, yeah? I have five guns, and I carry this knapsack full of ammunition. And what's holding us back? You said it. Let's get going. Right. For almost an hour. When we came to the bottom of the stairs, I thought we'd come to an opening somewhere right away. No, I'm not so sure. I don't know where this tunnel is leading us. I think we're pretty close to an exit. I can feel the air moving. Do, do you think they are in back of us? I don't know. Oh, Torrigo will not be beaten this easily. I know that. Hey, look up ahead, huh? Isn't that moonlight up there? See, we are nearing the end of the passageway. I wonder where we'll be when we come out. I go the drums again. It's a different beat this time. Perhaps they say to look for us. Maybe. Say we're coming to the opening. Be careful when we step outside. You, you think maybe? I don't know. Well, we're here. Yes. And listen. We're close to the river. It looked like. Our camp was here. They must have come through the tunnel when they surrounded us. That must be it. I wonder if the canoe was still there. Let's take a look, shall we? Oh, I have a feeling that it... Do you think they follow us, Senor? No, Maria, I don't. Not after what happened. Uh, you know something? What? Tarigo seemed to be their leader. Yes, and as soon as he fell, they clustered around him. No, I don't think they'll be following us. Senor, huh? where do we go now? We'll go down the river till we come to a town. It'll be too hard getting back up. What about the company, Mike? I don't know about the company. But I'm not coming back here. It was too close for me. If they want to explore this country, they can send in someone else. I've come close enough to death at the temple of Huitzilopochtli. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas.
dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Man in Black. The wind. Where did it come from? It is always there when he wants to speak to me. It is the sound of his voice. You're not serious about this man, are you? Take it as you will, my good sir. Put your own interpretation upon the words I have spoken. Yes, master. I understand. What did you say? I answered him. What do you mean? The wind. The mocking sound of the wind is his voice. He has seen. He has looked into your minds and seen you. But he sees only one woman. One woman in both of your minds. First, she shall die. Then, you. Both of you. Yes, Master. I hear and obey. (laughs) In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Man in Black. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Man in Black. We live in a world which borders at times on the unreal. A world that cannot explain the various phenomena which seem to have neither beginning nor end. That subtle, fleeting power of perception which reveals itself to a human being only at infrequent intervals throughout his life. That sudden, sharp feeling that danger or death is near. These things mankind cannot explain. This sixth sense of warning never appears when we go about our everyday tasks, but only when we are faced with an insurmountable problem, imminent and deadly peril. Such is the tale of the man in black. It was a cool, quiet night. That night it began. For some reason, Brian had insisted that we take a stroll in the park. That's late, Brian. Almost 11.30. I know, David. Beautiful night, isn't it? Yes. A good night for sleeping. I like to come out here about this hour. It seems to give me a sense of belonging. That sounds strange coming from you. No, I'm quite serious, Dave. I feel no relation with the rest of the world. But out here in the park, listening to the sound of the crickets, or footsteps on the walk, I feel as if I belong. You understand what I'm trying to say? I think so. Another thing strange, but I have a feeling. A feeling that something is wrong, that something is going to happen. What do you mean? Something inside of me. I almost know that something will happen that will change the entire course of my life. Oh, I think you're just imagining. A woman coming towards us. Yes, I see her. I wonder if... Man in black. Have you seen that man in black? I'm sorry, but we haven't Just a minute, David. Let her talk. Have you seen him? Have you seen the man in black? No, I'm afraid not. Oh, I thought perhaps you could help me. I must find him. Well, we haven't seen anyone out here tonight except you. The man in black. I must find the man in black. What does she mean? I don't know. The man in black. Maybe we ought to follow her. Now, let her go. That's strange. What? It was so still before, and now a wind seems to have sprung up from nowhere. <laughs> Listen. She went off in that direction. Let's take a look. I wonder why she screamed. Well, she couldn't have gotten too far. Look up ahead. That must be her. Lady, is anything... What's the matter with her? She's dead. Dead? That's right. I wonder who he is. Who? The man in black. the police and told them everything we knew. There were no marks on the woman's body, nothing to indicate the manner in which she died. 
The police were inclined to believe she died from natural causes. But Brian and I felt there was something behind her death that concerned the man in black. I didn't see Brian for almost two weeks. At the end of that time, I received a call from Carol Deming, Brian's bride-to-be. Hello? David, I hope I didn't disturb you. Oh, of course not, Carol. David, Brian wants you to come to dinner tonight. Any particular reason? I think so. And what is it, do you know? No, I'm not sure. David, I'm frightened. Brian's been so, so strangely mysterious lately. He seems obsessed with only one idea. Something about... A man in black. Not once during dinner did Brian mention the subject. It was perhaps an hour after the meal. The three of us were sitting in the library when he brought up the subject of the man in black. Remember that woman we saw in the park, David? Yes, of course. She aroused your interest, didn't she? Yes. She did the same thing to me. Only I did something about it. Brian... I wish you'd forget about this. I can't, darling. I know how you feel about it. I did my best to forget it, but I couldn't. Still, don't you think that... My mind will never be quiet until I get to the bottom of this. Maybe the woman we saw was upset. It was quite evident, David. I made some inquiries about this supposed man in black just to see if anyone knew anything about him. And? And I discovered that no person alive was described in that way. Well, then you can forget about it. I said, anyone alive. What do you mean by that, Brian? The man she was talking about has been dead for 30 years. Well, then, that ends your investigation, doesn't it? I'm afraid not. Why not, Brian? When I've traced down every last clue about him, only then will I be satisfied. Well, who was he, this man in black? An immigrant to this country, David. He's buried in a mausoleum in a private estate about 40 miles north of the city. You mean he lived here? No, he didn't. It was his dying wish that a mausoleum be built and his body placed there after his death. No one knows where he came from. Well, why should he pick this location? I don't know, David, but I intend to find out. How? I understand there's a caretaker for the estate. I intend going to him to learn the story. When? Tomorrow. Do you mind if I come along? Of course not. What about you, Carol? No. I don't want to go with you, and I wish you wouldn't go either. There's nothing to be afraid of. Are you sure, Brian? Are you really sure? Ah! What's the matter, Carol? Over there. At the window. There's nothing there. Oh, but there was. There was something over there. I couldn't see it clearly, Brian, but it was there. The grotesque figure of a man's face floating outside the window. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Man in Black. Neither Brian nor I saw anything outside the window, and we put it down to Carol's imagination. She asked us again not to go out there, but Brian insisted, and in the end, won out. The following day, in the late afternoon, we started out to the estate. This is the road that leads into the estate. It seems so, so lonely out here. Yes, doesn't it? Almost as if this little area was set apart from everything else. Maybe it's the day. Gray, overcast. Well, that all adds to it, of course. Uh, up ahead, is that it? Yes. Well, oh, that one building with that semicircle of trees behind it. I thought you said he was buried in a mausoleum. Yes. You mean that? I don't like this, Brian. Are you afraid? Maybe. Look, there's an old man standing in the doorway. Looks as if he were waiting for us. I wouldn't be surprised if he was. Well... Let's go meet him. Uh, maybe we ought to go back. Of course not. We've already come this far. We'd be crazy to turn back now. Good day, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Please well, come to find out. No need to tell me. Just follow me, please. He said you would be here about this time. Who? I'll tell you later. So, so dark in here. Your eyes will become accustomed to it. The darkness. Just come with me. What do you think? I don't know. You said something? No. No, nothing at all. This is the room. Right in here. You wish to learn of the man in black. 
Am I correct? Yes. Can't we have more light? The candles burning in here don't throw off much light. I'm sorry, but that would be against his orders. Whose orders? He who walks by night. What can you tell us about this man in black? Quite a good deal. The man who lies in a stone coffin in the center of this room. Died some 30 years ago. Yet his body is as it was when he was alive. Perhaps you would like to look at him. No. Uh, I'm sorry. You ought to look at on him. After all, he has laid claim to you already. What do you mean? The woman you met some time ago. She was the first link in the chain. The last in her chain, but the first in yours. They who search for the man in black shall die. But not before they see the one they love most in this world die first. The wind. Where did it come from? It is always there when he wants to speak to me. It is the sound of his voice. You're not serious about this man, are you? Take it as you will, my good sir. Put your own interpretation upon the words I have spoken. Yes, master. I understand. What did you say? I answered him. What do you mean? The wind. The mocking sound of the wind is his voice. He has seen. He has looked into your minds and seen you. But he sees only one woman. One woman in both of your minds. First, she shall die. Then you. Both of you. Yes, master. I hear and obey. <laughs> that voice. Where's that voice coming from? From his coffin. Stop now. Yes. He has stopped laughing. Your meeting is over now. But you will see him again quite soon. Remember to look for the man in black. The old man showed us out of the mausoleum. So cold and lifeless. So frightening to behold. We sat silent for some minutes as we drove back. But then Brian broke the unnatural quiet. I didn't know you felt that way about Carol. Oh, he was mistaken, Brian. You're not a very convincing liar, David. It's true, isn't it? Yes. I'm sorry. Forget it. All right. What do you think? About the story the old man told us? I hope he's crazy. What if he isn't? Then I... I don't know. I just don't know. When we get back to town, Dave, we'll pick up Carol and head for my place. Why? It's strange, but... Something tells me that what the old man said true. From the back of my mind, I also knew that what the old man had said was true. What bothered me was that we knew we were doomed to die, but not from which direction death would come, nor what form it would take. We phoned Carol from a little roadhouse just outside the city. She was waiting for us when we pulled up in front of the apartment building in which she lived. And there it was only a short drive to Brian's place. And that's the story, Carol. I... I can't believe it. You know, sitting here in your house, Brian, with the lights on like this and everything so normal, I find it difficult to believe myself. Perhaps we were mistaken, Brian. Maybe nothing will happen. Do you really believe that, David? I'm trying to. Just a minute. What time was it when you were out there? Oh, it must have been about five. Why? Well, maybe it was my imagination, but just about that time, I heard someone laughing. A voice came from behind me. I turned around to look, and no one was there. It could have been the laugh we heard. But we were there. How could she possibly have heard anything at the precise moment we did? The old man said it was his voice issuing forth from the coffin, the voice of the man in black. No! What's that? It's just thunder, Carol. It's been threatening to rain all day. Every time the old man said he heard the voice, did you notice how the wind would spring up? There was another sound, too. I don't know what it was. It was there. I'll never forget it. Well, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to hire bodyguards, take protective measures against anyone getting near... Listen. The wind. And that sound we heard in the mausoleum. Where's it coming from? I don't know. Ah! Carol, what's wrong? What's the matter? 
There's something at the window. Hey, terrible twisted face. Oh, it's do something. It's gone. The window's broken. Ted was looking in at us, watching the three of us. And those eyes, those terrible eyes. I'm afraid, Brian. Brian, you have to do something before it's too late. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Man in Black. A moment before, the three of us had been witness to an amazing and terrifying sight. For outside the window, we had seen a face, distorted and twisted. The fire burning in its eyes bespoke death. I'm afraid, Brian. Brian, you have to do something before it's too late. Was that the same face you saw before, Carol? Yes, only now it was much clearer. What are we going to do, Brian? Maybe we should call the police. They probably wouldn't believe us. I used a detective agency a few months ago. I'm going to call them. Telephone number should be here in my desk. Now, take it easy, Carol. But it's just that I'm so frightened. We'll be all right as soon as we can get some guards here. Bradford, is that you? This is Brian Connolly. I want every available man you have to come out here tonight. You know my address. Yes, thank you. They'll be out here as soon as possible. Is Radcliffe coming? No, but we'll have eight men here in the house to give us protection. We'll stay here, the three of us. That way we'll have a better chance. Oh, if only you hadn't been so interested in what that woman had to say, Brian. But I was, and I'm sorry. That's over and done with, Carol. I'm as much to blame as he is. Oh, I suppose we all are. There's nothing we can do except wait, Carol. But I'm sure the man in black won't call on us again. Not when we have help. Gray. Yes. What do you want? I'm just checking up on things, sir. Have all the men been posted? Yes. It's rather dark out here in the hallway. You shouldn't be out here by yourself, sir. I'm just as safe here as I would be with the others. Probably. It's so dark, I can't see your face very well. It's just a face, sir. Nothing else. You seem very nervous. Do you believe the old man's story? I prefer not to, but it is rather frightening, isn't it? Yes. Well, I'll continue on my rounds. Good night, sir. Probably see you again before morning. The guard somehow disturbed me. There was something unusual about him. In the gloomy hallway, I couldn't see his face. Of course, in the shadows, it was difficult to tell what color his clothes were. David. You... you startled me. Are you alone down here? Yes. Where's Carol? She had a headache. Went upstairs for a nap. Well, she shouldn't be alone. There's a man stationed outside her door. It's so quiet in the house. One of the guards just passed me in the hallway asked me if I believed in the story the old man told us. The guards don't know anything about the story. Are you sure? Of course I am. The only thing they've been told is to watch for a man in black clothing. Why should the guard know anything? Did you see his face? What was he wearing? It was too dark out there in the hallway. Of course, he might have heard something about it. No, he couldn't have. I didn't even tell Radcliffe the story. But how did he know it? Unless he was the man in black. There was something about him. It seems so strange. I, I can't place it, but he frightened me. We better search the house. The wind again. That sound. He is here in the house. It was Carol's voice. And that man wasn't a guard. Come on. Guards. Guards. Nobody answered. Carol, are you all right? Carol. Anything has happened to her? The door to her room. It's open. Carol. She's dead. Just like the woman in the pot. She can't be. What happened to the guard outside our door? What happened to all of the guards in the house, Brian? I haven't seen a single one on our way up here. 
Will they ever start this? We'd better call the police. Is there a phone up here? No, no extensions up here. You phone. I'll stay here with Carol. It won't do you any good to stay up here. Brian, she's dead. You better come with me. I guess you're right. Oh, Brian, I'm sorry. I should have known that the man in the hall... Not your was... fault. I'm to blame. I started this. I can't understand what happened to the guard. Whoever he is. Whatever he is. He has a power, David. Something evil and malignant. To send the guard to it would be a simple matter for him. You can use the phone in the library. You look all done in, Brian. You'd better sit down in that chair over there. All right. I'll never forgive myself. I hope they can get here in time. I don't know what will be done. Yeah, that's strange. What? I'm not getting any dial tone. Something's wrong with the phone. Oh. What's the matter, Brian? Nothing. I can't get to the police. The lines must be down. Yes, they must be. I thought I heard you moan when I was trying to get to the police. You were mistaken. It's rather dark in here, and with you sitting in that chair with your back to me, your voice sounds different. Does it? Yes. Stay where you are. Something's wrong with you. What is it? Don't you know? No. Perhaps you should look at my face. You're not Brian. The man in the hallway, you're... The man in black. What... What happened to... Your friend. We exchanged places for a while. You mean he's dead? That's correct. As you will be soon. Don't come any closer to me. Are you afraid? Why don't you run? I can't move. Now, you see him. The man in black, face to face. And now, you die. <laughs> Mocking sound of the wind is his voice. The last link in the chain has been broken. Death will strike at those who search for the man in black. For he is dead. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths with a veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Treasure of Kublai Khan. It would be impossible for him to still be alive. What was that? What? The sound I just heard. Only the call of the jackal, Miss Carlton. It frightened me. It is a brother to the wolf. They say its call means misfortune. There it is again. Take it easy, Marion. I don't know why I'm so nervous. Unless... Unless what? I had that 
same dream last night, Brad. But it was just a dream, Miriam. I know, but... But it was so real. Even when I woke up, I... I felt that I'd actually been there. That you and Mr. Hussein were really dead. Fantasy will present The Treasure of Kublai Khan in just a moment. And now for our story, The Treasure of Kublai Khan. I first heard of the legendary treasure the night I met Abdul Hussein. Marion had invited me to the dinner that evening. Her brother, Brad Carlton, had some business with Hussein, and he too was invited for dinner. It was after the meal, when we had adjourned to the living room, that I first heard the tale. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Abdul, I imagine some of our customs do seem strange to it you. It is quite strange, my friend. <laughs> when do you intend your return trip to Iran, Mr. Hussein? Well, I shall spend another two months in your country, Miss Carlton. Then I shall be forced to return to mine. I hope you have received a good impression of us. Oh, I would say I have. Though I will never understand why you people must have everything done so quickly. You don't enjoy life. Always running from one place to another, trying to save time. <laughs> I guess that's just the way we are. I shall never understand that. Abdul, when you were in my office today, you told me a little tale about Kublai Khan. I think Alan and Mary will be interested in hearing it. Oh, I am not so sure they would. Oh, no, please, tell us the story. Oh, we'd like to hear it. If you insist. Do either of you know much about Kublai Khan? Hmm. Just that he was the ruler of Mongolia and the Mongol Empire. I'm afraid I don't know much more than that. It is amazing to me that we tend to remember only one or two facts about a man after he has been dead for some time. Yet, their stories are there in the dry pages of the history books. And if one can read between the lines, the man comes alive. Kublai Khan was a fascinating person. Under him, the empire reached its greatest heights. To his treasure houses came the wealth and the money of the conquered peoples. I wonder whatever happened to all that treasure. Oh, it was probably spent or destroyed. You are right to a point. What do you mean? Most of the treasure was naturally spent or destroyed, especially after Kublai's death and the struggle for power which followed his demise. But there is one treasure catch, according to legend, which was lost, and to this day remains intact. Well, you can't be serious, Mr. Hussein. But I am, my dear Miss Carlton. Where is it hidden? <laughs> that is the only barrier which remains to be overcome. No one knows where it is hidden. The general area is known, yes, but the specific location is not. Well, what general area? It is said that the lost treasure of Kublai Khan lies somewhere between the Deshti Keber Desert and the Elburz Mountains. But that's in your country. The seat of government for Kublai Khan was in northeastern China. So it was. Well, why wouldn't Kublai Khan keep his treasure where he could get to it easily? Why would he hide it almost 3,000 miles away? I shall answer your question with a question. Why would he not only be interested in northeastern China? Why would he send his emissary, Marco Polo, to the far corners of his empire? No. Kublai Khan's interests were large. His armies had to be paid, and they ranged all over his vast empire, guarding its borders. Why would he not hide treasure in old Persia? Hmm, I didn't think about it that way. Yet, it is quite logical. Shall I tell you what I know of the legend? Oh, yes. please do. I'm sure they'd like to hear it. Shortly after he founded the Yuan dynasty in the year 1260, Kublai Khan had reason to believe that an attempt would be made to overthrow him. Kublai Khan was not sure whether the attempt would succeed or not, but if the attempt were made and was successful, then Kublai Khan planned to escape to Persia, from whence he would be able to direct an attack against the usurper. Accordingly, 
he sent for one of his ablest generals. You sent for me, O Khan? Yes, General Ling. You are to take enough men and supplies to transport the Shangtu treasure to Persia. There you will hide it and guard it. As you order, magnificent. When the treasure has been hidden, you are to kill all but a few of your most trusted men so that no one will know the hiding place. If need be, destroy them all and guard the treasure yourself until such time as I send to you. Yes, O oh great God. Remember, General Ling, if you must, destroy everyone so that no enemies will stand at our backs with their daggers poised. It shall be as you desire, O Khan. Not one will escape alive. The treasure was transported to Persia. True to his word, General Ling picked a few of his followers and together they destroyed the others. And then, one by one, Ling himself killed those that were left. Through the years, Ling guarded the treasure, and those who came too close to the hiding place saw a man on a horse in the distance, who rode towards them at a gallop. He loomed up before them, his great sword swinging, and death was their reward for stumbling out of the treasure. Never did Kublai Khan send to him, yet Ling remained faithful to his trust. When the great Khan died, no one knew where Ling was, and the treasure became lost. Ling was never heard from again. Is this story true, or, or are you just making it up to, to amuse us? I assure you, Miss Carlton, this story is true. Has anyone ever tried to find the treasure? Oh, yes, many have tried but with no success. Then, actually, there's no authentication for the story. I have reason to believe there is. Why? Recently, just before I left my country, I came into possession of this. Mm -hmm. well, what is it? It is a copy of an old map that I discovered in one of the caves near the mountains. Hmm. Then you've actually looked for the treasure. Yes. I stumbled onto the cave quite by accident. It had once been inhabited because I found ancient weapons and cooking utensils. On the wall of the cave, there was drawn the lines you see before you. That I copied down on this piece of parchment. I believe this map will lead me to the treasure of Kublai Khan. And you intend searching for it when you return to your country? Hmm? Yes, I do. No, I wouldn't mind going with you. Neither would I. Then why do you not come with me? Why don't we? Do you think we could, Brad? Well, we could arrange it, I suppose. I know. I could take a leave of absence. So could I. Well, I could get it away easily enough. Of course. And if we do find it, the treasure belongs to you, Mr. Hussein. There will be enough for all of us. Enough to make us rich beyond our wildest dreams. Then let's do it. Right. And whether we find anything or not, the, the trip will be worth it. There, There is one more thing I must tell you. And that is... When I said that many had tried and none had succeeded, I should have added that many have died or been killed in their attempt to locate the treasure. For it is said that General Ling still guards the treasure of the great Khan, that he still waits for word from Kublai Khan, and that he brings death to any who stumble upon the treasure. <laughs> Return to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of The Treasure of Kublai Khan in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of The Treasure of Kublai Khan. We were sure that the warning Abdul Hussein had given us was only a natural outgrowth of the legend that had grown up concerning the lost treasure of Kublai Khan. Even Hussein was dubious of the last part of his story. In the two months which followed, we cleared ourselves with the authorities, obtained visas, took our shots, and were ready to embark on the search for the treasure of Kublai Khan. It was the day before our departure that Marion mentioned her dream. Well, what's the matter, Marion? You should be excited and happy. We're leaving tomorrow morning. I know, but, well, I just can't help it. Is, 
Is Abdul coming here tonight? No, we're meeting him at the airport tomorrow. Anything wrong? I don't know. It, it's just that I had a dream last night. It frightened me. And I can't seem to shake it. Well, what was it about? Well, do you remember that story that Abdul told us about General Ling riding his horse and killing everyone who came across the treasure? Yes. Well, the dream I had last night, it... It seemed so real. Hmm. Well, tell us about it. Well, I... I dreamt that we were over there. we just crossed the desert. Ahead of us, the mountains rose up into the sky. I heard hoofbeats. And I looked up and, and saw a man on horseback riding toward us. He reined in and pointed to us. Go back, he said. Go back before it is too late. And then everything became confused. I, I dreamt that we stood there before the treasure, the four of us. And suddenly, I heard the hoofbeats again. And he rode up beside us and said, I warned you, now it is too late. And then he, he raised his sword over our heads. It started coming down and, and I screamed. And then I woke up. And then what happened? Well, that was all. Except that when I fell back to sleep, I, I dreamed I saw pictures. Pictures? Yes, like, like photographs. They flashed before me one by one. I, I saw the four of us standing before the treasure, and then the man with the sword in his hand, and Hussein lying on the ground, dead. And... And what else? I saw you, Brad, lying on the ground, and you were dead. <laughs> it was just a dream, Marion. You were probably excited last night when you went to bed. We've been all been living for the day when we start out. That's why you had that dream last night. I don't know. Maybe it, it was a warning of some kind. It was only a dream, Marion. That's right. It's just a dream, nothing else. <laughs> Your brother intends to live a long time. Still, it, it seems so real. It, it's so real. Telling us about her dream seemed to relieve Marion, and by the following morning, we had all forgotten about it. We had beautiful weather all through the flight. We stopped first in Africa, changed planes, and then flew over Libya, Egypt, the Red Sea, Saudi Arabia, across the Persian Gulf, and landed finally at Bandar Shapur, perhaps a hundred miles away from Abadan. We went by car to Isfahan. There we picked up a guide and camels and started across the desert. We traveled slowly, being able to make only about 30 miles a day. Eight days after we left Isfahan, we caught sight of the Elbers Mountains. We were seated around the campfire. Uh, we have not much farther to go. We should reach the cave sometime late tomorrow. The cave? Yes, I want to go there first to make sure the map is absolutely correct. From there, we will follow the map to its treasure. What if the map doesn't lead us to the treasure? Well, that is possible, I know. If that is the case, then I shall begin all over again. I have searched for Kublai Khan's treasure for ten years. I shall continue to search for it. <laughs> the guide you hired isn't very talkative. Uh, you are foreigners. He is afraid of you. does not trust you. But he is a good man. I hope we do find the treasure, Abdul. Oh, I'd hate to go back empty-handed. I have a feeling that we will. And the stories about General Ling? You mean that he still guards the treasure? Yes. They are not true, of course. It would be impossible for him to still be alive. What was that? What? The sound I just heard. Only the call of the jackal, Miss Carlton. Oh, it frightened me. It is a brother to the wolf. They say its call means misfortune. There it is again. Relax, Marion. We're all on edge. I suppose so. What was that? The camels, Miss Carlton. The call of the jackal makes them nervous. Take it easy, Marion. Oh, I don't know why I'm so nervous. Unless... Unless what? I... I had that same dream again last night, Brad. It was just a dream, Marion. I know, but it was so real. 
But even when I woke up, I, I felt that I'd actually been there. That you and Mr. Hussein were really dead. I must admit that the howling of the distant jackal even made me nervous. Throughout the night, the creature cried out to the heavens as if it were warning us that death would be the only treasure we would find. The following afternoon, toward sunset, found us at the cave. This is the cave. Follow me. I was in such a hurry last time, I could not be sure that my map was accurate. We must be sure, for that will save us much trouble. Shine your flashlights around. Hmm. Someone lived here, all right. Seems like we've stepped into another world from out of the past. Shine your lights over on that wall, if you will. Yes. There. You can see what I copied down. I will check my map against it. I wonder who lived here. Someone long since dead and buried, Marion. You know, it is a trifle frightening to be in here in this cave. Where someone lived generations, probably centuries ago. Yes, I thought so. What is it, Abdul? My map was wrong. In my haste, I made a mistake. However, now it is corrected. Are we going on today? No, no. It is much too late. The sun will set soon. We will continue tomorrow. We will camp here for tonight. Not, not in the cave. Why not? Well, not in here. Outside, yes, but, but not in here. We will camp outside, Miss Carlton. Yes, of course. Huh? It's just that... Well, what's the matter, Marion? I thought I heard something. I didn't hear anything, nor did I. Brad? No, Marion. I didn't hear a thing. Then I... I must have been wrong. What... What did you think you heard? A voice. A soft voice saying, Go back before it is too late. What uh, time is it? Almost 11. Well, Marion had the right idea. She went to bed almost an hour and a half ago. Mm. Well, I think it is time for me to retire also. What uh, happened to Ali, the guide? Well, I imagine he retired some time ago. I thought I saw him go into the cave. When? A short while ago. It is possible he went in, but why he should go, that I cannot understand. If, unless it is something that... That was a scream. It came from the cave. We'd better take a look. Right, come on. All right. Oh. Uh. Ollie, are you all right? He does not answer. Well, we'll see what's wrong in a moment. Oh. There he is. Oh. What's wrong? Just a moment. Well? He's dead. What? Yes. He's dead. Go. Listening to the tale of The Treasure of Kublai Khan on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story entitled The Treasure of Kublai Khan. We stood looking down at the prostrate form of the guide stretched out on the floor of the cave. We had heard his scream just a moment before, and we had run from the camp into the cave, only to find him dead. Go back, lest death be my reward. What was that? I don't know. I heard something. Yes, so did I. Shine your light around. No one seems to be in here. Then where did that voice come from? Maybe we were mistaken, perhaps. It was just the sound of the wind we heard. No, it was a definite warning. It said, go back, lest death be thy reward. I am not going to turn back now. Not after all these years. No one's asking you to go back, Abadol. What are we going to do with him? Bury him here. And then in the morning, we can start out as early as possible. We should reach the treasure by tomorrow evening. 
I have warned you. Seems to be leading us back into the desert. We are traveling in the right direction. The treasure is located at the Lost Oasis. I hope you're right, Abdul. I know I am right. We're only a few miles from the mountains. But we were at the foot of the mountain before, Abdul. The oasis lies west and south of the mountains, and that is the way we are heading. Does that wind seem to be any stronger than usual? A little. Do you think it might be blowing up a sandstorm? Uh, it is quite possible. We must make the oasis within the next few hours. It should be just up ahead. I can't see a thing in the storm. Unless we have gotten off the trail, we should be at the oasis any minute now. I hope you're right, Abdul. Isn't that something up there? I can't see. Yes, it is the oasis. We made it. After ten years of searching, I have found the treasure. Somewhere in that oasis, my friends, is the treasure of Kublai Khan. getting dark. Yes. The night is upon us. Maybe we ought to wait until the morning comes. No, we've come this far. I want to see the treasure now. I sense that we are getting very close to it. Look, up ahead. <sighs> yes. Yes, that is it. Be careful. Ah, we have found it. We have found the treasure of Kublai Khan. <sighs> wait, it's like a small oriental temple. There's no doorway, just an arch opening into the building. It's... Let's go inside. Yes. All right. Shine your flashlights around. Oh, the whole building is covered with, with open trunks and bags and gold and jewels. The wealth and grandeur of an empire now dead. We don't belong here. I feel that, that we're looking at a dead world. The night is upon us. And the jackal is telling the creatures out of the desert... That we are here. Why don't we go back to our camp? Just a minute. I want to take some of these with me. I want to tell myself this isn't just a dream. Put them back, Brad. What's the matter with you, Marion? Maybe you ought to put them back, Brad. I think Marion's right. This is the treasure of a dead world. It should remain dead. You mean we should leave a treasure here and go back empty-handed? Don't be a fool. Uh, and I shall take some, too. Uh, 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 yes, I do. Uh, the jewels we hold in our hands are enough in themselves to make us rich. But all of it is ours. <laughs> all of it. Yes, so <laughs> Who's that? It's Alan. Oh, I, I was afraid it would be someone else. Who? General Ling. I couldn't sleep. Neither could I. That's why I came out here. Listen. Yes, I heard it too. Sounds like, like someone riding a horse. Marion, look, over there. In the moonlight, there, there's a man on a horse riding toward our camp. It's just like the dream I had. Abdul! I heard something out here. Yes. So did I. There's a man on a horse riding towards our camp. Well, maybe someone else has found the treasure. We must stop him. Yes. Let's go. Yes. Brad, oh, yes. come back. Abdul, don't be a fool. Brad! I'm going out. You're him. staying right here. The man on the horse has a sword. Look out, Brad! Look out! He's the sword! He's... Ah! Dead. Both of them. Yes. It, it was just like the dream. Just like the dream. We should never have come here. Listen, he's coming back. What are we going to do? We'll wait here for him. There's nothing else we can do. I warn you. Still, you did not heed my warning. The two of you are free to return to your own land. The other two coveted the treasure of the great Khan, and so I brought death to them. Leave now. Leave this place. And wipe from your minds all thoughts of the treasure. For I must guard the treasure of Kublai Khan until he sends for me. 
Those who seek the treasure will find the way. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Automaton. Over here is what I call its brain. Put the power on, Elizabeth. Yes, Father. I've only begun on the binary system, but watch. Sitting up. Yes. It's getting down off the table. And now you'll see a sight that no one else has ever seen before. It's walking around the laboratory. Yes, you're witnessing the first movements of a new creation, superior to man in that it will never tire, a servant to man, for that will be its place in the future. A machine that looks like a man and will be able to think like one. The Hall of Fantasy will present the automaton in just a moment. The Automaton. I first met Dr. Eric Ziegler at the conference on scientific research. I knew of him, of course. His name was famous throughout the world as one of the foremost experts on automatic control. It was the closing session of the conference when he made his now famous speech. And in conclusion, gentlemen, may I say that mankind can expect his technological advance to continue. He can look forward to the future in the secure knowledge that his life will become easier and longer through the advances we make that he will be free to direct his energies towards the conquering of new frontiers, bringing him closer to the day when he will stand alone over all the universe. Bravo! Bravo! His speech so aroused me that I couldn't help making my way to the speaker's platform, pushing my way through the crowd which surrounded him in order to congratulate him. Congratulations, Dr. Ziegler. Dr. Ziegler? Dr. Yes, Ziegler? yes. My name is Drake Sheridan. I just wanted to tell you I thought your speech was the best thing I've ever heard. I take that as a compliment coming from you, Dr. Sheridan. I know about your work. Oh, nothing at all compared to yours, sir. And Dr. Sheridan, I'd like to talk to you further. Now, why don't you come to my house this evening? What time? Uh, after dinner, about 8.30. Here's my card. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, you'll be there? Of course. I'll see you then. Yes? I uh, came to see Dr. Ziegler. Oh, your name? Drake Sheridan. Oh, yes. He's been expecting you. Won't you come in? Thank you. Just follow me. Was the most interesting effect of all... A new paragraph. Uh, the success of the automaton of which I am speaking 
is uh, dependent upon the excellence of the brain I can give him. Uh, my work has become so... Dr. Sheridan is here, Father. Oh, oh, excuse me. I do hope you'll forgive me, Dr. Sheridan. Of course, I sir. I was dictating my report on a project on which I am now working. Please be seated. And before I forget, this is my daughter, Elizabeth. How do you do? My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, drink, perhaps, Dr. Sheridan? Yes, I uh, I could stand one. Yes, any particular preference? No, no. Uh, would you do the honors, Elizabeth? Of course, Father. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sheridan, perhaps you're wondering why I asked you to come here. I uh, have been, but I consider it a privilege and an honor to be here. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment, but it wasn't necessary. You may be interested to know that I've followed your career quite closely. And from what I've gathered, you're a very intelligent young man. Well, thank you, Dr. Ziegler. I'm not complimenting you to make you feel comfortable, Dr. Sheridan. I mean what I say. Exactly why did you ask me here, Dr. Ziegler? Uh, to talk to you. To see what kind of a person you are. And here are your drinks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my dear. That's just right, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sheridan, I'm going to be completely frank with you. I am working on a private project financed with my own money, completely divorced from my work at the Research Institute. Mm -hmm. My daughter has been helping me with this work, but unfortunately she does not have the knowledge nor the training to be of anything more than elementary assistance. I see. I am interested in finding an assistant who will devote his full time with me to the work I am doing. You mean you intend to leave the Institute? Yes, yes. My work is finished there, and besides, I want to devote more time to this particular project of which I'm speaking. What's the nature of your work? Automatic control, of course. Uh, would you be interested in working with me? Well, it's a great honor, sir. I will make it worth your while. Well, I'd like to know exactly what you're working on before I make any decision. I believe I can trust you. I I have a building some miles outside of the city which serves as my own personal research laboratory. Uh, we might as well drive out there. That is, if you're interested. Why, well, certainly am. Uh, good, good. Uh, Elizabeth, get the car from the garage, please. We'll drive out tonight. <laughs> Well, you certainly have it well equipped, Dr. Ziegler. I wanted to show you that you would be working with only the finest of equipment. Who's there? Uh, what's that? Oh, that's the watchman. It's nothing to worry about, Bart. Oh, it's you, Dr. Ziegler. I didn't hear you come in. It's all right. We'll check out with you when we leave. All right, sir. Uh, will you open the door, Elizabeth? Of course. All right, let's go in. I'll put on the lights. Now you'll see what I've been working on for the past year. That sheet-draped figure on the table over there, what is it? My newest research project in automatic control. But what uh, you'll see, you'll see. It looks like a human body underneath that sheet. Not quite. Here, I'll pull back the sheet. No, it isn't a human body. That's correct. What do you think of it, Sheridan? What do you think of my automaton? Is it finished? Not yet, but soon, with your help. A mechanical man, a robot shaped exactly like a human being. What better form could I give him? After all, our own bodies evolved to what we are today. Why should I attempt to improve on nature? What do you intend doing with, with him when you finish? Tell him, Elizabeth. Well, this automaton will be able to do all of the hard and painstaking work of mankind with, without ever getting tired. It can fight his wars. It, it can be the first to explore outer space. It can free mankind to direct his energies to, to other channels. I don't know. Oh, come, come, Sheridan. You look at the automaton as if you thought he was some Frankenstein monster. Believe me, this is the farthest thing from that imaginary creature. This is a work of science. This is not a monster created from the dark recesses of someone's imagination. This is our key to the future. We'll return to the Hall of Fantasy and the tale of the automaton in just a moment. 
Back now to the Hall of Fantasy and the tale of the Automaton. Dr. Eric Ziegler, his daughter, and I stood looking down at the metallic figure lying on the table before us. In all respects, it resembled a man, a metal and plastic man, created by the genius of Ziegler. This is our key to the future. This automaton will free man from labor. Let him develop his mind to the fullest. How much longer do you think you'll have to work before it's finished? I can't tell. That's why I need you to help me set up the automatic self-regulation of its brain. Then you haven't developed the system of feedback yet? No. As you are aware, that is the basic machine of all self-regulating systems of automatic control. A man's mind is a complex creation. The mind of the automaton must also be complex in order that it can do the work of a man, in order that it can think and regulate itself. Why don't you show him what you've accomplished so far in the feedback system? All right. Now, over here is what I call its brain. Uh, put the power on, Elizabeth. Yes, Father. I've only begun on the binary system, but watch. It's moving. Sitting up. Yes. It's getting down off the table. And now you'll see a sight that no one else has ever seen before. It's walking around the laboratory. Yes. You're witnessing the first movements of a new creation, superior to man, in that it will never tire. Servant of man. For that will be its place in the future. A machine that looks like a man will be able to think like one. I shall return him to the table now. It's climbed back up on the table. And it's lying down again. All right. Turn off the power, Elizabeth. Well, Sheridan, what do you think now? I'm afraid I don't know what to think. Will you work with me? I... Oh, yes. Who wouldn't jump at the chance? Of course I will. Good, good. You understand, of course, that the feedback system and the binary scale are still in their elementary stages. When the brain, the, the automatic control, is finished, it will fit inside the automaton's body and head. That's correct. There will be controls on the robot's chest to set the automatic control to working and another to stop the machine if it needs to be repaired. Of course, our largest task will be to develop a complete automatic self-regulatory system to fit inside the robot's body. As soon as you can be free... Which should be in about two weeks. Good. Then we shall begin work on the final stages that will lead to the completion of the automaton. Rather than completely sever my relations with the organization for which I worked, I took an extended leave of absence. There were living quarters in the laboratory in the country. Ziegler shut down his house in the city, and he and his daughter and I moved our belongings to the laboratory in order to devote every possible minute to our work. Not only was Ziegler intent on having the automaton think for itself, but he was also insistent that the robot be able to talk. To those ends, we went to work. If we were right in our calculations, the amplifier and receiver we have built into the mechanism will convert our words into electrical impulses, which in turn will activate a response from the automaton. Those responses themselves will be electrical impulses, which will be converted into words. Well, why don't we try it and see, Eric? We might as well, I suppose. After all, the automatic control is almost finished. We only have the more complex reactions to set in the binary scale. All right. Turn the control on his chest. Right. It's on. We'll see what happens. I order you to sit up. S sitting up? Yes. Uh, jump down to the floor. I want you to answer me with your voice. Uh, what have you been created for? To kill. That's not the right reaction. What was that? Correction. To work. That's right. We must have made a mistake somewhere along the line in the reactions we set up. That to kill value is present for only one situation. For personal protection. 
What are you doing? Well, we're just conducting a test. Oh, man. That's correct. Oh, man. Stay back. Stay away from me. Elizabeth, be quiet. He wasn't going to hurt you. I, I, I'm sorry. When he started toward me, it frightened me. You see? He stopped now. There's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Get back. Back to the table. Lie down again. Turn off the control, Drake. Right. What's the matter, Elizabeth? You're shaking. It's just that that thing frightened me so. It Those lenses that it has for eyes, there's... There's something hypnotic about them. He looks so much like a man. I, I know he's made of plastic and metal, but... But, well, I fear him. Elizabeth, there's no sense getting emotional about this. There's nothing to be afraid of. I know you're right, Father, but... But what? But what would happen if you ever lost control of the automaton? That will never happen. But... Is it possible? Hmm? Perhaps... We didn't do any more work on the automaton that day. We went into the city in the early evening to see a play, leaving the watchman at the laboratory to take care of things. We got back about 12 and were having a late snack. More coffee, Drake? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Please. I think it did us good to get away from here this evening. We've all been working too hard. Uh, do you feel better now, Elizabeth? Oh, yes, Father, much better. Yeah. Tomorrow we can finish up with the automaton. Then we can show him, after suitable tests, of course, to the world. Uh, if we're successful, you ought to win a prize. What was that? Oh, someone screamed. It came from upstairs. We'd better take a look. <coughs> Who could it have been? The only other person up there is Bert the Watchman. <laughs> there it is again. Hurry! Look! Huh? The door to the laboratory is... It's open. He must be in there. The lights are on. We'll see what's wrong in a second. All right. Oh, oh, no. It's Bert. What's the matter with him? His neck's been broken. Oh. He's dead. But how? I don't know, only... What's the matter? Look, we turned off the control on the robot... When we left, didn't we? Of course we did. Why? Because... Because now it's on, Eric. The control is on. You are listening to the tale of The Automaton on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story. An original tale of fantasy entitled The Automaton. <laughs> On the floor of the laboratory sprawled the broken body of Bert, the night watchman. A scant few feet away, I stood looking down at the inert form of the automaton. Before we had left the laboratory, we had turned off the control, and now we found it on. But that is impossible. Take a look for yourself. The control is on. But we turned it off before we left. Are you sure? Of course, I turned it off myself. How did it get on? Perhaps Bert turned it on. Why should he do that? Well, perhaps he was curious. But the most important thing to find out is what killed him. The robot. Don't be a fool, Elizabeth. The robot won't kill unless attacked. That's right, Elizabeth. It's the only reason for it to kill. Actually... The reaction was set in the control system for self-preservation. For no other reason than that. It's the only time the automaton is dangerous. Maybe you made a mistake when you set the automatic controls. It's possible that we might have made an error in the feedback system, Eric. And that the automatic selector chose the wrong value. When Bert turned the switch on, the robot thought he was in danger and killed him. We didn't make an error in the feedback system, Drake. We checked each value through five times before we placed it in the server mechanism. You know that as well as I do. Then... Then 
how did Bert die? I don't know. Master of men. It's still on. Turn it off. Did... Did you hear what it said, Eric? Master of men. We didn't set that reaction in the servo mechanism. Something's wrong. Do you mean the automaton can can think for itself? What about it, Eric? We'll dismantle it tomorrow morning and check it over thoroughly, just to be sure. What about Bert? We'll merely explain to the authorities that he died in an accident here at the laboratory. We can do that in the morning, too. Now we all need a good night's sleep. Don't you think we ought to move him out of here? Well, they may want to look at his body, Elizabeth. Besides, nothing more can happen to him. Elizabeth? Who is it? Drake. What are you doing up here on the second floor outside the laboratory? I... I couldn't sleep. Oh. Well, neither could I. Drake, do you think that, that the robot can operate by itself? Why do you ask that? I was thinking, what if, what if Bert was merely making his rounds? What if he walked into the laboratory and the robot was there, waiting for him? Well, that's, that's not possible, of course. I wouldn't say that. Isn't, isn't it possible that you and Dad might have made a mistake in setting up the feedback system? Isn't it possible that that there could be an error in the automatic control system that would allow it to operate without being switched on? Operate enough to at least turn the operating switch on? Well, it's... Uh, <clears throat> it's possible that there's something comparable to a short in the control system which would mean that the robot could operate without the control being on. Yes. I want to go in there and take a look at it. Why don't you wait until morning? No, I I want to see it tonight. All right. Let's go. Are you sure you want to go inside? Yes. Switch on the lights. Mm -hmm. Everything seems to be all right. Let's take a look at the automaton. Every time I see it, it... It frightens me. There's nothing to be afraid of, Elizabeth. I'm not so sure. Now the control button is still off. Wasn't he lying the opposite way? With his head at the other end of the table when we left? No, I don't think... Where's that hum coming from? I don't know. It sounds like the robot's power system. Yet the control button is off. Are you sure? Let me get a little closer to it. Well? The hum is coming from the automaton. That means I was right. I guess you... Drake! Huh? Look out! Master of men! system is on. It, it's sitting up. To kill. To kill. We made a mistake. We must have made a mistake. It's getting down. Let's get out of here. Is, is it following us? No, it's just standing there. But it will be after us in a few seconds. Hurry, hurry. Let's get this door closed and locked. I can see it through the glass panel. It's starting towards the door. I heard some noise up here. What's the matter? The automaton's in operation without the control being on. What? That's right. We must have made a mistake, Eric. The, 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 the only thought that thing knows is to kill. We have to destroy it. It's getting closer to the door. That door won't hold. Let's get out of here. It has to be destroyed. But how? It weighs over half a ton. I think I have it. Stop here by this window. Oh, another crash against that door and it'll be out of the lab. What are you going to do? Its reactions are slower than ours. We'll wait here for it. It'll come walking towards us. 
At the last minute, we'll run to the side. I don't think it'll be able to stop itself in time. It should crash through the window and to the ground below. The two-story drop should destroy it. The door is down. I hope your plan works. And if it doesn't? Then we'll have to think of something else. Here he comes. It's looking up and down the hallway for us. Over here! Over here! It sees you. Here it comes. Do kill. Do kill. It's getting closer. When do we move away? Not yet. Master of men, kill all men. Only a few feet from us. How soon? In a moment. Do Sure, it's destroyed? Yes. The fall completely destroyed the automatic control. You're looking at nothing but a pile of metal. What do you intend doing? Starting all over again. Somewhere along the line, we made a mistake. We have to find that mistake and correct it. We don't want a master of men, but a servant of men. Someday, I don't know when, but someday, we'll be successful. And then one of mankind's most useful servants will be the automaton. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of the golden bracelet of Amoniris. There doesn't seem... Over there, next to the sarcophagus. It's one of the workers. It shouldn't be in here. Something's happened to him. Here, you. Get up. Get out of here. Just a minute. Are you feeling his pulse for? He's dead. What? He's dead. And look, around his wrist. That's the snake bracelet the mummy wore. There's a strange mark on his wrist. Like the fang marks of a snake. The Hall of Fantasy will present the golden bracelet of Amoniris in just a moment. And now for our story, entitled... The Golden Bracelet of Amoniris. I had gone over to Egypt with Dr. Jason Freeman's archaeological group to discover, if possible, the tomb of the pharaoh Amoatan. Amoatan had been one of the greatest rulers of the Third Dynasty. Other parties before ours had covered every inch of ground in the Valley of Kings, only to meet with failure. Dr. Freeman believed the lost tomb was several miles away from the valley, and accordingly, our base of operations was set up some 20 miles north of the Valley of Kings. It was about midday, almost a month after we had begun excavating. Oh, oh it's 
scorcher. Ah, what I wouldn't give to be in a nice air-conditioned room in Cairo. I should imagine you'd be enjoying every minute of this, Charles. I can enjoy it and still be uncomfortable, Dr. Freeman. Yes, I suppose so. We don't seem to have had much luck so far. We will. I'm sure of it. One of the men is calling to us. Perhaps he found something. Well, let's see. You all right? Uh, we're coming. Where's Professor Porter? Uh, there he is over there. He's coming too. Yeah, how about that? We find tomb. What? We find tomb. Look. Here. Let me see. Well? He's right. And we're in luck. The seal is intact. What is it? What's happened? We were in luck when we started to dig here, Porter. We found the tomb. And the seal on the door? It's intact. That means grave robbers didn't break in. The tomb is just as it was left centuries ago. Is it Amawatan's tomb? We don't know yet. We won't know till we get inside. There's no marking out here for the door. Maybe the sand is covering it. What are we going to do? We'll clear this area by the doorway. Then we'll use dynamite to blast it down. Back far enough? There isn't anyone except us within 200 yards of that door. Good. The wire's attached, Porter? Yes. Then set it off. You've done it! Yes, a good clean job, Porter. When do we go in? You've forgotten about the heat, eh, Charles? You're caught up in the excitement of discovery. Well, it's to be expected. Yes, but when do we go in? In about two hours. We give the air a chance to get in there and replace that which is present now. I don't want to take any chances, one of us being overcome by the stale oxygen in there. Jason. Yes, Porter? It's strange, but I have the feeling that we shouldn't go inside that tomb. Well, I don't know. I must be reading too many murder stories in my spare time. Everything inside that tomb is dead. Uh, of course, nothing can hurt us. Are you ready? Yes. You told the men to stay back at the camp. Yes. All right, then. Let's go. It's a good thing we waited. It still smells stale, musty in here. It seems strange that there was no inscription on the door outside the tomb. Nor is there any in this passageway. The burial chamber will let us know whose tomb this is. Uh, shine your lights up ahead. I think we're coming to it. Yes, yes we are. Now, we'll find out if we've discovered the tomb of Amalatan. There's an inscription over there. Shine your lights over there. See if you can make it out, Porter. It's not the tomb of Amalatan, Jason. It's the tomb of Amoniris. Amoniris? Yeah. The legendary queen of the Third Dynasty... It's truly a great discovery. Then you're not disappointed. Of course not, Charles. We've come across something the world thought was lost forever. Amoniris, the greatest of the queens of Egypt. Even in the most complete histories of Egypt, only vague references are made to her name. But we were sure she existed. And this will prove it. Who was she? Queen of Egypt, master of men, and one of the cruelest rulers of the ancient world. To disobey her slightest wish meant death to the one who incurred her wrath. Let's see if we can open the sarcophagus. This burial chamber is magnificently preserved. I only hope that the mummy of Amoniris will be in the same condition. There's an inscription on the side of the sarcophagus, Jason. What does it say? Let me see. Ah, whomsoever violates the resting place of the queen and steals her wealth from her shall die... The death she reserved for him. Oh, nice and friendly. We well, went to a great deal of trouble to frighten the grave robbers away. Inscriptions like that were appealing to the superstitious natures of their people. They hoped it would save their tombs from being ransacked. For the ancient Egyptians believed that they needed their wealth and possessions after death. Well, it certainly made me think for a minute. Oh, well, there's nothing to it. Isn't it right, boy? Uh, no, no, there's nothing to it. No. Let's see if we can't roll the top of this sarcophagus off. The three of us together. Right. All right. All together now. A little more. That does it. Shall die the death. Yes. There she is. Wrapped in mummy cloth. And her head 
covered by a gold mask. The mummy of Amon Iris. Whosoever violates my tomb shall die. Listen. What's the matter, Father? Didn't you hear it? Hear what? The voice. You're imagining things, Ford. No, I'm not. I heard something, I tell you. A woman's voice saying, Whomsoever violates my tomb shall die. We'll return to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of the golden bracelet of Amoniris in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy and the tale of The Golden Bracelet of Amoniris. Both Freeman and I stared at Dr. Porter in amazement. He had backed away from the sarcophagus and stood staring down at the still figure of Amoniris in horror. Then he looked apprehensively around the burial chamber as if searching for someone. What's the matter with you, Porter? I tell you, I heard something. Well, I thought I heard something, too, like an animal howling. And that's all? Yeah, that's all. Well, I heard the animal, too. I didn't hear any voice, Porter. Maybe you imagined you heard it. It's possible that I imagined it, but it was so real, as if she were standing right beside me. Stop looking around the burial chamber. There's no one else in here. Are you sure? Of course we are. You know, you don't look at all well, Porter. Maybe you... Better go outside and get some air. No. No, I'll stay here with you. Then forget about what you thought you heard. Sound like a superstitious fool. I'm sorry, but... Forget it. What do you want me to do? We're well, going to unwrap the mummy. See what jewels and articles of value it has in this person. You've done this before, Porter. I think you should take charge of the job. That's it. That's the last of it. What a remarkable state of preservation she's in. Look, on her left wrist. That's a gold snake bracelet. Yes, I noticed it before. Beautiful workmanship. It looks almost as if it were alive. But it's not. It's getting late. We better go back to camp now. We can catalog the contents of the burial chamber tomorrow. It moved. What moved? The snake bracelet. It moved. Nothing's moved, Porter, except your imagination. You don't stop it. I'm going to recommend that you be sent back to the States. Oh, I'm sorry, Jason. I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I I thought it moved. You're not a superstitious man, Porter. Now, that's one of the reasons I wanted you with me in this expedition. But you're sounding like a frightened fool. Now, forget this nonsense once and for all. We'll go back to camp, eat, and then get a good night's sleep. I'm sure that's all you'll need to make you forget about your strange notions. What time is it? Almost 10.30. Uh, we'd better turn in if we're going to get that good night's sleep you were talking about. I don't feel like sleeping. Oh, you will once you lie down. You'd better go to your tent, Porter. Hmm. Yes, I suppose you're right. Well, good night. Hmm. Worried about him, Charles. Oh, he's just tired, Jason. He'll be all right in the morning. Oh, I hope so. All this nonsense about a voice and then saying you saw the snake bracelet move. You know, you, you'd think something was happening to his mind. <laughs> that jackal out there. I hope it finds something to eat and stops howling. Ever since we made camp here, at night it's been out there, as if it were waiting for something. Oh, you get used to it after a while. I... I heard that cry while we were in the tomb today. I heard something myself. But it could have been the wind rushing through the passageways. You... sound as if you're afraid. Oh, I don't think I am. <laughs> That's what the ravings of an upset mind can do. If Porter isn't better in the morning, I will send him back. Well, you know, while we were in there today, I could almost believe that he had heard something. Now, don't tell me you're starting to believe it. What was that? I don't know. It sounded like a scream. That's what I think it was. I heard a scream. Yes. So did we. It came from the tomb. Are you sure? Yes. My tent is at least a hundred yards closer to the tomb than you are. I heard it quite clearly. 
Maybe we better take a look, eh? Get your flashlights. One of the workers might have gone in there and hurt himself. Let's see what's happened. Anyone in here? Try your lights around. Well, that doesn't seem... Over there. Next to the sarcophagus. It's one of the workers. He shouldn't be in here. Something's happened to him. Here, you. Get up. Get out of here. Just a minute. Oh. What are you feeling his pulse for? He is dead. What? He is dead. And look. Around his wrist. That's the snake bracelet the mummy wore. There's a strange mark on his wrist. Like the fang marks of a snake. Let me see. Those are fang marks. I do What's, what's wrong? I felt it move. I felt it move. What move? The snake bracelet. You're insane. No, Jason. It did slip down his wrist a little. And now, it's on the floor. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, Porter. It's just a gold bracelet. An inanimate object that can harm no one. In the days that followed, we cataloged all the contents of the tomb. It was an exceptionally rich store of treasures that had been buried there with the Queen... Many of the objects we left with the Egyptian Department of Antiquities. But we were allowed to bring the mummy of Queen Amoniris and a small part of the jewelry and other articles back to America with us. Among them was the snake bracelet. About a month after our return, Jason Freeman invited Dr. Porter and me over to his house one evening. Gentlemen, my wife, Laura. How do you do? A pleasure, Mr. Jason. Freeman. Spoken of you often. And he's spoken of both of you often also, I, I feel as though I know you already. I, uh, I see you're wearing the gold bracelet we found in the tomb. Yes, sir. A, a gift from my husband. The other things he presented to the museum. Uh, did he tell you yes. about... Yes, yes, he, he mentioned that it was found on the wrist of a dead man. Porter seems to believe that, uh... uh excuse me. Hello? Yes. This is Jason Freeman. What's that? Well, it's not possible. I see. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting me know. Goodbye. Who was it, dear? Dr. Stevens. He's the curator of the museum. Anything wrong, Jason? Yes. He said the mummy of Amoniris is missing from its glass case. The case is completely shattered, but the mummy is gone. Well, who would want to see Stephen it? said the watchman told him he saw something walking across the grass outside the museum. What do you mean? He said it was the mummy he saw. You are listening to the tale of the golden bracelet of Amon Iris on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled, The Golden Bracelet of Amoniris. Jason Freeman had just received a telephone call from Stevens, the curator of the museum. From him, he learned that the glass case in which the mummy of Amoniris had been placed had been destroyed, and the mummy was gone. Are you serious, Jason? Quite serious, my dear. Stephen said the night watchman had seen the mummy walking. That's absurd. No, 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 not necessarily. Since I've been back, I've tried to learn everything I could about Amoniris. Uh, the bracelet you're wearing, Mrs. Freeman, has a definite connection with her. What are you talking about, Porter? Well, look, Amoniris had that snake bracelet especially made for her. Once she came into possession of it, she built her whole life around it. She believed that if the bracelet was taken from her... It would result in her death. And so she guarded it jealously. But one night, as she lay sleeping, it was stolen from her wrist. And she awoke to find it gone. She learned that one of the high priests had it in his possession. And so she went to him and demanded it. She went alone. When she walked into the trap the priests had laid, 
They killed her. I know that story too, Porter. That's only one of the legends that surround Amanira. That's right, Jason, only one. But I'm not through telling you about her yet. Oh, why don't you forget about her, Professor? Because it may mean our deaths if I do. I think your mind's going back on you, Porter. I don't care what you think. I'm trying to help you, and I think you should listen. And I think that you... Oh, now, Jason, let him talk. According to the legend surrounding her, it is said that if the bracelet is removed from her wrist, Amoniris will wake from her long sleep to recover the bracelet. And with her, she will bring death. I know that story too, Andrew. And it's all Tommy, right? I don't think it is, Jason. I think it's true. Then I think you're as stupid as the story you're telling. Jason. I'm sorry, my dear. The mummy is gone, Jason. Well, someone could have taken it. Not according to the night watchman. And he could have been drinking. He saw something, Jason. Something out on the lawn in front of the museum. I'm going to take this thing off. What's the matter with you? All of you. This is the 20th century, not the Dark Ages. How far is the museum from here? About half a mile. And it shouldn't be too long. What do you mean? The mummy should be here soon. Listen. Dog. Only a dog. I'm not so sure. It could be the cry of a jackal. Oh. I refuse to stay in here and listen to such stupid nonsense. I'm going out for a walk. Uh, Jason, don't go out there. I'm not going to stay here and listen to a lot of foolishness. Jason! Let him go. Oh, I'm sorry that I made your husband angry, Mrs. Freeman. It's just that I believe that we never should have entered the tomb of Amoniris. Andrew. Yes? Mrs. Freeman set the snake bracelet down on the coffee table. Now, no one has touched it since. Do you see what I see? It's moved. Oh, that's no dog out there. What are we going to do? I think that we should... That's Jason. We better see what happened. He shouldn't have gone out there. Let me in. Open the door, Porter. It's out there. What's out there? The mummy. I saw it. Then then the story is true. I owe you an apology, Porter. I'm sorry. What are we going to do? It must be destroyed. But how? That thing from the past is 5,000 years old and still lives. It's getting closer to us. We have to think of something. It's trying to break down the door. Get back. Do you have a gun in the house? No. Any other weapon? Nothing at all. Besides... What good would bullets do against it? Uh, that door won't hold up much longer. We have to think of something. Fire. What's that? The way to destroy it. Fire. Jason, do you have any kerosene, any turpentine, anything flammable around the house? Not that I know of. Oh, I, I have some cleaning fluid in the kitchen. Get it, and some old rags that we can soak with it. I'll be right back. Now look, when it breaks in, mm-hmm. it'll probably head first for the bracelet and then for us. Yes. Now... We'll soak the rags in the cleaning fluid, and when it gets close enough to us, we'll light them and throw them at the mummy. It's been kept dry through all these centuries. It should burn like a torch. The next time, the door will break in. We must be absolutely certain that the burning rags fall on the mummy. What about the house? What do you want to save? Your house or your life? Here it is. Good. Now, pour the cleaning fluid over these rags. Here, I'll do it. Make sure the rags are completely soaked with the fluid. Don't worry, I will. Ah! It's there, standing in the doorway. It seized the bracelet. Remember, when it takes up the bracelet, we throw the burning rags at it. That's all the cleaning fluid. It's got the bracelet. All right, light the rags. Right. All right, hurry. It's starting for us. All right, throw the rags. That's it. It's going to burn. But it hasn't stopped. Back away! Back away! Are you sure the fire's completely out? Yes. I was afraid that we'd never be able to stop it. So was I. Yes. But we did stop. And the mummy is destroyed. Well, there's nothing left but ashes. And the bracelet. Yes, and the bracelet. Only the flames melted it down so that it's lost all shape and form. That's all there is left of 
the golden bracelet of Amoniris. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Stone's Revenge. He let him stay out there in the freezing cold, pounding on the door and yelling, let me in. Monroe's daughter tried to let him in, but the old man wouldn't let her. So Jeff stayed there in the freezing cold and the girl heard him say, I'll make you pay for this, Monroe. For as long as the Monroe lives, I'll make you pay. And that's the end of the story? No, not by a long shot, young fella. Ever since that time, people have died who stayed in that cabin. People up here say they've heard him pound on the door and yell, Now let me in. And when they do let him in, they die. Real strange like they die. Fantasy will present Stone's Revenge in just a moment. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy entitled Stone's Revenge. Jim Loring was my best friend. His sister Betty more than my friend, for we were set to be married the following November. We'd all been working pretty hard, and we figured we needed a rest, so we took a two-weeks vacation and headed up north. Before we left the city, Jim rented a cabin from a real estate broker about 400 miles north of here. We left about three in the morning and drove steadily. Hey, what uh, time is it? Uh, 11.30. Oh, we've made good time. Yeah, that's right. According to the last marker we saw, we ought to be pulling into Woodlake in a few minutes. How far is the cabin from town, Jim? Well, Gehring, the real estate man, said it was about six miles out of town. You're uh, sure he said there were fish in that lake? <laughs> Some of the best fishing in the state. That's what he said. <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> we'll have to stop in town and pick up plenty of food. That's right. Enough to hold us for a few days anyway. Oh, look, up ahead. I think we're coming to it. Oh, we are. It says, uh, you see... A oh, Woodlake, population 709. Hey, big oh, town. You better slow down. You know these small towns. Yeah. The broker in the city said I could get the key to the cabin from the sheriff. It seems he also owns a store here, Sheldon's General Store. Well, if that's the case, we might as well pick up our food there. Yeah, might as well. Hey, look, there it is. Huh? Oh, yeah, I see it. Oh, open that door in a hurry. I, I just hope my muscles haven't frozen in this position. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh that feels great. Uh, oh, oh, boy. Good. Beautiful day, isn't it? Weather report said we're in for a storm tonight, though. Oh? Well, maybe it'll blow over by tomorrow. Oh, it's nice and cool in here. Yeah. Anything would be cool after driving in that hot sun. Oh, it doesn't seem to be... Well, yes, there is, leaning back in that chair with a paper over his face. Look. <laughs> <laughs> He's sound asleep. Pretty alert fellow, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard that, young fella. I was only joking. <laughs> Don't you worry, none, son. I can take a joke as well as the next one. 
Uh, you'd be wanting something, maybe? Uh, yes, we uh, rented a cabin up here, and we need some food. And you come to the right place. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, what can I do you for? Uh, you'd better take charge here, Betty. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's see. We'll need some eggs. Uh, about two dozen. Coming right, right up. Yeah. You come in fresh this morning? Uh, where are you staying? Oh, the old Monroe place. A real estate man in the city said we could pick up the key from you. Yep. Yep, I got the key, all right. Yeah, what else, ma'am? Well, let's see, some bacon, a pound of coffee, pancake flour, pancake flour potatoes, potatoes, oranges, oranges, some cream, sandwiches. Uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on, ma'am. I got what you said, but don't say no more, because if you do, I'll forget everything. <laughs> 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 so, you're staying at the old Monroe place, huh? That's right. Uh, let's see now, coffee, flour... You got a five-pound sack of potatoes here. Oh, that'll be fine. Yeah. Now, go over there and help yourself to some oranges, ma'am, and anything else you see. Just pick it up and set it on the counter here. <laughs> All right. I, I guess that will be the easiest way. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So you're staying at the old Monroe place, huh? Uh, you uh, said that once before. Yeah, I know I did. I know it. I just wanted to be sure I was hearing right. Well, your hearing's all right, Sheriff. Uh, by the way, may we have the key? Sure enough. Sure enough. It's right here under the counter. No. <laughs> Yeah, long time since that cabin's been rented. Oh? How come? Eh, people just don't like to go up there. Oh, why not? Anything wrong with it? Mm, not exactly. Still the best cabin around these parts. Got a nice refrigerator. <laughs> <clears throat> Indoor plumbing. Real nice place. But uh, you oughtn't to go up there. Why? Because of old Jeff Stone. People around here say they've seen him up there. Oh, he won't bother us. Eh, don't you count on that, young fella. Look, if he comes around the cabin, we'll ask him to leave. Only leaving, that'll be done. It'll be done by you. Well, why? Is he dangerous? Yeah, yeah, he's dangerous. And he's dead, too. What do you mean? Just what I said. Well, you can't expect us to believe I don't that. expect you to believe nothing. I'm just telling you what I know for a fact. The real estate man didn't say anything He's about... He's only interested in renting it. Now, you listen to what I got to say. So I don't think... Let that... him talk, Jim. Thank you, thank you. I'll tell you about what happened up there. About 15 years ago, it was. Old man Monroe hated Jeff Stone. Used to make life miserable for Jeff. And Jeff used to come in here and say that he was going to get even someday. And the hatred inside him would come out on the surface. And it even made me afraid. It was the winter time when it happened. Old man Monroe was in his cabin and there was a big storm outside. One of the worst we ever had up here. His daughter was with him. She was the one who told me what happened. <clears throat> Jeff got himself caught outside in that storm. He knew the only place he could reach was old man Monroe's cabin. So he fought his way through the blizzard... And he got to the cabin, half froze. Yeah, he pounded on the door. Let me in! Let me in! Old Monroe knew it was Jeff outside. He wouldn't open that door. He let him stay out there in the freezing cold, pounding on the door and yelling, Let me in! Let me in! Well, Monroe's daughter tried to let him in, but the old man wouldn't let her. So Jeff stayed out there and froze to death. But just before he stopped yelling, the girl heard him say, I'll make you pay for this, Monroe. For as long as the Monroe lives, I'll make you pay. Yes, sir. In the morning, when the storm was over, they went outside and found him frozen to death. And that's the end of the story? Yeah, not by a long shot, young fella. Ever since that time, people have died who stayed in that cabin. First Monroe's daughter, then him, and then others. Anybody who went up there. People up here say they've heard him pounding on the door and yelling, Let me in! Let me in! And when the folks in the cabin let him in, they die. Real strange-like. They die. We'll return to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of Stone's Revenge in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of Stone's Revenge. The sheriff leaned across the counter as he spoke to us. Even though the day was warm, I could feel a chill creep over me as he told us the story of one man's revenge. 
So I wouldn't go up there if I was you. Yeah, certainly a frightening story. Yep, sure is. Is there any other cabin around here for rent? Yeah, it's been a busy season up here. Most of the places got people living in them. I got a place, though, I could let you have. Not too bad a place. Let you have it mighty cheap. Maybe we ought to... Uh... Nonsense. No, we'll go up to the cabin. Well, it's all right with me. Well, I think that about does it, Sheriff Sheldon. All right, let me see now. 95 for coffee, 57 for bacon. Our uh, eggs... You sure we have everything we need? Well, as long as you two manage to catch a few fish we have. <laughs> if you don't, then we'll be making quite a few trips into town. Wait till we get out in the boat. Ha, I'll wait until I get the fish into the pan. Yeah, it comes to $11.92. You can check my figures if you want to. Oh, no, we trust you, Sheriff, here. Yep, out of 12. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> SUE. Always good to have a little business on the side, like this here store. Here's your change. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Uh, you, look, you're sure you don't want to go to my cabin, huh? Well, we're sure. Well, I warned you, warned you, you're walking in with your eyes open. I hope you walk out that way. <laughs> that is, alive. Certainly is far enough away from everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing we have a map or we'd be lost. Hey, look, I can see it. Huh? Yeah, hey, so do I. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Oh, and there's the lake. Oh, it's beautiful. Hey, can I pick him or can I pick him? Oh. This lake is so hard to get to that I, I bet it hasn't been fished much. I could hardly wait to get out there. They ought to be hitting pretty well this afternoon, huh? We'll get the boat off the trailer and whip that lake to a froth. Jim. Mm hmm. I heard that story that the sheriff was telling you. You don't think there was any truth to it, do you? Of course not. You notice when he finished, he said he had a place that we could rent? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> well, I did. He just wanted to talk us out of coming up here. Always good to have a little business on the side, he said. I wonder how many people he's talked out of coming up here with that crazy story of his. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few, I suppose. But it, it did frighten me. We found the cabin to be in excellent condition. We moved our things in, had a bite to eat, then Jim and I unloaded the boat and went fishing while Betty took a sunbath on the beach in front of the cabin. The big ones weren't hitting, but the panfish were. And when we came in, we had a stringer full of bluegills, crappies, and perch. Betty fixed dinner, and we had all the fish we could eat. The rest of the evening, we took it easy, listening to the radio we'd brought with us or reading. The weather report was right that day. And a little after nine o'clock, it began to rain. Hey, we're right about the rain. Yeah, sounds like it'll be a good one. I hope we don't have rain the whole time we're up here. That would be just our luck. Hey, who turned off the radio? I did. Nobody seemed to be listening to it. Well, put it on, will you? Oh. I want to catch the rest of the news before I turn in. If we're uh, going to get up early tomorrow, we'd better think about turning in. Yeah, we'll hear the news and then call it a day. Okay. And that's the news of the world and the national scene. As for the local news, there's... Ladies and gentlemen, a bulletin has just been handed to me. Lawrence Graham, an inmate of the State Institution for the Criminally Insane, escaped from the grounds a little more than two hours ago. So far, he has not been apprehended. His description follows. Six feet tall, gray hair and brown eyes. Last seen wearing gray shirt and pants. This man is dangerous. If you see him, on no account try to apprehend him, but get in touch with the local police of your area immediately. I repeat, this man is dangerous. Be very careful. Turn it off, Betty. The state hospital is for the criminally insane. That's pretty close to us. I think it's about... Five or six miles away. Oh, they'll catch you. Don't worry about it. He won't get away. I hope so. Well, I think I'm going to turn in. Uh, Listen. What's the matter? I I heard something. So did I. A crash of thunder. No, something else. I, I thought I heard a voice. Oh, nonsense. Maybe you're right. Maybe. There it is again. I heard it, too. Yeah, so did I. We'd better take a look outside. Yeah, all right. No, d don't go outside. We'll just stand in the doorway and see if there's anything out here. Huh? Do you see anything? No. Nothing. Then come back inside. Yeah. All right. 
Maybe it was someone lost in the storm. Uh, or maybe it was the man who escaped. Or Jeff Stone. <laughs> out there. Yes, there is something out there. We'd better go see what it is. All right, I'll... Let me in! He's outside the door. Let me in! Come on, let's see who it is. Okay. Let me in. Oh, I'm glad I found you here. What's the matter with him? I found him lying on the ground about a half a mile from here. I've been carrying him ever since. Here, let me help you. Put him down over here. All right. That uh, does it. What's wrong with I him? I don't know. He, uh, he doesn't seem to... What's the matter with him? He... He's dead. You are listening to the tale of Stone's Revenge on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled, Stone's Revenge. The storm was getting worse. Outside, thunder roared and the rain fell in torrents. Inside, we turned to look at each other, for a dead man was lying on the couch. Are you sure? There's no pulse. He's dead. Was he dead when you found him? No. Then he must have died while you were carrying him. Yes. Storm's pretty bad. You'd better stay here until it blows itself out. Thanks. Gordon. Yes? Come over here a minute. All right. What do you want? Don't talk so loud. Do you see his clothes? Hmm. Well, not the dead man. What's so different about them? Gray shirt and slacks? Remember the broadcast? Gray shirt and slacks. Six feet tall with gray hair and brown eyes. Well, that man fits the description of the one that, that they put out the warning about. Hmm. What do you think we should do? I don't know. The announcer said he was dangerous. But it might not be him. What if it is? Hey, uh, what are you two talking about? Uh, we, uh, we were wondering if you'd like, uh... Uh, something to eat, sir. No. You, uh, you live around here? At one time. Do you, uh, know who he is? I remember the face very well, but the name escapes me. What, uh, your name? I'd rather not say. <clears throat> well, um... Why don't you drive into town and, and get some cigarettes, Gordon? But we have... uh, Yes, we, uh, we're almost out. Uh, I'll go right away. But I don't understand. We don't have enough, Jim. Oh, all right, if you say so. You ought to wear a raincoat. No, I'll be uh, right back. I'll get back as soon as I can with the, with the cigarettes. Hurry, Gordon. Plenty. Did you hear the broadcast about the escaped killer? Yep. Well, there's a man at our cabin who fits that description. You sure? Yeah. He came to the cabin and he was carrying a dead man. What did the dead man look like? Well, blonde, nice-looking fellow. He's dead, huh? Yeah. And we think the other man killed him. The lunatic? Yes. He couldn't have. Why? Because he was captured a few minutes after that broadcast. You must have turned your radio off right after the bulletin. Oh, yes, we... we did. But, Sheriff, then, who are the men in our cabin? The men in your cabin? I'll tell you who they are. The young one was Tom Monroe. He was going up to see you. Tom Monroe? Yes. Why? To tell you that it just wasn't a wild story I told you. To tell you to get out of that cabin before it was too late. Then the other man is Jeff stone. I told Tom not to go, but he wouldn't listen to me. He said he didn't want any more people to die up there. And so, he died himself. Sheriff, 
Jim and Betty are still up there. With Jeff Stone? Yes. Well, we're going to have to move awful fast to save him. Come on! so slippery. I hope we can make it up to the top. Hey, we're almost there. Keep driving. Yes. I almost didn't make it down. I got stuck once up there. We'll make her. Oh, if anything's happened to them, I don't know what I Just do. pay attention to the road. All right. Here's the spot I got stuck in before. Ah, we're not moving. Rocker, little rocker. Right. Ah, no, we're stuck. We're stuck good. Then leave the car here and we'll travel the rest of the way on foot. All right. All right. Let's get out. I can see the lights through the trees. Come on, let's go. All right. It's slippery. Yeah. Watch your step. Betty! Jim, we're coming! I can't hear you, not with this storm and all. Oh, I thought if he heard me. Here, forget it. Just watch. Are you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Here, I'll help you up. Thank you. There you are. All right, let's go. All right. And we're almost there. Yeah. I hope they're all right. We'll go in quietly. Huh? Just open the door and walk in. Right. The storm ought to cover any sounds we make. Right. And you just let me handle this. All right. Here we go. It's locked. We'll have to break it down together then. Here all right. right. Well, that was Betty. We got to get that door down. All right. That's it. That's it. Betty, Betty, what's wrong? You. Well, of course. I brought the sheriff with me. Where's the man that was here? Oh, he's gone. I I thought it was him returning when you crashed against the door. That's why I screamed it. I was afraid. Well, I want to be sure that... Yep, it's Tom Monroe, all right. You know this man? Yeah, he's the grandson of old man Monroe, who murdered Jeff Stone by letting him freeze to death outside. Jeff Stone's revenge is over now. But... But if he'd killed other people that came here, then why didn't he hurt us? Revenge is a strange thing, ma'am. In Jeff Stone's case, I think it was strong enough to bring him back from the grave to try to even the score. And so he killed old man Monroe over again every time someone died here. And when he killed young Tom here, then his feeling for revenge left him. Why? Tom was the last of the Monroes, Mr. Blake. Jeff Stone's revenge is complete now. Yes, sir, it's complete now. And he can rest quiet in his grave. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Sea Phantom. There was a terrible storm on this coast. The ship was heading for safer waters when, when through the storm they heard a woman calling for help and ordered his men to rescue her. The ship heeled around and started towards her. Hey, is they were 
getting close to her, suddenly the ship hit a submerged rock that tore open her hull. No one had a chance. For in a matter of minutes, the ship and all hands were lost. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Sea Phantom. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Sea Phantom. The house stands on one of two points of land that stretch out into the ocean forming a small bay of the water and the shore between them. The tides rise and fall. The waves roll in inexorably. Sometimes the wind shrieks and howls in anger. On a calm day when the ocean is at peace with man and the soft sea breezes blowing off the water, there's no more beautiful spot in all the world. But when the sea is angry and... And the winds whip it into a raging fury and the sky is filled with black, swirling clouds. Then you would believe that... that you were in another world. And you would also believe the stories they tell. Don Fleming was an artist. And I, a writer. And through the years, we've become good friends. Off times, we would take trips together around the country to Europe... South America, he to paint, I to write. And when we had finished with the day's work, well, we managed to have some pretty good times together. How we came to rent that house in Maine on the rocky coast of the Atlantic, I still don't know. But we did, and it was there the story I tell you begins. Awful nice of you to come out here with us, Mr. Lohman. Well, I was coming out anyway. Got to see old Mrs. Green about some business, so I figured I might as well drive out with you, fellas. Make sure you get settled nice and comfortable-like. Well, we appreciate it, Mr. Lohman. Oh, it ain't nothing at all. You're that uh, writer, fella, huh? That Larry Reardon? Oh, that's right. Read one of your stories in a magazine just the other day. <laughs> Pretty good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and what about you, young fella? What do you do? Uh, I'm an artist. A uh, painter, huh? Yes, he is. And a very good one. Uh, <laughs> The only thing I know about painting concerns houses and barns and boats. <laughs> That's the only painting I've ever done. You're probably a lot better off. <laughs> I expect so. <laughs> well, here's the house. Better pull up. It's a beautiful house. Always come out here when I rent it to folks. Yeah. Here's the key. Thanks. And I want to thank you for driving me out here. I'll go on down to Mrs. Green's now. Uh, drop in now and then, see how you're getting along. Thanks, Mr. Lohman. And, uh, in case you see anything down in that bay, don't you worry, man. It won't hurt you, as long as you leave it alone. Both Don and I thought he was joking when he said that. He disappeared down the road, and we moved everything into the house. Ah, it was a beautiful old place, spacious and bright, standing like a lonely sentinel on the point overlooking the ocean. And in the days that followed, we were too busy to think about his words. Both Don and I seemed to be, well, (laughs) inspired, if you'll allow me to use that. And his painting was almost half finished while my story was well along the way. Not until a week after we arrived did we realize what was happening. late in the evening, we stood outside the house, looking down at the ocean. Larry? What? Something's happening. No? How do you mean? My painting. I don't know how to explain it. I'm not painting it. It seems like someone or something is moving my hand. I make no conscious effort when I stand before that easel brush seems to be alive. That's what's been happening to me with my story. You know, usually I have to think and plot ahead for hours before I can write a word. But it's it's been different with this story. Don, it's writing itself. 
What's it about? Oh, about a phantom ship that sails forever. You haven't seen my canvas, have you? Uh-huh. Well, why? Because that's what I'm painting. The phantom ship. Strange coincidence, isn't it? Yes. Listen, I heard it. It was a woman's voice crying for help. And it came from somewhere down in that bay. Well, there's nothing down there, Larry. I know. Hello? Is home? Who's that over there? It's Mr. Loman. Oh. Oh, and look, there's a woman with him. Hey, I thought I'd drop in and say hello. How are you getting along? Fine, Mr. Loman. This is Mrs. Green. These are those two I was telling you about, Maud. Mr. Gridden and Mr. Fleming. I'm pleased to meet you. How do you do? How are you getting along? Oh, pretty well. Say, by the way, uh, when you were coming up here, did you hear anyone calling from down in that bay? No, not a thing. It was a woman's voice. You didn't call, did you, Mrs. Green? No. Now, then we probably were mistaken. No, you weren't. You heard something, all right. You know who it was? Yep. It was a girl. What girl? The girl on the ship. But there's no ship down there. Yes, but there will be. What do you mean, Mom? You tell him, Maud. All right, Simon. Well, it was almost a hundred years ago, Mr. Fleming. It was a terrible storm on this coast. The ship, the sea mist, was forced into the sail. They were heading for shore when through the storm they heard a woman calling for help. The captain ordered his men to rescue her. They heeled around and started toward her. Then the ship hit a submerged rock that tore a gaping hole in her hull. Well, the sea mist went down in a matter of minutes. And all hands were lost. But how could anyone... It's true, believe me. Folks saw it on the shore. Saw the girl appear and the ship go down. No one knew where she came from. But who was she? Well, people said she was the captain's dead wife. The woman he murdered 20 years before. And that she'd vowed vengeance on all men. That's why I told you if you saw anything down that bay, to pay no attention to it. Oh, we haven't seen anything. We only heard her voice. Now you'll see the ship. Don't you worry about that. The waves seem to be rolling in much stronger than they were before. There it is again. Yep. That's her, all right. I can't see any... Wait a minute. It's down there, Larry. See? Sailing ship under full canvas. The girl. She must be in trouble. Why don't we go down? Right, there's a rowboat down there. I wouldn't if I were you. I'm going to see what's down there. I'm telling you, don't go. Come on, guys. Right. Don't go, I tell you. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Sea Phantom. Don and I went down the trail as fast as we could, even though it was steep and treacherous. As we neared the water, the spray from the breaking waves filled the air, and falling down on the rocks made it slippery and wet. Those waves look pretty strong. Yeah, but nothing to worry about, though. All right. You ready with the oars? Right. Now shove us off then. Okay. The ship's still there? Yeah. Can you see anyone? No. Well, shouldn't take us too long to get out to it. Then we'll see if anyone's aboard. Seems to be quieting down. Yeah. Can you make out a name? Let me see. It says Sea Mist. That's the one they told us about. Yes, I know. Hey, watch it. We're getting close. Uh, well, we're here. I'll beach these oars. Think I should try hailing her? Yeah, might as well. All right. Hello, Sea Mist. There's no answer. Ah, maybe I didn't hear you. Look, we pulled up right alongside this rope ladder. We might as well board her. Yeah, I suppose so. 
You know, Bloman's crazy with that story of his about this being a phantom ship. Well, it's the most solidly built ghost ship I've ever seen. <laughs> Say, you sure you tied our boat securely? Yeah, don't worry about it. Okay. Up and over. Yeah. yeah. Want a hand on? No. I can make it, Larry. Uh, uh. Anybody on board? What do I? Want? Someone aboard the ship. She couldn't have sailed into this bay by herself. Of course not. And she's in such good condition. They must have built her recently. Probably for a celebration of some kind. Well, there's one thing, Larry. What? Why should I paint a ship exactly like this, even to the name? And I hadn't even seen her. And why should you write about one? I don't know. Look, do you think we'd better take a look around? I'm not sure it would be a good idea. Well, we can't stand down here and... Don. Yeah? Look up at the sails. They're all unfurled. They're catching the wind. Where are you going? Take a look over the side. There's no wake. What? Don. The sails are full, but there's no wake. The ship's not moving. Now, how can a ship be under full... Where? Over there. The captain's deck. A skeleton. Lashed to the wheel. Larry. That wasn't there when we first boarded this ship. Uh, it, it, it could have been. We might not have seen it. Maybe, maybe not, but I think we better get off this thing. That's not a bad idea. But you will join us when we come for you. Larry. Yes. I heard it too. There's something here with us. I can't see anything. Nothing. Except that skeleton lashed to the wheel. You, Joy. Let's get back to shore. All right, let's go. I hope our boat... Don't worry, it's there. I can see it. Maybe Lowen was right. Uh, maybe this is a phantom ship. We will come for you. We're coming, Lowen. Yeah, we were worried about you. We thought maybe you wouldn't come back. What happened out there? Yeah. What happened? We boarded her. And? What happened? Well. Listen. She's calling to you again. Let's go into the house. Good idea. You shouldn't have gone out there. Uh, we know that now. Looks like it's going to blow up the storm. Yeah, it's clouding over very badly. Uh, we'll go into the front room. I'll have to be leaving soon, Simon. Well, I'll take you back home, Ma. Don't worry. I'm just interested in finding out what happened. What did happen out there? Well, like Don said, we boarded the ship. What was its name? The Sea Mist. That's the one, all right. And then what happened? Well, we looked over part of the main deck, but couldn't find anyone on board. Did you go down inside? No. Good thing you didn't. You mightn't have come up. We didn't see anyone by the wheel when we first boarded her, Roman. But suddenly, when we turned around... We saw a skeleton lashed to the wheel. And then we heard a voice. A woman's. A whispering voice saying, You will join us when we come for you. Do you know what that means? No. I'll tell you then. Like I said, you shouldn't have gone out there. If you hadn't, nothing would have happened. Well, nothing actually has happened yet. Just that we went out there and while we were on board, we heard a voice. That's just the beginning. What do you mean? What do you think she calls out for help for? She don't need help. She wants to get you out there, out to that ship. She's got her eyes set on one of you, or maybe both. Why do you say that? Because that's what I've heard. Now, mind you, I never saw it myself, and Maud has neither. But they say she's always looking for men for her crew, that she or the mate of the Sea Phantom will come to get you if ever you set foot on the ghost ship. Loman, you can't mean what you're saying. Oh, yes, I can. Like I said, I never saw it myself. But I've heard folks tell about it. And I've known men to disappear and never show up again. Remember what she said. You will join us when we come for you. When we come for you. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled 
The Sea Phantom. Outside, the weather was getting worse. The sound of the waves washing up against the rocky shore became louder. The wind became stronger. Four of us were in the front room of the house Don and I had rented. Simon Loman had just said, An I've known man to disappear and never show up again. He's telling you the truth. What should we do? I wouldn't know what to suggest. Well, we can leave. No, that won't do you no good. She'll catch you sooner or later. If I was you, I'd stay right here. She's going to take one of you. Or maybe both. You'd better take me home, Simon. All right, home. Okay. I'm pleased to have met you, both of you. Same here, Mrs. Green. I'll... Let's go, Simon. As soon as I take her home, I'll come back. Maybe I can help you some way. Now, be careful. What are we going to do, Larry? Listen, Don, maybe he's only trying to scare us. To play a trick on the smart city slickers. We've only got his story to go on. And the woman. Well, maybe she was in on it. Yeah, of course that's possible. Look, someone could have been on that ship when we went out there. And they could have waited until we weren't looking, then gone out and lashed that, that thing to the wheel, and then they could have hidden and called out the words we heard. And why should they go to so much trouble to do anything like that? It's sort of practical joke. It doesn't sound reasonable. I know, but it's possible. Yes, it's possible. And I think that's just what they have done. There is going to be a storm tonight. Yeah, bad one. I still can't believe that they'd go to all that trouble. Look, to... haven't we done the same thing on occasion? But we didn't go to such... Of course we did. Now, forget it. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. I wouldn't be surprised if Loman didn't send someone else out here tonight to... Tell us that the woman was waiting for us. It's starting to rain. I wonder if Loman will be back tonight. Well, he said he would. I don't know. But I'm not so sure he will. Listen. Yes, I heard it. If this is a joke. Why don't they stop it? Take it easy, Doc. How can I take it easy? I've had all of this I can take. There it is again. Where are you going? I'm going to take a look out the window. You see anything? No, I... Wait a minute. What's the matter? There's someone coming towards the door. Well, it's probably Loman. No, I don't think so. He couldn't have taken Mrs. Green down to her house and returned in so short a time. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Who is it, Larry? Who is that man coming towards the house? I don't know. Unless they're carrying through that joke of theirs. Well, you're right. I opened it. Larry? What? It's closed. What about them? They're not modern. He's wearing clothing worn by sailors almost a hundred years ago. He's at the door. Okay, I'll let him in. Yes? I want to come in. Why? I've come for him. For whom? The man with the brush. What are you talking about? The crew is short. One hand. That's why we put in here. Look, I've had just about enough of this. This thing has gone too far. You go back and tell Loman to stop his little joker, or I'll stop it for him. I came to the man with a brush. She said she wants him. Get out of here. But get out of here! I want to get away from here, Larry. I will leave tomorrow. Tonight. All right, all right, we'll leave tonight. Come on, let's start packing. No packing, we'll just leave. If we want anything here, we can come back when it's daylight. All right, we can... He's back. I warned him. Here, let me in. Quick. Loman. I want to talk to you. Sure. What about it? Look, this thing has gone far enough. This this joke of yours. Hmm? What joke? Trying to frighten us with that hullabaloo about a ghost ship and, and then sending him out here. Who? That sailor in a costume. Listen to me. I didn't send anyone here. Look, how stupid do you think we are? I don't know, but I didn't send anyone here. Then who was he? I don't know any more than you do. And that... The story you told us was true. Every word of it. I'm going to get out of here. Don! He's running the wrong way. Go towards the entrance cliff. we got to stop him. Don! Come back! I'm leaving now! You're running the wrong way! He can't hear us. We've got to stop him. Woman, there's someone else out there, too. Woman! Look out, Don! Look out!
It won't do you no good to look anymore. Now that Loman, he fell over the cliff. He should be down here on the rocks. You won't find his body down here. You saw him fall, so did I. And she went over with him. That's right. We saw them both go over. But we're not going to find him down here. If we could only see out onto the bay now, you'd know what I mean. Why? She needed a man for her crew. She has him now. And the ship's gone and won't be back again. Till she needs someone else. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. somewhere in the jungle. Oh, what a fright you are. Are you sure they won't attack our camp? The campfire alone is enough to keep them at a good distance. Don't worry, Sharon. You'll be safe. Listen. Yes, native drums. Somehow they, they sound ominous. They only sound ominous if you believe them to be. The diamonds bring death. What's going on out there? Just a wounded animal screaming out. Oh, no. No, there was something else. Do you think the jungle has a voice, Frau Courtney? That is only for children to believe. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Diamonds of Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled, The Diamonds of Death. Vince Porter had just returned from a business trip to Caracas. He called me shortly after his plane landed and said that it was important that Sharon and I come over to his hotel that evening. I tried to get more information out of him, but had no success. At 8.30 that evening, we were in his apartment, and there began the story I am telling you. Good to see you, Vince. Glad to be back, Jeff. Sharon, you're looking lovelier than ever. Oh, always there with a compliment, Vince. Now, why don't you say nice things like that to me, Jeff? <laughs> I'm married to you, darling. <laughs> There's someone else here that I want you to meet. Well, you sounded so mysterious over the phone, I'd almost think you were guarding some great secret. Well, it's a secret, all right. I'm going to tell you what it's all about tonight. Oh, uh, these are the people I told you about, Carl. A pleasure. Sharon and Jeff... Courtney, Carl von Ornberg. How do you do? How do you do? Have you told them anything yet? No, sit down, kids. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, now, what's it all about, Vince? Oh, show it to them, Carl. Yeah. What is it? It looks like a diamond, but it can't be. I've never seen a diamond that large. It not only looks like a diamond, it is one, Jeff. The largest diamond in the world. Well, you're not trying to joke with us, are you, Vince? No, I'm not. 
Where did you get it? From a man I befriended in Caracas. He gave it to me. Well, that's worth a fortune. What would he want to give it to you for? He certainly could use it himself. Not where he is. What do you mean? The man who gave the diamond to Herr Porter is dead. Oh? Well, I hope you'll excuse me if I seem a little dense, but I'd appreciate hearing the story from beginning to end. All right, Jeff. I met this man. His name was George Maupate, a Frenchman, at the hotel in which I was staying in Caracas. He was a strange man, seemed to be afraid of his own shadow. One night, it was quite late, he knocked at my door. He asked me if I'd let him come inside for a while, that he had reason to believe his life was in danger. I couldn't refuse him, of course. That was the first time I saw the diamond. He said he'd been with a hunting party that had gone deep into the Belgian Congo and stumbled upon a strange race of white men who worshipped a huge stone idol on the bank of the Congo River near the equator. They made offerings to this idol, and the offerings were diamonds. His party waited until the ceremony was over. When the people had gone, they took all the diamonds they could carry with them and started back to civilization. But one by one, the men in his party died until he was the only survivor. He felt sure that he was being followed and took passage for Caracas. That was when he met me. Then what happened? Well, two days later, he again came to my room. Carl was there with me. He gave me the diamond, said I was to keep it for him. That if anything happened to him, it was mine to do with as he wished. Well, evidently something did happen to him. Yes, early the next morning they found him dead in his room. How had he died? No one knew. It was quite unusual. Three doctors examined him and not one of them could tell us how he died or what caused his death. George Mopate had just stopped living. And so you have the diamond? Yes, that's right. What are you going to do with it? Keep it and go into the Congo and look for these people he told me about. Won't it be dangerous? Yes, but I don't expect it to be too dangerous. We ought to be able to get back in one piece, eh, Carl? Yeah, and when we come back, we will bring with us as many diamonds as we can carry. Oh, that's the reason you're going in. Yes. Why have you told us all this? Because I want you to go with us. What about it? I don't know. Think, Mr. Courtney. When we return, all of us will be millionaires. What do you think, Sharon? It's your decision, Jeff, not mine. Well, Mr. Courtney, I'll go with you. Then I'm going to. Oh, you'd better stay. Oh, no, I won't be any trouble, believe me. Vince, she can come with us. As long as she makes no trouble for us. No, don't worry. I can take care of myself. All right, then it's settled. I just thought of something. What? Well, this is going to cost a lot of money. Where is it coming from? From the diamond we already have. We are going to sell it. Huh. I guess that takes care of all the answers. All of them. And it is agreed that we share in the diamonds equally, one quarter share for each. I like that. You bet you will. We'll leave as soon as we can get ourselves clear. Oh, it seems such a shame. What's the matter? Look. Look at the diamond. I don't see anything. It's shining so strangely. Before, it was dull in color. But now look at it. Gleaming and shining as, as if there was something inside of it. There was a lie. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Diamonds of Death. A month later, we took off from New York, bound for Dakar. There, we changed planes, and several hours later, found us in Leopoldville, where we bought a car and a truck and our provisions, hired three native men to come with us, and set out on the last leg of our trip. The roads were good for the first 500 miles, but eventually we were forced to abandon the car and truck and set out on foot. How much farther have we to go? About 250 kilometers. I've been noticing the natives we brought with us. They seem to be getting nervous and afraid. Yes, they've heard stories about the idol in the jungle and they're afraid of it. They say to go near it means misfortune. To steal from it means death. What's that? A cat. Probably a tiger somewhere in the jungle who has just found his dinner. Oh, frightens me. It's nothing to be afraid of, Sharon. We can protect ourselves. We have all the guns and ammunition we need. I was wondering, Vince... You don't think there's any danger of the natives taking off some night and heading back? I don't know. They don't know where we're heading, do they? 
No, but they do know it's in the general direction of the Stanley Falls. I think that's what's making them nervous. I should think the closer we get to the falls, the more apt they'll be to desert us. They will die if they try to desert us when we get close to the falls. I will see to that. Well, you mean you'd shoot them down? Not really, but I will say that to them if need be. They will think twice, then, before they try so foolish a thing. Elephant. Are you sure the animals won't attack our camp? The campfire alone is enough to keep them at a good distance. Don't worry, Sharon. You'll be safe. I hope so. Listen. Yes. Native drums. Somehow they... They sound ominous. They only sound ominous if you believe them to be. A wounded animal screaming out. Oh, no. No, there was something else. I heard it, too. A voice that spoke from the jungle. You're imagining it. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think the jungle has a voice, Herr Courtney? That is only for children to believe. We pushed ahead in the days that followed. The deeper into the jungle we went the more difficult was it for us to travel. And the drums, the jungle messenger who throbbed out before us that we were coming, coming to steal the diamonds from the idol. Now, according to the map, we should reach the river tomorrow. This is the spot the Frenchman said where we would find the idol. This is the end of our trail. We'll all be rich. But will we be alive to enjoy it? Of course we will. Well, I'm beginning to wonder. The drums. Those are the same drums we've heard ever since we started into the jungle. They know we're coming. They're waiting for us. Do you notice that every time those drums start up, it seems to drive the animals mad? They're comparatively quiet until the drums start beating. <laughs> They do seem to get angry when the drums begin. I say to you, the diamonds bring death. There it is again. There, what is it? The voice. Nonsense. You heard nothing but the animals and the drums. Oh, didn't anyone else hear it? I thought I heard something. I'm not sure. I think you're tired and nervous, Sharon. We all need a good night's sleep. In the morning, you'll feel a great deal better, I'm sure. They're going as fast as they can, Charles. They are afraid, and their fear makes their feet lag. Why don't you relax, Charles? We're almost there. Because I won't be satisfied. Look. The idol of the diamonds. Why, it must be a hundred feet tall. Standing up with its legs outspread, and its arms stretched forward as if it were waiting to greet us. There's something frightening about it. Look. Where? Over there. There's a man coming toward us. Put your gun down, Carl. What do the strangers want? We have come to see the idol. The idol has seen you, and you have seen it. You speak English. Yes. Some of your countrymen have stumbled upon our secret. From them we learned your talk. We come as friends. Friends? Of all those who have come here, none came as friends. They came to steal, to steal the diamonds from the idol. What's that noise? Time will teach you. You say you come as friends. If so, you will be treated as friends. If not, then the diamonds will be your death. Come, follow me. I shall take you to my village. I guess we're to spend the night here. Well, they seem friendly enough. Strange how they all disappeared when it became dark. Well, the whole village seems to be deserted. What fools we are. Of course. This is the night of the full moon. This is the night they make the offerings to the idol. The village is deserted. Listen. I am going to see the ceremony. We'll all go. Do not make any noise, then. Come. All right, let's go. <laughs> 
Don't go so fast. Be quiet. They must not hear us. They must not know we are watching them. We must be getting close. Yeah, we are. I can see something ahead. Yes, through the trees. The whole village is there. And look, each man walks to the idol and sits at its feet. Diamonds. What's the matter? They've stopped chanting. Strangers, we know that you watch us. Step out into the clearing, but always remember that if you betray our trust, death will reach out and touch you, and the power of the diamond idol will destroy you, even as it has destroyed all others who have betrayed us. Strangers, step out into the clearing. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Diamonds of Death. We had followed the sound of the chanting, and it brought us to the river bank, and the clearing in which the idol stood, white and tall, rising up into the sky. We thought they weren't aware of our presence, but we were wrong. Strangers! Step out into the clearing. They know we're here. Let's do as he says. Right. Don't try anything, Carl. That is as far as you can come. Stop there. You have followed us, strangers. You say you are interested in the idol of diamonds? Then you may stay here. You may watch the ceremonial offering. Carrying a dime on the place of the idol's feet. No expression on their faces. Just walking towards the idol as if they were hypnotized. Later, when the village is asleep, we shall return to this place. And when we leave, we shall take with us all the diamonds we can carry. Now I leave you, you will spend the rest of the night here. Thank you. Make no attempt to steal the diamonds, for the idol will raise up in wrath and bring the fury of the jungle down upon your heads. He will raise his voice in anger, and there will be no escape from him, for the fever of the curse will be upon you, and you shall die. They understand, Buddha. It is my hope that you do. May we meet again on the morrow. Well, let's go inside the hut. Hmm? What do you think, Miss? I don't know, Jim. He said if the diamonds are stolen, the idol will cry out in anger and death will be our reward. I believe him. So do I. I think they're right, Carl. I think we should leave here. Just the way we came. You think I came all this way so that I could turn around and go back to civilization empty-handed? You're mad if you think that. Think of George Mopate. Mopate died of a fever. That's what we thought he died of. But it wasn't caused by the jungle. It was caused by the power of the diamond idol. You are a superstitious fool. Quiet. Do you want the whole village down on our heads? All right. I say to you, we came here for diamonds. We leave here for diamonds. I'm not taking any. Yes, right. And I agree with them. (laughs) All right. Let it be that way, then. Perhaps it is better that way. For in the end, I would have been the only one left. What do you mean? That when we got near the edge of the jungle, I was going to kill you. Because I wanted them all, not just one fourth. But now you have said you want none of the diamonds. That means I own them all. And you will help me carry my diamonds back. You and the native forces we brought with us. That's where you're mistaken, Carl. We're not going to help you carry them back. Oh, but you are. He has a gun. And I will not hesitate to use it. You're a fool. You are the fools, not I. Now, my gun is ready to talk for me. The village is asleep now. We will go back to the clearing and get the diamonds. Move. 
I said move. You mean that? that is correct. The native workers we brought with us are in the next hut. You will get them. Tell them that we are leaving. They will be more than glad to come with us. Now get your packs and we shall go. possibly carry any more diamonds. You are not carrying enough. It'll have to be enough, Carl. If the natives are loaded down, they can hardly walk. Our packs are just as heavy. We can't take any more. It is a shame to leave them here. But then, one can always return without his companions, of course. It's a long trail back from Arnberg, and you'll have to sleep sometime. We shall see about that. Now let us go. Move along! To think that you believe the story he told us. What fools you all are. Maybe. Maybe not. They do not even know that we have gone. Oh, what's that? I don't know. And the idol shall raise his voice in anger. And there will be no escape from him. Listen. They do know that we're gone, Carl. Then you must hurry. The first one who slows down shall answer to me. So, the whole jungle is awake. Hurry. Move quicker. Start to run. We, we have to stop to rest. We've been traveling like this for two hours. You cannot rest. Even you're tired, Carl. We must rest or we won't be able to go on much longer. Oh, please. For your own good, too. If we don't rest along the way, we'll drop down in our tracks and we won't be able to carry the diamonds out for you. Stop then and rest. But do not try anything. Don't worry, we won't. We won't have to. Shut up. Vince. Yes? Haven't we been here before? Don't get you. This is the spot we were in when they discovered us watching the ceremony. Are you sure? Yes. Just ahead of us, there should be a clearing. The clearing in which the idol stands. We've been traveling in a circle. What did you say? We, uh, we can go on now. Then let us go. Uh, 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 Mulan, move! Yeah, you're right. The clearing is... Something is wrong! We have been here before! We are back in the clearing! We have traveled in a circle! I must get away! I must... <laughs> Animal. It jumped out from behind the trees. He didn't have a chance. How horrible. Yes, it is horrible. But it was the death that he deserved. He didn't want to take the diamonds, would I? I know. When you came here, the thought was in your mind. But you were wise in that you pushed it away from you. What? What are you going to do with us? You and your party may leave this place in peace. And when you return to your world of civilization, it would be better if you did not tell them of what has occurred here. But there will be others, even though you do not tell them. There will be others who come upon this place. Let us hope that they do as you have done. For if they steal from the diamond idol... Death shall be visited upon them, and it may come in many forms, but it will come. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. To hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Granite Furniture Company, with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo, presents... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Perfect Script. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. Now for tonight's story, an original radio drama by Bob Olson entitled The Perfect Script. It's inspiration, gentlemen. With a proper inspiration, anyone can write a perfect script. In this case... The inspiration is horror. You have just listened to another in the series of dramas entitled The Perfect Script, a real-as-life story of horror produced by John Marchant. Be sure to listen again next week for another premiere of another Perfect Script. Wraps up another perfect script. Yeah, a little too perfect, if you ask me. Every time I work one of these shows, I want a police escort to see me home. There's a Mr. Schenk to see you. Shall I send him in? Schenk? Oh, the new writer. Yes, send him in, please. Schenk, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad you made it. Have a seat. Thank you, Mr. Marchand. Did you decide to accept my terms? Well, your shows are famous, Sounds like I'm starting at the top. You are. You realize, of course, that this is a one-time shot. Yeah, so I understand. Uh, No one ever writes two perfect scripts, but uh, why? Once you've written one, you'll know the answer to that. It's a queer setup, but it's too good a chance to miss. Uh, When do I start? Immediately. I'll drive you out there myself. Out where? In the coast, uh, a few miles to my beach house. You will find it perfect for writing your type of script. Sounds okay to me. Fine. I'll order the car. Mr. Maine... Call the garage and tell them to have my car ready in five minutes. I'll be up at my beach house. I'm taking the new rider. Just call the garage. I won't be back today. Now, uh, shall we go? Hmm. Sooner the better. Hmm. Trudy must have taken a walk. Trudy's the housekeeper. She spends a lot of time just walking on the beach... She had a terrible shock, poor girl, but she's harmless. Well, it looks as if we'll have to let ourselves in. Trudy? Trudy, are you here? Here I am, Mr. Marchand. I knocked. Where were you? I was down... I was asleep. Well, no matter. This is Mr. Schenk. He'll be with us for a little while. I thought you were taking one of your walks at first. Tonight? She's uh, looking for her husband, Beat. He was a pilot and crashed in the sea close to here. Trudy thinks he'll show up. Oh, he will. Don't you think he will, Mr. Schenk? Well, That's enough, that? Trudy. Show Mr. Schenk to his room. Same room the others have? Of course. Now, hurry. Mr. Schenk probably wants to clean up a bit. He's going to start writing, so take some cold milk and sandwiches to him. Or would you rather have coffee? Oh, milk would be fine. Show him where to find the writing materials, too. He has a big night ahead of him. I'm, uh, I'm sorry to hear about your husband. It was just a forced landing. He walked away from three others. He'll come back someday. Yeah. Uh, have you heard anything at all? Oh, yes. He sent me his ring. That's the signal we had to let me know he was coming home. How did he send it, Trudy? The ocean brought it. The ocean? Yes, a little boy found it on the beach. 
You mean a ring was washed up on the beach? Some poor man was washed ashore. He had it on his hand. Probably a friend of Jack's. Many flyers were killed during the war, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, uh, this flyer was washed ashore. Uh, didn't they identify him? No, he was in the sea too long. Well, did you see the body? They wouldn't let me. They said it was too horrible. Yeah, I can well imagine This is your room, Mr. Shank. They all use this room. Who all used it? All the writers of John, Mr. Marchant's scripts. Well, it's a very nice room. Nice view of the ocean from here. I I think I'll throw open this window and get some fresh air. Here's the clean linen and typewriter and paper, and here's the pitcher of milk. Ah, thanks. Ah. Yep, this is sure a fine place to do a bit of writing. Mr. Shank. Yeah, Trudy? I'm sorry you came here. Really? Well, uh, I'm sorry if you don't like me, Trudy. I do like you. That's why I'm sorry you came. Ah, nice folks. Well, if I can't write a script here, I can't write it anywhere. Uh, What more can a man ask? Uh, a little more of that Trudy, and I wouldn't be able to write the date. Too bad, too. You're really not bad looking. Kind of pretty, in fact. Yeah, well, when a mind cracks, there's nothing much anyone can do about it. Now, now for the perfect script. Yeah, February 16th. It's uh, a good start. <laughs> the perfect script by Peter Schenk. Yep, you're on your way. A Marchant production is a very auspicious beginning. The first inkling I had of any plot was when the deluded housekeeper told me that she wished I hadn't come. What has happened to the writers of the other perfect scripts, I wonder? Uh, If I had any sense, I'd scram out of here. That's Trudy. She's running down the beach, looking for her dead husband. I think I'll just follow her and see what happens. Jack! Jack! Trudy! Jack! No. No, Trudy, it it isn't Jack. It isn't Jack. Uh, Sorry, Trudy. But he will come someday, won't he? Yeah, yeah, he, he will. Yeah, let's sit down a bit. This running in the sand is very tiring. Jack isn't dead, is he? Certainly not in your thoughts, Trudy. Well, you watch the sea a lot, don't you? I must watch the sea. I wouldn't want to miss it. Yeah, I know. I spend a lot of time watching the sea myself. Mighty indifferent, the sea. Well, Trudy, shall we start back? Jack won't come tonight. Maybe tomorrow night. Yeah, maybe maybe the seal will give him to you tomorrow. You think so? Do you think he'll come back tomorrow? Tell me he'll come back tomorrow. Johnny said he'd never come back. Johnny lied, didn't he? Johnny? Who's Johnny? He's... Oh, <gasps> here you are. Are you ready to get started on that script? Well, Sean, where did you come from? I say, shall we get started on that script? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I've already started. Hey, what was that? What was what? I saw the shadow of a man diving behind that sand dune. George. Trudy, be quiet. Trudy always imagines she sees things at night. I think you're having the same trouble, Shank. That was just the moon shifting a new shadow across the sand. There's nobody around here closer than five miles. No, it was a man. It was a shadow, Shank. Nothing but a shadow. Yeah, okay. Shadow. Uh, Mr. Marshall, I, uh, I don't think Trudy was very happy to see me come out here. Why do you say that? Well, she told me she wished I hadn't come. What she mean by that? Mean? How do I know what she meant? Trudy's always afraid someone's going to take her away from here before she finds her husband. Pay no attention to it. There's George again. <gasps> oh, you heard me. I think we'd better get back to that script, Shank. Are you ready? You know, on second thought, Mr. Marchand, maybe I can't cut it. Maybe I'd better try some other show at first till I get good enough for the perfect script show. Nonsense. You'll never be any more ready than you are right now. Yeah, I know, but... The script, uh... Mr. Schenk, will be perfect. And you will write it.
You are listening to The Perfect Script by Bob Olson in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Presented by the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Now back to tonight's story, entitled The Perfect Script. Come in. Now, for that script. Yeah, better get started, huh? I thought you told me you'd already started it. Well, not not perfect enough. I tore it up. You shouldn't have done that. I wanted to see it. Maybe I could have offered you some suggestions. No, it wasn't any good. Just a false start. I see. By the way, I noticed you were taking in the view from your window. Yeah, I was fascinated by the way the moonlight topped those white caps. Very pretty. I should think you'd have gotten enough of watching the ocean in 29 months. Uh, just a habit, Mr. Marchand, just a habit. Tell me... What else did you see? See? Nothing. You lie. I do. Never mind. It's of no consequence now. Let's get busy with that script. Uh, before we do, Mr. Marchand, I, I, I have a question to ask you. Well, what is it? Whatever happened to your other writers? Why do you ask that? Well, frankly, I'm thinking of my future. Very practical, Shake. And what did happen to them? I found a place for them. A place? What sort of a place? A very satisfactory place, Mr. Schenk. And you uh, intend to find such a place for me? Indeed I do. Fear not, my young friend. You shall have just such a place. My Sean is gone. Cards are on the table. Yeah, he's even bolted the doors. For some strange reason, I can't budge the windows or even smash the panes. I know he plans to kill me. To produce such a horror in this room that he'll have the actual passionate record of a terrified and dying man. Yeah, but just how he intends to bring it about, I don't quite know. I've just poured myself a glass of cold milk. Yeah, but this I do know. This script is written by Peter Schenk, a very mediocre writer, but one with enough talent to find an enthusiastic audience in the Los Angeles Police Department. Now, Mr. Schenk, you will begin your script in earnest. And you seem to be collaborating in earnest. What's that in your hand, an Army 45? I am not a ballistics expert, Mr. Schenk. I must confess my ignorance. All I know about this weapon is that it's very deadly. Yeah, it's an Army 45. Very deadly piece of merchandise. <laughs> you find something amusing? Yeah, I was just thinking, Mr. Marchant, what a dirty trick it'd be if I should let you kill me and make you write your own perfect script. Oh, I don't intend to kill you, Mr. Shank. You don't? Then why the gun? This gun will keep you here until I'm through with you. I've no fear of anything I can live through, Mr. Marchant. Death is sometimes preferable. I have enough skill with this Army 45, as you call it, to make any movement on your part an extremely painful one. From there on, I have someone who might inspire the fear you spoke of. You mean our, uh, shifting shadow, George? Exactly. George has a cozy little apartment below ground. I hope he doesn't disturb you. Oh, so George is the inspiration for the horror you spoke of. Mm -hmm. George is very helpful. You know, Marshal, you strike me as being rather stupid. I'm sorry you think so. Yeah. Yeah, you want a script written, a perfect script. You engage me to write that script in the face of a torture and death from which you give me no chance to escape. You know, you, you ought to put a bonus on this thing. Give me a little incentive. That will not be necessary. I'm quite certain that in approximately five minutes you'll need no incentive. Five minutes? What's that got to do with it? You were observed pouring and drinking a glass of milk a few minutes ago. True? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. Wait, you mean that you... Poison... No, Mr. Shank. Just a little potion to deaden the willpower. In exactly five... No. Four and a half minutes. You will act only on the power of suggestion. Does that strike you as stupid, Mr. Shank? You're lying. Wait and see, or have you something better to do? I have, you filthy maniac. Why, in two minutes I could kill you. Yes, and by heaven I intend... Stand back. You wouldn't get two feet. This is no cap gum. Go ahead. As long as you're alive, you have a chance. Go ahead, commit suicide. See how much good it does. Hey, you're lying, I tell you. Besides, I 
I didn't have any of that milk. Now, Shank, you know differently. Just relax. This isn't so bad. You'll even get a thrill out of it. Believe me, don't fight it. You only hurt yourself when you do. I hope you... Uh, you're the craziest of the lot, Marchant. Your sister at least has some trace of feeling. You're just plain mad. My sister. Who mentioned it to you? Trudy did, Marchant. Or, uh, Johnny, if you prefer. You are more shrewd than I thought. Yeah, you're just careless. You depend too much on the discretion of the insane. They prattle without thinking, Marchand. Mm, it doesn't matter. Think me insane if you like. Maybe I am. You'd be too if you had to hide someone like George from the world. But it doesn't matter. As for Trudy, she's mad from heartbreak and shock. She could have been saved if... Yeah, if you'd let her. Yeah, but it serves your plans better if she isn't too bright. Mm. She's bright enough. She likes milk, too. You don't mean to tell me that you deliberately keep her dope out. Oh, no, she's insane, all right. But every once in a while, I can't depend on it. You hold a person's life at little value, don't you? She's the only one who can handle George. She wouldn't do it of her own free will, so I just help her to make up her mind. But your time is up, Mr. Shank. How do you feel? Your eyes are quite glassy. Soon you won't even be able to talk. Very effective. Very effective. Yeah. Yeah, very effective. And now, Mr. Shank, shall we start the script? The script? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the perfect script. Write it yourself, my shot. The typewriter, Mr. Shank. You're just about to write the finest script radio ever knew. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I want to write, but what'll I write about? Write just what you see. Explain it in detail. Everything you see and everything you think. Yeah, but I don't see anything. Don't you, Mr. Shank? And turn around. Trudy. And George, Mr. Shank. George is going to help us with this script. He's quite talented. Uh, what's he going to do? A beautiful job of murder. Trudy, come with me. Where are you going? We won't be far away. George doesn't like to have anyone in the family around to watch him. Do you, George? Bad blood. Bad blood. Write it down, Mr. Schenk. There's plenty of time. Be sure to get it all. Here, you, you might like some fresh air. I'll throw open this window. <clears throat> Special glass, you know. Strong as steel. But you won't need it now. You won't try to escape. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the room with this monster. My shot did open the window. <laughs> Easy escape, yet I can't move. I can't leave this chair. I can't even cry out. Write it down. Write it all down. How my brain works like a trip hammer and my body does the bidding of a madman. Yeah, it can't be happening. This is, this is like a dream where you want to run and your legs won't move. George is just... Staring at me and muttering about bad blood. Yeah, he's staring with those wild eyes as if he were waiting for a signal. Now he sees it. It's Trudy at the window, holding a knife with a blade that looks razor sharp. It's meant for me. I have no will for anything but to stay here and write this cursed script. Yeah, of course it's perfect. Why shouldn't it be? It's a diary of a monstrous murder. I'll never get out of this chair. Will I experience pain? I don't know. The script couldn't be perfect if I didn't. I hope I do. I want to experience something. Something that hasn't been willed on me by that insane Marchand. Trudy is handing the knife to George. Now she's pointing to me. George turns and faces me. He's walking toward me. Oh, why can't I do something to protect myself? Bad blood. George have bad blood. Everybody says George have bad blood. George need good blood. Then he be fine. No more bad blood. Trudy's climbing in the window. There are tears in her eyes. She's watching George. Trudy feels just as I do. Her mind's working, but can't do anything about it. I don't know what it is that Marchant's given us, but it's really hypnotic. George.
George get good blood now. George need good blood. George need lots of good blood. Then he all right. Then George like everybody else and walk in the sunshine and swim in the ocean just like everybody. And people say to George, Hello, George. How are you today? And George say, My blood very good today. George get good blood now. Cootie's standing there. She's trying to say something to George. Tears are streaming down her cheeks. Cootie doesn't want me to die. Uh, I gave her false hope. She'd find her husband. And now Trudy knows that if I die, that hope dies too. Oh, if Trudy only had the will to... Ah, what irony. The only person in this room with any power over his body is George. And he has no mind with which to control it. There's my shot at the window. He looks horrified. Something going wrong with his plan? Trudy! Trudy, get out of there! You know what George is when any of us watch him? Get out of there before it's too late! George heard Marchand. He's turning around. He sees Trudy watching him. He sees the tears. His face lights up with anger. He grabs Trudy by the wrist, slashes at her with a knife. <laughs> oh, please, please give me the strength to move. Give me the power to get out of this chair. Marchand's standing there. No, no, he's leaping through the window. I think he's going to try to fight with George. He's rushing at the monster. George brushes him off. As he does the sharp blade of the knife, opens a deep wound in the side of Marchant's neck. Judy's lying on the floor. She doesn't stir. Marchant falls and lays quite still. A pool of blood forms quickly from the gushing wound. The sight of the blood excites George. He kneels over Marchant. He... Oh, no, I, I can't write it. It's too horrible. I've never seen a more grotesque sight in my life. I... I'm going to be sick. Now George is getting up. He's actually smiling. He sees Trudy on the floor and he stoops to pick her up in his powerful arms. Strokes her hair just as he did on the beach. His hands leave rich red stains on her face and hair. Now he's setting Trudy down tenderly. He turns towards me. Now George got good blood. George got Johnny blood. Johnny blood, good blood. Now, George, like everybody else, George blood very good today. I tried to say something, but didn't have the power. Perhaps that's what saved my life this time. George had forgotten about me and his exhilaration over getting my shots. Good blood. Yeah, Trudy's dead. No doubt about that. The knife had slashed her from just above the ear to the corner of her mouth. Trudy's dead. <laughs> you know, I can't help but think that now she'd find Jack at last. Sea isn't so indifferent after all. Ah, oh, this night is interminable. The script soon will be finished. But Marchant will never produce it. Yeah. I had written it well. Couldn't help myself. Had to do it. Be Marchant's final triumph. <laughs> the worst of all is the quiet description of this room after George had gone. Telling about the two bodies. They're going cold. My great fear is that George will come back before this potion wears off. I sat staring at the window. Now letting in a chill breeze. Just about convinced myself that George wouldn't be back when... There he was! The thing I feared was happening. George did remember at last. But Trudy had told him to kill me. And I am still powerless to help myself. This was the story that Marchant had designed for the script. Now he's about to get it. Get it too late to bring him any more of his precious fame. George do bad thing. George forget, Trudy. George forget. George do bad thing. Once more I tried to move but couldn't. All I can do is write. Uh, I'd at least leave a record this thing, so that all the world would know what a half hour of a perfect script had cost the lives of so many people. George is standing over me now. He's raising his arm. The knife blade catches a glint of light, and my eyes are blinded momentarily by the brilliance. George shifts his weight a little to plunge the knife. 
He pauses and... <laughs> you know, suddenly, for no reason at all, I think of a road. A road that I walked along in Arizona just a week ago. Free, happy, glad to be alive. And then... the tale of The Perfect Script. But remember to join us next week at the same time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear the tale of The Cask of Amontillado. Tonight's program was an original radio drama by Bob Olson entitled The Perfect Script. Heard in tonight's program were Richard Thorne as Marshawn, Carl Grayson as Schenck, Beth Calder as Trudy, and Nelson Hall as George. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. These programs are produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at 8.30 p.m. when the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear the tale of The Cask of Amontillado. Ladies and gentlemen, the Granite Furniture Company, with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo, presents... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Death in the Bayous. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. You know, spring is practically here and the centennial summer is not far away. So now's the time to cheer up your home with something new from the Granite Furniture Company. You'll be amazed at how easily you can improve the beauty and comfort of your home with small items here and there, such as a new floor lamp, a new lounge chair, a table or so, or some other seemingly unimportant item. The Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo are daily receiving new stocks for spring home redecoration. And now you may choose from these delightful new things at prices well within your budget. Go in tomorrow and see for yourself. And be sure to listen a little later in tonight's program for an important announcement from the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. And now for tonight's story. An original radio drama by Robert Olson entitled Death in the Bayous. Death strikes quickly along the bayou. Who's to say the deed was murder? According to this map, we should be nearing that plantation. Oh, I'll be glad to get there and a chance to freshen up a bit. It's a long drive from New York. Ah, very true, Mrs. Crane. A long ride and a dull one. That is, as far as the scenery is concerned. I think it's been lovely. No, oh, if you say so, said the henpecked groom. <laughs> but the Adirondacks have this beat a million ways. Look at this swampland. Well, whatever made you want to spend a honeymoon down here anyway? Oh, Tom would have been hurt if we'd refused his invitation. He'd have been hurt? Well, whose honeymoon is this anyway? Oh, now, Reggie, it's really charming. And you'll like Tommy. You've been down here quite a lot? I spent two summers with the Bonds, and they're really wonderful friends. And Tom the is... Thomas Bonds, the fifth? <laughs> yes, he's a dear. He wanted me to marry him once. Oh, fine. We spend our honeymoon with one of your old suitors. <laughs> we'll probably sit around the family hearth and glower at each other. Oh, no, that's over now. He's nothing more than a friend. A very dear, very rich, and I'm afraid a very lonely one. Now, he must be a fool to be able to forget you, Mad. I know I never could. Don't you dare ever try. Ah, uh, no danger, beautiful. Ah, but methinks I see a sign of life in this uh, forsaken waste. Where? Oh, you see those lights ahead? Reggie, this is it. This is Tyne Oaks. Ah, the welcoming committee. 
Say, that mastiff looks as if he'd like a pound or two of leg. Now, take it easy, Hound. We've been invited. Hello there. Would you let us in, please? Who's there? Oh, it's Amos. Amos, this is Miss Madeline. Why, Miss Madeline, hello, child. Of course, Master Tom's expecting you all. He's pacing the floor right now, he is. Amos, this is my husband, Master Reginald Crane. Yes, Master Reginald. Welcome to Tyne Oaks. You'll just drive up to the house. Master Tom is powerful anxious to see you all. Well, Mad, this is wonderful, really wonderful. I thought you'd never get here. And this is, I presume, the lucky gentleman? Yes, Tommy. This is Reggie. Of course, Reggie. Well, take your things off and join me in the drawing room for a little drink. Lena, take Mrs. Crane's things. Yes, sir, Master Tom. Thank you, Lena. I'd very much like to clean up. Ah, let me see now. That's one. And another. Ah, there's your drinks. Amos, take our guest things to their rooms. The rooms? Why, this is a honeymoon, old man. I, I believe it's legal oh, to... Of course, it seems strange to think of Mad as being married. Forgive me, please. Oh, sure thing. <laughs> I'm a little dazed about it myself. Fabulous luck, you know. Did you ever see anybody so lovely in your life? No, Reggie, please. No. Never have I seen a more lovely creature. Never. Too lovely for you, old fella. Much too lovely for anybody. Well, excuse me. I'm getting a little self-conscious in here. Tom, how are things at dear old Tyne Oak? Well, it's not what it used to be, Mad. Echoes of the old days. Since the colonel and my dear mother died, well, it's a lonely old place. Now it's yours, Mad. Oh, thank you, Tom. It was nice of you to ask us down here. Well, I'll be going now. Where are you going? I moved to the guest house this morning. You mean this entire house is... is a bridal suite. Pardon me, Master Reggie, but do all these things come in? I'll be right with you, Amos. Uh, excuse me for a minute, will you, Mad? Don't forget my black overnight case. Okay, I won't. So you did it anyway. Did what, Tom? Married that... Tom. That... I told you I'd never let anyone else have you. Tom, what are you saying? Your pardon, Mad. I forgot myself. I thought you'd forgotten that and it's all over. Forgotten? No, not forgotten. Good night. Forgotten. Often forgotten, is it? Oh, man, you should never have let me love you so much. Well, my pretty, here's your precious black case. Thank you, Reginald. Oh, why so formal? Well, during our courtship, you called me Reggie. Now we're married, it's Reginald. I'm going home to father. Oh, please, Reggie, don't joke. Maybe we should have gone to the Adirondacks. Oh, nonsense. All I had to offer you there was a rustic little three-room cabin... But th this plantation, all to ourselves, <laughs> it's like something out of Gone with the Wind. That cabin sounds heavenly to me, Reggie. Now, wait a minute, beautiful. A honeymoon is no time to start second-guessing. This is it. This is what we dreamed about. Yes, sir, by golly, I'm going to make our honeymoon at Tyne Oaks the best either of us ever had. You expect more, then? Oh, I certainly do. Well, mighty square of you to tell me about it. Uh, we shall have as many honeymoons as there are days in the year. Oh, Reggie, you're a nitwit, but a charming one. What is it? Now, I'll see you a minute, Miss Madeline. Yes, Lena, come in. Excuse me, I didn't know the master was here. Oh, don't be shy, Lena. This is Master Reggie, my husband. How are you, Lena? Nobody the same at Tyne Oaks. You shouldn't have come down here, Miss Madeline. Lena, what do you say that for? Tyne Oaks has always been my second home. That when Tyne Oaks was the home for everybody. It changed since the Colonel and Master's bond died. Master Tom changed. He get crazy drunk and beat us. Beat you? Why? There ain't no why, Miss Madeline. He just mean. I get so scared of him. And tonight, well, Miss Madeline, he's acting awful. But... Lena, I won't have you saying such things. Now, you run along or, or I'll tell Master Tom. Oh, no, please don't tell Master Tom. Please, he'd... He'd, he'd... he'd, he'd what? Please don't tell him. Then don't let me hear you talking like that again. I'm ashamed of you. Yes, and Lena medicine fool. Lena should be dead. Well, Tommy. You know, Tommy sounds to me like a problem child. He, he was. Oh, but he settled down now to, to, to this quiet life of a plantation owner. Uh, who knows this is all really hate with the lines of the souls of men? Why, Reggie, what do you mean? Only that he still loves you and hates me. Now, I could see that right away. He wanted to put us in separate rooms. Can you imagine it? Yes, Reggie, I think you're right. Well, that's what I was going to tell you. While you were out there, he said something very strange. It frightened me. Well, what did he say? He talked as if he's forbidden me to marry you. Oh, he did, huh? Had he ever said anything to you about our marriage? Nothing, whatever. That's what startled me. Well, it strikes me, my pretty, that we're... Uh, skip, skip it. What, 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 Reggie? No, 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 nothing. Nothing at all. 
Say, come on out here in the balcony, Mad. Oh, there's that moon again. And the jasmine. Oh, Reggie, isn't it lovely? Oh, I don't know. You don't? No. <laughs> Anything lovely outside of you is just too dull to attract my attention right now. Then you retract your threat to go home to Father. Oh, home was never like this. What do you say we stop reading weird meanings into Tom's words and give him credit for this beautiful honeymoon mansion? This is really something, Mad. It's got that cabin beat a mile. I'll bet that little cabin is wonderful. Well, I built it. What was that? That sounds like the dog that greeted us at the front gate. Now, what's he doing out in the swamps this time of night? Well, the prince is in the swamp. Tom's there, too. Well, then I'll revise the question. What's Tom doing out in the swamp this time of night? <laughs> hey, what's that? There's something wrong out there, Mad. I'm going to see what it is. No, Reggie, don't go out no, there. No, I've got to see. Reggie, come back! Oh, Reggie, you fool. You don't even have a gun. Go on back. Go back to your bride, you nitwit. Go back. Uh-oh. The sentry. Nice doggy. Bitch, nice. come here. Down, bitch. Tom. What was that scream? I, th I thought maybe I might help. It's Lena. She's dead. Dead? But we were... Why, only a few minutes ago we Death were... Death strikes quickly in the bayous, Reggie. Now, will you help me get her out of here? Oh, sure, but I want you to tell me what happened to her. Later, Reggie. Stay on the way. Now, come on out here. Just like that? Well, it looks pretty muddy to me. Is there some way around? No, Reggie, there's no way around. Are you afraid of getting your feet wet? No. Well, okay. Here it goes. Hey! Hey, I went down to my waist. I seem to be stuck. You'll have to give me a hand, Tom. A hand? I don't dare give you a hand, Reggie. You're in a pit of quicksand. Quicksand? Then why didn't you warn me? I forgot, Reggie. Tom! I can't get loose. Help me. I felt sorry for you when Madeline got word that you were a German prisoner. And then when word came through that you'd been killed trying to escape, Madeline was brokenhearted. Tom, get me out of this. It was I who dried her tears, Reggie. Madeline finally promised to marry me. They set the date, even sent out the invitations. And then you came back from your grave. That, Reggie, was very inconsiderate of you. I'm sinking, Tom. Do something. Do something? When you were dead, I headed the list with Madeline. When you're really dead, I headed again. Tom! Tom, get me out of here. Madeline's bound to know she'll hate you for the rest of your life. Hate me? Perhaps, but she'll be mine, Reggie. She'll be mine. No. Reggie, you're in pretty deep. You're in pretty deep, Reggie. I'm almost to your chin. Tom! Tom, you won't get away with... Oh, man, I... Reggie? Reggie? Here, Madeline. Reggie? No, Madeline, it's Tom. Oh, Tom, where's Reggie? Reggie? I thought he was with you. That's where I'd be if you were my brother. He came out here to... Oh, help me find him, Tom. I'm afraid to have him out in the swamps alone. Sure, Mad. I'll help you hunt for him. But don't come out here. Why not? I'll come to you. There. You almost stepped in a quicksand pit. Quicksand? Yeah. Very treacherous, you know. You are listening to Death in the Bayou in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy presented by the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Well, here's the special announcement we mentioned a few minutes ago from the Granite Furniture stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Just received another new shipment of 9 by 12 rugs. Yes, you heard correctly. Another new shipment of 9 by 12 rugs at the Granite Furniture Company. You may choose from a wide variety of colors and patterns. And in addition to these new 9 by 12 rugs, you may now choose from an excellent selection of Wilton and Axminster wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Choose from more than 20 rolls. And you know that rugs and carpeting have been very difficult to get. And because of better buying connections, the granite furniture stores have scooped the market. So buy early tomorrow. Rugs and carpeting just received at the granite furniture stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Now back to tonight's story, an original radio drama by Robert Olson entitled Death in the Bayou. Who is it? It's Tom Madeline. May I come in? Oh, yes, Tom. Please do. Madeline, is there anything I can do? Oh, Tom, help me find Reggie. Where could he have gone? The bayous have many hiding places. If he's lost, we do our best to find him. 
What happened out there tonight? Happened? What do you mean? There was a scream. That's why Reggie went out. He thought someone was in trouble. Now both Reggie and Lena are missing. What happened? These are treacherous swamps, Madeline. Maybe Lena was caught in a quicksand pit. It wouldn't be the first time it happened, even at Tarn Oaks. It's no place for anyone who isn't acquainted with every foot of it. And you think Reggie I was... don't know, Madeline. Quicksand leaves no traces. Where were you when Lena cried out? I must have been in my shower. The first thing I heard was Prince's barking. What did you see when you reached the quick pit? Just Prince raising up an awful clamor about something. Is there anything we could do? Well, make sure about... About the pit? Hmm. We've never been able to find out how deep that pit really is. I'm afraid it would be a heartbreaking task and fruitless, Madeline. Well, then what can we do? You have some hounds, don't you? Bloodhounds? Oh, they went out with slavery. I have some hunting hounds, but, well, we could try it, I guess. Well, then let's do it, Tom. First thing in the morning. Get a good night's sleep. Bright and early we'll start. (laughs) No, I want to start right now. Oh, I couldn't sleep knowing I was doing nothing. You really loved him, didn't you? Loved. Oh, I do love him, Tom. I don't want to live without him. You know, all I have asked of life is to be loved that much. Get your rest, Matt. I'll take the dogs and see what I can dig up. Tom! I'm sorry, Matt. I didn't think. We both need a drink. Here, I'll pour one. Drink this, Matt. You'll feel better and sleep better. Well, thank you, Tommy. You're sweet. It's beginning to get light in the east. I'll soon be able to see where I'm going. Let me go with you. No, Matt. There's nothing you could do, and I don't want something to happen to you, too. You stay here. Oh, I guess you're right. I'm getting a bit drowsy already. I know. Uh, I'll put a little sleeping powder in your drink. It'll calm your nerves. Right you are. Oh, my arms feel like window weight. I'm so sleepy. So very sleepy. That's right, Mad. Sleep. Sleep, Mad. Sleep. The Adirondacks, Reggie. Oh, it would have been a lovely honeymoon. Madeline. Madeline, what have I done to you? If you've only loved me. I couldn't expect you to know what a difference it always made to this old place to have you here. And how desolate it became the moment you left. Even now, as you sleep, Tyne Oaks has an enchantment. The charm it never had at any other time. Is it my fault if I love you too much? What are the rules, Madeline? Is it all right for me to go mad with longing in these tinkin' swamps while you and some other man live life like a musical comedy? I couldn't do it, Mad. Not because you love me too little, but because I love you far too much. Oh, forgive me, Matt. The loneliness is too bitter. As long as Reggie lived, I could never hope to be anything better than half dead. Poor old Lena. That was never meant to be. But she tried to warn you and drive you away forever. That I could never allow to happen. Yes, Madeline, I killed for you. But I'll do it again and again until I know you're mine. Another day will soon be here. What will it bring for you and me, Madeline? How can I steal the heartbreak that weeps inside you, the longing for the lost one? Reggie's gone, it's true. Reggie will never come back. I destroyed him. But how can I destroy the memory of him? How unless I destroy the mind in which that memory is embedded? Open your eyes, Madeline. Oh, where am I? In your room. You thought you were asleep. You weren't. I, I put nothing in your drink. I only suggested that. But I have been asleep. Asleep I suggested to you only that. You act on my suggestion now, don't you? Yes. You believe in me, don't you? Yes. Then listen carefully to what I have to say. This is what is known as post-hypnotic suggestion. You will obey me. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know that. Then listen and don't forget. But that light, it, it hurts my eyes. You see a light. I am that light, Madeline. I am the light. If that light ever bothers you, all you have to do is come closer to it. Does it bother you now? Yes. Then come closer. That's it. Closer yet. Now does it bother you? Yes, it hurts my eyes. It's too bright. Then come closer. Now what do you see? You. I see you. You're very close. Then the light is what? The light is you. And if the light bothers you, what do you do? Come to the light. Come to you. That's it. You come closer to me. Now remember this. That light is all the pain you know. There is no other, no other. Now what is that light? Pain. It's all the pain. And what do you do if you feel pain? I come closer to you. Right. You won't forget that. No, I won't forget. All right, Madeline. Now listen carefully. 
Reggie is pain. Every time you think of Reggie, you'll come to me. Do you hear that? Come to me. I am Reggie. I am pain. I am the light. You remember that? Yes. Yeah. Good. Now, Madeline, wake up. Oh, hello, Tom. How long have I been asleep? Not long. How do you feel? Oh, I feel a little strange, Tom. Well, how do you mean, strange? I feel as if I'd forgotten something, but I don't know what it could be. Hmm. But I'll be downstairs, Mad. Join me as soon as possible. Tom, wait. Well, what is it? I couldn't see you for a moment. What do you mean? Just then, when I looked at you, I... Yes? I saw nothing but a blinding glare of light. I must be going mad. I, I can't seem to think. I have the feeling that now, more than any time in my life, I must think. I must think. What is it I've forgotten? Oh, think, Madeline, think. I've never felt like this before in my life, but then how have I felt in my life? I can't remember that. What happened to me? I want to do something. There's something I must know. What is it? What is it? Who is it? It's Amos, Miss Madeline. Amos. Could I talk to you a minute? Amos? Who is Amos? Maybe he can help me. Come in. Miss Madeline, I can't find Lena. Lena disappeared last night. Do you know where she is? Lena? Who's Lena? Who is she? Was she Lena, Miss Madeline? Amos, what am I doing here? What's that? What am I doing here? I'm... I'm sick. I can't seem to remember. Amos, where's that light coming from? What light, Miss Madeline? That light behind you. It's blinding. Amos, what are you doing here? I look for Lena, Master Talk. She gone. She didn't come to the house last night. Do you know where she is? Of course not. But if Lena is lost, we'll find her. Now, don't bother Miss Madeline about it. She isn't feeling well. Oh, I don't mind, Tom. Stay here, Amos, and talk to me. I told you not to bother Miss Madeline. Now get out of here. Yes, Master Tom. Amos, go. But Amos, find Lena. Amos, find Lena. Get out, you tramp. Get out of here before I hit yes, you. Yes, sir. Amos, go. But Amos, find Lena. Tom, will you help me? I can't seem to remember anything. You need a lot of rest. Look at me, Madeline. Yes? Yeah. What do you see? Why, your face is... It's what? It's the face I've been trying to remember. Who are you? Come closer. Yes? Yeah. Now what do you see? Why, you're Tom. Good. Now sleep, Madden, sleep. But that face I saw a moment ago. Oh, would you let me see it again? I said sleep. Yes, I'm asleep. But I must remember, too. I must remember. Good. She's asleep. I must act quickly. And I will sleep a word from here. We'll go on a long trip. She'll never have need to remember. I'll give her a completely new life. Tonight we'll drive out of here. We'll go to Cuba. That's it. We'll go to Cuba and keep her on going. Reggie. Reggie, where are you? She's talking in her sleep. She remembers everything I told her to forget. But she doesn't know it. Reggie. Reggie, I can't hear you very well. What is it? What are you trying to tell me? She's talking to someone. She's hitting up. Her eyes. Her eyes are wide open. Louder, Reggie. Where are you? I, I can't hear you. I didn't hear you, Reggie. In the pit. The pit? <laughs> Madeline. Wake up, Madeline. Take that light out of my eyes. Look, Madeline, look. Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom, I was dreaming. You were? That's strange. You haven't been asleep. I haven't. No, Madeline. You've been right here talking to me all the time. But, Tom... Oh, what's the matter with me? I'd sooner be dead than this way. Why can't I remember anything? You have no memory, Madeline. It's been taken away from you. Who took it away? Why? Oh, just when I need to remember. I took it away, Madeline. You? Why? Because you're about to learn something that would have killed us both. What was it? You'll know soon enough. Until then, don't try to remember. Miss Madeline, Miss Madeline. Who is it? It's Amos, Miss Madeline. I must see you right away. Come in, Amos. Miss Madeline, you've got to get out of here. Get out? Why? Master Tom's in a killing mood. He just tried to kill me. Oh, Amos, what are you saying? Tom wouldn't kill yes, you. Yes, he would, Miss Madeline. I followed him out in the bayou. I saw him with Lena. Who's Lena? You remember Lena, Miss Madeline. She's Lena. She's my Lena. I seem to remember, yet I don't. Oh, tell me, Lena. Tell me more about her. Why should I remember her? You should remember Lena because, well, Lena's your friend. 
Lena tried to help you. Now she dead by Lena dead, Miss Mellon. Massa Tom Killer. I see him with her down on the bayou. Hey, man. I can't see you. It got light again. Hey, Amos, be careful. The light is behind you. Amos. I told you to stay away from Miss Madeline. Why are you here? I saw you, Master Tom. I saw you bury Lena in the bayou. You killed my Lena. I warned you. Now you're going to... Come back here, you babbling fool. Come back here. Amos, Amos, be back. But Amos, come back for Lena. Miss Madeline, run away. Run away, Miss Madeline. Huh? Get that meddling fool. Amos. Amos, I'm coming to get you. Oh, the light. It, it's going away. I must follow it. I must follow the light. Madeline, stay back. Don't come out here. The light going away. I, I must follow the light. Madden. Madden, turn back. Without the light, there's nothing. I I can't lose the light. Madden, I command you to go back to the house. It's gone. Where did the light go? Hey, Miss Madden. Duck behind this tree. It's Amos. Master Tom, don't see us here. He must take you back to the house. Master Tom, awful crazy. You've got to get out of here. Where are you, Madeline? Answer me. Down low, Miss Madeline. He's coming. Madeline. Madeline, don't move. Cottonmouth, don't move an inch. The light. There's the light. Forget the light, Madeline. Freeze. Don't move a muscle. That snake isn't two feet from your face. Tom, bring the light closer. I, I want... I want pain. That's what I want, Tom. I want pain and, and Reggie. Madeline. That's it. I must find Reggie. Reggie. Quiet, you little fool. That snake will strike at anything moves. Madden, look out. Reggie, I lost Reggie. She remembers after all. Please, Miss Madden, listen to Master Tom. Madeline, the snake, it's Madeline. Snake, snake. Ah! Right in the mouth. Hey, Miss Grabber. Miss Madeline, Miss Madeline. Give it to me. Madeline, speak. Tom, you... Did this? Don't talk, Madden. I'll get you back to the house. You killed Reggie. No. Reggie died in the quicksand pit. You killed him. Oh, Reggie, it would have been lovely and... Uh... Madeline. Madeline, speak to me. Good heavens, she's dead. Madeline's dead. Uh... Master Tom. Go away, Amos. Go away, Madeline. What have I done? Master Tom, you killed Master Red. I didn't mean to, Amos. I didn't mean to. And you killed my Lena, too. I must have been mad. Now Amos kill you, Master Tom. Go away, Amos. What? Now old Amos kill you, Master Tom. It's right. Amos must kill you now. Stand back, you fool. Get away from me. Amos gonna kill you, Master Tom. May the good Lord help me do it. Amos, give me that gun. I'll have you whipped. No, Master Tom. You won't whip Amos. You won't whip anybody anymore. Amos. Amos, don't. Master Tom, gone. This man has gone. Nothing but the bubbles in the bayou. Ain't nobody left the dinos anymore. The bayou got us all. Now Amos go. Lena. Lena. Amos, hear the voices. So runs the tale of Beth in the Bayou. Well, friends, heave a big sigh and uh, then listen to this. Another new shipment of 9 by 12 rugs and wall-to-wall carpeting has just arrived at the Granite Furniture Company. You may choose from a wide variety of 9 by 12 rugs in choice colors and patterns. In carpeting, the Granite Furniture Company is now able to offer you a choice from more than 20 rolls in Wilton or Axminster grades. This is hard to get merchandise, and the Granite Furniture Company, through its bigger buying power and better wholesale connections, has scooped the market. Buy early tomorrow on easy terms, rugs and carpeting at the Granite Furniture Company. There is a store near you in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Remember to join us next week at the same time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear the tale of The Doctor of Terror. Tonight's story was written by Robert Olson. Heard in tonight's program were Michael Bruce as Reginald Crane... Beth Calder as Madeline, Dick Thorne as Tom, Carol Moser as Lena, and Ken Jensen as Amos. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. Your announcer is Mal Wyman. These programs are produced and directed by Richard Thorne.
Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at 8.30 p.m. when the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear the tale of the Doctor of Terror. Ladies and gentlemen, the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo presents... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall ascend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the bed of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Judge's House. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. And now for tonight's story, a radio adaptation by Bob Olson of Bram Stoker's story entitled The Judge's House. Justice. Peace. How can we be certain of either when hatred burns unchecked even beyond the grave? I am Malcolm Lane. This is my story. I want to tell it to you while there is still time. I watched them carry the parcels into the judge's house. Mrs. Widom, whom I had engaged as my housekeeper for the next three months, was directing the activity. She was an amusing little character. I had to promise that she wouldn't have to stay in the house after it began to get dark. The upholsterer's man was coming up the pathway with a cart and a new bed. Mrs. Widom had insisted on this one new piece of furniture because, as she put it... A bed that just hasn't been aired for 50 years is not fit for young bodies to lie on. And she was right, of course but my head was too full of plans for study to worry about such details as my living quarters. As for the tales about the harsh old judge whose house this had once been, I had only a mild enthusiasm. He must have been quite a character, though, to make an entire village fear him and his house even 50 years after his death. Mrs. Whittam was positive there was something about the old place, though she nor anyone else quite knew what it was. The consensus of opinion, however was that they would not take all the money in Drinwater's bank to spend an hour here alone. But Mrs. Whittam startled me with a very rational statement. The place is full of rats. And rats is bogeys. Just the same as bogeys is rats. That explanation suited me very well. For as I said once before, my head was full of plans to study. Examinations were coming up soon, and I had paid three months' rent in this old house so that I would be assured of peace and quiet while I prepared for them. The only mysteries I'm interested in, Mrs. Widom, are those of harmonical progression and elliptical functions. They're mystery enough for me. Not that you won't find company here, Mr. Lane. I've already cleaned all of 50 years of dust from everything. Oh, but that waistcoat in this room must be hundreds of years old. And you'll find creaky doors aplenty and loose flats all over, ready to flap in the wind. And bureau drawers that stick and then fall down in the middle of the night. And uh, don't forget the rats. No, Mr. Lane. Don't forget the rats. The workmen were all gone, and but for the busy little figure of the housekeeper, I was alone. It was for this that I'd taken the tiresome ride to Benchurch, a remote little town that had all the attractions of a desert. It was drawing close to evening as Mrs. Whittam was unpacking the last hamper, and I could see that she was beginning to cast worried glances about as the shadows began to creep into the corners of this huge dining room I'd chosen for my living quarters. Oh, you may go now, Mrs. Whittam. It's getting dark in here, and I'm sure you're anxious to get home. You've done well with this old room. I shall reward you with complete possession of this house for the last two months of my tenancy. Three or four weeks will be all I'll need, and I'd hate to see that rent money go to waste. Thank you kindly, sir, but I wouldn't stay here I know, for all the money in Drinkwater's bank. (laughs) I'm really grateful, for I do want to be alone. And if you were not so opposed to it, I might be tempted to uh, accept your company. Ah, you young gentlemen. You fear nothing. 
and I'm certain you'll get all the solitude you need here. Uh, good night, sir. You'll find your supper beneath the cloth. Good night, Mrs. Whittem. Oh, yes, this was comfort. After I'd finished my supper, I cleared the great oak table and got my books out. Then when I'd put fresh wood in the fire and trimmed the lamp, I sat down to a spell of hard work. I hardly looked up from my books until nearly 11 o'clock, at which time I threw some more wood in the fire and indulged in one of my most deeply ingrained habits, that of tea drinking. I thoroughly enjoyed tea and drank it this night with a sense of, of real enjoyment. Soon the new wood I had thrown on the fire began to crackle and the new flame threw quaint shadows about the great old room. And as I sat there sipping my tea, I reveled in the complete sense of, of isolation. Then for the first time, I noticed the noise of the rats. Strange, I hadn't heard them before. Huh, maybe they're just getting used to me. But they're bold enough now. How busy they were. And what strange noises they made. Up and down the old wainscot they went. And over the ceiling and over the floor, racing and gnawing and scratching. There were so many of them that I'd have sworn that if they set their strength to it, they could have carried the house away. I had a smile when I recalled the words of Mrs. Whittem. Rats is bogies and bogies is rats. <laughs> The stimulation of the tea gave me a sense of security, and I grabbed the lamp to take a good look around the room. Strange why such a beautiful old place should have been so neglected for all this time. The carving on the oak panels of the wainscot was fine indeed, and that around the doors and windows was of rare merit. I saw some old pictures on the wall next to the fireplace, but they were coated so thick with dust that I couldn't distinguish any of their details, even though I did hold the lamp high above my head. Now and then I would get a quick start as the light fell upon the old walls and disclosed the glittering eyes of a rat as he would stick his face out of a hole or a crack. In an instant, it would disappear with a squeak in the scamper. Another object that struck me as odd was the rope of a great alarm bell that hung in the corner of the room on the right-hand side of the fireplace. After my inspection tour, I sat in a high-backed chair that was near the fireplace and sipped from another cup of tea. For a while, I thought the noise of the rats would i a distraction, but that eased off and I became accustomed to it. The same as a person gets used to the roar of water when he camps beside a stream. Soon I was so engrossed in a mathematical problem that I forgot everything else in the world. But since the solution to the problem came stubbornly, I looked up and was surprised to see that the fire had fallen to a dull red glow. There was a sudden quiet, the strange hush that comes in the hour before dawn. I became aware for the first time the noise of the rats had ceased. When it had happened, I couldn't remember. But something instinctive told me that it had been in the last few moments and that it had been sudden. I looked up, and what I saw... What I saw was a most amazing thing. For there on the high-backed chair sat an enormous rat staring at me through deadly, malignant eyes. I tried to frighten it away, but it didn't stir. I made a motion as if to throw something at it. But it only bared its teeth angrily, and its cruel eyes shone all the more bright. I'd grabbed the poker from the hearth and was going to kill the creature. But before I could reach it, that enormous rat jumped to the floor, and with a squeak that sounded like a consummate hit of the whole world, scampered up the rope of the alarm bell and disappeared in the darkness. Then, as if by a signal, the noise of the other rat started all over again. By this time, I gave up working my problem and bartered it for some much-needed sleep. It was Mrs. Whittam who woke me as she came in to make up the room. You're much paler this morning, Mr. Lane. I am. You shouldn't stay up so late with your work. It isn't good for you. But tell me, how did you spend the night? I was certainly glad to see you. Alive? <laughs> oh, yes, that was quite all right, Mrs. Whittam. The something didn't worry me too much. But the rats certainly held themselves a camp meeting. There was one that sat up in that chair by the fireplace and wouldn't go away until I chased him with a poker. It was the biggest old devil I've ever seen. Old devil? Maybe it was the old devil. <laughs> I only meant Never that... you mind, sir. Many a true word is spoken in jest. Well, pardon me, Mrs. Whittam. I, I didn't mean to be rude. But the thought of the old devil himself sitting in that chair last night struck me as being rather funny. And it's a good thing you can laugh. But all the same, if I were to spend the night here tonight, oh, heaven forbid, I'd make sure I was ready for him. 
that night, the rats put on an earlier show, for their scamperings began almost as soon as I'd finished with my supper. The cursed creatures seemed to get on my nerves, and I sat there and popped to my pipe. While they squealed and scratched and gnawed. They seemed to grow bolder by the minute. By now they were coming to the chinks and cracks in the wall until their eyes shone like miniature lamps when the firelight struck them. They'd even make bold sallies under the floor and I'd have to frighten them away by pounding on the table with my fist. That was how I passed the early part of that night. Despite it, I became more and more engrossed in my studies. And then, a strange sensation coursed through me. For there it was again. Instinctively, I grabbed the handiest object I could find, a book, and flung it at the baleful little beast. But the book was too hastily aimed, and the huge rat didn't stir. So once again, I went into the poker routine. And once again, it fled up the rope of the alarm bell. I tried to follow its flight more closely this time, but before I could see where it went, it had been swallowed up in the shadows. And just as it happened last night, as soon as the big rat had gone, the others resumed their activity. I looked at my watch and found that it was very close to midnight. I built up the fire and brewed myself a pot of tea. I tried to get back to my work, but I, I suddenly became curious to know where the rat had disappeared to. For I was certain that tomorrow I would most likely get myself a rat trap. I gathered all my books about me and put them in a handy position for throwing. Then I took the rope of the alarm bell and placed the end of it upon the table underneath the lamp, where there would be plenty of light on it. As I picked up the rope, I was amazed how pliable and strong it was. Ideal, I thought, for hanging a man. Soon my preparations were complete. Now, this time, my friend, I intend to learn more about you. Once again, I was hard at my work, and the noise of the rats was forgotten. But just as suddenly as before, I was aroused by that same sense of startling silence. I was conscious of a slight movement in the rope at my elbow. Without stirring, I, I checked to see if my pile of books was an easy reach. It was. I cast my glance up the rope just in time to see the huge rat drop from it to the back of the high oak chair. I grabbed a book and hurled it. With amazing agility, the rat sprang aside and dodged it. I threw a second and a third, but each time it managed to dodge my battery. It was almost funny. Almost. Finally, when I was down to the last book, I took careful aim, and as I did this, the rat squeaked and seemed afraid. I let the book fly. It struck the rat with a resounding thud. It gave out a shrill, terrified shriek, and running up the back of the chair made a desperate leap, and with the speed of a bolt of lightning ran up the bell rope. The lamp rocked with a strain, but it didn't topple. Then I saw the rat leap to a molding and disappear through the hole in one of the big pictures that hung on the wall. I made a mental note of the exact spot... Third picture from the fireplace, huh? I'll remember that and have Mrs. Whittem scrub it clean the first thing tomorrow morning. I began to pick up the books I had thrown at the rat. As I did so, I took a good look at their titles. Conic sections. Mr. Rat doesn't seem to mind that. Neither did he this one on cycloidal oscillations. And this one on thermodynamics he dodged very neatly. Oh, Here's the book that got him. As I looked at the title of the book that had finally hit the huge rat, I could feel a pallor spread across my face. For the title of that book was... The Holy Bible. You are listening to The Judge's House by Bram Stoker in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy... Brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. And now back to the story by Bram Stoker entitled The Judge's House. Mr. Lane, this is Dr. Thornhill. Dr. Thornhill, are you ill, Mrs. Whittem? Your pardon, Mr. Lane, but uh, Mrs. Whittem wanted me to come up here and have a talk with you. A talk? Well, in that case, let me prepare some tea for you. Oh, please don't. Uh, that's one of the things I came to talk to you about. Mrs. Whittem thinks you drink more strong tea than is good for you. She tells me also that you put in quite long hours at your studies. Mrs. Whittem, I engaged you as a housekeeper, not as a guardian. I... 
Oh, please, Mr. Lane, I didn't As a matter of to... fact, Lane, she didn't uh, mean to have me talk to you at all. That was my idea. I see. Well, now that you're here, what do you want me to do? Leave this house. Well, even if I could see the reason for it, I doubt if I would. But as for the tea and late hours, I might be able to give them up. Would it make you feel any better, Mrs. Whittem, if I promised not to study after uh, one o'clock tonight? Yes, if you promise. Mm, then I promise. I advise you, not as a total stranger to your problem, Mr. Lane. I was a student once myself, you know. Of course. Shall we shake on a doctor? Uh, fine. Now, if you will, I wish you'd uh, tell me what you've noticed in this house. Well, it's just as I've told Mrs. Whittem. I'd be working late, and I'd suddenly be... <laughs> I looked to see which book it was that had struck the rat, the devil, as Mrs. Whittem calls it, I was amazed to find that it was the Holy Bible. <gasps> there now. Please, Mrs. Whittem, you're not hurt. Uh, now, Mr. Lane, you say the rat always went up the rope of that alarm bell? Always. I uh, suppose you know what that rope is? No, I... It's the very rope the hangman used to execute the victims of the judge's hatred. Oh, no. Now, Mrs. Whittem, there's no reason to get upset about this, really. Uh, doctor, you shouldn't put such horrible thoughts in poor Mr. Lane's mind. He has enough to unseat him already. I, uh, I did it for a definite purpose. Mr. Lane, I want you to fix your attention on that rope. Now, I know you're sound of mind and body, but hard work and long hours and this suggestion of the devil, especially in this lonely old house, can do things to the mind. Now, I don't mean this is any offense, but if you should find yourself having, well, hallucinations or some unexplainable fright, I want you to pull that rope. It'll give us some kind of a warning in the village. We might be able to be of some help. Well, thank you, Doctor. I'll do that. <laughs> I may get stuck with a problem. Mm, fine. Goodbye, Mr. Lane, and, uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised if Benchurch hears the alarm bell from the judge's house tonight. I didn't quite share the doctor's views, but just the same, I caught myself staring at the bell rope. The more I stared, the more restless I became, and every now and then my mind would conjure up the vision of some wretched victim dangling from the end of it. But that line of thinking would have me out of my mind in a hurry. Mrs. Whittam had made the place neat and homey. I wandered over to one of the big windows and flung it open. I was surprised to find that a sharp wind had come up, a very cold wind for April. It was more than a sharp wind, really, for it was carrying a stone. Little drops of rain began to pelt me in the face until soon it became a thing of fury. I bolted the shutters and built up the fire with some fresh wood. I was uncomfortable and was only vaguely conscious of the reason. Suddenly I knew the rats were quiet tonight. It gave me a slight case of the jitters, and I instinctively took a hasty glance at the bell rope. The rope was quite still. I wanted a hot cup of tea, but remembering my promise to Mrs. Whittam, I desisted. Instead, I set up the great oak table and opened my books. Soon I had started a problem, and the noise of the rats began. For the first time since I had taken up residence in the church's house, I was glad to hear those rats. I had worked for an hour or so and suddenly became conscious of the furious storm outside. I was thankful that I didn't have to be out of it. The faint movement of the bell rope impelled me to walk over to it and take it in my hand. I saw nothing. It had only been the wind and the rope was rising and falling gently with each new gust of air which caused the bell to sway back and forth a little. That rope had a deadly fascination to it. I wondered why the judge wanted such a grisly memento in his house. The thought of it sent a chill through me. Or was it a thought? Didn't I sense a tremor along that rope? I, I couldn't be sure, but at that moment I remembered the picture. I walked over to the table, picked up the lamp, and approached the spot where I'd seen the picture the night before. I counted out the pictures until I came to the third one from the fireplace. Even before I raised the lamp, I could see that Mrs. Whittam had washed it clean as I had told her to do. Then what I saw... What I saw gave me such a start that I nearly dropped the lamp... My knees almost gave way beneath me, and I was conscious of huge beads of perspiration that were forming on my forehead. Just looking at it made me tremble like an aspen leaf. The picture seemed fairly to leap out at me. For there, dressed in his scarlet and ermine robes with a judge, with his merciless evil face, his sensual mouth, and a nose that was shaped like the beak of a bird of prey. His face had a cadaverous culling. It was a ghastly picture. But it was the eyes that really made me go cold. For those eyes were... And heaven help me if I'm going mad. 
Those eyes were the exact duplicate of the evil eyes of the great rat. The picture had been painted in this very room. I began to compare the two, and as my eyes swept the room, they were suddenly riveted to the judge's chair. For there, with a rope hanging behind it, sat the huge rat of the judge's eyes, and the hatefulness was now intensified with a fiendish leer. Never did the wind howl so. This had to stop. I wanted some tea, but I didn't take any. The doctor had been quite right. My nerve must have been getting drawn pretty taut. Strange, too, because I never was in better health. Well, no tea. We'll substitute some brandy. Let's see. Then, uh... <sighs> I had a stiff glass of the brandy and went back to work. The rats were at it again, and I was glad to hear them, for they had become a sort of symbol of normalcy. The storm raised such a fury that I was unaware of anything else. But once, during a sharp, silent lull, I heard another sound, a faint squeaking noise. I listened for it again and soon detected it. It was coming from the corner of the room where the bell rope hung. At first I thought it was just the motion of the rope in the storm, but I looked up and saw something in the dim light that made me all the more positive that I was going mad. For there was the great rat, clinging to the rope and gnawing at it. I could see the lighter coloring where the bare strands were exposed. Just then the rat finished its job and the rope fell to the floor with a thud. For a moment the huge rat just hung there like a tassel. It was then that I realized what had happened. My only contact with the village was now gone. I don't know why, but I rushed to the lamp on the table, snatched off the shade and ran over to the picture of the judge. A chill of horror went through me. But I think I must have expected what I saw. It seemed more like a confirmation than a shock. For there in the center of the picture was a great patch of brown canvas, as clean and as fresh as the day it had been drawn over the frame... And where the portrait of the judge himself had been, there was nothing. I heard a sound behind me. When I turned around, I really got the palsy. I suddenly became incapable of movement. I could hardly think. I had been prepared to see most anything but what was there. For there in the judge's high back chair, with his black cap in his hand, his ermine robes fixed about him with a smile of triumph, twisting his cruel mouth, was the judge himself. As the clock struck the hour, it seemed to beat the blood right out of my heart. At the twelfth stroke, the judge placed the black cap on his head and walked deliberately over to the place where the piece of bell rope lay in a heap on the floor. He picked it up and drew it through his hands as one would a valuable fur pelt. Then he began to knot one end, fashioning it into a noose. He tightened it and tested it with his foot. All this time, he never took his horribly cruel eyes from my face. I began to feel trapped. For some reason, I could barely move. I could only watch as he started to move along the table toward me. And then, with a quick movement, he, he threw the noose at me, as if to ensnare me in it. It missed. He raised it again, never once taking those hateful eyes from my face. Once more, the noose came, flying toward me. Once more, with some last ounce of strength, I dodged it. The room seemed flooded with light. The lamp had suddenly flared up high. I looked about the room and was astonished to see the shiny little eyes of the rats as they peered out the cracks and chinks in the wall. I looked up at the bell rope, my lost and last hope of warning the village. It was covered with the little fellows. Funny thing, but those rats were the only thing that gave me even the slightest sense of comfort. For as the rats clambered along the bell rope... The bell itself began to sway, and I heard a tiny sound, yes, very tiny, as the clapper touched the bell itself. It was only a whisper of a sound, but it would grow louder in time. Or would it? At this sound, the judge looked up, and a scowl of terrible anger came to his face. His eyes were like red-hot coals, and he stamped his foot so that the house seemed to shake. The rats kept running up and down the rope as if they were conscious that it was a race against time. Now the judge was approaching me with a noose in his hand. As he came closer, there seemed to be something paralyzing in his presence, and I stood as rigid as a corpse. Suddenly, I, I felt the judge's icy fingers against the skin of my throat. He was adjusting the rope about my neck. Then he picked me up and stood me on the high oak chair and put his hand on the swaying end of the bell rope. As he raised his hand, I was conscious of my little rat friends fleeing through the hole in the ceiling. They were my last hope. I stood there on the chair and couldn't move a muscle. 
Now that my last hope seemed gone, I wanted the judge to hurry and get it over with. Soon he'd tie the end of the rope just above my neck, to the dangling end of the bell rope. Then he jumped down to the floor and looked at me with those eyes that hated me so. The smile of diabolical triumph seemed to wreathe him in horror. I began to wonder about hangings. I wondered how long it would take, whether the doctor in the village could possibly reach me in time, for I knew that I would soon be sounding the alarm bell. I even wondered what kind of a shadow I'd cast on the wall as I dangled from the end of the rope in this grotesque candlelight. But I didn't wonder for long. Because suddenly, the judge grabbed the chair on which I was standing when the sudden movement jerked it out from under me. So runs the tale of The Judge's House. Remember to join us next week at the same time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Tonight's program was adapted from the story by Bram Stoker entitled The Judge's House. Heard in tonight's program were Dick Thorne as Malcolm Lane, Beth Calder as Mrs. Woodham, and Mal Wyman as the doctor. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. This program was written by Bob Olson and produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at 8.30 p.m., when the granite furniture stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Ladies and gentlemen, the granite furniture company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo presents... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall ascend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of... Markheim. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. And now for tonight's story, an adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Markheim. They said that Markheim's first great crime was that he had committed murder. That's hardly true, for no man can kill his fellow until he first twists the knife in his own heart. This is the story of Markheim. He was a gambler accustomed to lightning shifts of fortune. But on the eve of his greatest triumph, he couldn't resist that final spin of the wheel. It was his life against the future. He wanted the decision to come swiftly, as it had always done before. But this time, the wheel turned tortuously slow for Markheim. And once set into motion, no power on earth could halt it. It was Christmas Eve. Markheim was happy to be towed along an Angela's little leash. She loved him, or what she knew of him. Angela was quite aware of the power of her smile, and Markheim was aware of the fact that she'd been leisurely and charmingly spoiled. But even if it had been a great chain that had led him into this lovely garden, instead of a warm, sweet smile, he'd have resisted no more than he did now. For this leash would lead him to a fortune. 
more money than he'd ever dreamed existed in all the casinos in the world. Besides, he was in love with Angela. Mark, when do you plan to speak to Papa? Very soon, dearest. There are a few things I want to clear up first. It won't take long. Just a few days at the most. Tomorrow, perhaps? Tomorrow? Well, that's pretty short notice, darling. I'm afraid that I... Oh, I want it tomorrow. Yes, but why? What's so significant about tomorrow? I had thought to wait just a few more... Oh, tomorrow's just as good as any other day. In fact, it's better. It's Christmas. It's tomorrow or never. Angela, what are you saying? Oh, don't look so frightened, darling. I was only joking. Oh, better. Only it will be tomorrow, Mark, won't it? You always get your own way. Always, darling. But I wouldn't have insisted if I didn't think it would make us both happy. And you think we'll be happier if I ask your father tomorrow? Of course. There's no need to wait, and, and I want this for a Christmas present. Christmas present? Yes. Oh, and speaking of Christmas presents, I have a very nice one for you. Oh, not too nice, I hope. I mean, I hope it wasn't too... Costly? Oh, but it was very. I wish you hadn't, Angela. That is, well, I have something for you, too. You have? Oh, what is it? Well, I... Well, you like it. It's... it's... Yes, it's very nice. I... Now it's my turn. You shouldn't have done it. <laughs> Nothing is too good for you. Nothing. I hope it isn't too expensive. expensive? <laughs> well, it was. But uh, it's just a little trinket. I, I... Whatever it is, Mark, it'll be very nice. But if you weren't such a successful member of the stock exchange, I'd scold you for spending too much money on me. Stock exchange? Oh, oh, oh yes, quite. Well, Angela, I think I'd better be going. Oh, so soon? Yes, I, I really must. And then I won't detain you. But I want you here early tomorrow. Come just as soon as you possibly can. <laughs> the iron rule of Angela... Ah, but I love it, darling. Until tomorrow? Tomorrow. As Varkheim made his way through the dark streets, the chill, damp fog soon dispersed the warmth he'd felt in the rich comfort of Angela. And the last word he'd spoken to her as he'd taken his leave seemed to mock him as he traveled in the night. His futile groping for happiness seemed to slap him full in the face with each new wave of the night gray night mist. For a moment, he thought to return to his foul, dingy little room, barren and ugly though it was. The thought of it made him shudder. Any other time, he might have found some comfort in his hateful little iron bed. Another night, he could have slept and dreamed of fabulous fortune, of an endless flood of gambler's luck, making him richer with every spin of the wheel. But there was no time for that now. For tomorrow was... He cursed the inconvenience of this moment. Tomorrow was... Christmas. Suddenly, as if some henchman of the devil had whispered into his ear, Markheim heard the name that had been synonymous with resentment in his heart. That name seemed to strike faint but unmistakable sound in his brain. It was very faint at first, like the soft, tinkling snap of an icicle when it breaks. But it soon became a giant thing that loomed up so forcibly it was almost physical. It came without warning out of the thick fog of his brain, and Markheim suddenly found the name on his lips. Zeigler. 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 What do you want? Ah, oh, it's you, Markheim. Let me in, Zeigler. On Christmas Eve? Can't you see I'm closed? Open up. I've got to see you right away. All right. What kind of trouble are you in this time? Well, come on in. I don't want all that cold and damp creeping in. I've enough aches already. Yes. Merry Christmas. What's your end? You do a pretty good business here, don't you, Zeigler? You didn't come to talk about my books. What did you come for? I told you the last time that I wouldn't take any more of your stolen goods. I didn't come to sell anything, Zeigler. My uncle's cabinets are disgustingly empty these days. Uh, he's moved his collection. I don't wonder at that. Your uncle is a remarkable collector. His items were rare indeed. It must have been quite a blow to him when he discovered that they were disappearing so methodically. <laughs> it was more of a blow to me, I assure you. He booted me clean out of the place. I was taking an awful chance myself handing that stuff. An awful chance. Mm, but at an awful profit, Zagler. What good's a profit when you once get the yard after you? Well, if you didn't come here to sell, what did you come for? To buy. I want to buy a Christmas present for a lady. Mm, you pay dearly coming in on me like this. You know I've put up my shutters and I'm refusing business. You won't refuse my business, Zagler. You won't be getting any bargains either. 
You'll have to pay for both my time and your rather surly manner, young fellow. I suppose you can pay him? Don't worry about that. Then you can pay it someone's way. I've done very well in the stock exchange. And likely as not, I'll do much better soon. My errand today is very simple. I'm really quite sorry, Zagler, that I have to disturb you this way, but it's a little matter I overlooked until this late hour. I must have this little compliment ready before morning. And, you know, a man would be a fool to deliberately harm his chances of a wealthy marriage. Well, let that be it, then. You've been a good customer, and if you have a chance, as you tell me for a fortunate marriage, I don't want to be an obstacle. Now, uh, here's a nice object. You'd let you certain to favor it. It's a hand mirror. Guaranteed 15th century. It's from a fine collection. Whose collection, Zagler? In the interest of my customer, I would hold the name, if you don't mind. He was, shall we say, somewhat like yourself. The nephew of a remarkable collector. The pointed remarks of this unscrupulous old dealer suddenly flushed Markheim's column with waves of passionate resentment. But they passed, leaving nothing but a slightly emotional residue and a slight nervous trembling in his hands. He took the mirror Zeigler held out to him. Surely you do not propose this for a Christmas present. Why not? Your lady should be very happy to have such a fine item. And every time she looks at herself in it, she'll think of her sterling husband. Your manner is likely to cost you something before long, Tagler. So you suggest a thing like this. Look at it. Look at yourself in it. Though I dare say you'd look little better any other way. But look at it. Your future lady must be difficult to please, sir. I am buying a lady's Christmas present. Not some monstrous souvenir of the sins and follies of the past. Certainly not that grim thing. You weren't actually serious about pawning that off on me, were you? Quite serious, sir. What are you made of, Zeigler? What keeps your dry old heart at work these overtime years? You certainly must have a few thoughts now and then of something beside your miserable little existence. Are you joking with me, Markheim? You'll find it on the sale price if you are. (laughs) Everything about you can be found on the sale price, Zeigler. Come, what's the purpose of this talk? Christmas Eve, man. See how the world scurries by outside? They're all touched with a very warm, friendly spirit. What does your life consist of tonight but a hand for grabbing money and a safe for hoarding it? Is that all? You've drunk too much to the health of your lady, I think. Ah, then you have been in love. Tell me of those golden moments of yours, Zeigler. Tell me all about them. I have no time for such things. I have no time for this foolishness either. Do you take the glass or not? Yeah, but let's not be hasty. A pleasant talk, a pleasant walk. Uh, how does that go? Well, pleasant it is, Zeigler, and I must not hurry away from any pleasure, even one as doubtful as this. Each instant is a precipice, Zeigler, a very high precipice. If we hurry, we fall and dash ourselves to a thousand meaningless pieces. Yes, if we hurry, we fall, Zeigler. Let's take our time this fine evening. Let us tear away the masks that hide us from each other. Who knows? We might even be friends. I have my books to balance tonight, Markheim. Either make your purchase, or I have to thank you to leave the shop. To be sure, there is no time for being friends, is there? Show me something else, then. Show me something else, Zeigler. There was something in Markheim's voice just then. It couldn't have been the words themselves. It was a tone or a light that flashed in his eye but it filled the little dealer with an unexplainable terror. He turned and was about to climb the small ladder that would take him to a little object art on a higher shelf, when suddenly Markheim poised a little dagger high in the air. It flashed only a fraction of a lightning bolt. This for you, Zeigler, and a very merry Christmas. Zeigler flashed at the shelves like a chicken. Then he fell to the floor, and flesh seemed to telescope into flesh as he settled into a senseless little pile. Markheim stared at it through eyes that had suddenly seen too much. A single tick of the old clock seemed almost to buffet him into unconsciousness. His lips parted to speak. Must not hurry. Each instant, the precipice. Yes. Zeigler! Stand up! Stand up and speak to me!
listening to a radio adaptation by Bob Olson of Markheim by Robert Louis Stevenson on tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. And now back to tonight's story of Markheim. Markheim the gambler wagered his life and became Markheim the murderer. In one swift blow, he'd cut himself away from any part of the world he'd known. That's why no one can tell his story now but Markheim himself. I stood there, my hand still clinging loosely to the dagger. That hand that seemed to have no relationship to the rest of my body. I looked about me. The candle on the counter caught a chill draft and was wagging like the tail of an excited puppy. I steadied myself, for the room was heaving and tossing like a schooner in a storm. Hundreds of feet away, it seemed, the door was slightly ajar. Through this opening, a long, slim finger of light pointed accusingly at the very spot I stood. I leaped aside. A shiver of fright shocked through me as I realized the stupidity of the motion. I looked at the body of Zeigler. It lay there like a listless sack of sawdust. As suddenly as had the fright, a wave of calm came over me. I looked again at the body. It was nothing. Yes, there was nothing there to be afraid of. A hunk of lifeless something that had once been a man. The clock ticked on, but no longer affected the day of this thing on the floor. Yes, it was nothing. It had suddenly lost meaning to Zeigler, to the shop to everyone but me. But that security didn't last. I looked again, saw the deep color forming about this haggard heap. That blood. It was still alive. What if it found a voice? What if this flesh should raise a cry that could be heard all over England and then... Where? Then it would take up its endless flight around the earth. It would never be still again. Never. Time. Time. I must have time. Oh, but time had such a raucous voice. Yes, what is time? A new precipice each instant. Each tick of the clock was a new danger. I picked up the candle, started about the room, filling my pockets with the treasures of art that Zeigler had gained so craftily and guarded so fiendishly. I saw things that terrified me. Things that turned out to be my own shadow. I'd catch a reflection of myself in a rack of mirrors, rich imported glasses that sent a new fear to wilt my nerves. For each time I looked, I saw a hostile sea of my own eyes spying on me. A thousand questions flashed across my world hysteria. Why had I used a knife? Why hadn't I chosen a more quiet hour? Why had I killed him at all? And then there were more. Where was the servant girl now? When would she be back? How much time did I have? Yes, how much time? When would the world know of what I had done? When would Angela know? Oh, you fool. My brain became a racetrack for nightmares. There seemed to be something terrifying about the normal as ever rhythm of the footsteps out on the street. They must know about the thundering riot in this house. How could they help it? I began to fear nature herself. I expected her to break her own laws to accomplish my own personal destruction. Yes, what if the walls should suddenly fail to hide me? If the prying eyes of London should gain the power to see beyond nature's barriers? <laughs> then, then another vision came to me in this room that was pulsating so with clamor and silence alike. Yes, yes, all the old women of London started to rock feverishly in their chairs and began to weave a rope with which I was soon to be hung. I knew I was tottering on the brink of the final shock that would send me screaming my guilt to the world if I didn't take hold of myself. But one thing I was rapturously grateful for, I was alone. I was alone. <laughs> no. Zyla, open up. Answer your door, Zeigler. Thank heavens. He 
he's gone. Time. Time. Yes, I, I must have time. Others will come. The girl. I must get the money. No time to waste. I walked over to the body, shoved it with my foot. It rolled over crazily and took on a queer, twisted posture. The face was pale like wax. I remembered the wax museum I'd seen as a lad, and that memory robbed the scene of its grotesque quality. I took new courage. I saw myself as a boy. <laughs> Here's how horrified I'd been at those realistic reproductions of famous murders. Even the music came back to me. The monotonous chant of the calliope. The time came for me to act or run. But I didn't run. I grabbed the keys from Zygler's coat pocket and started up the stairs that led to his private apartment. There were 24 steps and 24 separate torches that led to the drawing room where I knew I'd find the safe. As I walked, I seemed to hear the echo of another footstep coming from behind me. Now I was at the top. I pulled open the door, entered, and bolted it behind me. The sense that I was not alone in this house was about to drive me mad. I longed to be in my shoddy little room, away from the eyes that were constantly dancing about in this house. Every man who walked became an avenger and sought stealthily for some scrap of evidence that would curse me forever. I thought of Angela, not long, just the length of a breath or so, but I heard her voice in hollow mockery. Tomorrow or never, Ma. Tomorrow or never. Yes. She said she was only joking. She thought she was only joking. I was before the safe. The finale of this little drama. I fumbled with the keys. There must have been 50 in all. And again, the rush of time began to make me tremble with uncontrollable anxiety. Time, time, time. If I ran out of time, this nightmare could have no meaning at all. I shot a glance at the door. Nothing stirred. Yes, I was satisfied that I must be alone. It was quiet here. Even my heart began to slow down a little. Suddenly, another sound broke the stillness. It came from the nearby church. The organ was playing a familiar hymn. I listened. Then I heard it. A sound to freeze a scream in its making. The knob on the door was turning. Someone was going to enter this room. I was caught in a vice of terror. Slowly the door opened. And there... There was a face without a body staring at me. Who are you? Did you call me? I stared. I could do nothing else. The face seemed to swim before me. It seemed a familiar face. No, no, it wasn't familiar either. Oh, what was that face? It belonged to neither heaven nor earth. What do you want of me? I came to see you. See me? How did you know that I was here? You told me. I told you? Not directly, perhaps. Then you really do know me? Right down to the soul. Are you the devil? Does it matter? Oh, yes, but... But you knew me some time ago. <laughs> yes, thank heaven you don't know about the... Murder. Oh, but I do. I came to warn you that the servant girl has left her sweetheart early tonight and is on her way home now. Now? Yes. Shall I tell you what she brings with her for your Christmas? What? The gathers. Now you must hurry. Shall I tell you where to mine mon the money? For, for what price? It's a Christmas gift. What, what are you going to do with me? You know that I'm really not evil. I had no heart for these things. Yours will probably be a deathbed repentance. I have no concern with that. I'm interested in you only as long as you are alive. But, but why do you do this at all? Can't you see that my hands are red? Don't you realize that I've murdered the little dealer? Yes. Then why do you stop with me? Because your name is Markheim. Yes, yes, yes. My name is Markheim. You know that I'm made up of evil and of good. You'll see that they don't destroy the good to avenge the evil. You, you will help me, won't you? This money you're about to take, how will you use it? On the stock exchange. But that's where you've already lost thousands. Yes, but this time I have a sure thing. You will lose again, Markheim. You know. I do. But but I'll save out half. You will lose that, too. Oh, if that happens, if I do lose again, what next? Yes, 
Yes, I'll, I'll start over with Angela. You have lived for 36 years, Markheim. Fifteen years ago, you would have shuddered at the thought of stealing. Three years ago, the name of murder would have made you ill. Who knows, Markheim, what you might embrace in the next five years. But I still have good in me. Tell me, have you grown any better at all in the past few years? I can remember when I was a boy. Yes, I still love the things that I loved then. But are you better than you were then? No, 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 no. And you still want me to help you get the money. Remember three years ago, Markheim, weren't you seen in a little chapel? Yes, yes, I was there. I meant to go back. And didn't you raise your voice louder than the others in the hymn? Yes, but... Where are you going? We part company here. Time has run out. That's the maid, you see. The maid. Uh, what shall I do? Why not do what you did with the dealer? Here's your last great danger. One more swift blow, and you can finish at your leisure. Don't. Don't. Don't go. Don't leave me. He, he's gone. My last great danger. Yes. There is nothing left to do, but... I took the little dagger from my coat pocket and crept down the stairs. Twenty-four steps to... Where? Never, Mark. Tomorrow or never. I can do it quickly. I'll tell her old Zeigler is ill. Yes, now, I don't crack a smile, Markheim. Whatever you do, don't overact. But curse the thing that made me lose all this precious time with talk. Yes, too late now, though. Much too late. Too late. Too late. There's no more time for you, Markheim. You again. Who are you, anyway? The door, Markheim. Here's your chance. Open the door. First, tell me who you are. Don't you know... Don't you know, really? No, no, I don't. My name is Markheim. No. Then you're... The door, Markheim. Answer the door. Hello. Is Mr. Seigler in? Are you the maid? Uh, yes. Then you'd... You'd better go for the police. I... I've just murdered your master. So runs the tale of Markheim. Remember to join us next week at a new time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Tonight's program was adapted by Robert Olson from the story by Robert Louis Stevenson. Heard tonight were Carl Grayson as Markheim, Richard Harcourt as the narrator, Beth Calder as Angela, and Richard Thorne as Zeigler. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The engineer was Nephi Sorensen. These programs are produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at a new time, just one hour later at 9.30 p.m., when the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of... The Hall of Fantasies.